Witch on the Run. Book Four of the Red Witch Chronicles. Sammy Valentine. The fourth book of the Red Witch Chronicles, an urban fantasy series containing magic, paranormal adventure, and vampire mayhem, along with swearing, violence, and adult situations. All rights reserved. No portion of this book may be reproduced in any form without permission from the publisher, except as permitted by U.S. copyright law. 1. TNC. January 31st, early evening. Nevada, Clark County. Red admired a row of slot machines in the truck stop as she finished her snack run. Only in Nevada, the dark horizon hid the bright lights of Vegas, but they were close. She left the brightly lit travel center for the dry desert night with her sugary loot. After transporting a soulmancer across state lines, she should have been aching and stressed. She had upended her life in Los Angeles at the last minute, after all. Being on the road, even if she were hauling dangerous cargo, felt simple after months of grappling with vampire intrigues. The smell of old exhaust in the parking lot could have been the finest cologne to her. The breeze whipped over the parking lot, carrying dust from the encroaching wilderness. A tickle of magic made her spine itch. She shivered in her faux leather jacket and fought the urge to do a bewildered turnabout like a person who forgot why they went into the kitchen. Imagining flicking on a black light to reveal mystical energy, she called upon her spirit gaze to see magic. She scanned the eighteen-wheelers rolling by with her third eye. Vic Constantine fueled up at the pumps, patting his black van like a trusty dog. Called the Millennium Falcon, neon protection sigils were lovingly traced on its dusty paint job. Only the glimmer of elemental energy, the usual spectral bric-a-brac, floated over the lot, but Red still sensed... something. Pulling out her cell phone and adjusting the snack bag, she pretended to look at the screen to not look like a total freak while feeling out the strange magic. She walked down the building's wraparound sidewalk toward the distant smoking area. White light radiated from under a picnic table, streaming between the bench legs to cast an ethereal glow on the truck stop's windows. It outshone the slot machines inside. An elderly couple walked into the truck stop, but neither seemed to notice anything amiss. Red bent to check out what the hell was glowing under there. Dry weeds nearly hid seven perfect triangles, formed by tiny white and pink quartz into sacred geometry. She wasn't properly schooled in witchcraft and had spent too much time stubbornly resisting her power, but she still recognized the common spell. It was to bring good luck. Nothing evil about it. Hey, miss, are you heading to L.A.? A polite young voice piped up behind her. Worry lined the teen's brown eyes. A spring green aura lingered over her clean jean jacket. Her cherry red hood covered a must ginger wig. It almost looked real in the dull outdoor lights. Sorry to bother you. You're traveling alone? Red tried to see the other woman's chakras with her spirit gaze, yet strangely didn't find a glimmer. If the girl could hide those from view, she wasn't a normie, but she looked harmless and human otherwise. I'm 18. I can do that. I just need a ride to L.A. to, um, see my cousin. She nodded firmly, as if it could cover the tremble in her voice. I'm not heading west. Red didn't like seeing the worry on the young woman's face. Her soft heart battled with her brain. She was already on a job getting Basil to a magical academy in Las Vegas. Her docket of innocence to save was full, but she couldn't help herself. What's your name? Ellie Blue. Red smiled, knowing a fake name when she heard it. She had one herself, but she had a feeling Ellie didn't have amnesia as an excuse. Well, Blue, I'm Red, seriously. I don't know if there's a bus station near here, but I'll chip in to get you a ticket. There isn't anything in this town besides a dry lake, Ellie shrugged, rubbing her arms. Thanks anyway, lady. Hey, I can still give you some cash. Red tried not to sound awkward, but having money to spare still felt new, considering how shady the supernatural bank that held her mysterious trust fund was, she felt better when she used the money to help people. I need a ride, not cash. Ellie shook her head, a solemn expression on her round-cheeked face. Thank you. I'll be fine. 
<laughs> Red didn't know what to think of that, but it wasn't her mystery to solve. She smiled, trying to keep the mom worry out of her tone. Be safe. I have luck on my side. Ellie grinned, readjusting her red hood to cover her wig, then walked away. Red looked at the Lux Bell under the picnic table, mumbling to herself, I bet you do. The Millennium Falcon rumbled to the curb. Vic glared at her from the driver's seat. Wanted Dead or Alive by Bon Jovi streamed from the speakers. He turned it off, then ruffled his hand through his shaggy black mullet. It's almost the witching hour. She hopped into the passenger side, placing the bag on the floor, and belted herself in. As they drove away, she glanced in her side mirror to check on Ellie one last time. The teen was talking with a group in yellow track suits, another woman and two lanky guys with their backs turned. Maybe she had found some college kids on a road trip. Hopefully her luck held. Basil poked his head between the two front seats, kneeling on a beanbag chair. His bright green jacket collar matched the nauseated tint to his usually sun-kissed skin. His British accent came out wan and weak. How long until we get there? Hey, lay down, buddy. Red-eyed the soulmancer. For a guy who vacationed in Bali, he didn't travel well. She wasn't the only one who had a job on this trip. He was the one who was supposed to convince the school to not just let him stay, but also accept her as a student. I got you ginger ale. Vic looked back at him. Still car sick? I'm rolling around this stoner van on a bean bag. What do you think? Basil hiccuffed before holding his mouth. God damn it. Vic pulled the falcon around the truck stop, out of view of the smoking area and busy front entrance. He parked and hit the console button to open the side door. Hurl out there. We still got at least 30 minutes on the road. Basil dashed out to lean on a dumpster. Red put her hands to her ears to block out the piteous retching. She said to Vic, You know he can't be seen. Any vampire would put the soulmancer in the ground on principle. I don't care if Cora scrubbed him from the Blood Alliance record. We're out of sight. Vic gripped the steering wheel, knuckles paling. Besides, the undead feds aren't our problem, and they're the only ones who know what really happened the night we faced the dog. Hilda Higby's followers were executed. Dead men tell tales. She sounded flip-pant to her own ears, but goosebumps surfaced on her skin. Countless vampires had been cursed with souls. Or said to feel the full range of human emotion and empathy by magic-slinging vigilantes. All because of one soulmancer in 1900 who taught the supernatural world how to do it. That wasn't something vampires forgot. The August harvest might as well have been yesterday for them. She felt cursed by amnesia, but some things were etched in her memory forever like the Genesis machine. Spectral smoke had wafted off its jagged metal as it sucked at her magic. She had survived the Dag's damned machine, but she couldn't forget it. A favor for Cora Moon, the supreme master vampire of Los Angeles, to get Basil to safety in Las Vegas was an easy one to accept. Red had lost enough in the City of Angels. They had saved every sold vampire in California from reverting to bloodthirsty monsters. But Quinn Burns had paid the ultimate price for their victory. He wasn't the only victim. Basil had been drained of his magic and nearly his life. She squared her shoulders, shoving the trauma aside because she was on the clock. It was simpler that way. He was strapped to the Genesis machine, casting forbidden soul magic in front of a legion of vampires just four days ago. Vic shot her an unimpressed glance. So were you, and I let you out of the van. No one wants to kill me for once. She wrapped her fist on the dashboard. Pretend I'm knocking on wood. The last few weeks had been heartbreaking, from Quinn's passing to her banishment from the Brotherhood. The only bright side was it had cleared out her enemy list, Sancha Constanza, Michelle de Gramont, Hilda Higby, and even Christoph Novak. The first three were dead, and she had leverage on the last. Was Christoph still her enemy? She couldn't help but feel grateful to the unsold vampire whenever she saw Vic's miraculously healed legs. The lie about an experimental treatment hadn't fooled Basil. 
judging by the skepticism on his face, but he had let it go. Fingers crossed everyone else would do the same. She touched the fang scar on her neck. Was she going to use Kristoff's dark gift against him? No, but it was a card up her sleeve if she needed it. Revealing the rare healing power of his blood would make him a target. Red pushed her thoughts away from the all-too-complicated Mr. Novak to the simple job at hand. Basil is the priority. So are biohazards. Vic snapped his head to the side so fast his mullet fanned out like an agitated, frilled lizard. You're not appreciating that I cleaned up and reorganized the supplies while you were sleeping off the last case. I won't be able to find anything for days, Red chuckled. Looking at the stacked utility boxes decorated with Tibetan prayer flags and LED lights along the wall behind the driver's seat. I put in new sun curtains, too. You didn't even notice. Vic huffed. I finally got the van back to how it used to be. I'm not going to let a fake Englishman mess it up. Red lifted her palms in surrender. She found it hard to argue with the desire for things to be back to normal. Or whatever normal was for demon hunters. Fine. I don't want to toss a beanbag because he ralphed in it either. I'm telling you just what I told that state trooper when I left Stan's pot farm in Colorado. The beanbags lock in old smells. She rested her elbow on the car door, letting him ramble on about his organization project. They didn't get much of a chance to talk about the fallout on his side from the insanity of the last few weeks. He lost his oldest friend. They technically still freelanced for Quinn Investigations, but neither could face going back into the office so soon. Her heart panged, thinking of her farewell to Lucas. He had broken up with her, but she couldn't stop herself from worrying about him. Caring for a grieving Delilah would be easy for him. Processing his own loss? Not so much. She had sent him a text that she had gone on a job, but wasn't surprised that he hadn't replied in the few hours since she'd left the city. He had taken up his grandsire's mantle and the responsibilities that came with it. Mouthwash, Basil muttered as he returned to paw through his suitcase in the back of the van for a tiny bottle. He gargled and spat onto the asphalt. The indignities never end. First, I nearly died in dirty sweatpants, and now I am cleaning myself up by the rubbish bin. The distant honk of a semi-truck mingled with a nearby high-pitched yelp of surprise. She straightened in her seat. A hint of magic stirred in the air. What was that? The travel center's shape had an irregular, built-upon design as if it had expanded from a humble gas station to include a restaurant and a gift shop as an afterthought. The unevenly spaced lights bred shadows. She didn't like it. Beyond the empty back lot, squat creosote bushes trembled in the wind, giving little cover to anything but scorpions in the flat desert. She motioned to Vic. Drive around the building. I think there's trouble. Basil closed the side door of the van quietly and hunkered down inside. There is enough trouble in here. You saw the girl that I was talking to, right? I think she made a luck charm. A shriek broke out over the din of the rest station before a distant youthful voice yelled, Get away from me! Vic killed the headlamps driving forward. Doesn't sound like that luck charm worked. Basil, get the door ready, she warned, as the Millennium Falcon nosed around the side of the building. The back of the gas station and attached sandwich shop met in an unlit corner, hidden from the passing travelers in the front. A trio in yellow tracksuits loomed over a smaller figure in a red hood. They raised their arms to keep Ellie Blue in the center of a tight square. The teen had found the wrong ride. A hyena-like chortle rose from the group as they teased their prey. Basil sighed. We're meters away and I can feel the dark juju from here. Do the hero thing. Red reached into the large hunter's kit between the front seats, for a heavy steel cylinder of modified pepper spray with powdered blessed silver, cold iron, and wolfsbane to give it a supernatural kick. Vic called it wear-mace, but it gave most things a second thought about attacking. It didn't necessarily kill, but it stung like a son of a bitch. We need to go to her now. Vic shook his head, gesturing to the scene. 
We need to know what we're dealing with from these tracksuit mofos. The creeps had the same square jaw, intense dark eyebrows, and thin lips. In their 20s or 30s, the family resemblance was strong even without the matching outfits. Red didn't detect magic from them, but their earthen-colored auras had a savage edge. The man on the left lunged in a faint. Black-bearded and bright-eyed, he had the lanky, long-limbed enthusiasm of a growing puppy. His Boston accent came out a chortle. Thought you wanted a ride? We're going to take you to a Ripa in L.A. Ellie whirled around, brandishing a shaking dagger at him. Get back! The little witch wants to fight, a bald man grunted from the other side. The words slurred together as if he had too many teeth in his mouth, but his dark tone echoed crystal clear. A white scar split his dark upper lip under a patchy mustache. The sole woman in the gang tossed her hair, bleached to a radioactive-looking white blonde. Her thick black brows matched her roots. She laughed sarcastically. You're wicked scary, kid. Put it away. We're not pussy vampires like you're used to. An older male in a black tracksuit jumped down from the one-story roof and landed in a crouch by the bullies. Shadows clung to his plain, craggy face. The other three bowed their heads as he stepped forward. His dark hair and nondescript olive skin tone could have allowed him to disappear into any crowd around the world. Only the dead-eyed stare and missing ear marked him as a man to watch. He gripped the zipper of his tracksuit and yanked it down to reveal his hairy, scarred chest. Lips moving, he didn't need to raise his voice to command attention from the rest. Red couldn't hear his words, but it didn't matter. She didn't like anything about this situation. Now. Vic gunned the engine, turning the Falcon on a dime and zooming toward the bunch. The van skidded to a stop. He flipped the headlamps on. The tracksuits recoiled, shielding their faces. Their eyes reflected silver in the bright light shifters. Red jumped out of the van and lifted the mace. She made sure the wind wasn't against her. Her arms trembled, but her tone was firm. Get in, Ellie. Ellie bolted forward, dodging the stinging liquid. She escaped into the van, slamming the side door behind her. Squeezing the nozzle, Red released the arching six-foot stream at the closest predator, the cackling female. The female shifter shrieked. As her face and neck blistered, she wiped at the mace with her jacket. She ran to an abandoned mop bucket and plunged her head into the dirty water. Her bleached hair soaked up the gray moisture. Sis! the bearded man howled, hairy fingers curled to slash. Red pivoted, spraying him in the face, grazing his cheek. Her muscles ran on autopilot, even as fear curdled in her veins. He fell to his knees two yards away, sobbing as the wear-mace ate at his skin. Tap dancing, baby Jesus, it burns! The bald one turned to snarl. Bad move, bitch. Palms sweating, Red agreed and pointed the wear-mace at him. Pissing off a family of supernaturals was never a good move. She hustled backwards to the Millennium Falcon. The flat-eyed leader inched closer, arms behind his back. He lifted his nose, sniffing, filling his lungs with her scent. His irises turned silver. He revealed his hands, transformed into large black wolf paws tipped with tapered claws shining like onyx. A partial shift. That was alpha-level skill. His whisper came out gravelly, words like tombstones grinding together. Two red-headed witches. Red climbed into the already moving van and barely had her leg inside before slamming the door. She usually had a witty parting shot, but not when facing a pack of werewolves. Go! Wolves! Cursing, Vic sped around a dumpster to the front of the building. Shifters could be peaceful. There were even some species that Vic and Red hadn't pissed off. Then there were werewolves, big, aggressive, and territorial. He had made his reputation hunting them. Even in human form, they were supernaturally tough with a better nose than a police dog. The Falcon lurched, cutting off an SUV in the parking lot on the way out of the truck stop. Red dug through the mix of supernatural defenses in the hunter's kit between the front seats. Damn it, it's all steaks and holy water in here. She glowered at the reorganized wall of supplies. Where was the wolfsbane? 
Her inheritance had bought them new toys like the costly Wormace, but they had been so focused on vampires lately. There wasn't even a sprig of wolfsbane in easy access. The long-running West Coast drought had made it rare for most hunters, and they hadn't found it for their last werewolf hunt in Oklahoma City, but she had finally tracked down an importer in L.A. You could kill a werewolf without wolfsbane, but they could walk off a lot of damage, even a silver bullet. A tinge of wistfulness entered Vic's voice. I haven't hunted a wolf in months. Rolling her eyes at him, Red belted herself in and twisted to face the newcomer. Are you okay? Ellie shifted to find her footing in the back of the van and plopped into the orange beanbag chair. I'm fine, just banged up. Thank you for saving me. That's what we do. Vic here is with the Brotherhood of Bards and Heroes. Red smirked at his mullet and denim jacket. It was an outfit that screamed hunter, not scholar of the supernatural. Even if he doesn't look like it. Don't get used to this sweet van, kiddo. Vic flapped his hand, hunched over the wheel like a disgruntled father on a family road trip. He pulled out his phone and typed out a quick text message. I'm dropping you off at the academy and letting the alchemist figure out the rest. I don't need another intern. Ellie wrapped her arms around her knees, shoulders slumping. I can't go back there. Not after what I did in the lab. You're enrolled there? Red fought her curiosity because the teen's educational path was the least of their concerns now. The guys had told her stories, but they had to have been exaggerating. An academy of alchemists hidden on the Vegas Strip. Really? Basil crossed his arms, capturing as much dignity as one could while perched in a tie-dyed beanbag chair. Little Red Riding Hood, why are werewolves attacking you? And what's up with the wig? Ellie pointed to the silver-streaked wig hanging off a strapped-down toolbox along the cramped van wall. I can ask you the same question, mister. Vic interrupted the sassy exchange, gaze locked on the dusty road leading back to the highway. Do your parents know that you're getting into knife fights at midnight? My parents are dead, Ellie snapped at him. Red put a hand to her chest, sympathy blooming. Ellie! Vic snarked into the rearview mirror. Welcome to the club. I'm the president. Since we risked our lives to save your ass, and you haven't even chipped in for gas, I think we deserve answers. Crunch. The van shuddered and lurched. Red flew forward. The seat belt dug into her ribs, forcing the air from her lungs. Her palms bashed the dashboard as she braced herself instinctively. An unlit jeep rode hard on their tail, close enough to see the driver's yellow track suit and bleached hair. It rammed the van again. Suddenly, Vivid white high beams flashed from the white jeep, blinding the mirrors. Vic gripped the wheel tighter. That's my trick. The Millennium Falcon jerked to the side, missing the highway ramp to careen onto an unpaved frontage road. Red clutched the roof handle, her teeth clanging together like pots in a clothes washer. Ellie shrieked, falling into a groaning basil. Red tried to tap into her inner well of power. It sputtered, trying to ignite. She tugged at her magic with the desperation of a carjacker hot-wiring an engine as the cops closed in. Where are you going, Vic? Fuck. They're still following, Vic muttered. His attention whipped between the car mirrors like a spectator at Wimbledon. Do a soul thing, Basil. Make them chill out. I'm a soulmancer, not an empath. I can't control their feelings. Red sighed at the arguing and tried to problem-solve by taking stock of their situation. She pawed through the pouches of the hunter's kit to see what they had for hand-to-hand -hand combat. That was their last resort. Wolves were faster and stronger, even in human form. Basil wasn't a fighter, and Ellie was spunky but spooked. That left her and Vic as the muscle, and he needed to drive. Gritting her teeth, she tried to estimate the growing distance between the vehicles. Ellie pointed to a holstered, snub-nosed revolver in the hunter's kit. You have guns! I see two! Shoot their tires! Vic growled. This isn't a movie, kid. I'm not a sharpshooter. Red shook her head. No use wasting a silver bullet now. Our best bet is outrunning them. Vic swerved to miss a giant tumbleweed in the road. Basil gagged, slumping against the wall. Bugger! 
Don't spew in the falcon, dude, Vic yelled over his shoulder. Do something magical, Red. I'm still recharging. I had my juice harvested by an unholy mixture of magic and machine this week, remember? She gripped the door to stay upright as his driving became more defensive. I couldn't float a feather. Ellie braced herself between the front seats. And I need stuff. Witch stuff. I can't just pull a spell out of my ass. It'd be cooler if you could, Vic drawled, then yanked the steering wheel right to turn onto a rougher road. Basil moaned from queasiness on his beanbag. They sped by a faded sign. Red only caught the word lake on the sign. You can't shake a tail in a country lane, Vic. There's nothing else out here but rocks, and the highway is the other way. Ye of little faith, this isn't my first trip to Vegas. A gun blasted behind them. Bullets pinged into the sand beside the moving van. Vic revved the engine and zigged off the road onto the wide expanse of a dry lake bed. The van sped over cracked earth toward distant mountains dark into shadows under the midnight sky. He balanced the wheel with one hand as he sent another text. Who are you, kid? Don't think I won't find out once we ditch these furry losers. Watch the road, Red said, glaring at him for texting during a car chase. She grabbed her armrest to steady herself in the rough ride. Why are they after you, Ellie? I don't know. Basil straightened, holding the side door for balance. His soulmancy magic radiated from his aura. Her real name is Hannah Elizabeth. She's been running since her parents died. The teen squeaked, neck disappearing in the rolls of the red hood as her shoulders tensed. No, that's... Red said, Some people call Basil a shaman. He can read your soul like a book. We're trying to help. Vic cursed as the van hit a jagged rock, wheels jouncing. And we're getting hunted for it! Who are they? I'm really Hannah, but I don't know them. But you think they were sent to finish what happened in Oklahoma City. What was it, Hannah? Basil crawled over the beanbag, sliding on the rollicking van floor to grab her hand. He closed his eyes. A sheen of sweat rolled down his face. He gagged and fell back. Her last name is Proctor. She is the last. Red shared a panicked glance at Vic. They knew that story. They had been the intrepid werewolf hunters in it but this was a plot twist. The Proctors had been massacred. Descended from the legendary Salem witches, the line was extinguished by the late and unlamented King of the Prairie Dead to stop a feud between werewolves and witches. They didn't just read about it in the papers, ghosts told her. She asked, You're related to Brian, right? Hannah nodded, lip trembling. My brother, how did you know? Long story, Red would save the fact that she had met his ghost and that she had been hired to hunt down his werewolf girlfriend for another night. Adding that she'd been double-crossed by the vampires who hired her only made it more complicated. I was there with Brianna Larson when she died. She loved your brother very much. She got him killed, Hannah said bitterly, expression hardening. The werewolves gained on the van. They fired another two shots, hitting the ground. Was it an attempt to blow out the tires? Red tried to keep the fear off her face, even as her throat tightened painfully. Vic zagged the van over the shifting sands to stop the wolves from getting a clear target. This can't be Brianna Larson's pack. The Cowboy King killed them too, made a pelt out of the Alpha. Good. Hannah opened the hunter's kit. No one is left from the feud, Red said, swatting the teen's hand away from the weapons. Someone is still pissed, Vic replied. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel. A vein pulsed visibly in his forehead. Okay, kiddo, they gave you a key to the academy, I'm sure. It should work on the back door. Take it out now. Red didn't like the conspiratorial nod that the bard and the runaway exchanged. Hannah pulled a golden casino chip on a leather thong out from her jacket. I got it. Focus hard on the academy. Vic pushed the straining engine until the van shook from the effort. He drove straight toward a dead cottonwood tree in the center of the dry lake bed. Imagine the sights, sounds, the smells. You have to want us there. Opening her spirit gaze, 
Red visualized pushing a thread of her weak magic to the teenager. It felt like offering a cup of water to a stream. She didn't know what the plan was, but she wanted to give the girl what energy she had. Hannah bowed her head and kept repeating, I'm at the academy. Seconds stretched by as the jeep rode their tail. The one-eared werewolf rose from the back seat. Bullets ripped through the back of the van, pinging against a metal utility chest and ricocheting into Red's duffel bag. Concentrate, kid. Vic, look out. Basil pointed at the fast-approaching cottonwood before diving under a beanbag chair. The tree looked dead to the mundane eye, but the silhouette of a drooping banyan tree shimmered like the Milky Way around the physical branches. Magic sigils ignited on the gray trunk. Swirling concentric circles of a green and purple vortex materialized in front of it. The Millennium Falcon hit a rock. The axle creaked as the wheels lifted. It soared into the widening portal that brightened to a supernova white, too. January 31st, early evening, a portal in the desert. The Millennium Falcon passed through the portal in a blaze of glory. Red closed her eyes, still blinded by the brilliance. She screamed. It couldn't penetrate the silence. G-force rippled across her cheeks, flipping open her eyelids. Outside the windshield, blue and purple thunderstorms raged like an interstellar monsoon. Time and space stretched as the van flew into galactic oblivion like its namesake. She reached into the back seat to check on the other guys, her arm elongated the atoms unable to stop the accelerating momentum. Reality snapped out of its unnatural extension, constricting like a dropped spring. The van landed with a hard, metal-creaking bounce. Her seatbelt caught her painfully before she hit the dashboard. Vic hit the brakes, teeth audibly mashing together. The falcon skidded toward a shelf of delicate beakers and bottles, stopping only inches away. The glass rattled as if shaking in relief. Red scrambled out, leaving the door open, blinking away the sparkles in her vision. She bent at the waist, holding her hips, releasing an anxious breath that she felt down to her toes. You could have given me a heads up on whatever the fuck just happened, Vic. Almost pissed yourself when I booked it for that tree, huh? He said, a shit-eating grin in his voice. She straightened and immediately stumbled back, blinking from the vibrant magic traces in the long chamber. Sigils glowed like neon graffiti from every surface, nearly obscuring what was underneath. Energy hovered like a beaded curtain. She adjusted her dazzled magical sight like a dimmer switch. The surreal scribbles faded, leaving behind the strange objects cramming the walls. Glass cases filled with mummified hands, silver goblets, and uncut crystals mingled with slot machines and old neon signs. Only shadowy arched passageways in the corners broke up the eclectic collection. Holy shit, where are we? Red asked in awe. Vic unbelted himself and rubbed his hands together. This is Sin City, baby. You'll learn magic and I'll gamble. Next, you're going to tell me the Academy has a buffet with all-you-can-eat shrimp. Basil staggered out of the van and tried to lean against the bumper. It fell with a clatter. He groaned green around the edges. Bloody hell, he tottered back inside. That was so cool. Hannah scooted by the sickly soulmancer to jump out the side door with an excited smile that made her honey-brown eyes twinkle. Her red wig sat askew on her head, showing natural brunette hair. Vic, how did you know a portal was there? Good question, Red murmured as she spun in a circle, trying to decipher the chaotic mix of magic in the climate-controlled air. She was awestruck already, and this was just the storage room. How did you? I know an alchemist who owes me one. Vic climbed out of the driver's side and walked around the van to inspect the damage. Let's hope he finds us first, and not the gendarme. Hannah ducked her head and leaned back against the van, mumbling to herself, Please don't let it be Trudy. Red asked, Who is Trudy? Constantine. 
A rich theatrical voice boomed in the chamber as an older Hispanic man emerged from a rune etched archway in a wake of purple sparks. His dark pompadour was so shiny that it reflected his electric blue suit. He pulled Vic into a hug, chuckling. What an entrance. Sorry about the skid marks. Vic drew back, sweeping his arm over the floor. I'd make a joke about underwear, but after that portal ride, it hits too close to home. You've brought back our runaway witch. I think the Academy will call it even. The stranger straightened his collar. Just in time, because my lounge set is starting soon. Red walked forward, hitching her thumb on her belt. I thought you said he was an alchemist. My man, Diego Blanco, is 100% alchemist in the top 20 here, if you want to be precise. But between us, he's a better singer. Vic said behind his hand with an exaggerated whisper and wink at a faux modest Diego. I have layers, thank you. Alchemists do more than secretive research passed from master to apprentice in smoky laboratories, Diego said with a joking smile. It's mostly that, but I still like to moonlight on the stage. Layers. I also book the guest lecturers and apparently welcome the riffraff. Vic clapped him on the shoulder. You're the hardest working alchemist in town. I'm glad you checked your phone so close to showtime. Diego crossed his arms. Thankfully, I could decipher your misspelled text messages. Aramaic is easier. So, who's the prospective student I have to convince the rest of the alchemical synod to accept? Red waved sheepishly. They had tossed around the idea of her taking a class or two here, but suddenly it felt too real. Her voice came out tiny. Hi. Vic jerked his thumb at the soul man, sir, emerging from the van. And we have this guy. Can you get Basil a job? He'd make a hell of a poker dealer. Diego lifted his brows. The jovial lounge singer demeanor grew dour. I see you picked up a new name and a new life after leaving your old friends. Do I call you Basil or Philip? Red mouthed the word yikes to Vic. She knew the soul mancer had lived more lives than a cat, but she hadn't thought about the people he'd left behind. Basil attempted a winning smile that looked more nauseous than anything else. Listen, I had to move on discreetly before I was exposed. You ran without word. There's a difference. You know that Neville went brokenhearted on a sabbatical in Prague, right? Diego tugged on his lapels, wrinkling the shiny material left me with a gap in my lecture schedule and down a research partner. Nev was always dramatic. We were barely dating. Basil flapped his hand, still looking pale and sweaty. He sat down in the open door of the van and flopped backwards onto a bean bag, hand over his face. Oh, bother. Now my life decides to belatedly flash before my eyes. I'll just be processing another near-death experience over here. As usual, I will be the bigger man. I'll see if I can help him get a place in the academy. For you, Constantine, and no other reason. Vic wiped his brow, shifting to block Basil from view. I appreciate it. Diego turned to the teen, hands behind his back. Disappointment deepened the lines around his mouth. The room grew silent and heavy, like they were all going to be sent to the principal's office. And we have to find a place for the last proctor, even with all the trouble you caused. The school sent out a search party. Hannah bowed her head, pulling off the wig and twisting it in her hands. I'm sorry. Red put a hand on the kid's shoulder to remind Hannah that she wasn't alone. Hormones and trauma could make anyone panic. If you were my apprentice, Diego said then let the unspoken implication sink in the air. Report to your bard. The baritone order invited no commentary. That never stopped Red. Does that mean Hannah is... She gawked at the girl. The Brotherhood of Bards and Heroes was an ancient society of scholars who mentored supernatural champions for the good side. Hence the hero part of the name. There was a whole division of psychics in the organization who sought rare fey hybrids, demigods or seers marked for destiny. You're a hero? Sniffling like she wanted to burst into tears, Hannah fled from the room through an archway in a cackle of green energy. Red winced. What did I say? I didn't mean to make her cry. 
Diego pinched the bridge of his nose. That girl, she blows up a laboratory accidentally and flees just when the immortal alchemist is in residence. The entire synod has been on duty putting out metaphorical fires. We didn't need a literal one. Vic shifted around, looking at archways in each wall. Ah, so the boss is in from headquarters. No one will know we're here. We'll throw a tarp over the van, or you can tell me where the portal to the parking lot is. A stately woman in a white linen dress materialized amid violet sparkles at the eastern archway. Her presence demanded attention. Power radiated from the thin cords of silver, copper, platinum, and gold hanging around her pale neck. A dark mane brought out her regal features. Esoteric black arm and chest tattoos glittered with energy as she glided toward them. Diego bowed. Madame, you grace us with your presence. Good evening, Diego. Who are your guests? The bullet hole in the vehicle tells me that it hasn't been an easy journey to our haven. Her accent sounded as if she had learned English as a second language in the United Kingdom but the only clue to her origin was the faint trace of a dropped H. Interest flowered on the mysterious woman's ethereally smooth features as she stepped closer. Her coal-lined eyes were a startling lilac. Vic crossed his arms. It was fine until the werewolves attacked. Diego elbowed him, eyes wide as he jerked his head toward the newcomer. I have the honor of introducing the immortal alchemist. Paranel Flamel? Red nearly choked on her tongue in nerdy excitement. She had heard of the Philosopher's Stone and Nicholas Flamel. Few beyond the supernatural world knew of his wife, however. You're the Perinelli Flamel? The founder of all the Alchemy Academies? Oh my god! Dial it back, Vic muttered to her. There were other hands in this undertaking, the immortal alchemist demurred. Even if I am the only one that remains... Red couldn't stop her enthusiasm for this pioneer of the arcane arts. It's so cool to meet you, Madame Flamel. Wow. Likewise, my dear. And please call me Paranel. She reached out for a handshake. Gems glittered on each long finger. What do you call yourself? Red. She shook the offered hand, sheepish embarrassment cascading over her from her entire lack of chill. Paranel radiated sincere kindness from her phoenix-colored aura. The Academy of Alchemists provides sanctuary to mages of any discipline or coven. You will be safe here, Red. Thank you. Especially since we dropped in rather suddenly. Diego gestured to Vic. She is accompanied by a bard and friend to alchemists, Victor Park Constantine. What's up, my lady? Vic bowed, doffing his cap. Another bard mentoring a witch, Diego? Perinel pursed her lips thoughtfully. The Brotherhood has increased recruitment for their heroes among mages, I see. Pardon? Red rubbed her ear. Had all the hearing damage finally caught up to her? She definitely wasn't a hero in the eyes of the Brotherhood. They wouldn't even let her take the hunter's challenge before they pushed her out. She resisted the urge to stare at her shoes like a child. Um, no, we're just traveling together. I'm a hunter, unlicensed, kind of like an intern. Nobody, really. I very much doubt that, Red. I am curious to learn more about you. And your compatriots, the immortal said. She stepped closer to the van. I sense a soulmancer. It has been too long since this academy has seen a talent like yourself. Basil popped up from his hiding place in the beanbag nest. He massaged his temple. I could be your new headliner, after some sleep and a good English breakfast. Diego folded his arms. I'll put you in the chorus line and see how you work out. Madam, I know you've been busy with attending the latest school ranking exams. Thank you for welcoming my guests. As you can see, I need to find them rooms. Then I will formally request the Synod to assess Red's abilities tomorrow. You can continue your evening knowing that the Academy is secure. In fact, Hannah Proctor should be in her room, thanks to our bard and his apprentice here. Ah, yes, she had the good fortune to find them. Carry on with your arrangements. I'll make myself more useful and assess Red in my office with her bard present. Perinelle didn't wait for an answer before strutting toward the archway she came from. 
Now, if you please. Red and Vic looked at each other. He motioned forward. Which is first? She stepped into the archway. Purple lightning crackled in her wake. Her body stretched, tension popping from her joints as the chaotic light swirled around her. Unknown energy seemed to slip between the very fabric of her being like water through a sieve. The laws of gravity snapped back into place on the next step. The vertebrae floated in her neck as if she had just visited a great chiropractor. Her foot landed heavy as she regained her balance. The electrical storm of the portal door gave way to a white parlor with overstuffed lavender chairs and spindly brass bookshelves. Natural light shone over a desk under the wide window. The view wasn't of the Las Vegas Strip, judging by the distant red roofs and leafy green trees shining in the sun. The immortal went to open an ornately carved chest by the wall. You may take a seat. There should be a pinch of tea in the cups already. I imagine that this all must be strange to you, Red. Even as a hunter, I do promise that I will answer your questions after the assessment. Red and Vic settled into a plush cushion in the circle of cozy chairs around a copper tea service on a round table. Steam shot out of the teapot's spout. She studied the emerald green ceramic handle and matching tray. How did it do that? He leaned forward in his chair, elbows on his knees. I'm not officially her bard, Madame Flamel, but I'm not dropping her off here either. She needs a touch of schooling, not enough to spoil her. Then we must be moving on. Lifting an eyebrow at his parent at a teacher conference tone, Red was strangely comforted. She knew it was the paranoia talking, but he had a lot of reasons to bail and find an intern with less baggage. He loved the full use of his legs, just not how he got it. I will merely submit my observations, but I'm sure that the Synod will be flexible on the curriculum. The Las Vegas Academy is less orthodox than other campuses. Now where is that? Leaning over, Perinelle stuck her head surprisingly deep in the chest. Her entire arm sunk into it to the shoulder. She lifted out a large wicker basket and set it at her feet, then flapped a hospitable hand at them. Drink, drink. Red picked up the teapot and poured into a ceramic cup. The hot water hit the loose-leaf tea and released curls of Earl Grey-scented steam. It darkened to the right color instantly. She sipped it to find it the perfect temperature, wondering how the alchemists had figured out speed steeping. Was this a charm embedded in the tea set or some other enchantment? New questions emerged as the immortal alchemist retrieved a black feather from the chest with a triumphant huff. She continued to gather random items like a magpie, a mirror, a stick of chewing gum, a seashell, some wooden musical instrument, and a gold nugget. She placed each item into the basket with equal care before finally tucking a rubber duck in it. Rising with the strange collection, her quick steps to the desk under the window made her skirt hem flutter. Huh, Vic said, chin doubling mouth flapping open as if straining for a smart-ass remark. His eyes narrowed, brain wheels visibly spinning underneath his mullet. Red didn't like it when he was confused. He was the one who had double majored in computer science and demonology. She didn't even know if she had finished high school. So, I've never been assessed before. When does the rubber duck come into play? Later, Paranel said cheerfully before arranging the objects on a desktop. She returned with a crow feather and laid it on the table, then sat across from them. Can you read the symbol on the feather, or at least describe it to me? Red opened her third eye to the unmarked feather. A glimmering dot encased in a circle appeared on it, as if she had switched on a photography filter. It's the alchemy sign for gold. You know our symbols? I learned some so I could better understand old demonology texts and hunter's journals. Red shrugged, embarrassment heating up her neck. This wasn't something to brag about. It was like telling Shakespeare that you knew how to write your name. Vic and I have to do research in a rush sometimes. You're correct. Paranel rested her chin on her knuckles, shifting forward in her chair. How did you learn to harness your spirit gaze? It came to me in a dream. Red said. That was the short version. 
The long version included the infamous Bell Witch, a vengeful warlock, and a coma. Beyond learning the trick to see magic, she hadn't gotten much out of the experience besides a chip on her shoulder about being a witch. She glossed over the details to say, Gotta admit, I don't know much about witchcraft. I tried not to for a while. Tell me about yourself. Does magic run in your family, or was it awakened by other means? How old are you? Have you gone through your witch bloom? Perinelle paused, lips twisted into a rueful smile. Pardon my barrage of questions. That last one was quite personal. This isn't an inquisition. Red had asked herself these questions more than once. The witch bloom was a new concept, but she couldn't focus on it as a familiar sadness fell over her. She had seen soulmancers and psychics, and even recklessly let a vampire try to mesmerize her to remember. Nothing shook the truth loose. The Blood Alliance's version of the CIA hadn't found anything on her either. The question mark in her memories felt like a sting. You're a busy woman. I can save you some time. If you have a question about my life before last year, I can't answer it. Even my age. Not because she's stubborn, either. Has amnesia. Soap opera style. Vic poured himself some tea and blew on it, crossing his leg. I found her by the side of the road like this. It's not just her backstory. She has like a ten-year pop culture dead zone in her memory banks. Hadn't even seen the Avengers before I came along. A geeky cinephile's pity haunted his gaze. Er, yeah, I'm still catching up on movies and magic. I figured the witch stuff out when some vamp was taking a bite out of me in Utah. Managed to spook the both of us. Red breathed out slowly, wishing the hot flush to her cheeks away, trying to figure out the best way to say it. I'm not much of a witch. I wasted a lot of time fighting this gift, in fact. You talked about mages of any discipline being welcome. That's the thing. I don't know what kind of mage I am. I learned some tricks from being a hunter, but that's it. I'm still thrashed from my last job, but even on a regular day, I couldn't light a candle. Then it's fortunate that I am asking you to levitate this feather instead, Perinelle commented brightly. I will not put a stipulation on how you do it. Red tried a cleansing deep breath, but it came out ragged. Her nerves had been pumped with adrenaline and then wrung out. Magic required focus, and her brain might as well have been bouncing around in her skull. Rolling her shoulders and cracking her knuckles, she concentrated on the task. Time to shine, Red. Don't blow it. Some mages traced sigils in the air or set up a grand ritual while others called on the power of old gods and spirits. Red magically poked at the air and wheedled it into doing her a favor. Which it might, if it felt like it. She turned her third eye on the ball of energy behind her belly button, tapping the strength chakra at her solar plexus to drum up some juice. Remembering an old grimoire, she tried to visualize it as a sunny yellow sphere encircling a fiery triangle ringed by petals, the dark blue of pregnant storm clouds. Her chakras blazed like road flares from her crown to her waist, then immediately dimmed. Fuck. Forging ahead, she touched her energy, coaxing it to her. It stretched like taffy as she drew it back. A wild thrill coursed through her. The connection between herself and the universe deepened. Her strands of magic felt weak, but the energy pulsed with life. Magic was simple. Want something and make it happen. She pushed what little she had into her intention, visualizing her desired result. Sweat beaded on her brow avoiding the judgmental eyes of the rubber duck on the desk she tried to channel her power to will the bustling air molecules float the damn feather nothing red lifted her hand up like she was leading a slow dog to a throne stick sometimes movement helped harnessing an element meant infusing herself in awareness of it then igniting her will with magic right now it felt like slapping two wet flints together and expecting a spark she collected as much energy as she could toss at the air. Her hair fluttered around her face. The feather stayed put. You're looking paler than usual. Vic pushed a teacup at her. Maybe you need a snack or something. Red leaned back in her chair, wiping her forehead. Fatigue made her muscles droop. Her cheeks burned like the fresh onset of a fever. 
magic took a toll on its user without the help of relics and other objects. I tried a thingy with the air, but I gotta have more juice to make it work. You sent a guy crashing through a window once, he pointed out cheerfully. Once! Then for the next month I couldn't do anything magical without it being scared out of me at the point of death. Air works with me maybe 10-15% of the time if I'm being honest. Perinelle twisted a ring on her pinky finger as she pondered. Elemental magic was your first instinct, unconventional. I can see by your chakras that you are depleted. Energy regulation is a challenge for you. Red covered up her torso with her hands as she psychically curtained her multicolored chakras. Saw those, huh? You conceal yourself well when you will it, I see. Perinelle frowned as if puzzled by a riddle. She rose from her chair and walked to the brass-plated desk. You are certainly a natural witch. Let us continue before I get ahead of myself and share more of my observations. The rubber duck stared from the green ink blotter as Red approached. I would like you to select an object. Perinelle waved her hand over the random assemblage. Clear your mind and pick up the one that calls out to you. There is no wrong choice. Red closed her eyes, imagining herself vacuuming the extra thoughts out of her brain. The pressing question of what was up with the duck was the hardest to tug loose. She took a few slow, deep breaths, then opened her eyes. Sunlight sparkled on a golden nugget and the long-handled mirror. A seashell and silver-wrapped stick of chewing gum lay opposite on the desk. The yellow duck judged her, lying next to a small harp-like instrument. She watched Perinella put it in the basket, but hadn't quite made out what the wooden thing had been. It was a lyre. She peered closer at the antique, examining the strings and curved teak body. Her eyes darted to the duck. She reached down, holding her breath for a second, wondering if she should change her mind. She touched the lyre. I choose this. Fascinating choice, Perinelle murmured. Vic looked over her shoulder. Not the ducky. This is just like my tattoo. Red chuckled before she noticed the realization on Perinelle's face. You're looking at me like I picked something weird. This is a sorting hat or Myers-Briggs kind of a thing, right? A personality test? Not as such, but it has given me much to think about. You have potential that I would like to see cultivated. I will recommend that the Alchemical Synod permits you to learn with us. What do you hope to achieve with our knowledge? I want to explore who I am, all of me, and magic is a part of that. My job is fighting monsters, but I can't do that if I'm fighting myself. So many people told me what I was, and I almost believed them. Red fidgeted and twisted the ends of her black shirt. The frank honesty left her lightheaded. She didn't like admitting that she had amnesia to strangers, let alone the existential crisis that dogged her even before she found out about her checkered past life as Jennifer St. James. I don't know who I am exactly, but I'm not afraid of it. I am keen to see where this journey leads you. The immortal scrutiny focused like a scientist refocusing a microscope. She smiled, relaxing the intense stare. I don't need to be a seer to know that there is a comfortable bed in your future. Once you have rested, we can speak further about your education. Perinelle turned, walking to the white door. She revealed a stone hallway lit with torches. Follow the gold symbols to the lobby. You'll be taken care of there. Sounds good to me, Vic said as he strode out. Hasta mañana. Thank you. It's been an honor, Madame Flamel. I mean, Perinelle. Red stepped into the hallway. Curiosity made her pause, and she glanced to the window that certainly wasn't showing Vegas. Where is that view? Prague, the first city of alchemists. Welcome to the newest. The immortal smile contained centuries of mystery and wonder. As the door closed by itself, she walked away to the tea service and picked up a cup to peer inside. It was the one that Red had used. The door disappeared without a trace. Red stepped closer to touch the space. The beige stone was a wallpaper pattern. Even the flaming torches were just blown glass. It was all a facade. An empty housekeeping cart rested at the end of the line of numbered hotel rooms in the hall. Where are we now? I told you, the floor plan is always changing here. Hard to tell where the school and the casino begins or ends. 
Vic rubbed his chin, taking in the scene. I don't see anything gold. Let me rev up my witch of vision The walls were etched with sigils against theft and fire, but one symbol stood out with its glimmering golden script. She walked down the hall until she found another. This is like following Lassie. Do you have the scent, girl? Shove it. And yes, I do. She took them right at a fork in the hall. The rush of surviving a wolf fight and crashing a magic portal ebbed away, leaving worries behind like shells on a beach. What do you think classes are going to be like, Vic? I mean, I want to learn, but you saw me back there. I got two out of three right, and that's just because one was multiple choice. I was freaked when I went to London to study with the bards, too, he said consolingly. You feel like a bumpkin, and like everyone is ahead of you. Then they tell you to your face. You're only friends with the weird IT guys and the crusty old dudes. Every class is a battle. You know you're just going to make them eat it. He slammed his fist into his palm. A fervent determination entered his increasingly loud words. All the judgment. Make them eat it. I'll keep that in mind. She lifted her eyebrows at his outburst. I'm hoping there isn't that much judging. Your friend seemed cool, and Paranel is surprisingly approachable for an immortal. What if I don't have the potential that she sees? Hey, you got this. He lightly punched her shoulder. I'll be here every step of the way, sometimes at the poker table, maybe a boxing match, but always there emotionally. Her sarcastic reply died in her mouth as the hallway opened into a massive circular atrium. She figured that the casino had to have a gimmick. All of Vegas did, but she wouldn't have guessed this. Electronic signs advertised Diego Blanco, the spellbinding singer in the Nostradamus lounge with a silent video of him in a white suit crooning into a microphone. The screen transitioned to a cauldron full of shrimp and the directions to the buffet it changed to purple letters, supernatural happenings at the Circe Casino. Are you serious? Take it in, Red. You have to admire their magical balls. At the busy front desk, clerks checked in guests under a magnificent dragon-shaped chandelier. A bellhop in a robe and purple turban pushed a suitcase trolley past tourists in shorts and flip-flops on their way to gamble. The lights flashed blue, causing the crowd to still. Heads tilted up at the high ceiling decked out in an LED display of an ethereal eddying cosmos. Vic chuckled and checked his watch. Right on time. The alchemists are keeping up the old traditions. They stopped doing the pirate show at Treasure Island, you know? Recorded thunder boomed over the sound system. A stilted masculine voice rose over the dean from speakers hidden in potted palms. Stop, fiend! A sneering man, hunched in tattered back robes, skittered to the center of the atrium. He juggled three shiny goblets as the crowd circled him. I've stolen the chalice of Anne Boleyn. She could make any man do her bidding with one sip. I came for just one, but then I saw another flashy trinket and then another. Well, you know how a five-finger discount goes, people. The theatrical hunchback waited for the easy laughter of drunk tourists as he tucked the props back in his robes. As the chuckles died down, the hero in the pop-up production emerged from the growing crowd. In a fantastically embroidered purple suit, he was handsome in a long-faced Shakespearean way, like one of those British actors who are always in period pieces. He seemed more scared of the spectators than his supposed foe. Red bet he was hired for his good looks. He struck a heroic pose. You'll rue your jokes! The opposing thespian pantomimed his diabolical glee, a mic taped to his cheek broadcasting his scene-chewing. That mage thinks he is a paladin, but nothing can keep a bad warlock down. The good mage raised an elaborately carved wand, tip glowing like an overgrown laser pointer. Ego to Nico! The overhead LED screen flashed a confusing, meaningless jumble of mystic symbols in time with the fake thunder. Falling over, the hunchback twitched on the marble. Smoke and sparks rose from his body. The atrium returned to its fluorescent glow. At the applause, the actor jumped up and bowed with a flourish. Fancy the fantastic? Crave the arcane? Want a show with your dinner? Join us at the Clash of Wizards tonight. 
The tourists eagerly accepted coupons from the two men before wandering to their next misadventure. Red glared at the scene. Her delayed annoyance broke through the spell of the spectacle. Did that just happen, Vic? Welcome to the Circe Casino. This is where the real magic happens. When you said that they had the Academy hidden in a casino, I thought you meant it was hidden. Doesn't this violate the Dark Veil somehow? I almost get turned into a vampire for barely breaking the big old code of secrecy, and they have a neon sign that literally promises the freaking supernatural. Everything is part of the act in Vegas. You saw the wizard duel. They get them used to weird shit at the door. This isn't a vampire town, buddy. Different rules. He strode forward to the reception desk, inlaid with a mosaic depicting the zodiac signs. A clerk chirped a peppy greeting from behind her computer monitor. Golden alchemy symbols decorated the breast pocket of her suit. How much did the cute young woman know about her employers? Vic leaned on the desk. The room might not have hit your records yet, but our agent should have arranged rooms under Red or Vic Constantine. He smiled and winked at the clerk. She's not my wife, by the way, like a little sister. Red rolled her eyes at his attempts at charm. He had already proclaimed that he was back in the dating game on the ride here, repeatedly. The clerk replied in a neutral, professional tone. Well, you might need to tell your travel agent that because I just have a single room with a king-sized bed under your name, Mr. Constantine. Red shot him an annoyed look. You're taking the floor. Hannah strolled up to the desk. Her earlier tears had disappeared. She seemed to be in a better mood, but one never knew with teens. Don't worry about a room, Red. You're staying in another part of the, um, hotel. Red held up a finger to the clerk. Just a sec. Vic will be right back for that room key. She led her group away from the desk for a quick huddle. The Synod got back with a decision quickly. I mean, I think they did. I'm still not exactly sure what a Synod is, but I assume it's a fancy council of guys in pointed hats. The teen shrugged. I'm just the messenger. I got no idea how those committee geezers work. He grinned. Usually, I'm the cynical one, but I knew they'd let you in. You're going to wow them with everything I taught you. Really make them eat it. You got the thumbs up from Paranel. How could they say no? You talked to the immortal alchemist? Oh, did she mention me? Or the explosion? Hannah winced, chewing on her lip. She shook her head, rubbing her arms, lips falling into a sulking pout. Never mind. Maybe I don't want to know. Vic chimed in. She didn't seem phased, kid. Red smiled at the forlorn teen. So, I'm going to be staying in the academy? You're going to have to show me my room. Genuine excitement flashed across Hannah's face. Of course, you're bunking with me. Three, well, oh, January 31st, evening, the Las Vegas Strip, Circe Casino. Hannah led Red through a disoriented maze of neon machines, card tables, and roulette wheels in the Circe Casino. Sigils against fraud and violence graced the ceiling but no manipulative energy hovered over the games. The alchemist didn't need magic to take tourist money. Gambling was its own spell. Cocktail waitresses in black pointed hats darted across the aisles to sling high balls to the slot jockeys. Tapestries of phoenixes and griffins hung on the faux stone walls between potted palms. Visitors queued up for selfies with bosomy wax mannequins in a tawdry historical exhibition on the Salem witch trials. The decor blended medieval times and Arabian nights sprinkled with nearly every mystical pop culture reference from the last century, all served up with cheeky camp. They heard the Nostradamus lounge before it came into view. The open entrance framed packed tables surrounding a stage. Diego Blanco sang an old Sinatra song beside a white piano like a classic Vegas showman. Red stopped to admire the alchemist's pipes. His rendition of I'm gonna live till I die was spellbinding as advertised. He wasn't using witchcraft to boost his performance. The enthusiastic clapping started at his final note. Outside the lounge, she lifted her hands to join in until she noticed the good mage from the pop-up show. Leaning against the open bar door, he cocked his head at them. Dark hair, streaked by the sun, draped over his lace collar. 
His gorgeous mane framed a strong jawline and handsome features. He smiled, walking to them in the purple suit that seemed like it had escaped a flamboyant steampunk tailor. Hannah waved. Giggles escaped her pressed lips as she checked him out. Hey, Ezra, nice outfit. Did you fight the ghost of Prince for it? I love Prince, so I take that as a compliment. Ezra chuckled, laugh lines at the corners of his deep-set hazel eyes. He adjusted his tightly fitted jacket. Raoul called out sick. I'm doing him a favor. Luckily, I did bad enough that they aren't going to make me do the Clash of Wizards tonight. I guess I missed my shot at show business. I'm better at mixing drinks anyway. Hannah groused, you won't make me a drink. In three years, ask again. Who is your friend? She's another witch. This is Red. She has a bard, too, the girl announced the piece of trivia with a delighted air as if they shared a birthday. I travel with a bard, to clarify. I'm a hunter, just here to sharpen up some skills. Nice to meet you, Ezra. Red held out her hand to shake his. If you're the bartender, you'll meet Vic soon enough. Vic is the best, Hannah squeaked. He is so cool, like car chase in the desert cool. His van is full of guns and Mountain Dew. Ezra did a double take at Red. How many guns does your friend have? Red lied. Not that many. Vic has a lot. Hannah stilled her fangirling to flick an unimpressed glance at Ezra. No offense, but he's totally cooler than Trudy. I won't tell my mom you said so. She's already mad enough at you. He crossed his arms, a gentle scold entering his tone. It's how she worries. We were all looking for you. I checked out the pinball place before my shift. I even went to Fremont Street, worried that a vamp had found you. Hannah bowed her head. I'm sorry, I made something explode and I didn't know what to do, so I ran before I could cause more trouble for everyone. I left a note. You're new. You don't know how it is yet. After five years of working in this casino, I can promise you that all the students blow something up once. The good ones do it a couple of times. Ezra touched her arm and leaned down to meet her eyes. He had a kind mouth, as if he served up sympathy at his bar counter as much as beer. I know my mom is scary, but you can talk to me next time. Hannah nodded, shoulders still slumped, but a light broke through the gloom on her face. Okay, I better go before she texts to see if I'm messing around. See you some other time for a virgin cocktail. She turned away with a wave. Nice to meet you, Ezra. Red followed, looking back. He smiled at her. She couldn't help but match it as she glanced away. After letting distance grow between them and the lounge, she asked Hannah, He's the son of your bard. How did you even get connected with them? Trudy found me after I skipped out of Oklahoma City and said I had a destiny. She brought me here to be trained. I think it's just to lay low because of all the attacks. The furred foursome wasn't the first. Hannah mumbled the explanation like it was a boring tale from high school instead of a hero's origin story. Come on, I gotta make my bedtime. I'd take you on a tour, but you probably want to get settled. Well, I'm tired. I need my bag, though. Taken care of, I bet. They like to do things like that. Magical hospitality, you know. Hannah took them to a tiny donut shop tucked into a corner of the casino where the smell of fresh cream-filled delights won the battle against secondhand smoke. Ducking down a small hall, she leaned against a full-length mirror and took Red's hand. You gotta act natural for this, and don't let go. It was the only warning before she stepped into the mirror. Red held back her unease to follow. The mirror slipped over her skin like plastic flaps into a walk-in freezer. Her body stretched then snapped into place as she passed through. On her next step, she found herself in a rounded brown stone hallway. Electric lights shone onto red sigils painted on the wooden floor. A spiral brass staircase twinkled at the end of the hall. The energy felt layered with decades of magical residue building up like soap in an old shower. Hannah asked, You can feel it, right? You might get lost in the academy, but you'll always know you're in it. This is the way to our dorm. Once you get your key, that mirror will take you right here. Not every door is that reliable. 
They walked to the giant staircase, an ornate rail guarded wide steps that could handle a dozen people walking abreast. It spiraled up through the open shaft of a tower. The softly glowing brass reflected the blown glass light fixtures to cast its own warm light on the windows and artwork on the stone walls. Red craned her neck and squinted. Suspended walkways bisected the stairs at each floor above them. You live here? Hannah yelped, knocking into her. A giant raven strutted past on skinny legs, feathers shaking, as if late to its next appointment. Red let the bird pass, smiling at it with the crazy hope that it would speak. That's real, right? Wait until you step in its shit. This might as well be a coop, Hannah said, pointing at the black crows perched on the brass railing as she walked up the steps. Sometimes the staircase turns into an escalator, and I haven't figured out how. We're less than novices, so we're at the top with the birds. Don't expect anyone to be too buddy-buddy with you. No one was with me. I'm just here to learn. Red shook off the creeping first day of school jitters. She only had TV shows for comparison. Somehow, she didn't think that old reruns of Saved by the Bell had prepared her for this student body. Hannah huffed about the climb and how annoying it was that they couldn't just put in an elevator, but Red didn't mind. She couldn't stop staring at everything. The steely gaze of Elizabeth E.A. stared back at her from a portrait with a gray-bearded man in a neck ruff holding a golden astrolabe, likely the famed alchemist John D. Other portraits hung between the stained glass windows. Even squinting, she couldn't decipher all the images in the shadows. The bright nightlife of Vegas didn't stream through the windows. Where were they exactly? The tower was mysterious to her mundane vision and downright arcane to her spirit gaze. In her experience. Magic was hard won. It took effort and set up. Most witches had only one or two big tricks even after a lifetime of practice. She had seen power out on the road, but the alchemists brought a modern convenience to the mystical that she had never considered. Lingering at the landing of the fifth floor, Red tapped a glowing sigil on the rail leading to the hall on the south side. It's not a button to turn on the escalator, Hannah said, with the force of a woman who had already tried it. At least, not for us. In the end, the stairs didn't do them any favors, and they trekked up the full ten floors to a door on the north hall of the tower. Hannah revealed a sitting room filled with lumpy, mismatched plaid furniture and a table in the little kitchenette. Two sets of French doors faced each other on either side of the suite with a bathroom in the middle. She walked to the door on the right and opened it. This is yours. See, there's even a duffel bag on the bed. It's mine. Red examined the cubbyhole of the room. It had only enough space to walk around the double bed. The wardrobe was a brass rod with bare hangers suspended in the corner. She had slept in smaller spaces, like the van. At least in here, she wouldn't have to smell Vic's feet. She unzipped her duffel bag, frowning at the bullet mark in it. Riffling through her clothes, she pulled up a shirt, looking at Hannah through a hole. I'm definitely going to need to shop tomorrow. I have some pajamas you can borrow. Hannah went to her room, returning with an oversized University of Oklahoma shirt and old cotton shorts. You said something between all the gunfire. You said you knew my brother, Brian, and his girlfriend, Brianna. I wouldn't go that far. Red took the pajamas and set them on the bed to stall as she gathered her thoughts. This wouldn't be a simple story. She had played both sides of a conflict that she should have avoided from the jump. I came through town on a job with Vic. We thought it was a regular bounty on a killer werewolf. High risk, but high pay. We'd done it before. She bit back a sigh. This wasn't a thing that you rattled off like a grocery list. It's not a pretty. Hannah sat at the end of the bed, her legs shaking with nervous tension. I still need to hear it. Just rip the band-aid off. I already know the worst of the story. It all went sideways when we found out who hired us and why. Red paused to find the best and least traumatic way to tell the story. That Oklahoma City job was a rough stretch for her. But she didn't lose anything. 
She couldn't imagine what it must have been like for Hannah, who had lost everything. It didn't seem like the teen had adjusted well to the school and made friends to fill the gap either. Brianna was avenging your family and her pack. She died trying to take down the Vampire King at the Bricktown Canal. You're talking about that mass shooting last year? It was the vampires who did that and then covered it up. Brianna just exploded. Red cringed remembering huddling in an ice cream parlor during the blast, making it to shelter just before the shrapnel hit the air. The werewolf had wrapped herself in a makeshift bomb and blessed silver scraps. She almost got cowboy Kurt then, but I finished the job later. Hannah wiped at her wet face, staring at the tears on her fingers. The hatred in her eyes emphasized the baby fat in her cheeks. Good. I'm sorry that we couldn't have done more. I don't even know how you survived. I saw the ghosts at the Proctor house. They showed me... Red trailed off, not knowing how to say it. You saw my family? Tragic hope infused the words. When we were hunting Brianna, we followed her into your old house. What was left, that is. She was there with Brian. Well, his spirit. Hannah put a hand to her mouth to cut off an errant sob. Your brother seemed nice. He was trying to talk us down and stop the fight. Red ducked her head, not sure how to stop the story now that she'd started. She described being locked in the ruins of the ballroom with multiplying ghosts before the specter of John Proctor appeared, as if straight from old Salem. The pilgrim patriarch had been the strongest spirit of them all. Her voice trembled on the next part. He showed me. Her throat tightened. He had shown her how they died. Let's just say it changed how I saw the situation. He wasn't chatty, but he got a point across. Tossed some cryptic riddles on top of the visions, too. Were they for me? Hannah asked, as if the guidance from her ancestors would appear in flashing lights like everything else on the strip. I mean, in hindsight, do you think? Red recognized that fervent need. She looked in the mirror every day, wondering where she came from, trying to find her mother's face in hers, so one day she might spot her mom in a crowd. What would mom have to say if they actually met again? That question kept her up at night. Hannah must have the same problem. Red didn't have any wisdom for her. She lost her mother in the way that one loses a set of keys, with the expectation that they will be found. The younger woman had lost her mom for real. I don't know. He said it wouldn't just be his clan wiped off the map, but he couldn't say why. Like a cold wind, the old memory slotted into place. You survived hidden in the branches of the juniper tree. Red rubbed her forearms to ease her chill. He told me about my mother. It's all I actually know about her. Hannah looked away, brushing away the tears on the apples of her cheeks. Her lungs rattled as she hugged herself, breathing deep. What? Were you adopted by the Brotherhood or something? Is that how you have a bard? Red hunched her shoulders, sensing the teen's desire to turn the conversation, and gave in to confessing the short version of her life story. What about you? My mom was so amazing that even a cruddy kid like me knew it. Then you had my aunts and all the cousins. I couldn't even keep track of how many people were hanging around the house. You don't even know your mom. That's awful. Please don't spread that around. Red had shared more than she usually did. It wasn't everything that John Proctor had told her, but still. She never talked about her mother with anyone but Vic and Lucas. Enough about me. You've gone through so much to survive. Hannah huffed out a bitter laugh. Hardly. I did a luck spell so I could sneak to a friend's house without being caught. Then, when I came back, I found everyone. She bowed her head, sniffling loudly. Her slender back shook. She stood abruptly. Without facing Red, she pointed a shaking finger at an open white-tiled bathroom off the sitting area. Um, you can get ready for bed and use the shower first? Sure. Red didn't need to be a soul mancer to sense that Hannah wasn't just being a good host, but needed her space. It was a lot to learn that the vampire that killed your family was dead. That had to be a shock for one day, even without a wolf attack. If you need to talk, 
I know. Hannah shut herself in her room, hiding her tear-streaked face. Red put her hands on her heart and tried to center herself. The lingering call of her flight, or fight response, answered her. It had been that kind of night. A dreamless sleep was all she wanted. She didn't fear flashbacks of her death-defying race through the desert. That was a pleasant romp compared to the last few weeks. If she prayed, she would pray for no dreams of Quinn's sacrifice, the Brotherhood's rejection, or what she had left behind in L.A. She grabbed her toiletries bag and the borrowed pajamas, then went into the bathroom. Undressing in front of the mirror, she felt older than the 24 years she guessed that she was. She let her red hair down from her ponytail and shook her head, covering her face. Tired green eyes peeked through the wavy lengths. Pushing her hair back, she rubbed her desert-dried face and promised to moisturize extra this week. Hunters and bards had created libraries with their field journals and dissertations, but none mentioned how hard monster hunting was on the skin. This year had aged her, and it was only February. Red trod into the clawfoot tub and pulled the curtain around it. She let herself indulge in the apple-scented body wash before numbed exhaustion drew her from the shower. Before dressing, she craned her neck to check out her tattoo in the mirror. The thick black lines came together into an elegant lyre like the one she had chosen in Perinella's quarters. She didn't think about it much, yet it was pretty. Vic thought it was hand-poked, but the craftsmanship looked experienced to her. The steamed mirror reflected a small glimmer on the tattoo like a light on a deep fog. She blinked and rubbed her skin, checking the mirror again. The shine had disappeared. She yawned, wondering if she had even seen anything. Magic floated in the academy like dust motes. Wrapping a towel around her head, she stepped out of the bathroom and glanced at her doormate's room. Neither the closed door nor the cawing crows could muffle the sound of crying. Red wanted to knock, but she knew how much she enjoyed being interrupted in the middle of an ugly cry by a stranger. Flipping the light switch off in the parlor, she went into her room. She cracked the door open in case Hannah decided to take her up on that offer to talk. Morning came in a blink. Red jumped out of bed with an excited knot of energy bouncing in her belly. That was the power of a change of scenery. In Los Angeles, she had felt heavy from memory. In Las Vegas, she was at a magic school. She had read every Harry Potter book, and now she was at Hogwarts. It was enough to lighten even her jaded and weary heart. What if ravens made her coffee? She tottered out of bed and dressed in the only intact pair of jeans and black shirt in her bag. Hauling around her hunter's kit might send a negative message to her hosts, so she grabbed a big floppy purse for her stuff. She crept out of her room with the intent of finding coffee and not disturbing her doormate. Hannah sat at the table, hunched over her phone, one knee fidgeting in her skinny jeans. Oh, hey, you're up. Got your key already. I'm supposed to show you around. It's Trudy's version of community service. The real service would be finding me coffee. Ugh, hate the stuff, but I know where to get it. Hannah went to the door and opened it. We should be early enough to snatch breakfast, but hopefully late enough that the bird keepers have cleaned up. What's a spooky magical school without crows? Red asked, walking out onto the walkway, hanging in the open tower. The birds fluttered and flapped from their perches on the rafters. She put her hands on her hips. It's ambiance. Misty sigils and energy appeared as if superimposed on the real world. Red tried to adjust her spirit gaze so she could take in the spell work without being dazzled by the sight. Sunlight glowed through stained glass windows, painting the air and stone walls with rainbows. On the brass spiral staircase, a man in brown robes chatted with a woman sporting a pink ponytail and lime green platform sneakers. The climb was awful, but the view from the top fulfilled her castle fantasies. A stinky wet plop hit Red's shoulder, moistening her sleeve. Ew! Hannah hooted with laughter. Isn't being pooped on by a bird supposed to be good luck? Ten minutes and one borrowed shirt later, they began their climb down. An elderly woman with a top hat and stately cane joined them in the commute on the wide staircase. 
More people emerged from the halls, trotting over the suspended walkways to the mass migration down the stairs. A gray-bearded mage passed them in a Hawaiian shirt, chanting into a cell phone. And that is the first verse to awaken a portal seedling, Neville. Don't be afraid to put some oomph behind it, Red asked. Isn't it weird that they have electric lights and phones? I was imagining more flaming torches and dusty scrolls. Alchemists are practical, Hannah shrugged. They use what works. You can get your stereotypical kicks in a pile of scrolls in the library. There is cell phone coverage everywhere. Well, I think so. I still haven't explored the whole academy. I've gotten lost so many times. I got stuck in a painting for a bit before my bard came along. Still not sure how I got in there, but it must have been a booby trap. Two alchemists faced off in the center of the wide stairs, papers scattered around them. Their raised voices stilled the commuters, bewitching them with the mundane promise of a fight. That was my manuscript, an offended alchemist huffed. Wind stirred in the tower, flapping at hemlines and hats. The papers reassembled in his arms, lifted by invisible hands. Merlin's nutsack, it's all out of order now. I said I was sorry, the other alchemist flinched, retracting into his black woolen robes like a scared turtle. If I don't make rank? Sweater vest guy tugged on the other alchemist's collar, as if to make good on a threat before he made it. A flash flared between the men, and they flew apart, papers scattering again and startling the crows. Red lifted her eyebrows. The sanctuary spell didn't surprise her. She'd seen a similar one in L.A. It was the furious alchemist's venom over a simple accident. Why did he go postal over that? Hannah nudged her away. It's exam time, and it's making them crazy. They rank the adepts, so everyone is fixated on their number. Thank goodness the anti-violence spell keeps them from doing something stupid. Red eyed the crowd who looked ready to bet on the arguing men. We definitely have a pecking order here, then. Don't worry about your rank. We're more like exchange students. I don't think that booby trap was actually for me, either. These guys are just serious about protecting their research. This place was built for secrets. You have no idea. And weirdly enough, pop quizzes. There's this one door that forces you to answer trivia questions to unlock it. It gets really mad when you use your phone. Hannah stuck out her tongue and made a face. The stairs creaked and suddenly the steps started to move like an escalator. Sigils all up and down the rail shimmered. Finally, the senior adepts know a trick to activate it. Don't bother asking because they won't tell you. They figured it out the hard way, and so should we, as far as they're concerned. Are they all going to class? Most alchemy adepts study with a master, either solo or with a few others in a lab. They do a lot of seminars that we can sit in on, but mostly Trudy is guiding me. It's going to be nice to have another person to study with. Some of these students look pretty old, but some are closer to your age. Can't you study with them? Red gestured to a quartet ahead of them, taking a group selfie. They've been studying together for years. It's hard to break into a clique around here. Or maybe it just is for me. You've already talked to the immortal alchemist, so you're doing fine. High school wasn't easy, but I thought a witch college would be easier. Hannah frowned, shoulders slumping. We're not going to have to worry about jocks in the cafeteria, right? Red asked, as they followed the growing herd from the stairs through an echoing concourse. Hannah laughed. Nope. In this school, the nerds rule. Perinel found them walking by a suit of armor. In a flowing empire-waisted velvet dress with her black hair loose over her tattooed shoulders, she had the sorceress aesthetic down. Good day, witches. I'm afraid I must delay your breakfast. The Alchemical Synod wants a word about your tribulations. I admit to being curious to learn more myself. Hannah looked like she had accidentally swallowed a bug. Hiya, Perinel, Red cheerfully said. If they were going to get questioned, they might as well get it over with. Sure, lead the way. Perinel directed them to a side hallway, away from the commuting students. She tapped the threshold of a door. Glowing gold sigils appeared along the side. 
We're just rerouting this for a bit. Mustn't make them wait. They step through the door into a long room. The high benches along the narrow far wall contained 20 robed alchemists. Black drooping hoods obscured their faces. They loomed above the four people already waiting like supplicants. Two muscle-bound men in tank tops and gym shorts sat together in front of the synod on low stools. Werewolves, if red were to guess. Both had a wild ripple to their auras. Sitting a yard away, an olive-toned man, a vampire by the look of his unnaturally white teeth and still chest, checked his watch. Annoyance hung on his heavy brow. A pale Asian girl in overalls played with her phone. She looked like any other college student except for the fox ears twitching on the top of her head. Impressed, Red raised her eyebrows at the kitsune. They were rare outside of Japan and Hawaii. Perinel motioned them to a glowing glass orb on the podium between the Synod and the assembled supernaturals. She retreated to a spot in the shadows by the door. Red walked forward, feeling Hannah's eyes on her. Was this how Vic felt all those times they had been dragged into trouble? Like he had to tamp down his own worry for her sake? Her tension eased when Diego Blanco, sitting amid the synod, lifted his cowl and winked at her. The alchemist in the center of the first bench lowered his hood to reveal flowing gray dreadlocks and a wrinkled, dark-skinned face. A piercing gaze beamed above his hooked nose. As the first alchemist, I call two witches forward to give testimony. Hannah whispered to Red, That's Darius Jefferson. He ordered, Rest your hands on the orb. Red obeyed alongside Hannah. The glass stuck to her skin like ice. A floating illusion of the four werewolves in their tracksuits appeared in the air. Gravitas flowed from Darius Jefferson as he addressed the room. Do you know these four? Our men are already scrying for the assailants. We ask our allies to keep their eyes open, too. The Kitsune swiped away from her phone game app to take a picture. These four aren't with us. I'll pass this around the underworld squats and make even the ones without eyes look at it. Our thanks to the Supernatural Union of Las Vegas. The vampire sighed, shifting on the wobbly low stool to follow the Kitsune's lead and take a picture with his cracked iPhone. Couldn't this perp alert have been sent in a text message? Or this meeting done at night when I'm less likely to burn in the sun on my way here? We didn't want to drag the Supreme's representative away from his nightly duties on Fremont Street, the first alchemist said blandly, yet a mischievous twinkle lingered in his dark eyes. Give O'Sullivan my regards. The older werewolf studied the images sadly before he asked, Are you sure about the species? Red didn't wait for the first alchemist to answer. Their eyes reflected silver. Wolfsbane burnt them like acid, and we got a soulmancer to verify that they had the call of the wild in them. Then their leader did a partial shift. Hannah hovered her hand in front of her chest, mouth twisting. He was super furry and scarred, like something was wrong with his chest. Really gross. Not a dilf at all. Red blushed. The kid didn't know not to talk to fancy supernatural judges like they were your girlfriends. This must be how Vic felt too often during her internship. She predicted and I told you so when she told him the story. She asked the werewolves, do they remind you of anyone? They had Boston accents. The beefy gym wolves shared a long glance before crossing their arms nearly in unison. Again, the elder spoke for the two. Who are you again? The first alchemist coughed. No matter. Answer the question, Alpha Gonzalez? No, but my pack will be on guard. We keep the desert's peace and value the truce with the academy. He turned his nervous gaze on the synod. This group is not affiliated with us. We don't attack humans, especially not their young. Red said, I can help track these rogue wolves. The first alchemist flicked his hand, dismissing the two women. The academy needs its students to study. Mind your lessons, and maybe one day you can join the gendarme as an investigator. That will be all. Hannah skittered away from the orb podium toward the door. Red followed, trying to be sedate and calm, even as the vampire inspected her neck from afar. He raised his eyebrow in consideration, not hunger. 
She covered her scars, certain he was wondering which of his kind had claimed her. The scar was enough to give a hungry demon pause, even without hearing Kristoff's notorious name. A vampire's claim was something most supernaturals respected. She had left Los Angeles to get away from undead drama. Intriguing another wasn't on her to-do list. On the way out, Red stopped by Paranel at the door and dropped her voice as the synod meeting continued behind her. I can help. Wait until an order is given. Trust is earned in the academy. Disappointed, Red left with a whispered farewell. The idea of sitting on the sidelines while others investigated felt like an itch she couldn't scratch. The alchemists had welcomed her, but she doubted she would get brownie points for meddling on the first day. She rubbed her shoulder, trying to loosen up the nodding tension. The synod meeting had felt too much like a tribunal. She reminded herself that she wasn't in trouble as she hurried to join the rush of students in the hall. Hannah and Red sidestepped a growing huddle, peeking into an open chamber. The plaque above the large doors read, Ranking Court, in golden letters. A little man in a Lakers jacket waved a flip notebook at passers-by. I'm calling it now. The good doctor has defended his rank, so get your future wagers in. The battle for a synod seat is next. Place your bets on if you think Finch will finally make Blanco sing his swan song. Red slowed to stare inside the ranking court. It hummed from the whispers of spectators on either side of a long chamber, nearly double a football field. Hannah groaned, speed walking away. Ugh, I don't even know if I want breakfast now. That was crazy. Red trotted to catch up. Crazy is easier on a full stomach. I guess you're right, Hannah said. The crowd dispersed as the mouth of the corridor opened. Red mused out loud. You said the synod ran the school. It looked like they ran the town. It's why Trudy brought me here. There is nowhere safer for a witch to be, Hannah said, checking her phone, then added as if an afterthought. Welcome to Pyramid Hall. Red sea head at the site. It's beautiful. Aptly named, the massive chamber's ceiling stretched into a high point obscured by mist. A giant banyan tree grew in a center park. Lavender and apricot-colored clouds churned above it like an eternal sunrise. The verdant canopy rose over the gargantuan space, shading wide sections. Aerial roots dropped from the thick branches to rest between ferns and forget-me-nots. People reclined on a blanket of grass ringing the massive tree. On a mirrored pond in the corner of the green space, black swans floated through the reflection of the impressive clouds. The banyan was an oasis in the bustle of alchemists striding with purpose over the marble floors of the giant pyramid. Some made a beeline to a wooden platform of arched doorways, where guards in black bowler hats collected poker chip keys to points unknown. Others stopped at the many kiosks arranged in Titi Rose hawking paranormal trinkets and ingredients. Alchemists loitered on the scattered benches and at cafe stands. A riot of smells from honey-baked ham to earthy roots tussled for supremacy. In a nearby corner, a line of chattering people served themselves at a buffet. Red was expecting a great medieval longhouse with grand fireplaces and owls, not a magical mall. Wow! Let's get you that coffee. Hannah navigated to the buffet between tables filled with studying adepts bent over scrolls and books. One young man looked between a clay tablet and an electronic one. Red had joked about the place having a buffet, but hadn't known she was right. The buffet was better than the average, with a diverse selection of international cuisine, but the food all looked normal, even if the pancakes seemed unusually round. The only strange addition was a soda fountain that spewed out carbonated elixirs instead of Diet Coke. <laughs> Hannah dropped a muffin on her plate, fluttering her fingers over the streusel on top. Confused, Red asked, Are you blessing that pastry? You don't bless yours? No, but you're making me think it's a thing. Sorry, I figured you knew. It's folk magic, something my mom taught me. She even had a muffin song. Witches can mix the mystical into the mundane. Boil magic down and it's all about attracting or repelling. I didn't do grand magic, but it's a signal to the universe that I'm open for goodness. 
Muffiny goodness, Hannah smiled. Exactly. You teach me about hunter stuff, and I'll show you my witchy ways. I have a thing that I do with my face creams. Deal, Red said. After settling at a square table, she dug into her small meal. Her stomach nodded from nerves, but she forced herself to eat. Hannah poked at her food, hands fluttering like disturbed pigeons, as she set down her cutlery and fidgeted with her napkin. I know why I'm nervous. It's my first day here. Red let the implied question settle in the air. She didn't want to pry, but her heart went out to the kid. Hannah had gone from a big manor full of family to being a friendless orphan living in the attic with the birds. Red was luckier, in a way. She didn't know what she was missing, even if a part of her still missed it anyway. Eh, uh, it's not bad here. I just used to be good at this stuff, you know, compared to my cousins, at least. I keep messing up now. Hannah paled and sighed over her juice glass, then nodded to the right. It's Trudy. Oh, God, she was so steamed at me last night. A middle-aged brunette marched to their table like a general in a tweed skirt suit. Adepts dodged out of her way. Her hair was pulled tightly back from her thin, tanned face. The ponytail seemed to hold her wild, natural curls through sheer will. Behind wide tortoiseshell frames, her piercing, deep-set eyes were fixed on Hannah. This was not a woman who looked like a Trudy. Red took another fortifying sip of coffee. Posture perfect, the woman stopped at their table. She pulled a small flip notebook and pen from the front pocket of her satchel and jotted down a quick observation. Miss Proctor, you should have already finished the tour and breakfast by now. Hannah gestured with a mocking sweep of her arm. And this is my bard, Trudy Fox. Trudy, this is our new friend, Red. If you had been doing as I requested, she would already be aware of me. You have a strict agenda to catch up on your studies. Trudy tucked her notebook back into her pocket. Red put her hands together in a timeout motion. It's my bad. I woke up later than expected. She hustled me out as fast as she could. You've already rescued her once. You don't need to do it again. Trudy pulled a printed sheet from the satchel and handed it to her. Especially since she has put you behind schedule as well. This is your syllabus with a reading list. You will be expected to study these texts in the library before your first magic lesson next week. Red took the sheet and looked over the list. The books had titled like Cunningham's Cunning Charms, A Dissertation of Elementary Magic, and The Prophecies of Goody O'Grady, The Witch No One Listened To, unless these had Cliff's Notes. She was going to have to read around the clock. Maybe she didn't have time to hunt werewolves after all. Humming, Vic sauntered over and sat at the table, silverware shaking on his tray. Still in clothes from the day before, the bags under his eyes hinted at a long night. Hey, gang. Kid, how are you feeling after that wolf fight? He belatedly looked up at Trudy. Am I interrupting something? This is Hannah's bard, and she was just giving me a reading list, Red said. The words pointedly, telepathically, telling him to not embarrass her. Unfortunately, telepathy wasn't one of her talents. Vic raised an eyebrow before studying Trudy through skeptical eyes. Shouldn't y'all be hunting down that werewolf pack? What's the strategy on that? Read until they get bored? Trudy crossed her arms, staring down at him. The strategy is to keep Hannah safe and inside the academy. The gendarmes have taken the matter of the werewolves firmly into their hands. And who are you? Vic Park Constantine, bard at large. It's a pleasure, no doubt. And you're Trudy Fox. I made some calls before I hit the tables last night. I thought the synod was setting something up for Red. They deferred to my expertise in mentoring magic-using heroes, but I am open to suggestion, Trudy said the words with a precise calm, but a challenge bubbled under the surface. Let me check out that reading list. Taking the sheet, he huffed, rolling his eyes before he got halfway down the page. Red grabbed the list out of his hand and put it in her purse. Be nice, Vic, Trudy said. Be honest. I prefer it. He lifted his hand, shaking the palm. Eh, 
Not sure about Turner's Compendium of Witchcraft. The newest edition is 50 years old. It's a classic. Trudy tightened her fingers on her satchel strap, face locked in polite interest. What other volume would you suggest, Mr. Constantine? I'd least put Jerome Chaka's Encyclopedia of American Witchcraft on here. That's what she's going to see on the streets. She doesn't need to know what Welsh wizards were doing back in the day. Chaka does have a modern take. I'm curious to see how you've taught it. I'm sure she will be eager to demonstrate. Trudy pivoted to face red. In what region of North America do hedge witches imbue intention into knotted strings? I know this one. Red raised her hand, pulling it down sheepishly when she realized the silly school kid instinct. Appalachia. Good. You probably haven't encountered it much out west, Trudy said. Chaka documented interesting American interpretations of astrology and its effect on spells. Right now, Uranus is transiting through Taurus. What modifications should you make to a protection circle to compensate for the current astrology? Um... Thinking back to the last time she'd tried one of those circles, Red hadn't even thought to look up what was transiting the heavens. I don't know. Trudy didn't miss a beat. What's another name for Needle U? It's used in exorcisms and purifications. Red drew a blank, face heating. Got me beat on that one, too. It's the folk name for any evergreen coniferous tree in the plant order Penales. I would have accepted cedar or juniper. Red took a deep breath at the name. She had gone almost a day without thinking about her past life doppelganger. That was exactly the kind of thing she was hoping to leave back in L.A. Her breakfast settled like a rock in her gut, as embarrassment ate at her. She failed this pop quiz. Trudy retrieved her pen and notebook again. She flipped it open one-handed. The plastic cover landed with a soft snick. We'll have much to cover, Vic snorted. My intern doesn't need all that trivia. She has field experience. You'll see that she learns quick. Intern? Is that what you're calling her? I made inquiries myself, but I couldn't find out why she failed the hunter's challenge. Trudy didn't look up from her swift notations. I assume it was due to the written. Probably didn't have a chance. Red kept her chin up while a blush climbed down her neck. The truth was worse. The Brotherhood hadn't even let her take the challenge. Hannah sunk deeper into her chair. Mortification pinked her cheeks. Classes haven't started. Give her a break. Trudy ignored her charge. Red has potential according to the immortal alchemist. Let's see what she could be with proper instruction. Vic sneered and spat out the words like a bad taste. I know where your instruction got your last hero. Red didn't know what he meant by that, but judging by how Hannah gasped and Trudy stiffened, he had drawn first blood in this intellectual duel of bards. The din from nearby alchemists studying for their exams seeped into the jagged silence at their table. A cawing crow flew over the buffet to the overstuffed carts in the market on the other side of the pyramid-shaped atrium. Red wished she could fly away with it. Four. February 1st morning. The Alchemy Academy, Pyramid Hall. Trudy paused her pen, the sudden grimace melting from her face and leaving a frozen glare of disdain. She turned, dropping her hand to her side, clenched fingers bending the notebook. Hannah, you'll show Red to the library later. Let us begin your first lesson. Sorry, guys. Hannah picked up her tray and chased after her bard. Red pushed away her plate, grateful that she had eaten before the morning had stolen her appetite completely. This was her first day, and she already felt like she was in detention. She had made the worst possible impression on her teacher thanks to Vic. That was awkward as hell. Was that some kind of bard pissing contest? She took it up a notch with that dig about the hunter's challenge. He shoveled up a mouthful of pancakes. So, you gonna tell me more about who you pissed off? Because all I know is I'm taking her class, and I'm probably going to fail it now. According to my guy, she's the, he raised his fingers in air quotes, best of the Brotherhood, or at least she was. Started off as a hero before she became a bard to train them. She retired after her last charge died. 
That makes your parting shot to her really shitty. Vic dropped his eyes. I know, but geez, what was that pop quiz? She doesn't have the accent, but she has that same imperial elite attitude they all had in London. Acting like we're trash because we don't know what the fuck you berries are. He pushed his plate aside on the tray. You've done more than her champion. Hannah's young. Give her time. Plus, I'd rather not be marked by destiny. I have enough stress. She can be the chosen one. She's chosen for something. Those wolves weren't just roughing her up for shits and giggles, even if she didn't know why. Basil says she's been running since her parents died. That's why they're holed up here. Trudy's a witch. She could train Hannah anywhere. This was far from the first attack. The presence of mystical protection wards comforted Red like a thundershirt on a nervous dachshund. The first alchemist had declined her help. She doubted he would take Vicks. He didn't need to. The academy was fortified like nothing she had ever seen. She had been to sanctuaries with anti-violence spells, but the expense at the installation and maintenance, priced per square foot by savvy mages, made it a luxury to most. The alchemists had the money and the manpower to cover a whole casino complex. Either way, I'm rooming with Hannah, so I'll end up babysitting her. We'll get more details soon enough. Not that the alchemists will let us do anything with the hunt. Tough shit on that. I already did some footwork to find the wolves, but the guys at the local hunter's bar haven't seen anyone matching their description. So they're not locals anyway. The closest pack is pretty domesticated. Vic slurped his coffee, shaking his head as if disappointed. Runs a CrossFit gym in Henderson. That explains why you didn't go to bed. I get the feeling from the glitter stuck to your shirt that you found a strip club somewhere in the timeline. Red shook her head, smiling wryly. Anything else? The alchemists keep the peace. I gotta give them that. Those hunters were bored and happy to hear there might be feral wolf trouble. The only excitement they've had in a while was a few ghouls last month. He swayed in his chair, eyelids slipping down. She didn't need him dozing at the buffet. Okay, mister, you need to go to bed. We're in Vegas. Vic stood, pumping his arms in the air with a weak cheer. He winced at the sound of his own voice. I'll help you get there if you show me a way out of here. After picking up their trays, she kicked at his foot. Don't fall asleep at the table in a carb coma. He pouted like a puppy woken from a nap. But Vegas? It's the first day. Red chuckled, leaving the trays at a rubbish station. She followed his sleepy mosey out of the buffet and through the milling alchemists in the expansive atrium. They passed by a cart filled with handmade leather journals and old spell books. Her feet stopped involuntarily, and she had to touch the covers. Life on the road meant she had to read on her phone or listen to audiobooks, but there was something about the feel of a real page. Red reached for her purse and justified her future spree by telling herself she was almost done with her current hunter's journal. She ignored Vic's shifting impatience to speak up to the seller. Excuse me, do you take regular money, or do I need to answer your riddles three? Cash or a credit card works like abracadabra around here, lady. No checks. The middle-aged bookseller smiled. He pointed to a wall of archways on a platform, each labeled with different alchemy symbols. You'll find an ATM in the casino that way. Red picked out a green journal. After a quick back and forth with the merchant about vegan leather that had Vic rolling his eyes and tapping his feet. She clutched her new prize when she left the kiosk for the portal platform. After a dour official in a bowler hat checked Vic's silver poker chip key and her own golden one, they walked through the archway labeled with the alchemical symbol for gold. Spectral glitter showered over them as they stepped into a quiet corner of the hotel by a nursing mother's room. The chaotic cacophony of the casino filtered in. The entryway behind them was disguised as a linen's closet. She said, I hope you remember where to go. Grunting, Vic pointed ahead and walked with the determined hunch of a man hunting for sleep. They wandered through the maze of the Circe Casino. He stopped in front of the Nostradamus Lounge. Okay, this looks familiar. I can take it from here. Are you sure? 
Nodding, he peeped into the bar. Good. Diego and Basil are in there. One of them can take you back, if you can't find those doors again. Get some sleep. Red watched him leave, trying to dial back her worry. Seeing him walk still felt like a miracle. They had talked about how it happened, but they hadn't talked about how it felt for him. He had been sidelined in a wheelchair, dealt with depression, and had only come out of it in the last few weeks, with some perspective on his handicap. Now he was walking. That had to be a mindfuck. And he no longer had Quinn, the Batman to his Robin, then add the allure of a werewolf hunt. If there was something they talked about less than their disagreements over the newest Star Wars movies, it was what had happened to his biological family. He didn't need to talk about it for her to notice the emotional scars. She'd have to keep an eye on her friend. There was too much trouble that he could find in a city like this. Red walked through the open threshold of the Nostradamus Lounge. Empty tables were ready with rolled silverware while the closed curtains of the stage waited for prime time. Last night, it had been dark, smoky, and with a clapping audience. In the morning, it felt incomplete, like a drag queen without her fake eyelashes. The casino floor was already hustling, but there were only three in the lounge. Ezra washed cups at the end of the horseshoe-shaped counter. A black apron replaced the wizard costume from the night before. Gold symbols decorated the pocket of his purple-collared shirt. His dark hair was slicked back in a low ponytail. He flashed her a worried smile. Diego rose from the center stool, glaring at the soul mancer beside him. Basil clutched his Bloody Mary, twisting to face his friend. The lime green fur coat and oversized sunglasses perched on his head like a tiara gave him the aura of a grand dame of the theater hiding from the paparazzi. He slapped on the faux English charm thick. Fancy a drink? We're mates. Be reasonable. We can talk this out. Diego slung a satin jacket over his shoulders. A wild lock of hair escaped the shiny gelled hold of his pompadour. I was friends with Philip. I don't know who you are now. Red pivoted to linger at the end of the bar. She looked away from the brewing scene, sharing a universal glance of, oh, geez, this is awkward with Ezra. Maybe her friend earned the scolding. Maybe he didn't, either way. She knew that he wouldn't want her to intervene. Basil insisted, I'm the same person, Diego. Then you're the same person that screwed me over. Come now. Yes, I ended things badly with Neville. We were all working together on that project when you left. I nearly lost my place on the Synod in the ranking that year. Diego's voice rose, but he jerked his volume down with the force of a whip. The quiet tone cut as much as if he'd yelled. I thought you were dead. You could have said goodbye. It's not like I didn't know your condition, but I didn't get a word. I'm sorry. I don't trust you to stick around, not even for something important. Want to stay here? Show me things will be different. Diego whisked past Red out of the Nostradamus lounge. Basil slumped his elbows against the counter, tipping his sunglasses down to hide his eyes. He stirred his Bloody Mary, his mouth straining to fall into his usual counterfeit British stiff upper lip. Red climbed onto a stool next to him at the bar. They were stellar examples of how to make friends and influence people. She decided against commenting on his coat, a hand-me-down from Cora Moon, since he'd already endured enough reminders of the past. Your day's starting off well, too, I see. It wasn't the best night, either. You were there for it. His sigh rattled his sunglasses. I was stress-eating discount shrimp at 3 a.m. And here you are, up and dressed for a fancy liquid brunch. I'm impressed. It's called self-care, and I earned it. You're welcome all and sundry for my many contributions to the common good and my near-mortal sacrifice for humanity. He addressed the empty bar, arms wide and drink raised. Not that anyone acknowledges it, Ezra called from the far sink. Is this where I say thank you or just ask Red if she wants to order? Basil harumphed. She flipped a quick thumbs up. I'm good for now, better than my friend here. You know it. Basil said into his drink. What's the story with Diego? A boyfriend? 
He's straighter than he seems, but I need to drink more before I can tell you that saga of friendship soured. Basil pursed his lips, flapping his hand like a southern matron going through the womanly change in July. He tilted his head at her and let his sunglasses slip down his nose. Red, you little minx, are you a singleton as eager to mingle as Vic? You added color to your wardrobe? She looked down at the green V-neck top. The teenager was her height and build, but it was a shade too small for her. I borrowed it from my new roommate. A run-in with a crow took out my last shirt. Oh, that girl. Basil sipped his drink. The dark lenses might have hidden his eyes, but his expressive lips slackened in apathy. Diego regaled me with her tale of woe before we started fighting again. Is she driving you bonkers yet? It's not her. I just had a run-in with her bard. He peppered her retelling with eye rolls and comments like, You know we're going to find Vic drinking and cry-singing Auld Lang Syne wrong for Quinn because he thinks it's Irish? Venting helped to take the edge off her worry, but she still wanted a Bloody Mary by the end of it. So I managed to piss off a teacher before I even started studying. You have the immortal alchemist's attention, at least. Grease some wheels on my behalf. Have her stop Diego from tormenting me. A first-name basis with Perinel doesn't mean I get special favors. It was heated when I walked in. What caused the blow-up? He offered me a job. Basil rubbed his forehead, cheek twitching. He's making me teach a guest lecture and inviting the whole school. That's fantastic. You can hide in the academy now. Safe as houses. Magical houses. No, it's not. I thought I could help in a laboratory or do research and, well, hide. Not announce that I am a... He glanced at Ezra, nervous as a rat smelling a terrier. Even inside mystical wards in a loud supernatural casino, he couldn't say the word soulmancer. He's doing this to get under my skin. I never told anyone here besides him and Neville what I am. Now he wants me to tell everyone. You're freaking, huh? I know I can give them a show. You've seen my shaman act, but this is different. This is about what I can really do, and it must be excellent because I haven't quite gotten the job yet, per se. It's like an audition. Diego will be watching to decide if I can stay on or jog on. Hell, even if I do well, you saw the fellow. He's likely to tell me to get stuffed even if I received a standing ovation. Maybe I can help. I need at least one teacher on my side. I know just the way you can suck up. Red didn't like the wild, desperate cast to his thin face. She might have freed him from captivity by vampire terrorists, yet he still had a pinched, underfed look. He was her pal, so she would do whatever he asked, but she had a sinking feeling she wouldn't enjoy it. What do I have to do? I need to make this lecture not just entertaining, but informative. These alchemists aren't easy to please. This is the closest to hard science that magic gets, and soulmancy sounds like New Age gobbledygook at its most intelligible. I need to hook them in the beginning. That is where you, my beautiful assistant, come into the picture. I'm not wearing a showgirl costume while you saw me in half. She quipped, but her lungs tightened at the idea of being on a lecture stage in front of the school. That's not what she'd meant by help. She'd already shared too much with Hannah. The emotional night had made her sappy. She didn't need everyone knowing about her amnesia. It had been used against her enough. His fear about the new gig made more sense now. Like, I would do anything so gauche. I shan't say anything personal, either, Basil said. He sniffed, lime coat ruffling as if it, too, were offended by the implication. You'll just stand there while I talk and serve these alchemists a riveting lecture. You're a unique case study with your memory gaps. It's a fabulous example of the tabula rasa principle. Please, it won't take more than 15 minutes. He held his hand out. She shook it. Deal. I did promise to protect you. I guess that can include making sure you're gainfully employed. That's the ticket. <sighs> Ezra moseyed to their side of the bar, a clean towel over his shoulder. An easy smile spread across his long face, reaching his deep-set hazel eyes. Can I break up the negotiation? It seems high stakes, but if you're thirsty, let me know. A water bottle for the road would be nice. 
Red leaned her elbow on the counter, resting her chin on her palm to inspect him. The casino was like a funhouse mirror reflecting a strange version of the truth, but there was something genuine about Ezra. He had his mother's eyes and angular good looks, but his straight, nearly shoulder-length brown hair and easy-going vibe must come from his father. Is Trudy really your mom? She accepts my Mother's Day card, so unless she's been too embarrassed to correct me all these years. Ezra bent over and pulled an icy bottle from a mini fridge. He opened it and set it on the counter. She probably already gave you homework. Red flashed the syllabus from her purse as she tucked the water bottle inside. A few of the titles were familiar, but she doubted alchemists used the Dewey Decimal System. Reading list. I just need to find the library. I'm not a student. Mom's the magic one, but after a few years of getting drunk alchemists back to their rooms, I know the place well enough. Now, if it were my break, I'd show you myself. Hopefully this is easier to decipher than Latin. He dropped a napkin on the table, whipped out a pen, and began to sketch a rough blueprint. You'll walk into the pyramid, right? Once you get to the swan pond by the banyan, go toward... Red bent her head close to his, following his pen movements as he described the directions. So, there are roses carved on the library door? You can't miss it. They still haven't fixed the giant hole Hannah made in that hallway, so watch your step. He put the finishing touches on his sketch. His gaze swept up to hers, their heads suddenly too close together. His hazel eyes twinkled. Warmth spread down her neck. He was awfully cued up close. Or far away. Basil rattled his ice cubes in the glass and peered at them over his oversized sunglasses. Did everyone forget I'm here? She's just taking a class. I must teach one. I need sympathy and a refill, por favor. The bartender chuckled. Coming right up. Thanks. Her cheek twitched as she repressed a grin, paying for the water with a generous tip. She rose from the stool and picked up the napkin. Walking past Basil, she patted his furry sleeves. Take care of this one. Ezra waved. I'll try to get some solids in him. Red called over her shoulder as she left. Celery doesn't count. She navigated between gamblers on the casino floor to find the hidden entrance to the academy near the nursing mother's room. Rubbing the golden poker chip with her thumb, she lodged it in her palm. Hannah said she just had to have it on her person, even in a backpack, to walk into the academy, but Red wasn't taking any chances. She turned the knob of the double doors and slipped inside quickly, not certain if everyone could see the pyramid in its depths. She rolled her shoulders, finally getting used to the strange, extending sensation of the portal doors, but she still hadn't gotten over her awe at the expansive banyan tree. The clouds made a fiery pink display over the canopy. She passed a group of teenagers on her way to the first landmark in her quest for the library, but the crowds had cleared out. The place felt like a mall in the morning, quiet and waiting for the next rush. Buffett staff wiped down the tables. The sellers checked their phones, leaning on their kiosks and carts. Even the swans slept in beds of heather by the pond. She followed the directions down a grand arched concourse. Marble statuary of wizened men with staffs competed with tapestries of Hindu gods woven in vivid still life. The pantheon changed to Romans and togas as she walked. The muffled sound of an amplified speech drifted through the marble corridor. A man in black, bowler hat tipped low, leaned against a wide set of closed doors. Thumbing to the next page in his book, he peeped over the cover. Pointing up at an illuminated plaque reading auditorium, he shrugged at her. If you want to get in, the lecture is already full. Diego Blanco knows how to pack seats. She eyed the entrance nervously. The bigger the doors, the bigger the stage. Of course these lectures would be popular. I must be in one of them soon. I don't suppose I can plead that you just don't let anyone inside come the day. He closed his book and tucked it under his arm, propping a hand on his hip. His face was round and beige like a boxing mitt. The crooked cartilage in his nose gave him a pugilist's profile. He was built to play defensive tackle. I'm not a hall monitor, Red. You know my name. Slow day for school gossips, then. Word could travel fast, but she had just arrived. 
she turned up her spirit gaze. An onyx-studded harness, glimmering with mystical energy, was strapped over his shoulders. He tipped his bowler up, and the edges of his dark crew cut peeked out. Blunt eyelashes surrounded his serious eyes. I'm in the gendarme, the academy police force. I'm here because Proctor is in there. I'm glad she has protection. Red strove for a neutral, non-suspicious calm. She hadn't done anything, but she had been on the wrong side of the law enough to step lightly. Cops and hunters didn't mix well. The Academy is her protection. I'm just waiting to get another testimony from her. He shook her hand, balancing his book in his elbow. I'm Ian Keeley. You're welcome here, but you need to play by our rules. Your friend attracted some notice last night, stumbling across an undercover operation. She tamped down a sassy reply. This was about territory. Vic had bumbled into the gendarme's investigation without realizing, hopefully before the strip club. It wasn't the first time they'd rolled into a hunt claimed by another. Was it a great idea for him to go out into the field without getting the down low from the alchemists? No. She defended him anyway. We hunt werewolves. It's what we do. You're not the only ones. Ian matched her gaze. His presence loomed even if he hadn't budged from his leaning pose. You came here to study. He can catch a few shows in the meantime. It's a big school. Couldn't hurt to have some more eyes on the kid. I saw some shoppers in the Pyramid Bazaar that definitely weren't alchemists. This isn't some fly-by-night operation. He tossed her a superior glance. We got a system for that. Every visitor must apply for a silver poker chip to get in. Wards keep most in the pyramid. We monitor and collect each one at closing time. Even the golden keys like yours are tracked. Unless you are on the synod, we know when you come in and out, and with who. But what if someone... This city already has defenders. Red nodded, biting her tongue. I'll tell Vic then. Enjoy your story, Ian. The library is that way, right? He nodded, his face once more hidden behind the book. Once she was out of his sight, she muttered to herself about her bad luck. What was next? Being sent to the principal's office? Smoke damage dusted the stone ceiling overhead. The film grew thicker as she walked. Cracks in the marble floor deepened and splintered. A dark abyss divided a wide, charred entryway. Half covered with particle board and ringed with orange cones, the hole stretched a yard into the hall. She lifted her eyebrows, gauging the depth as she sidestepped the crater. Hannah must bring the heat to blast that far into the floor. Red checked Ezra's napkin directions again before she spotted the roses and scrolls carved into a grand wooden entrance. Heaving the thick door open, the sight took her breath away. Vaulted mural ceilings crowned the spacious chamber as stained glass chandeliers created a warm, bright glow. Tall bookshelves stood at attention, like a waiting battalion, and puny tables lay in their shadows. A hush lingered over the bent heads of studying alchemists. She made her way to a busy librarian station. A sweating adept pleaded with the attendant for help, and the two disappeared into the stacks. She leaned on the desk to wait and readied her list. Perinelle strode past, doubling back to her when they made eye contact. Madame Flamel? Red tried to smile and not look panicked. She had been two for two in getting warnings from authority figures this morning. I'm waiting to get my school books. May I? Perinelle took the list and peered at it. She nodded, releasing a satisfied, hmm. I have some additions, but... This will do. I assume Miss Fox is trying to spare you from our alchemy texts, which can be more esoteric. Some may say coded with symbolism. I can believe it. Perinel led them to a nearby shelf. How do you find the Academy Library? It sounds stupid, but I had no idea there were this many occult books. They were always so hard to find on the road. You'd think the internet would make research easier, but not for demonology and real lore. Red hovered her palm over the books, careful not to touch the aged spines. Most of the search results are just D&D manuals. You're a truth seeker, an explorer. Alchemists have vast interests. You'll find new horizons behind these covers. 
Perinelle reached up to pull a book out and handed it over. This is not on Miss Fox's list, but I think you will find it interesting. Red ran her hand over the title on the cover. Crispin's Genealogy of American Witches. She pressed it to her chest, heart thumping against the book. Her throat tightened. She didn't trust herself to speak. This was exactly the kind of book she had been seeking. It was written by a bard with too much time on his hands and a propensity for gossip that he regretted in the end. More than 50 years out of date, it still makes for an illuminating read. Not every family listed has survived. Hannah Proctor's family isn't the first lost in a witch hunt. It's not only my clan that will be wiped off the map to ensure their victory, Red quoted the words absently as she remembered them. She flushed at the other woman's confused stare, realizing that she sounded like a nut. It's something John Proctor's spirit told me, probably about the vampires who killed his family. It's a long story, probably boring to you. She shifted on her feet, rubbing her arm. Sorry to be morbid. I had an intense conversation with Hannah last night. I don't know if you have any empaths on staff for students, but she could use a guidance counselor. She's fortunate to have you thinking of her. A voice squeaked behind them, high-pitched from nerves as a round androgynous librarian in a bow tie popped up. Excuse me, Madame Flamel, I can help that student. Please don't trouble yourself. Thank you, Lee. They can help you with your reading list, Red. Red handed over the list for the librarian's perusal. She looked up and Paranel was gone. Frowning, she wished she could have said thank you. Lee, the cheerful librarian, soon had her set up at a round table by a shelf of scrolls. Her entire reading waited, stacked in front of her, with Trudy's careful notes on the order in which to read them. The stained glass windows cast a rainbow over the book that Perinelle had given her. Her internal tussle between curiosity and the desire for scholastic success was short-lived. Red yanked the genealogy closer and flipped it open. The title page listed Richard Crispin as the author, likely from the Big Brotherhood family that included her ally, Jacob Crispin. An inserted handwritten note listed the copy as extremely rare. Only 50 copies were printed in its first and only edition, with nearly all destroyed. The dry catalog note added that the publisher was forbidden to print more after a defamation lawsuit registered by some of the mentioned witch families who were represented by Smith and Reaper. Smith and Reaper, the banking branch of that shadowy multinational corporation, held her mysterious inheritance. Obviously, their legal division was the preferred choice for witches, too. It looked like Smith and Reaper was more successful in a libel case than shipping a package. She had been waiting months for the delivery of the few physical items in her inheritance. It probably wouldn't be a note from her parents, along with a scrapbook of her life, but it was a real tie to her past. With wistful hope, Red dove into the book. She scanned the first self-congratulatory verbose lines of the foreword by the author about his ability to be invited to the best supernatural society soirees, then flipped ahead to the first chapter on the origins of indigenous witch dynasties. Tugging a pen out of her purse, she jotted down quick notes in her old journal as she read. She had bought a new one, but she couldn't start it without more ceremony. There was something about a leather-bound book like that which required some reverence. Fixed to the comfy reading chair, she barely noticed the mages and alchemists walking by her, carrying oversized scrolls and backpacks slung over their shoulders. She only moved to make notes. Her script grew thin and wavering as she got to the section on the Proctor's journey from England to Salem and then finally to Oklahoma. She read it twice to see if there were any clues as to who might want Hannah dead. The old pages stuck together as she moved to the next chapter. The name St. James jumped out at her. She thumbed back, wincing but not stopping at a paper cut. The surname dominated the chapter page in curling Old English text, the St. James Witches of Old Philadelphia. Her heart thumped loud enough that she expected the librarian to shush her. She turned the page, fighting the urge to put a hand over her eyes and read between her fingers. In Boston, they ask, how much does he know? In New York, how much is he worth? In Philadelphia, who were his parents? Mark Twain. 
The author started the chapter with the usual quote and tangent about meeting a notable socialite in a fashionable upscale. After meeting with the precocious Abigail St. James at the Algonquin Hotel, I knew those bow lips couldn't be unsealed. I was so desperate, I booked passage to a seaside resort in Maine favored by the family, with tomes creatively borrowed from the Brotherhood. The entry continued to detail the family legend of its founding by a mermaid daughter of the water spirit Melusine, before the journey to the New World to hide from the witch trials among the Quakers, then its rise as a powerful and mysterious coven. Red failed to find Juniper's name on her first scan. She read ahead to what the St. James family was up to around 1900. It was a well-documented period, thanks to a dotty great-aunt who mistook Richard Crispin for a nephew, and regaled him with family gossip at a crashed summer wedding. There weren't any missing red-headed relatives. The author loved juicy stories, so he wouldn't have skipped out on a tale about a vampire's courtesan. Quinn had told her the Burnses had given Juniper her name. It must have been a coincidence or maybe an odd joke that the surname was the same as this notable witch family. A shadow fell over Red. Lifting her head, she blinked at the realization that the sun had faded outside the windows. Vic sat down in the chair beside her, putting his backpack on the table. He was dressed in a clean flannel shirt, and a trucker cap rested backwards on his mullet. Aren't you the diligent little student? Kinda of, she lied. You're already firing on all cylinders, so you're ahead of me. I've been thinking about these werewolves since I woke up this afternoon. They were hunting that girl in human form. It certainly wasn't a pack getting moonwild while shifted. The local alpha said he didn't recognize any of them. She knew that the word of a wolf didn't mean much to him, but she hadn't sensed anything shifty from the pack leader. A group that bold would have made waves before now. The one-eared guy is old enough to have been operating for a while. It feels familiar. In what way? Red set the genealogy book on the table. She might not remember her biological family, but he remembered his was slaughtered by a feral werewolf. He had only escaped as a boy because the hunter, Henry Constantine, had found him and taken him in to raise beside his own son. Vic never could resist a wolf hunt. Last time, they had nearly died. She didn't want to egg him on when the academy cops already had their eye on him. He pulled out his laptop and then four curling notebooks with the year marked on the covers in a faded script. These are Henry's. I brought them back from Arizona when I saw LaShawn. My brother didn't want to check them out with me. Not interested in a trip down memory lane? Weird, huh? He shrugged his incredulity away. I love reading about Dad's greatest hits. My hunter's journal is a lot of bullet notes and shitty sketches. He wrote lore. We didn't go up against wolves a lot as a kid, but I remember a few times. Are you sure? You've been hitting the head a lot. Vic scrutinized the other tables. We're too close to everyone to talk about it, but judging from my last MRI scan, your healer buddy cleared up some old concussions. He's not exactly my buddy. Red squirmed in her seat, not knowing what to call the vampire who claimed her. She had let Kristoff bite her. He had been injured. The bite was necessary, so he had the blood supply to heal Vic. It was when she was stupid enough to think that friendship was possible with an unsold vampire. Then he had stopped her from saving Trey, traitor to humankind as he was, from his friend Donald's vengeance. She had seen where a claimed human-master-vampire relationship could end. It wasn't something she wanted to talk about either. What did you find? Can you take a break to help me skim these journals for the furry parts? He slid two across the table at her and kept the oldest one for himself. Red nodded, swallowing thickly as she read the year embossed on the cover. He must have been nine that year. It was the year his birth family had been murdered. Vic crossed his legs and slumped deep into the chair. His hands trembled ever so slightly as he thumbed through the pages. She opened one of the notebooks, long used to the late hunter's style of putting a small timeline in the back of each journal. Before she had come to the Academy, Henry's journals and BardNet, the glitchy Brotherhood database, were her most reliable sources of information about the dark beings she fought, 
night after night. Red scanned the timeline index, smiling at his note of Vic's 14th birthday in May, to find any mention of werewolves and other shifters, and wrote down the page numbers. Then she turned to the front of the journal. Henry had redrawn the right margin in a thick line to separate his later notes from the blocky script, marking out every other centimeter of the pages. She started to read the entry about the Constantine encounter with a feral wolf in Cajun country. It was quite a year for shifters, so she'd only gotten halfway through the journal by the time Vic got through his first and moved on to the second. A detail or two caught her eye, like a shifter working with a witch in Philadelphia from an unidentified coven, but nothing seemed to point to a group of four werewolves with a penchant for matching tracksuits and a family resemblance. He lifted his head, excitement jerking his volume up. Holy shit, you have to be kidding me. The whispering werewolf. You don't have to yell. Red hoped an embarrassed apologetic smile would placate the library goers glaring at the interruption. Besides being alliterative, what does that mean? It sounds like a pub in England. True, but in this case, it's an assassin from Boston. Vic leaned over to show the page with the small mugshot pasted in. It was the leader of the tracksuited quartet. Younger and possessing two ears, the flat-eyed stare was the same. Frank Lopes, former military sniper, current pain in our ass. What was the case? Dad was protecting some poor sucker in Indianapolis with a bullseye on his back. I remember having to hang out in the guy's laundromat for hours. He was laundering more than clothes for supernatural types. I had just turned 16 and had been on hunts before. Not this case. Dad packed us off to Colorado when Frank dropped an ear off at the hotel that we were staying in. It was from the client's wife. She had no idea what her husband was into. He shook his head. Henry didn't lose many innocents. Frank earned his fee then. Red tried to sound neutral, but it wasn't exactly comforting to know that the fabled Henry Constantine, who had been toasted in Hunter's bars from Arizona to Vermont, had failed to stop the wolf. Dad took an ear from him. The rest got away. He tried to keep tabs on Lopes, but the trail dried up, called him the Whispering Werewolf until he found his real name. The case must have stuck with Dad. Vic snapped the journal closed and drummed his fingers on it. This isn't just a big bad wolf. This is a stone-cold killer who's found himself a gang, or bred one. He's not working for free, and hiring a werewolf death squad can't be cheap. This guy takes underworld contracts brokered through God knows where. I doubt he even knows who wired the money into his offshore bank account. He stroked his chin. But it couldn't hurt to track him down and ask. It could hurt a lot. You're a little eager about this case. I'm not the only one who's noticed. Red sketched out the warning from Ian and retold the synod meeting with the supernatural leaders, figuring that he'd been too hungover to process it this morning. She added, this isn't our city. We're not the first call when something weird happens. It's your vacation. Relax, play a poker game, process things, you know. Nope, don't start with the therapy stuff. But Quint, he just... Uh, and he wouldn't want me sitting on my ass now that I can walk again. I think a werewolf hunt is the best way to get my mojo back. Vic fixed a determined glare on her. You want me to process... This is my process. Red put her hands up in the surrender. Don't get me kicked out of here. And you're going to get an ulcer, by the way. Probably just give you one. He opened his laptop and entered a long password before bringing up his browser. He typed the obscure sequence of letters and numbers that made up a masked URL to a black page with a white login form in the center and put in his password. Let's see if the Brotherhood has anything on Frank Lopes and the gang. She drew closer, expecting to see the Bardnet interface that looked built in 1997 and never updated. Instead, the page refreshed and sent them off to a random car dealership website in Telford, England. It automatically forwarded any failed logins as a security measure. Did I forget the exclamation point? Vic went back to the page to log in. The page rejected him again and again. This is what you get for making paranoid hacker passwords. 
Leaning back in her chair, she checked her phone to see if Lucas had finally texted her back. She sighed at the empty inbox. Should she try calling him again? It's been crapping out a while now. They need a new IT guy. I say this, and he's a buddy. If old Chuck hadn't changed his password, I could have used it again. Damn it, we're going to have to ask that woman. A soft cough interrupted him. Trudy walked from the stacks to their table. She clutched a satchel strap while the other hand took off her glasses, letting them hang on a chain, losing a shade of severity in the appearance of ten years. Mr. Constantine, Red, good evening. I'm glad I found you. I must apologize to you both. Oh, it's okay, Red said. If it were up to her, they could have an unspoken do-over for the whole day. No, carry on. He beckoned further apologies with a crooked finger, leaning back in his chair. The contrite expression curdled on Trudy's face. She licked her lips, nostrils flaring. Her tone held the evenness of a woman resisting the urge to kick a man. We didn't start our working relationship as I would prefer. I should have thanked you both for bringing back my charge. Guarding Hannah is my number one priority. I'll accept help where I can take it. She held out her hand to Vic. Red crossed her fingers under the table. School was going to be tough if her old mentor kept squabbling with her new teacher. He shook the offered hand, grinning. Well, I was a hungover horse's ass, so no worries. You're not wrong about my style. I'm not much for details until I need them. Trudy smiled, laugh lines crinkling by her hazel eyes. I remember the pace of field work. It doesn't leave much time for memorizing magical correspondences. Red relaxed in her chair. Seeing the two bards make up eased the knot of tension she had been carrying all day. He wagged his finger at the other bard. You would know. I've heard about you back in the day. They say Trudy and her hero held off a horde of ghouls until sunrise, and she was rolling with just an empath. Red whistled. They aren't the ones you want in a ghoul melee. It was a small horde, Trudy clarified, hiding a shy smile behind her hand as she put her glasses on. You can brag around us because I certainly will. I got a lead on the pack that attacked Hannah, Vic said. He laid out their evidence on Frank Lopes. Trudy pulled a tablet out of her satchel, thumbs moving quickly on the bright screen. The bards have a file on him. It's skimpy on details. Hmm, he travels with his children, Paul, Gloria, and Nuno. I'll give this to the gendarme. You're on the bard net. It's working, then. Vic quieted, gaze moving quickly between them. He clenched his jaw, launching himself out of his chair to toss the laptop into his backpack. The journals were carefully set on top. Well, now you know the score. I'm going to bounce. Give me a holler if you need a wolf hunter. Thank you, Trudy said after his fleeing back. She turned to survey Red. I heard from the librarian that you've been here all day. Red picked up the only book from the reading list she had glanced at, an elementary guide to witchcraft. It was so crammed full of theory that reading it was like staring into a solar eclipse. Don't expect much. I'm going to have to work hard to catch up to Hannah. I'll see that you will. I should inform Ian and the rest of the investigators now. Carry on. Trudy departed with a brisk stride. Red's phone buzzed on the table, and she turned it over to see the screen. It was a test notification from Sheila Jones, her agent at Smith & Reaper. She tapped it, bracing herself for more disappointment. Had the mystery box from her inheritance been lost? She had been waiting for it since before Halloween. Was the uber-competent representative who had arranged apartments, rented cars, and secured access to mage hospitals finally admitting defeat to the whims of the mail? A message popped up. Red had to read it again to believe it. The package had exited foreign customs. Sheila estimated the arrival time to the minute. It was the same time as her first class later this week. She knew she would wake up that day at dawn like the kid that she didn't remember being on the Christmases she couldn't recall. She opened her new hunter's journal and touched the first creamy white page. Her hands shook, and she realized it was finally time to write in it. She didn't know what was ahead, or if she was ready. It was coming, anyway. She wrote the date and the location in the corner, 
Then began the entry as she always started her journals. They call me Red. I don't know who I am. She frowned, scratching out the last sentence. She hated blemishing the first page, but that line didn't fit her anymore. I know who I am now, and I'm going to find out who I was. I'll find my way home. Five. February 6th evening, the Las Vegas Strip. Red and Hannah jogged on the sidewalk between a construction site for a new hotel tower and a parking garage of the Circe Casino. The arid breeze dried the sweat on her tank top. A small bag of crystals bumped against her back. Trudy insisted they train with witch gear on. Tonight, their teacher wanted to test them out in the elements instead of in the climate-controlled fitness room. Red joked, I didn't think we'd have gym class at witch school. Witchcraft requires physical stamina, Hannah said in a winded impersonation of her bard. Don't worry, you'll get to handle the real magic soon. With perfect form, Trudy outpaced them both in a blur of a wild curly ponytail and runner's shorts. A satchel bounced on her hip. She disappeared around the parking garage's corner. Red picked up her feet to keep up jogging toward a sleepy, unfamiliar parking lot. The building complex was a maze without even counting the hidden academy. She'd been here nearly a week and hadn't left beyond a quick shopping trip. Still, the place held its secrets well. She mostly knew her way to the casino, the library, and the gym to work out with Hannah while Trudy led them through routines. The bard seemed just as interested in their physical prowess as the magical. Trudy waited for them at the curbside, checking her watch. Fantastic time, girls. Hannah, you're showing marked improvement this week, I'm pleased to report. Vic trained his charge well in the field, and I think it's rubbing off on you. Red smiled at the genuine compliment. Time had smoothed over the rocky start with the bard, even if she was a stricter mentor than Vic. Trudy channeled the vibe of a drill sergeant, hard on her recruits now to keep them alive later in the war but that intense focus seemed to soften after a good endorphin rush from exercise. The bard worked herself as hard as she pushed them. Hannah stretched her legs with wistful hope on her sweaty face. So, we can end early tonight, and I can hang out at the Nostradamus? Trudy folded her arms, seeming to repress a smile. You're doing well, but we won't go that far. Heroes need more than supernatural gifts to survive their battles. Red, do a rotation of jumping jacks. Hannah, wind sprints. The teen stifled a groan as she wiped her forehead with the edge of her pink sleeve. Red patted her shoulder, leaning into whisper. I have ice cream in the fridge for later. You're on! Smiling, Hannah trotted off. Launching into jumping jacks, Red didn't mind the workout. It burned off the edge of nervousness that had been brewing all day. Her first magic lesson was tomorrow. Time had sped by at the academy with full days of study and training that left her tired but happy. She had even managed to get in a session with Dawn, her empath therapist, to unpack her grief around Quinn, Joe Chang, and even the traitor Trey. The serenity of life under the banyan tree was just what she needed after Los Angeles. An alarm trilled on Trudy's wrist, and she turned away from the girls, pulling an elixir vial out of her satchel. Barely noticing the bard taking her nightly prescription, Red paused between reps and watched the sprinting teen instead. Hannah stopped at the far end of the sidewalk. She powered through her bag, then dropped it. A discreet beckoning wave to the others was the only warning before she tore off into the parking lot. Red jogged off after her. It took a moment scanning the darkened rows of cars to see what alerted the other witch. A tall man emerged from behind a van in sunglasses and a popped-up collar. He held a sagging young woman in a mini-dress by the waist. They were followed by a round-shouldered male whose husky form and darting glances gave him the appearance of being a literal bundle of nerves. Both men were too pale. Their teeth glimmered an unnatural white. Vampires. Red wanted to shout to get back, but Hannah already brandished a glowing crystal. She slipped on her spirit gaze, hoping the teen had a spell ready because she didn't have a stake. Let her go, Hannah called out, stopping behind the vampires. 
She held up a cross in her other hand. Soft, translucent waves of energy sprung from it. Gulping visibly, she shuffled forward. Drop her. Hissing, the vampires drew back, clumping together. The squat minion muttered, I told you we should have stayed in Cali, Chad. Regaining his courage first, Chad pushed the unconscious woman to the other man. Tossing a side glance at the complainer, he popped his wavering collar up, then rolled up his sleeves, striding toward the young witch. Look, dessert found us. Wait until Leroy comes around with the car and sees this party. Red raced ahead, calling out, Dessert has a friend! Trudy outstripped her, pulling an old book from her satchel. Chad laughed at the two advancing women. Red pumped her legs, blood running cold, not from the villainous guffaw, but from the determination on the teen's face. Hannah dropped her crystal and tossed the cross at Red, who caught it instinctively. Voice wavering, the teen addressed the dead man. Give her up peacefully. Nah. Chad lunged to meet the defenseless girl, fist aiming for her face. A bright flash rose on impact. He flew back, slamming into a sedan, setting off a car alarm. Hannah snorted, dumb ass, there's a sanctuary spell. There's more than that, Trudy said, holding an open grimoire. Dark orbs jetted out of the book to orbit over his head like birds in a cartoon. Stay down, dead man. You run and my magic follows. Voice firm, Hannah faced the trembling minion. The innocent now! He shoved the barely conscious woman at her and sprinted away. Red chased after him. Trudy's orbs beat her to him. She'd already guessed the gambit to avoid triggering the sanctuary spell by containing the vampires. She wasn't the only one. The minion skidded to a stop, fangs out, and eyes amber as the dark spheres circled him. You won't hurt me. It'll rebound on you. I suppose you're right. Mischief behind her glasses, Trudy beckoned her orbs back with a crooked finger. Someone else can. Huh? A golf cart zoomed between a pair of parked cars and slammed into the minion, Perinelle Flamel at the wheel. Bowler hat tipped low, Ian popped out of the passenger side. He lifted a small handheld crossbow and aimed it at the stout dead man. Uncut onyx studs shimmered with power on his shoulder harness. A precise bullseye to the heart made the vampire collapse in a decaying slump. With a professional's cool, he reloaded with a small arrow plucked from his trench coat. Chad scrambled over the hood of a car to get away. An arrow impaled deep into the center of his back. He dissolved to bones, rolling to hit the asphalt. Trudy snapped her book closed and smiled at Ian. I'm surprised it took you this long. There is a third to find. He's staked, Ian said, hanging the mini crossbow on his belt under his trench coat. We were tracking them in the casino already. Red sighed, relieved that she wouldn't have to stake anything tonight. She already had a reputation with the Blood Alliance. Three dead vamps. The Supreme around here is going to be pissed. He wouldn't say boo to the first alchemist over outsiders. Ian smirked, then turned away, putting a cell phone to his ear to order cleanup for the bodies. Perinel smiled. Well, this has been a most exhilarating staff observation. Hannah, if you would lead this poor woman to the cart. Yes, ma'am. The immortal alchemist adjusted her wind-blown bell sleeves as she stepped toward Red. I am not surprised to find the vampire hunter in the thick of things. It was really the others who saved that woman. I'm just here for the exercise. Trudy put a hand on Red's shoulder calm as if they had done yoga for their cool down instead of taking on some vampires. I believe the night's workout is complete. Get my young hero back to the dorm. Rest up. You'll be using a lot of magic tomorrow. An early night it is. Red grinned, waving the teen over to walk out of the parking lot. Hannah pushed open a side entrance of the casino. We are so not going home now. The guys are probably at the Nostradamus. But Trudy said, Come on, you know I don't have anyone to hang with ever. Besides, Basil needs you. He's working on his guest lecture, Hannah wheedled. He and Vic are still fighting over puns. Red couldn't deny the orphan a little fun. You're right. 
Ezra can only smooth over so many creative differences with beer and buffalo wings. Just don't tell your bard. She could hang out for a bit. It was still early. It wasn't like she was going to be late for her first magic lesson tomorrow. <sighs> the next morning, Red hurried down the hall, feeling more lost with each step. Cursing to herself, she couldn't believe she was going to be late. Groggy from last night, she'd woken early to finish her reading assignments in the library. Hannah had wanted to sleep more instead of study. It wasn't a special day for her, after all. She'd waved her roommate along, after murmuring that she would meet up in their late morning lesson, along with directions to the lab. Red thought she could handle finding one class. Another failed test. She darted through a doorway that she could have sworn Hannah said went to the East Laboratories, the pulled taffy sensation of portal travel barely phased her anymore. It opened behind a curtain in a room full of chain-smoking gamblers watching screens of dog races and boxing matches. Time moved strangely in the Circe Casino. The dazzle of the machines, the spin of the roulette wheels, and the ever-changing faces of the guests seemed to exist in their own dimension. Even if she weren't obscured behind Dingy Velvet, they wouldn't have noticed her. It wasn't a spell that held them wrapped. It was the allure of Lady Look. Ducking back into the portal disguised as a broom closet, she ended up in a completely different hall constructed from the same brown stone as the dormitory tower. She hated when the doors switched on her. The halls had a lot of random decor and symbolism stuck in shadowy nooks. A marble statue could stand outside a laboratory one day and then disappear the next. Unless it was carved into a wall or nailed down, she wouldn't use it as a landmark. Turning in a circle, she thought she recognized a copper sconce shaped like a salamander. What the hell am I doing? A raven squawked in reply as it soared overhead. I think we've all asked ourselves that question. Red defended herself to the departing bird. Shrugging her bag up, she guessed and opened the third door on the left. Perinel Flamel experimented in the lab, clutching a glass vial with tongs to examine the glowing contents. A thick lens on a copper stand magnified her wide cheekbones and pointed chin. Her skin looked eerily smooth and poreless. She poured the liquid into a raised metal horn. The mixture cast shimmering lights on her velvet dress. Her magnified eye narrowed, purple iris gleaming. Did you want to speak, my dear? Striding forward, Red shrugged and adjusted her bag. She hadn't been able to have a conversation alone with the immortal alchemist since the library. Finishing the genealogy book had raised some questions, but this wasn't the time. Er, I'm actually lost. I'm looking for the East Laboratories. I'm supposed to be meeting Trudy for my first real lesson. You have found the right wing. When I am assisting with the assessments, I enjoy working outside my private laboratory during ranking season. I find that I understand my adepts work better in their own environment. Perinel put down the empty vial and moved away from the lens. Do you feel recharged? You've had many ordeals before you found us. Red dropped the psychic barrier she had over herself, revealing bright chakras. She had been blessing her muffins like Hannah taught her. More importantly, she had convinced Vic to leave the werewolves to the gendarme. She hadn't needed to strain her energy on any supernatural shenanigans. Looks pretty good to me. Still, I'd like to... It's just a quick aura scan. We've only just developed this prototype. Perinel reached for a small handheld device from the shelf. It looked like a store inventory counter mated with a medieval astrolabe. She hovered the gold-plated end over Red's shoulder, murmuring something that sounded like French, too, quietly to make out. She clicked her tongue, returning it to the shelf. You regenerated nicely from whatever horrid thing that drained you. I'm curious about what it could have been. The Genesis machine was a secret the Blood Alliance would kill to keep. Red was happy enough to leave it behind her. What were you working on before I interrupted you? I was replicating an adept's experiment, a drinking horn that can neutralize the magic of even the Fae's mead, something to impress the Synod at his ranking. It's still an experiment, but I suppose everything is. Perinel pointed to a shelf hanging over the counter. 
Delicate white blooms shaped like broken hearts flowered in a shiny black pot reflecting the light of the gleaming sphere beside it. The squat bottle in the middle was nearly lost in the surrounding brilliance. Genetically modified ghost flowers for poisoning ghouls, an enthymema draft to unlock the mind, and my personal favorite, harnessed sunshine, all unstable experiments in progress. Red Gox. It wasn't the draft that impressed her. She had drunk her share of snake oil potions to uncover her memories. Even a foul psychedelic mushroom concoction with basil. All she got was some eerie dreams out of it. Harnessed sunshine was another story. The implication sunk in. That would revolutionize fighting vamps. Her thoughts tumbled over themselves. She had seen magic before, but never someone listing off wonders like they were just craft projects around the house. She didn't understand how this place even existed. How was the network of spells and enchantments even powered? She had tried to chat up alchemists for answers, even stopping Ian in the pyramid hall, but they all gave her the cryptic act. Only the librarian tried to help her understand by recommending books that read like a Byzantine monk had taken acid before picking up the pen. Red was already late to class, but the rambling questions popped from her. How do you even do this stuff here? I've seen mages hold up spells using altars or craft magical objects, but there are portal doors here. Then the freestanding illusion spells and a bottomless pond by the banyan. That tree is a topic by itself. I haven't even seen a ghost, and they love to lurk around mystical energy and just the physical dimensions of this place. I don't even know where that dormitory tower is actually standing. It's not visible from the outside. Mouth dry from her rant, she shifted on her feet. I thought alchemists were like potion makers, you know? Magic chemists. Chemists! Perinelle huffed a small laugh. They did a rebrand in the 1800s because they thought they were better than us. Intellectual cowards. True alchemists are Renaissance men. They are as literate in demon summoning as they are classic transmutation. Still, how can you keep all these spells going? The magic that a collective can do together. It's been the work of many lifetimes for me to convince my fellows to study together in such numbers. This academy is a monument to layers of intricate craftsmanship by generations of alchemists. My next trick is to open our doors to unaffiliated mages like you. So I'm a guinea pig to see if witch integration works out? As is Hannah. However, if you find yourself interested in joining our order and learning our art, you'll be welcomed. Perinelle walked around the counter. I do think you have the temperament for alchemy. Of course, we're all mages, no matter our discipline, united through the spark of the mystical divine in us. I can't help but be biased. Well, you are the immortal alchemist, after all. Perinel smiled, heading toward the door. I suppose I should let you have one lesson with the bard before I try to recruit you. She's a talented witch, uniquely suited to your deficiencies. She is a master of magical control. Red dropped into step beside her. She had met a lot of things that called themselves immortal. Mostly, they were just old. There was an ethereal quality to Madame Flamel's features up close that made the name seem real. Why are you interested in me? I appreciate it, but I'm getting the feeling that you're too busy to have a personal interest in every adept. You are correct. I care for all my students. Yet you have aroused my curiosity. How much do you know about the August Harvest? Enough. Red bit the inside of her cheek. She knew some truths behind the original soul curse that not even the Brotherhood possessed. Even if she wasn't sure exactly what role her past life had in bringing the soulmancer Father Matthew to his destiny in 1900. Lots of vampires got souls. Vampires delighted in witch hunts as much as the witch hunters once upon a time. I lost dozens of students to such an unholy alliance one grim October over a century ago. Perinelle paused, seemingly lost in remembrance of a darker time. Politics tied my hands against revenge. The blood clans were too powerful then. Until the soul curse. 
Every coven with a soulmancer sent them after local troublesome vampires. Some didn't even bother with soulmancy. They created unstable spells, hoping to replicate the effects of Father Matthew's original. With mixed results, I must say. Lots of them died trying. Red had heard the stories even before the name Juniper St. James entered her lexicon. The August harvest had rocked the supernatural world for decades. The scars still hadn't healed. Her last few months proved that. Those who survived to curse a vampire only seemed to summon more to hunt their coven in revenge. It was chaos. Cue the blood alliance. The immortal alchemist snorted, a very mortal sound. They organized their side, but it was the global covens convening for the first time in lifetimes that quelled the violence. Alchemists sat beside voodoo queens and druids, Mages united for a moment to ban non-consensual soul curses on vampires. Then the bickering began. I can still hear it. She rubbed her temple. The conversation lulled as they turned a corner, passing a student boggling at the legend in his midst. Maybe I am chasing a dream, but I hope one day you and Hannah will be joined by other knowledge seekers from every mystical path. I'll do my best not to tick off the alchemists before they come. Red couldn't swear that it wouldn't happen. It wasn't making friends that worried her. She considered herself very friendly, for an amnesiac socialized by a wary drifter in a van. Promises were hard to keep in her world. The sea is changing even without your wave. Centuries of witch hunts scattered the mages. It's time to truly unite them. Paranel opened a laboratory door in the hall. Disappointment rushed over Red when she realized they had finally reached the classroom. She had been so excited for her first class, and now all she wanted was Paranel to tell her stories. Madam, Trudy sputtered, rising from a table in front of a chalkboard. Hannah twisted in a desk chair to get a better look. Oh, wow, it's her. I beg pardon for interrupting. The immortal alchemist inclined her heat and left in a sweeping flutter of fabric. Thanks, Paranel. Red waved before taking a seat. She tried to open her bag and pull out her journal as quietly as she could with the women watching her. The lab felt too big for just the three of them. Half the room was empty behind their chairs besides the potted plants on the counter illuminated by purple UV light. Frowning skeptically, Hannah propped her chin on her palm. You're like besties with the immortal alchemist now? Trudy cleared her throat, walking around the table. Since I assume it was important, I'll forgive the tardiness then. Red winced, lowering her head. It wasn't. I got lost. She helped me. We are past it. Trudy raised her chin, arms folded over her white blouse under her corduroy jacket. As I explained to Hannah, we will be reviewing fundamentals. After her showing in the last laboratory, it is merited. I saw the hole, Red said. I'm impressed. You must have had two blessed muffins that day. Hannah flushed, mouth twisting. Gee, thanks. Red wanted to groan in frustration at the sensitive teen. It wasn't sarcasm. Maybe she was wrong about her social skills. She struggled to even remember the last time she'd interacted with a teenager beyond a case. She certainly didn't remember being one. The hardest skill to learn is not conjuring illusions, channeling fire, or ensnaring a demon. It's mastering yourself, Trudy said, drawing attention to the outline of a figure on the chalkboard. Precise handwriting labeled parts of the mystical form like the aura. This used to be easier back when I was younger. Honing your focus is more important than ever in this pell-mell world. Red inched forward in her chair, waiting for the next word with her pen ready. Sighing, Trudy held out her hand to Hannah. Especially if we are checking our phones in the middle of a lesson, Miss Proctor. Scowling, Hannah tossed her phone over. Trudy caught the device one-handed and deposited it on the table. Every practitioner of magic, from any tradition, must clear their mind to allow room for pure intent. From hedge witches crafting folk magic with superstition to warlocks without their own power, harnessing bought relics, you could design a picture-perfect ritual and still fail unless your focus and spirit are aligned with the goal. Do you understand? 
Red nodded eagerly. Trudy smiled. Now, let's see if you know how to breathe. Red stopped writing notes and lifted her hand for a question. What kind of breathing? Hannah grumbled. I'm already doing it. I'll determine that. Uncloak your chakras so I can sense your concentration level. Trudy set a candle on the table and lit it with a match that released lavender-scented smoke. Circling them, she led them in a guided meditation, instructing them to focus on the candle flame, then trailed into glorious silence. Red settled into her chair, planting her feet firmly on the ground, and relished the mandate to not think. She kept up a daily habit of at least ten minutes of what she told Vic was her shut-the-hell-up time, but when the shit hit the fan, it felt indulgent to simply be. The sound of the bard's scratching pen in her notepad and Hannah's fidgets faded into the background. She fell into a deeper meditation than she had ever attempted on her own. Trudy roused them with a gentle order. We are going to attempt to connect with our magic. Red raised her hand. Um, I am still in recovery mode, emotionally and magically, so consider that in your grading. Emotions are a distraction to a mage. Red tried to stop herself from disagreeing. She told herself to be a good student. The words popped out anyway. Time to settle for being good enough. My emotions fueled any of my spells that were worth a damn, mostly terror. And it was unpredictable, I suspect. True mastery doesn't require a bolt of external stimulation. Trudy retrieved a pyramid from a box on a counter. It looked like a fancy paperweight, clear resin-coated bands of different colored smoothed crystals. She passed it to Red. Your magic is restoring nicely, but you can cultivate it with this. You'll recognize amethyst and smoky quartz for spiritual healing, but there are also bands of blue lapis lazuli and iridescent labradorite. Now, you'll begin with belly breathing. Hannah glared at her captured phone on the table as the lesson tangent continued on crystal vibrations to stimulate magic regeneration. She drummed boredly on her desk. Trudy shushed her. You'll get your phone back after class. I think I feel something. Red grinned at her shining aura, the distinct patterns and shapes in the brilliant colored chakras clearer than ever. The lesson was sinking in, as opposed to all the hundreds of times she had tried learning in a van rocking down a highway. Now prime your focus and magic with a visual, Trudy said. Think of something that makes you feel strong and full of mystical potential. You don't need to tell me, just visualize it. When you want to draw on your own power, you can tug at it like a dog on a leash, but it will fight you the whole way. Work with it. Show it what you can be together. Red searched her memories for that power moment. Flicking through the memories like a slideshow, she discarded the summer night she'd staked Cowboy Kurt with a wooden spoon. That was sleazier and more terrifying than empowering. She'd conjured fire somehow and melted the bullets from Michelle de Gramont's rebels on Halloween. That was cool, but she still didn't know how she broke the laws of physics to do it. Then there was the winter solstice. She had spent most of her time in the dreamland running from Maxwell Baldacci and his henchwoman Neve, but she had done impressive magic. Magic and intention were amplified in the dreamland, so she couldn't do a fraction of that in reality, but her exorcism had released spectral hellhounds to drag the warlock below. That was the power she'd earned. Trudy snapped her fingers. I saw your root chakra flash. Excellent. Whatever it is, keep drawing on that memory. Hannah sighed. I'm happy for her breakthrough, but can I do something more advanced here? My mom taught me this in kindergarten. Red's inner peace faded as self-consciousness drifted in. She'd told Vic she would end up the dumb kid. I get it. I'm slowing you down. No worries. I can catch up after class. Trudy lifted a hand for silence. Miss Proctor, not everyone had the privilege of growing up in a mage household. Blamelessly, your classmate has had a checkered education. She needs to be grounded in the basics. Hannah said, she can just hang out with Perinel then. I'm sure they can Merlin it up over coffee like this morning. 
You're my bard, not hers. No offense, Red, but I need to be ready for whatever my mysterious destiny is supposed to be. Red felt a fight brewing with her in the middle. She wasn't here for drama. Let's pick up the pace. I can learn on my feet. Eyebrows arched. Trudy placed the box from the counter onto the table. Well, Hannah, since you want us to proceed, demonstrate your mastery over focus with one of the classics. I have everything you need to craft a simple scrying spell. Use the pendulum to find a location. Red will have read about these by now. Show her how it is done. Hannah walked to the table, a determined set to her chin. She unfurled a large map of the United States, arranged multicolored rocks and gems in a circle, and twirled a copper teardrop pendulum on its chain. Trudy removed her chained glasses, letting them dangle over her chest as her arm crossed over her waist. She lifted a lazy hand, the fingers flicking out. The Proctor House. Opening her third eye, Red bent forward in her seat to see the spell better. The words conjured the memory of the burnt ruins of the aged Edwardian mansion and the ghosts inside. She couldn't imagine what it brought up for the orphan. Hannah glared with the force that only a teenager could. Biting her lip, she bent her head and lowered the pendulum over the Midwest. The copper teardrop began to spin. The energy built up around her. Sparks traveled from her hand to the pendulum. Imagine pushing open the front door and walking inside. What do you see? Or who? Trudy asked as she drew closer to the girl. The pendulum flailed wildly. I see the light show that is your aura and chakras right now. Concentrate on the location, not your feelings. This is the first step to learning more complicated location spells. Hannah threw down the pendulum, arms shaking. I should be learning something I can use in the field. You know, considering that werewolves want to kill me. Maybe I should train with Vic instead. Me and Red can do a bard swap. Shoulders stiffening, Trudy smoothed down her corduroy suit. Mr. Constantine could teach you much. I will concede that to my colleague, but even he would agree that scrying is important. Wouldn't a scrying spell have helped you in your previous cases, Red? Red crossed her arms, considering how many past enemies had the capability to mystically cloak themselves or buy a mage's pricey services. The smaller jobs, for sure, you don't always have a clear suspect to focus on, but it would be better than trying to find a place based on a torn matchbook with the internet. Hannah scowled at Red. You're taking her side? Whoa, I didn't... Try again, Hannah, Trudy said. You learned this in kindergarten, remember? The girl tossed the map and the crystals back into the box. Whatever. Let her do it. Sit down. Trudy had perfected the sharp snap of a general. Meditate before you make any rash decisions. Hannah slunk into her chair. Your turn. Gesturing to Red, the bard lectured on the technique of allowing the pendulum to feel its way on the map instead of forcing it. The pendulum is an extension of your intention. Don't let your emotions cloud you. She adjusted her glasses, gaze askance at her other sulking pupil. You'll have to reassemble it. Red reached into the box for the heap of crystals, identifying only maybe five types to recreate the circle. She smoothed out the corner of the map as she waited for more instruction. Find yourself. Just a second. Red bit her lip. On impulse, she rearranged the circle into a triangle of lapis lazuli and rough selenite. Visualizing her victory over Maxwell, a thread of magic jumped into her hand like an eager puppy to be channeled into the crystals. She raised the pendulum over Nevada and tried to concentrate. The pendulum jerked to the east toward the Atlantic Ocean before curling around to the west coast. She tried to wrangle it like a sheepdog after a wayward flock. It only kept wilding out as she focused harder on locating herself on the map. I think the problem is, I am confused on where we are, physically in space and time, since this part of the Academy definitely isn't in Vegas. Good point, but I think your pendulum went in the right direction even if we wouldn't get the location out of the Synod. Why construct a triangle instead of a circle? Dunno, I thought I'd try it. Red shrugged. 
wishing she could whip a smarter sounding answer out of her butt. There was a big section on crystal grids in the reading. Downturn triangles are better for feminine energy. It's why I switched it when you told me to look for myself. Trudy made a note on her pad. Interesting improv. Tell me a place you know, then scry for it. I'll cross-reference it. Trust that I can tell if you manipulate the pendulum. Quinn Investigations, Red said quietly, imagining opening the door to the front room with its squishy, sagging couch and the smell of Indian food from the restaurant next door. Lucas would sit with his feet up on the desk until Quinn fussed at him to take them down. Cases changed, and the takeout bounced between curry or lo mein, but that office remained the same. The pendulum swung wildly, then dropped on part of the map that she hoped was Culver City. Trudy nodded. Google says it's a notary's office, but you found it. Hannah slumped over her desk in that nearly boneless fashion that only teenagers and cats could pull off. I can scry, you know. I've been doing it since my witch bloom. Red remembered where she had heard that word before. Paranel mentioned... Paranel again? Red ignored it, telling herself to be nice. Trudy had just asked Hannah to scry for the childhood home where she found her entire family slaughtered. That was an ice-cold lesson. This sudden brattiness was annoying, but she had a feeling it came from a place of fear and loss. She steered the conversation away. What's a witch bloom? It's that very special time in a witch girl's life when she becomes a witch woman, Hannah snarked. The bard explained after a stern look at her charge. You may recall a time as a teen when your powers matured. Some mages report fantastic outbursts of magic, while others are just a little more moody. Like she would even... Huddled over her desktop, Hannah spun her golden poker chip key on its edge. She glanced up, stopping the spin with her palm. Never mind. Red rubbed the back of her neck, thankful that Hannah had kept her secret. She forced out a chuckle. High school is a blur. So what is next, Trudy? Let's go back to our breathing exercises. The young witch stood up, hands on hips. Ugh, I need to learn to fight, not meditate. You know what's out there waiting for me. I'm marked for destiny, remember? You're marked for death, and the school is a respite you may not know again, Miss Proctor. Use this time wisely. Trudy wagged a finger. You can't cultivate inner calm on a battlefield until you can do it in a classroom. This is a bunch of wax on, wax off karate kid bullshit that I don't need. Hannah grabbed her backpack, running from the room. Turning to go after her, Red didn't want the girl fleeing the academy again, or causing another explosion. Ruefully smiling, Trudy picked up the phone, waving it. I'll go. She'll talk to me because I have this. Red followed the bard to the door. I think she's more freaked out about the werewolves than she's telling us. The feud that killed off her folks started with a pack back home. Maybe go easy on the death stuff. It's almost the full moon. Every hero is marked for death. Trudy paused her quick clip into the hallway. The hall lighting reflected off her glasses, and the glare obscured her eyes. It's what they're chosen for. I would know. Red rubbed the goosebumps rising on her arms after that eerie ass remark, and she thought Vic could be blunt. She puffed out a heavy breath, drama fizzling the serenity she had honed through meditation. The day had packed more magic instruction in a few hours than she had experienced in her life. She hadn't used much magic but she felt more connected to it. The screen came to life on her phone. It was the Circe Casino, she answered, hands shaking. We have a package for you, ma'am, from Smith and Reaper. Would you like to pick it up at the front desk? Heart skipping, she choked back the sob that tried to escape and rattled off Vic's room number to send it there. Then she grabbed the box from the table and threw the scrying supplies in there. Hustling out the door, she dialed and tucked the phone between her neck and shoulder. Vic, you better be dressed and ready to open your door. Six. Uh, February 7th afternoon, the Las Vegas Strip, Circe Casino. 
Red bounced on the white duvet from the force of her jiggling knees, unable to keep still on the squishy bed. She beat the package to Vic's room in the casino side of the alchemist stronghold. The hotel tower was certainly in Las Vegas, judging by the view of the Bellagio Casino from his window. And so was her inheritance, finally. She had waited months. Now she just had to wait for a bellhop. Vic pulled a beer out of the mini-fridge under the muted TV. Chill out, dude. I can't chill out, she paced. I don't know what's in this box. Ever since Smith and Reaper told me I had an unexplained multi-million dollar inheritance, I've wondered where it came from. Sheila doesn't even know. The account has a fake name, and you tried to trace the money. It could be fey gold that some ancestor suckered a bank into taking decades ago. A knock on the door made her jump. She swallowed, her mouth suddenly dry. The only thing that's real is in this package. Answering the door, Vic came back with a bread box sized parcel, holding it away from him like a bomb, and placed it on the bed. Pulling a pocket knife off his belt, he cut a slit in the tape with the precision of a bomb specialist cutting denotation wires. It's not that big. She hovered over his shoulder. Her throat was too tight to speak. She revved up her spirit gaze. There were no sigils or strange energy traces on the cardboard. Were you supposed to get just one? He opened the box, pulling out the top layer of thick plastic bubble wrap. The inventory list was lost with just a mention of a... Red reached for a thick journal. The leather was flaked from age. Her heart raced. She hadn't expected a book. This could have all the answers. She set it aside tenderly on the bed, knowing there was more. Anticipation made her hands shake. She peeled back the bubble wrap over a smaller velvet box. A silver chain necklace lay inside. She stroked the old metal, finger pads finding the miniature carvings on the links. Oh, it's beautiful. Looks like it's for a dude. She glared at him, setting the jewelry box down. Vic put up his hands. Or your mom was a tomboy. Valid style choice. What's in the book? She opened it to see a blank, brittle page, turning the next empty one like it could dissolve. Her care turned desperate as she thumbed through it. A chill spread up her digits. She didn't trust herself to look at him as all her hopes shattered. Disappointment pressed on her chest like a dead weight. She sat down on the bed and hugged the unfilled book to her. It's all blank. Blank. It's all part of the mystery fun. Cheerful ploy failing, Vic tried a more consoling tone, towing the ground, head bowed. Hey, these are still clues. Red inhaled the dust from the old leather, blaming it for her sniffles. How many of these dead-end clues have we collected? I have a book, a necklace, some money. Lots of money. And some mumbo-jumbo I don't understand from a dead pilgrim. Don't forget that diner in Oregon that came to you in a dream. Neither of us have found it yet. It probably doesn't even exist. Red hugged the book tighter. She didn't know why she had been so foolish. Of course, this hadn't led anywhere. Every step toward her real family ended up being a slide back. Hey, we don't know anything for sure. You've been wanting to find your roots since we left the Midwest. Yeah, we got distracted in California because of vampire politics, but we can do it now. I know you wanted this box to explain everything, but maybe it might explain something. Vic pointed to the supplies she'd brought from the classroom. Now, you must have had an idea. Or that's just a girly craft project. She nodded and eased her death grip on the blank journal. Trudy taught me something today, or at least it finally clicked. I did a meditation before I scried earlier, so it might take me a few tries now. Vic watched her set up the scrying ritual on the desk. How is this going to go? I want to find who owned this before, or at least where they lived. Maybe if they're my family. That's a bit of a complicated ask. Maybe you can narrow it down. I ain't a mage, but I know you gotta ask for things specifically from the universe. Fine. I want to know where the last owner lived, then we can start researching there. She picked up the necklace and clutched it in her fist tried to focus on that intention. It wasn't a location or even a person she could picture, but she tried to make her desire as pure as possible. The pendulum curved around the map. 
Worries sank into her mind. What if her mystery ancestor hadn't lived in America? What if they still lived? Where were they now? The pendulum jerked toward Oregon before swinging down toward Vegas before curling in a confused loop over the west like an undecided bird. She sighed and dropped the pendulum. He asked softly, Why don't you try the journal? Red picked it up and tried to find whoever had possessed the journal before. The pendulum twisted in her grasp before skittering across the map and off the desk. She cursed. I can't do it. You can try again when you're calmer. Let's go down to the Nostradamus. Hell, we can leave the casino and hit another place. Maybe see one of those weird clown shows they have everywhere. Nah, I just... I'm just gonna go. Red set the journal and the necklace inside the box, then piled the map and crystals on top of it. She fled the room, not stopping when he called after her. The forced party vibe of the casino floor grated on her raw nerves as she weaved around staggering tourists with novelty cups. The latest vapid pop song blared from the speakers. Looking down, she didn't notice Ezra until she clipped him with her elbow. Red, are you okay? His quiet, gentle tone felt out of place in the brash intensity of the Circe Casino. It's my break, but I can make you a drink. Muttering an apology, she ducked past him. She scampered into a crowd of showgirls dressed like sexy ravens, hiding among their feathered bustles and headdresses. She filtered out of the flock by the disguised entrance to Pyramid Hall and stepped through the portal door and into the busy stream of customers weaving through the merchant carts, picking out chicken feet and bazaars. The banyan tree glowed in the center of the giant atrium. She tried to focus on that. It felt serene even to her chaotic mind. Ian Keeley strolled up on her left, tipping his black bowler hat to reveal a smile. Keeping your nose clean, Red, she bit her tongue, suppressing the urge to tell the campus cop to stuff a donut in it. This wasn't the day for her to mingle with authority. Yeah, sure am, officer. At ease, newbie. What happened? Is it Proctor? No, more like crushing personal disappointment. Red shook her head and started walking toward the dormitories. Not an emergency. She barely noticed the grand staircase turning into an escalator, hoping that none of the alchemists noticed the witch trying not to lose her shit beside them. The next kindly acquaintance was going to get their head chewed off, and then she'd feel like a jerk on top of everything else. She burst into the suite at the top of the stairs and shut herself behind the French doors to her cubby room. Dry sobs exploded from her like racehorses out of the gate. Flopped on her bed, she finally stopped crying even as the sadness pressed down on her. Light peeked out under the door from the sweet sitting room. She lifted her head, finally noticing how dark it had gotten in her room. Hannah opened the door and peeked inside as she knocked. Hey, I saw... Red wiped the itchy tear flakes off of her flushing cheeks. She probably had raccoon eyes from the fallen mascara. Hannah came into the room and sat on the end of the bed. Head bowed, she fiddled with her hands. Is this about what happened today in class? I'm sorry. I was a huge dick. Brianna used to tell me I popped off too much, and then I would tell her to stop banging my brother. I guess she was right. It wasn't you. I just had a lot of stupid hopes in something, Red said, feeling numb after her crying jag. Sitting up, she sipped from a water bottle at her bedside. I finally got a package I was waiting for. I thought it would tell me who I was. Instead, I got a necklace and a bunch of blank pages to go with my blank memories. You thought you would learn more about your mom and make sense of what John Proctor said. Something like that. Red didn't know what she had been expecting. A big arrow on the map pointing to her family and a happy ending. She couldn't do the scrying spell. It probably only worked with Quinn Investigations because of how strong her memories were, fueled by the fresh grief and other emotions that the place stirred up. She was supposed to come from a line of witches, but was probably the worst one. An idea shone in Hannah's eyes. It's dinner time. The labs should be clear. Red flopped back down on her wrinkled duvet, elbow pillowed under her ear. I'm not studying tonight. Hannah held out her hand. 
Come on, you'll want to. Bring the necklace. Red groaned and let the girl pull her up, force her into shoes and out the door. The escalator spell was still on the brass staircase, so they zoomed down the ten floors. She propped herself up on the rail, dully staring at the passing stone walls and stained glass windows, and exited onto the flat ground at the base of the tower. So, what's the plan? I might be able to cheer you up. Hannah glanced around with her hands in her pockets, trying to look casual as she sidestepped to a crooked wall tapestry of Anne Boleyn. It's the least I can do for being a butthead. Sure. Red didn't have the heart to tell the kid that her innocent act sucked. Let's take the long way. Hannah slipped under the tapestry into a narrow passageway. Red ducked under the dusty fabric. The academy felt like an anthill when she was lost in the twisting halls, but she'd seen little pattern to the laboratories, personal quarters, and the guarded potions manufacturing line. Her memories weren't to be trusted, but she could have sworn the Tudor tapestry hadn't been near the staircase yesterday. She didn't recognize the low passage, but it had a darkness to it like the walls hadn't seen natural light in lift hymns. Only sporadic wall lamps, blown glass forming horned rabbits and other fantastic shapes, diffused the cavern like dimness. Watch out for the sigil. You can see it with your witch sight. Hannah pointed to a bear patch in the stone floor. You'll spend the rest of the day singing opera or trying to in fake Italian. Frowning, Red shuffled around the tiny symbol glowing on the floor. What happened in the lesson today? When I was a jerk, I don't know. I just kept thinking about last night. I was like a hero helping save that woman. That's how I should be all the time, but I'm not ready. The wolves are out there. I can't fight them yet. You have before. Hannah rolled her eyes. I freaked last time. I couldn't even remember any spells. Nearly lost my dagger. Even with those other attacks, it was Trudy who saved the day and brought me here, told me that I had a destiny. Her mouth twitched like the last word tasted bad. That's why you're here, why we're both here, to learn. Red shrugged. You should at least read the hero manual before going out into the field. You didn't. You've done so much without some mysterious hero destiny. Everyone sees that, even the immortal alchemist. Hey, I'm older than you. More time to do stupid shit and nearly die. Besides, that was scary with those wolves. You were right to be freaked. I needed to be saved because I couldn't put a scratch on them. Some hero. Hannah fell silent, leading up an invisible staircase, each step a big F you to gravity. Entering a trap door in the ceiling, they passed through a maze of hallways until stopping under a salamander light fixture. She reached for the door beside it. The keyhole over the knob puckered like an unimpressed mouth. A high-pitched French accent emerged from the hole. Name the daughter of Gorlois and Ygraine. Morgana Le Fay, ask me a hard one, Hannah answered, pushing the door open without resistance, and slipped inside. Now, I remember what the bottle looks like, but we have to search for it. Red sat on the long center work table. A tank full of moist ferns cast a weak purple light over strange copper equipment on the stuffed counters. The high shelf hummed behind her, the sound emanating from a softly glowing sphere. Neither light source dispelled the heavy shadows. She wanted to turn on a lamp, but didn't want a passerby to notice that someone was in a supposedly locked laboratory. Picking up a forgotten gray lighter, she lit a small candle on the desk. I've been a good sport about roaming the halls, but can you tell me why? The shadows faded as candles flicked to life on every surface. Ooh, nifty, Red said. She shook herself, remembering she was the adult in the room. I mean, why are we pulling a B&E &E in a locked laboratory? Hannah grabbed something off a counter shelf. We're breaking in because the alchemists have all the good shit, and they don't like to share. I saw a guest lecture by the guy working in here. He's doing some stuff about neuropathways, essentially jump-starting them. To unlock the mind, Red whispered, recognizing the humble bottle. She had accidentally stumbled upon Perinelle in this lab before her first lesson. After downing more failed potions for her memory loss than her stomach liked to remember, 
She hadn't really noticed it next to the harnessed sunshine. The anthemima draft. You wanted to dust off some memories, find out who you were before. Isn't that what you wanted? Red punched back the rising hope. Another personal disappointment would get her crying like a little girl again. Her cheeks burned as she thought of not just Ezra, but also the freaking Magikop seeing her sniffle. She'd been staked in the palm once and managed to banter until she passed out. That hurt like a son of bitch, but she could wrap her mind around it. She knew what it was, unlike the big hole in her existence that other people filled with family, preteen birthday parties, and thousands of other little moments that made them a real person. Some said what you didn't know couldn't hurt you. They were wrong. The journal and necklace were just one more tease from the universe. Red had once wanted to find her real identity to clear her name with the Brotherhood. At this point, she wasn't itching to run back after their rejection. If they wanted to kick her out because of a past life and not judge her present, then she'd make her own way. She had worked hard with an empath therapist to manage her panic attacks and process her crazy job. She was flush with cash even after paying an exorbitant Christmas hospital bill and had cobbled together a few good people, too. It wasn't like she could fit into whatever her old routine had been. She didn't need to know who she was to live a good life now. Each deed and hurt just a little bit more. She didn't feel ready to offer her heart up for the universe to stomp again. Was the truth even worth this emotional roller coaster? It was personal trivia. Except for one thing, her family. I thought you might want to remember your mom. John Proctor gave you the first clue about her. Maybe I'm supposed to give you another, Hannah said nervously, holding up the silver necklace. Red tensed, wondering how the other witch had guessed her next thought. Are you serious? Look at this place. You think they can't do it? Hannah put her hands on her hips and waited, letting her point sink in. The alchemist who made this, well, I saw his lecture on it. There's nothing dangerous in the ingredients. You just drink it, and someone guides you wherever you want to go as you sleep. It's all supposed to be in your subconscious. Sounds like something I did with a shaman. I got weird dreams and that's it, Red said. It had been an eerie experience that gave her past life deja vu when she met Lucas and Kristoff for the first time but it hadn't unlocked anything concrete from her mind, besides possibly some Spanish vocabulary. Hannah switched gears like a salesperson realizing she was losing the deal. And you don't need a shaman. I can do it. It's the least I can do for you saving my life and then me being a brat and stuff today. I've tried it all, dude. These alchemists aren't some redneck coven with only one good spell in Granny's grimoire. You've seen what they can do. Red didn't need to know her origins to prove anything. Most of the details wouldn't change her life. She could live without knowing her high school's mascot. Seeing her mother was different. Rubbing her face, she nodded. It was clear. She was a glutton for pain. This was at least quicker than brooding about the enthymema draft for a week before breaking down to try it. Okay, make me remember my mother's face. Hannah darted around the room, gathering crystals into her hoodie's front pocket, along with a piece of chalk, then grabbed two lit candles. I want to juice it up a bit. Alchemy is cool, but witchcraft is where it is at. Hissing as wax dripped on her fingers, she set the candles on the ground and assembled a small, sacred crystal circle around the flames. She chalked a sigil around the silver necklace and the ritual arrangement. Hey, I know you don't know me enough to trust me but I really believe this could help, and I'll do all the cleaning in our dorm for the next week if I'm wrong. Red sat cross-legged on the floor by the ring of crystals, resigning herself to disappointment. The candles flickered over white quartz, amethyst, and labradorite. Each one had some benefit to either cleanse negativity, protect, or boost her intuition. Why the witch washing on the alchemy? The guy said you could just drink it, but I figured I should amp the vibes with a ritual. Hannah settled on the other side of the candlelight. The light caught the honey strands in her braided brown hair. 
I'm using the necklace to refine the trance's focus. Loosen you up. Good idea, Red said. Her subconscious mind couldn't exactly unlock if her stressed-out consciousness fought it. Where did you learn this? It's an old one from my coven whenever we would do dream magic. My mom taught me. How to align yourself with the elements or tap into a crystal's vibration. These are just symbols, she told me. They hold power, but it's what we and the gods give them. A ritual is just a sequence of signs announcing what we want to the universe. Hannah touched a white quartz and a light flared within it. Her brown irises darkened to black. She held out the small bottle. Right now, we want to spark a memory. Red tipped the enthymema draft back like a shot of rot gut, throwing it over the tongue and down the gullet. She gagged at the inky taste, hunching over. Her belly gurgled, audibly protesting the vile fluid. She slapped her hand over her mouth. Her spirit gaze flipped on, the intricate symbols drawn into the ether pulsed, nearly blinding her. She laid back, covering her eyes. The crystals seemed to sing. Red, go to your mother. The teen sounded far away and wrapped in layers of cotton. She's in there. Go to the place where you left her. Red shuddered as her stomach churned. The usual kaleidoscope blacklight visuals of her third eye were in hyperdrive. Mystical energy raced over her like a meteor shower. Now I remember there's peyote in this, Hannah said and brought over a trash can. Red immediately puked into it like it was a spell. Her body sat up for a sip of offered water but her mind was miles away. Lying down, she closed her eyes and opened them to a completely different place, a kitchen. The room was filled with natural light streaming in from wide windows overlooking a fenced-in yard. It was so green outside. The room smelled like spring and pancakes. Her eyeballs shifted under her lids and the image blurred. Shadows lengthened to late afternoon. A woman appeared at the sink with her back turned. She hummed a familiar tune as she washed dishes. It was an old Tom Petty song, Learning to Fly. The woman whirled around. Darkness fogged over her face, leaving only veiled contours of cheeks. Where is my June bug? Go to her, look into her eyes. The order drifted like birdsong on a breeze. Your mother, can you see her? Red jerked herself up to walk through the kitchen. She left some of herself behind. Gliding like a spirit toward the woman that felt like home, she squinted, trying to make out the veiled features. Mom! The shadows retreated from a smile so like her own, even down to the little crooked curve to the right side. The eyes weren't green. They were brown and full of love. Mom raised her arms. Oh, Junebug! A yank on her spirit like a spelunker's lifeline tugged her out of the kitchen. Red floated in a dark abyss. Stacks of black and white TVs crackled to life. Each showed a different still image like broken tiles, torn lace, and a missing fence board in a big backyard. The screen started to move. She rocketed down through the bottomless pit like gravity was mad at here. The screens blurred, flailing her arms, fighting against the current. She tried to wish herself back into the kitchen. Nothing happened. Her mother was gone and Red wasn't powerful enough to find her. Conscious awareness landed with a plink, like a marble on a wooden track. Red tried to get up but only stumbled, kicking the crystals out of alignment. Kneeling, she hurled into a trash can like she had eaten old mini-market sushi. She collapsed on her side. The cool stone felt divine on her hot cheek. Reality whisked together with hallucination. She couldn't keep up with the images flapping against her brain with the urgency of a caged crow. Then the convulsing started. Big hands held her shoulders down as a worried faraway voice asked, Hannah, what happened to her? Do I need to get my mom? What about Vic? No. Red Rose hoisted in strong arms, yet she couldn't stop yearning for her mother's face. The shadows had almost cleared around it. Hallucination beat reality. The academy corridor transformed into the sunny kitchen. Then it shuddered like a video skipping. Tower walls and the brass staircase spun, but the images in her mind were even faster. Darkness crept into frame like fire eating away at film. A cemetery grew on a hill in the ashes. 
the tombstones blurred into a red booth in a diner. Three names were scratched into the underside. The montage moved too quick to read them. The bellow of the horn announced a new twist. A train chugged past darkened landscapes into a misty blackness that dissolved into a short man in a top hat and orange plaid suit. He scrawled names and numbers on the wall-sized green chalkboard. I see my name. Red lifted her arms like a swimmer breaching the surf. Waves churned in her ears. The vision dissolved like foam. A man in a white coat gripped her wrist, two fingers pressed on her pulse. Then a firm thumb slid her eyelid up. His pen light blinded her. He said, the worst of it is over. The charcoal elixir should soak up the rest. She screwed her eyes shut, curling on her side as the light moved on. Thank you, Dr. Finch, a foggy voice said close by. No, thank you. The high snicker drifted over her, muffled at the end by a cough. I mean, you're welcome. It's a shame how incompetently the 22nd alchemist brewed this potion. The voices faded as a door closed. Her lucidity flew away like a hat blown off in a breeze. She no longer cared. Reality could crumble if it led to her mother. That primal mammalian instinct drew her across the dystopian ranges of her subconscious. A blood-red sun set over a wide crimson river and seven hills. She shared wine with Lucas on a park bench overlooking a candlelit city beside dark waters. Gun blasts exploded the scene. The smoke cleared on a rain-drenched rooftop. Kristoff pulled her close, kissing her so deeply that her knees buckled. He disappeared as her heart thumped against his unmoving chest. She ran down an asylum hallway with Maxwell Baldacci behind her. Her mother's frightened warning echoed, Run, Junebug! Red jerked up in bed, head in her hands, screaming. Her heart raced like a spooked Mustang. She flinched from the hand on her shoulder. Isra shushed her, Hazel eyes scanning her sweetie face. He stroked her hair as he sat next to her sprawled legs on the bed. Hey, hey, you're safe! Head throbbing, she tried to figure out where she was. The room had stopped spinning enough for her to pick out her bedstand and clothes hanging in the corner. She gasped out, the academy. Yes, home. She glared at him. This wasn't her home. He dropped his hands. You're coming down from a trip. Hannah told me what was in that potion. It's just drugs. I thought I saw my mom. Red put her hand to mouth to hold back the dry sob. She felt wrung out and didn't even have tears to cry as she leaned into him. I can't remember her face now. Oh God, I know I saw her. Where did it go? Ezra patted her back. Shh, it's just the peyote playing tricks on you. I went to college in Vegas, so I've had a bad trip or two. Whatever you're feeling, it's temporary. Promise? I've got my pinky ready for it. He reached to grab her a glass of water from the bed stand. Sniffling, Red accepted it with a small sip. She figured she must have been coming out of it for the embarrassment to hit her. I'm sorry for screaming, then crying on you. You had a rough night, he said, taking the unsteady cup from her. I'm not at the bar, but I'm still ready to do the sympathetic bartender thing and listen to the tale. She studied his face. He meant it. She opened her mouth, not even knowing what she would say. Hannah rushed into the suite, slinging her backpack on the table in the sitting area. Oh my God, are you okay? Luckily, Ezra glared at the young witch like he wanted to throw the drink in her face. He set the glass down before he stood. How about you try to rest, Red? She nodded before slumping back on the pillow from a rush of vertigo. Closing her eyes, she felt like she would have to rest whether she wanted to or not. Heavy footsteps clomped away. The door closed with a soft click. Hannah's high voice drifted from the other part of the dorm suite. I got some food, but the sparkling water is shaken. I ran up the stairs when I heard the scream. I can't believe you didn't even know what was in that potion before you gave it to her, Ezra said. Disappointment etched into each word. You know how these alchemists brag in their guest lectures during ranking season. That could have killed her. Hannah's voice trembled. She wanted to. After you promised it would find her long-lost mom. I caught that much from her gibberish. You dangled the one thing she wants most in the world right in her face, 
and told her to trust you because you're a hero. He sounded farther away, his footsteps retreating. I'd tell my mom if you wouldn't both get into trouble. I used a good favor to get Dr. Finch to do a house call. An unseen door opened to the cawing of crows. Cawing grew in Red's ears as a current, blacker than a raven's wing, washed over her. A sparkle of pink lightning exploded from the hands of a hopeful-looking black girl. Follow me, she said. The howling wind stole a name from her throat. Red ran until they reached a cliff where burnt tree trunks cowered in submission. A portal grew below. Dark dreams oozed out of the rift in reality as the witching hour approached. She didn't remember any of it when she woke with Hannah curled up at the foot of her bed. After repeated apologies over breakfast, Red finally had to tell the kid to knock it off before they met Trudy for a lesson. Sure, the night hadn't been fun with her brain twisting itself into a Gordian knot. All said and done, she didn't understand the appeal of psychedelics. Her stomach still protested about anything more than toast and sparkling water. Tired, she didn't want to dwell on the magical peyote trip. She had been an eager accomplice in the dumb, desperate move, too. Basil had agreed when he visited them that morning to see if the experimental potion had done soul-deep damage. The soulmancer hadn't been as sympathetic as Ezra had been. He told Red to walk it off and be early to the auditorium this afternoon for her grand debut in his guest lecture. Hannah pushed open the door to their usual laboratory, where the wall-counter jungle of herbs and botanical specimens looked patchy on the empty side of the room. The sight of the potted living counterparts in front of the chalkboard solved that mystery. Hello, girls. Excited to help Basil with his presentation? Trudy placed a pot next to an arrangement of dried herbs on the table. She pushed her glasses up and inspected Red. You're looking a little pale. Have you been straining yourself with magic outside class? You caught me, Red said, sitting down. She'd rather cop to that lie than the truth. I appreciate your go-getter attitude, but there's a reason I assigned you more reading than practical projects to start with. Brute magical strength can only go so far. You need tools to achieve stamina and regulate your energy. Next week, I'll teach the concept of how to personalize a magical object or relic so you can imbue it with intention. Books, rings, and crystals can all become as useful and familiar as your hand when they are triggered for specific spells. Trudy gestured over the common bundles of dried sage and marigolds, then patted the springy living basil. White ghost flowers glowed by her elbow. Today we will cover the most common botanical defenses against the supernatural. Before we break for Basil's lecture, I want you to see your specimens. What can you identify? Red raised her hand. The door burst open. We need to talk, Vic said as he stomped inside, jabbing his finger out like a bayonet at the other bard. He glanced over his shoulder. So, buzz off, Hannah. Trudy nodded to her charge. Her face took on a fixed, patient cast, as if she was mentally counting to ten for serenity. She crossed her arms, glasses slipping down her nose to peer at him. Can I help you, Mr. Constantine? Your glasses make you look too smart to play dumb, Vic said, jerking his thumb at the exit as Hannah slowed to gawk. He waited for the girl to close the door. You got me kicked out of the Brotherhood. Excuse me? Trudy asked. Red demanded, what the hell are you talking about? He glared at her. I texted you, charge your phone. He shook his head, stepping up to Trudy like a dueler who had been waiting for high noon all morning. My login didn't work, so I called up HQ. Turns out it's not supposed to. Stiffened with righteous indignation, he raised his finger to the heavens. The plot friggin' thickens, madam. My man on the inside told me you made a complaint about me. Oh, that... Don't lie. I know how you career bards play politics. Hey, maybe this is just a mistake. Red tossed out the attempt at diplomacy with the timidity of a first-day zookeeper feeding hungry tigers. Would they calm down or want fresher meat? He veered his cynical gaze to her. No, this was by design. 
Trudy lowered her chained glasses. Certainly not. Vic began a slow clap, then leaned against the table, steel tension in the pose, tucking his hands under his arms. What a showing from the best of the best. You come out of retirement to mentor some big champion, and I roll in to save her. Maybe that was a blow to the ego. I don't know. I'm a dirtbag, and I don't have one. Drowning out Trudy's surprised, preposterous, Vic raised his voice. He dropped his arms, rocking on his heels. We have one disagreement over a fucking reading list, and you tattle on me. It's the straw that broke your camel toe, I guess. Trudy crossed her arms, nose wrinkling at his crude turn of phrase. You're the scion of the Constantine family with a legendary head bard in the family tree. How could I get you fired? I'm a bullshitter, and you know how the saying goes. You're in textbooks at the Brotherhood University. Don't deny it. They finally got the Golden Girl back in the fold, and I've always been a pain in their ass. You do the math. I told them you were rude when I reported your arrival. I didn't tell them to fire you. You shook my hand as I gave you everything on Frank Lopes. Some olive branch. He stalked out. His stomps rattled the plant pots in their trays on his way to the door. Red glanced between Trudy and Vic before she raced after him, passing Hannah eavesdropping in the hallway. She shrugged off the teen, tugging on her sleeve. Right now, all she could think about was him. What if it hadn't been the other bard that had gotten him fired? What if it was because of Red? Seven. February 8th afternoon, the Alchemy Academy, the Pyramid Hall, the Great Banyan Tree's mystical serenity couldn't distract Red from the hard truth. There was nothing she could say to comfort Vic, nothing that anyone could say. She might not have his deep ties to the Brotherhood, but she knew how cold it was outside the fold. They sat cross-legged in the center of the Academy Park. Hanging tree branches shielded them from the rest of the busy Pyramid Hall. A swan floated nearby in the pond, undisturbed by their anxious huddle. After recounting his call with the Bardnet IT guy, one of the few he had befriended during his brotherhood studies in London, he said, They ghosted on me. She brushed an anxious hand over the grass. You acted like you hated the brotherhood sometimes. Contemptuous of the bureaucracy, maybe. Not hated. That was my brother. Vic rubbed his melancholy eyes. Speaking of, he's in town for a conference, and I don't want you to tell him when you see him. He'll try to get me a job with his accounting firm. Red flashed him a crooked grin. You're a rebel in the supernatural gig economy like me now. He made a limp smile at hearing his own words repeated back at him. I bitched about them a lot, but all I can think about is what they did for me. The bounties, the information, the occasional backup. The mission, Henry thought he was handing it over when he made me family, but I already knew exactly what I wanted to be. Dad walked the line between the hunters and the bards. I fell off it. I was adopted into a long line of bards, a tradition, and I broke the streak. She brought her legs to her chest. What if it's not because of Trudy? What if it's because you work with me? They rejected me. Vic shook his head. Wouldn't they have fired me last month, then? I was the sponsor for your hunter's challenge. You at least got a form letter. They didn't even tell me. You like to take the blame for everything, but I've pissed off enough people. I bet it was some asshole from my school days who finally got promoted high enough to screw me over, and that narc provided the opportunity. Fat Crispin can help, right? She rested her head on her knees. The old bard was from one of the oldest brotherhood families. He had to have some pull. Could he help you? He stood, nervous energy agitating his aura. I need to walk. At least I still have that. Red sighed at the swans when he left. She pulled out her phone and called the Nostradamus lounge. Hey, this is a message for Ezra. Tell him to turn the other way if he sees Vic. The clock on the phone slapped her upside the head. The lecture was starting soon. She raced down the marble concourse off Pyramid Hall, ahead of the pack of adepts filtering their way to the auditorium. 
At the door, Basil checked his watch and adjusted a long string necklace of uncut emeralds over a fitted teal tunic shirt that reached the thighs of his jeans. I thought you were wearing a suit, Red asked. He hadn't been sure before if his California shaman style struck the right tone and vetoed all of Vic's pun suggestions in the name of professionalism. I thought you were going to be early. Fair enough. He pulled her into a hug, giving her a lingering squeeze. Excuse my nerves. Junebug? He pulled away, confused by the word, even as he said it. Your soul is projecting loud and clear. We don't have the time, but there is a lot going on with you, isn't there? You'll be able to sense Vic before you see him, too. She jammed her hands in her pockets to hide her nervousness. She had nearly forgotten all about this because of Vic, even after taking extra time on her makeup this morning. If I get a next lecture, I'll invite him. He shooed her closer to the stage. It's showtime. Red stood awkwardly beside the carpeted stage stairs as the last alchemist took their seats. She straightened her dark jeans and buttoned her black cardigan to the middle of her hunter green top. Her fingers twitched to fiddle more with the buttons. The presence of the audience felt as intense as a warding barrier spell. Open soul mancers were non-existent, and the house was packed to see one in person. This was a student body that asked for seconds of homework. Paranel strolled toward her, smelling like cocoa butter and mystical herbs. Her black chest tattoos were shiny in the light. She gestured to the seats, dark sleeves draping like a bat wing under her arm. I don't see Diego, but I am sure he will be pleased when he sees the crowd. Red partially shielded her eyes from the house lights, trying not to focus on the many faces. It looks like everyone in Vegas is here. What is the non-mage luck incantation for the theater? Eyebrows bouncing up, Paranel put her finger to her lips as she remembered. Break a leg! Red felt queasier when the immortal alchemist returned to her seat and Basil readying himself at the podium. Maybe she could break her leg literally, and not figuratively. That would get her out of this, right? The house lights went down, and a spotlight illuminated the soul mancer on the stage. Stray conversations petered out to silence. Basil began his lecture in hushed tones. Alchemy is a science. Soulmancy is an art. Alchemical symbols glimmered in the air behind him and faded into constellations. Gravitas stuck to him as tightly as his teal tunic. And what is the medium? Aristotle called it quintessence and proposed it as an element connecting us to the cosmos. Witches call it spirit. I didn't know what I wielded when my powers first awoke in me. In many ways, I still don't. I know it's grandeur, I know it's mystery, and today I want to share it with you. A figure in a gold suit in the stands drew Red's eye. It wasn't a random Elvis spotting. It was Diego Blanco slinking to an aisle chair, passing Trudy taking notes. Basil seemed to spot his frenemy. Perspiration beaded on his brow. He started again, voice growing stronger. Forgive my reliance on metaphor, but I can only explain the unexplained with what I know. I can tune into a soul like someone can tune into a radio station. The closer to humanoid a species is, the more I can read from the soul. Yes, the soul, and not the mind. Your mind is filled with the debris of today, like what you want for dinner and the Honda that cut you off in traffic. Your soul is imprinted with what matters. Common thought holds that the soul is immutable, and you are just born with this quintessence fully formed. Basil held his hand out to Red. Behold a human soul. She walked on the stage, mentally bracing herself like she was going to wrestle a troll naked. The spotlights beamed down on her, sweat rolled down her neck. How could it be so much hotter up here? He patted her shoulder, revealing a slight tremble to his hand. Walking away to the edge of the stage, he began again. Flavor it with magic. It's that sizzly to the steak. You all buzz with that little extra tang of the supernatural. Not only that, but you have dimension. The world has made an imprint on the blank slate you were born with. Basil held his hand up. The image behind him changed to show a lavender halo around his body. You can see it here. This is my aura. 
blown up and enlarged. Radiating off the invisible soul, the aura reveals the road damage. You can see the nicks and cuts on the edges. I've seen some things and it shows. He paused for the audience's chuckles. This is hers. A green aura, pulsed with veins of gold and purple, surrounded her. How had he convinced a magical AV tech to help him? Originally, he had a slideshow. Notice the smooth patches on the profile. The potential is there, but the experience isn't. What is that? He paused and waited to let the suspense build. She has some memory loss. Too many hits to the head as a hunter, I guess. Red tossed him a side eye. He was right, but he didn't have to say it. Soon, he discreetly waved her away. She walked down the stage steps with his voice echoing behind her. What does this mean for alchemy? What does this mean for soulmancy? I reject the common thought that our souls are fixed. I propose that the soul is something we co-create. Base metal to gold. You could call it transmutation. At the magical word, the alchemists leaned forward in their chairs as one. Now that I have your attention, I'll introduce myself. He grinned, chest heaving as he paused for dramatic effect. He took a deep breath and revealed his deepest truth without a visible twinge of fear. I am Basil Bansko, and I am a soulmancer. Red pumped her fist in the air, fighting the urge to clap. It could distract him, so she reeled in her inner cheerleader. She made her way to a side wall near the exit, as all the seats had been taken. He eased into a groove quickly, sharing his truth and a talent in that easy, fun, utterly Basil style. The lecture ended to thunderous applause. Diego was the first to clap as he trotted to the stage. He shook the soulmancer's hand and asked him to take audience queries. The question and answer portion stretched long after the talk had ended. Basil sat on the stage and breezily worked the crowd as if he had been giving interviews all his life. Red felt her energy waning. Reminding herself she had only promised him 15 minutes, she headed out of the auditorium. She slipped through an archway that almost always took her to the Circe Hotel lobby. Circulated recycled air wasn't going to cut it. She needed the fresh stuff. The archway pranked her, and she stepped outside the Nostradamus lounge into a cloud of secondhand cancer from a wandering cigar smoker. She flapped it away, annoyed. Ezra spotted her and waved as he approached. Hey, Red. Thanks for the heads up about Vic. I saw him before Hannah found me and spilled the story. He looked gnarly. She shrugged, her nervous edge softening around the kindly bartender. Whatever was going on with his mom, he had always been good to them. He had certainly come through last night. His snark is worse than his bite. Still, I'm sensitive. He smiled, shrugging. You look better than yesterday, but still a little peaked. Can I get you some coffee? My shift isn't for a bit, and I need the java. Coffee and food sounds great. After walking to the donut shop, she munched on her bare claw silently, as her stomach finally decided to be hungry. She studied a dealer at a poker table beyond the brass rail in the gaming area. I wonder if I'm good at that. Poker? You don't know, or you haven't tried. He grinned, brow puckering in amused intrigue as he dunked a donut in his coffee. I haven't tried. Sometimes I am weirdly good at things with the first go. I have a story about that with Spanish. She pulled herself away from card shark fantasies. There wasn't just an elephant in the room. It was on her chest. Did your mom really get Vic fired? Ezra finished his chew, staring into the distance. She's a hero even after years as a bard. When I was a kid, I wanted her to wear a cape. You get older and realize how complicated your parents are. I could get into it, but the short answer is, I don't think so. She has bigger things to worry about. They seemed chill to me all last week, but she wasn't happy when they first met. Not after Hannah got Gaga for the hunter's life. It's hard enough to keep a teenager penned up than add the romance of fighting monsters with a cute dude. Red made a face. Don't tell me she has a crush on him. Ezra shrugged. Vic is her every other word, but what do I know? I do know how much protecting Hannah means to my mom. That girl is her top priority. Because she lost her last hero? Know about that, huh? 
I am her son, but those champions were her kids too. The kids that never disappointed her by not being able to levitate the family dog. If you think she's demanding now, imagine it cranked up. Mom worked them hard because she cared. Field tests, pop quizzes, textbooks thicker than your bicep. She threw everything at them so they could live long enough to survive their destinies like her. Losing Melissa. It was hard, I bet. Understatement to the extreme. Maybe she had just been in the life too long. It broke something in her. That's the only reason she'd retire. I'm sure of it, Ezra said. He propped his elbow on the table and shrugged. Not that she talks about this stuff. I'm sorry. She had ripped her mind open, searching for her mother's face, but it was hard to imagine the next moment after that first hug. Would she be like Hannah, serene in her mother's love, or left with something more complicated like him? I'm guessing she didn't consult you. I hadn't talked to her in years before she retired. I grew up around hunters, but it wasn't for me. I'm sensitive, like I said. Ezra grinned, self-deprecation dripping on his last sentence. I don't know what it's like for you, but I know what it's like to want to know your mom and have her in your life. You guys seem tight enough now. You're all together here. Red assessed the casino and could imagine that after a bit, it could feel like a home. I don't live with my mother in the teacher housing. I have an apartment near the art school, I'll have you know. He chuckled. But yeah, it started with some phone calls, and then it was different. So much better. It's like I know her now. When she found Hannah, I told her exactly where to come. We're getting along finally, or maybe she needs a babysitter. You're doing a good job. Hannah seems to listen to you. That's flattery and you know it. She's a teenager, and they obey no god or man. She laughed, then stiffened as she looked over her shoulder. Intuition jabbed her, but there was only the usual parade of revelry between the gaming aisles. Still, I'm glad to have another babysitter to help. Even if you did take peyote on the job. He sipped his coffee to cover an amused snort. Laughing again, Red wagged her finger at him. That wasn't listed as an active ingredient. Besides, I've only had like one or two flashbacks since, you know. Lucas stalked into the donut shop area from the poker tables. Tousled black hair gleamed like a raven's wing in the flashy casino lights. A dark leather trench coat draped to his knees. It hung open to reveal the fitted navy turtleneck underneath. Red grew quiet at his approach. As if he conjured the memory, she remembered her fingers in his wild locks. It felt like a lifetime ago, like it belonged to Juniper St. James in the murky past. It had only been weeks ago. If it were up to her at the time, they could have continued as they were. He made the call. Was she angry? Attracted? She didn't know. Her split brain was only certain about feeling pity over his loss of Quinn. Mostly she was simply confused to see him in Las Vegas. Ezra looked up, expression growing cool on his watchful face, as he zeroed in on the vampire's unbreathing chest. Can I help you, stranger? Lucas flared his nostrils flaring to take in the man's scent before snorting lightly in dismissal. He snapped his head to her. We need to talk. Ezra met the challenge quite calmly for a guy who claimed to be too sensitive to be a hunter. Red, do you know this vamp, or should I call security? Embarrassment heated the back of her neck. I know him. Thanks for the coffee. Ezra smiled, but he still seemed wary. It was fun. I'll see you around. Lucas nodded towards the gaming floor. If you'll walk with me, Red? She retreated into the bustle of the casino floor with the silent vampire, trying to get lost among the anonymous faces illuminated by screens promising algorithmic luck. He walked with his hands in his pockets beside her. Something felt heavier about his aura. He had always had that tinge of sorrow shared by all good guy vamps, but it had been infused with an impulsive passion. He snarked, fought, and lived with his whole heart, even when it nearly killed him. Brooding contemplation hung over him now, as if his grandsire had bequeathed it along with the private investigation agency. You drove to Vegas must be important, Red prompted gently, fidgeting hands clasped behind her back so they couldn't betray her nerves. She tried not to think about how he hadn't texted her. 
not to say that he was coming or anything. She hadn't heard from him since she left Los Angeles. Was this some romantic gesture in the making? Her heart rose at the thought. Celine told me about a vision. She felt stupid suddenly. Oh. The last weeks had revealed new depths of disappointment for her when it came to her love life. Why would this be any different? She didn't know why she bothered to get her hopes up. He ruffled his hair, scanning for eavesdroppers. You're in danger. Something about werewolves or ghouls. It was murky, but she was freaked. Kept saying it was seen through the eyes of another, whatever that means. She might be late on that. Frank Lopes already attacked us with his gang, but they were gunning for my new roommate. Lucas stopped walking. I thought this was a vacation. I was accepted into the academy. Red shrugged away her premature defensiveness. She hadn't exactly given two weeks' notice to Quinn Investigations, but how could she? He hadn't been communicating with her. Warn a bloke that you're putting down stakes. You didn't reply to my last two texts or the call when I tried to reach out to see how you were. I was worried, but you have a lot going on. I got the unspoken message, so I didn't push it. She matched his stiff posy. I didn't enroll as an alchemist. I'm like an exchange student, I guess, for a bit. Not permanently. Deceptively casual, he scratched his temple, darting eyes avoiding her. You're rushing into this magic stuff quickly. Chewing the inside of her cheek until she trusted herself to speak, she made herself reply coolly, The immortal alchemist opened up her library to me. It was sudden, but I had to take the opportunity. I don't blame you for taking the job from Cora Moon and making a holiday of it. Last month was shit. Maybe you're getting the jollies you missed by losing the Brotherhood, but don't sink into the group think, he said with a hand jammed in his pocket, while the other gestured widely to the Casino Dazzly. Is that what you think of me? Red crossed her arms. She wasn't joining the Academy to join something. She didn't need a club sticker. If that's all she wanted, she would have remained one of Cora's pet humans. I'm making up for lost time. This magic is in me, whether I accept it or not, and life will be easier once I do. You didn't see half the times I got my ass kicked fighting the dog. I'm just lucky that Kristoff was there, too. The mood grew even more awkward. That name wasn't one they brought up. The relationship between Lucas and his progeny was as complicated as only two vampires who had loved and lost the same woman could be. In a past life as Juniper St. James, she had been Lucas's courtesan, but Kristoff had loved her terribly. Red's resistance hadn't stopped a pale echo of that cycle from continuing in her current life. Only a threat against millions of Californians got them to work together last time. Somehow, she felt like a soulmancer, reading the uncertainty and loss in Aura. His stormy gaze pulled her in. She stumbled over her words, leaning closer to him. Lucas, I don't want to fight. I'm... Vic ambled from behind a clump of slot machines. Finally, I found you. Diego is missing. He nodded to Lucas, gesturing them off the gaming floor toward a quiet corner between a gift shop and the Nostradamus lounge. They think he's holed up in a lab, working on his ranking, but I'm not sure. Red straightened, mine yanked from her own drama. How long has he been missing? Since he left post-lecture drinks with Basil. What if it was Trudy? Maybe he was rude to her too. She suggested dryly. Give it at least another hour before we accuse her of murder. He probably has better things to do than hear people fawn over Basil in a bar. Lucas punched his upper arm lightly. Yeah, put her out of your mind, mate. It's not worth it. She's been on your ass since you met. Red narrowed her eyes as the implications sank in like burning acid and pivoted to Vic. Why weren't you surprised to see him? And why is he already updated on your newest rivalry? The two men shared twin shifty expressions. Vic spoke slowly, but soon veered to throw Lucas under the metaphorical bus. I wanted to tell you when he showed up a few nights ago, but he said not to. She tried to do the funny calming breaths that her therapist recommended, complete with imagining a happy place. It didn't calm the angry pulse in her ears. 
Have you been sulking and guarding me all week, Lucas? More guarding than sulking. What made you talk to me tonight? Lucas glanced toward the Nostradamus lounge as Ezra entered it before he refocused on her. I don't know. I didn't plan on it. You know me, I don't always think. She thought she had an idea of what really compelled him. It wasn't a coffee date with Ezra, by the way. That's not it. It's not because of the boy. Vic seemed to visibly roll the idea around his head before he shrugged. Ezra. Oh. Hmm. I'm neutral on it. She rolled her eyes. Thanks for the endorsement for a guy I am not dating. Vic lifted his hands and backed away. So, this is getting personal. I'm going to mosey away now. We'll talk about this later. Red promised her mentor before turning to her soulful ex-boyfriend. She had spent the fall and winter chasing Lucas, feeling that spark between them, even as he felt conflicted on what he could offer her as a vampire. Push, pull. They hadn't named what they had, but when they had finally slept together, she'd thought something had solidified between them. Then it shattered. Lucas, I'm grateful when people try to help me, but I don't get what this is. I'm trying to protect you. Red tramped back a long sigh. I'm not annoyed by that part. You've been here for days, so I assume that's why Vic hasn't been trawling the city for the werewolves. You're doing it for him. Fat lot of good it's done me. They're lying low and away from the usual haunts. The alchemical synod already put the Vegas soups on alert. They run this town, so the pack must obey. Not sure if that stops the local whirs from sympathizing. Frank Lopes kills his own kind if the money is right. Doesn't make him popular. He's a hired assassin. They usually aren't, Red said. It was validating that the Lopes family weren't being helped by the other wolves. But now she had a new issue. What was she going to tell Ian when the Academy cop discovered the identity of the mysterious new vampire messing with his case? You don't seem worried. Selene saw you fighting for your life. Why should I be worried? I'm safe. She twirled her finger at the casino surroundings. There are guards who have his picture, protection wards, and magically locked doors. I spend most of my time in an academy where exam-stressed alchemists are ready to vanquish anyone who even coughs in the library. It's not like I doubt Celine's sight, but mistaken identity happens. Hannah is my build. She wore a red wig when we found her on the run. She might have seen that. It couldn't have been in the desert. My sire kept talking about tombstones and rain, and some of the vision could have been a bloody metaphor but it doesn't change that you were in it. Dying. Mission accomplished. Now I'm on guard. She tried to de-escalate the growing mutual frustration curling around them like the smoky air of the casino. Snipping at him wasn't what she wanted. Really, though, thanks for telling me. I get why you're worried, but once we found out Frank's identity, it was game over. They blew their only chance. These jobs fall apart without a payday. And how long will their client pay them to wait? The gendarme will find them soon. Those wolves could get desperate, then grab you, the little chosen one's buddy, to lure her out. That's what I'm trying to stop here. Vic agreed. Lucas lifted his palm as if offering the statement on a plate. Maybe he thought the Constantine seal of approval would change her mind. He could have told me that theory before I went to the mall. Red gritted her teeth as she held back the rest of the biting sarcasm. I appreciate the vision warning. I would have appreciated it sooner and with a lot less going behind my back. Were you even planning to tell me that you came? The whirls and beeps of gaming machines filled the silence between them. I'm taking that as a no. Lucas put his hands in his pockets. I thought space was better for you considering... You broke up with me? She chomped on her tongue to stop a half-baked remark about the sudden what's best for Red Committee. That's not it. I missed you. Not enough to talk to me until you saw me with another guy. You broke up with me. That was the decision you made for us. Remember that. She walked away, stiff-kneed, heart racing, and disappeared into the disguised doors to Pyramid Hall, where he couldn't follow. 
Not even the sight of the verdant banyan calmed her. Hannah rushed up to her eyes wide and watery. Red, before I tell you this, you have to know that I had nothing to do with it. I came as soon as Trudy told me. I hate this. It really freaking sucks. Ears still buzzing from Lucas's words, she snapped. What? We're going to be ranked tomorrow against each other. Eight. February 9th, early afternoon, the Alchemy Academy, Ranking Court. A wide, tarnished gate waited for Red in the Ranking Court. Its copper bars glinted like sharp teeth in a crooked smile. Spectral traces of ether floated through the slots. She had no idea what was in the gloom within, only that she had to face it without her hunter's kit, and competing against Hannah. Across the long chamber, nearly a football field away, the synod sat in judgment on high benches. Clerks with clipboards scurried underfoot. Magical barriers, glowing elongated golden bubbles covered the stands. People packed into either side of the ranking court in bleachers. Some held binoculars to better view over the tall fence that wrapped around the ranking field. They all looked hungry for the games to begin. Red was sick of staring at the starting line, too. It wasn't that she was pumped to crush the other witch in a contest. The ranking didn't mean anything to her, not like the hunter's challenge did. She had woken up ready to get this over with. Even before she'd turned on her phone to see all of Vic's text messages, she didn't even have Basil in the throng. The soulmancer had fallen sick this morning after his great academic debut yesterday. She knew he wasn't simply hung over because he would have come in sunglasses with a Bloody Mary. Her cheering section consisted of Vic muttering advice to her as he glared at Trudy. The competition stood a few yards to the right. Hannah sent anxious glances toward them. The stone-faced bard was in dark tweed, but her champion was outfitted for a fight in a padded turtleneck and knee pads over very aerodynamic-looking pants. When Red went shopping, it was for regular clothes. She didn't think she'd need to outfit herself for the Hunger Games. Now, she and Vic looked like they were representing the Redneck District. She definitely looked like his intern in her oldest jeans and denim jacket. A bullet hole marred the jacket, and the right armpit had given out in Santa Fe. She was fine if this and her North Dakota tourist t-shirt were ruined by yak bile or something else as equally weird. She had been dragging the old thing around since the nurses at the Eugene Hospital gave it to her. Technically, it was her first shirt after Vic found her, at least the first that she remembered. She tried not to be sentimental about it. This wasn't the time. She pressed her temples and tried to meditate. Lee rushed to them from the base of the high bleachers, a ranking volunteer pinned bright orange under their bow tie. The librarian puffed out of breath with a megaphone at their side. Sorry about the delay, folks. This ranking is unexpectedly well attended, but we have finished extending the protection wards for the spectators. Red huffed out a sigh. Finally. Vic started rubbing her shoulders like she was a boxer about to go into the ring. Now you gotta fly like a bat and sting like a porcupine. That's not even the quote, Muhammad Ali. Red tapped his hands away. After Hannah had told her yesterday about the surprise ranking, they were pulled into separate corners by their bards. Vic hadn't stopped hovering over her ever since. You're like my million dollar baby, he frowned. Scratch that, I just remembered how that ended. Man, Clint Eastwood's movies have been a bummer in this century. She shushed him, long skirt flowing behind her parallel step between the two bards and their witches. We have been ranking alchemists for millennia, but witches. That called for something new. After consultation with Ms. Fox, the Synod has designed three trials that appeal to both of your strengths and weakness. Vic muttered to Red. Bet she told the kid everything. Cheaters. Hannah looked stricken by his words. Red elbowed him. She had been thinking the same thing, but they didn't need to say it out loud right then. Perinel gave them one final warning. You will be evaluated on your speed and spell work, not collaboration. You'll find what you'll need inside. The copper gate slid open with a coffin's creak to reveal a small makeshift hall built from the same gray wood as the perimeter. Hannah and Red stepped up and exchanged a glance. Was this a maze? They had been forbidden to go up in the stands to peek. 
Vic shouted through cupped hands, it's timed. Red sprinted through the gate, turning right when the other witch went left and into a thin open air corridor. She dialed up her third eye. The alchemist murmured in the bleachers. If she lifted her head, she could see the top row where one man, surprisingly not Vic, yelled out indistinct suggestions. The sight was more distracting than anything else. Dropping her eyes to the ground to look for traps, she turned a corner. A hex circle drawn on the floor waited for her. She jumped over it. Landing in a crouch, her knee slapped the ground awkwardly, and she winced. She rose, yearning for knee pads, and pumped her arms for speed, ignoring the throb. A yelp rose from the other hall, and the crowd winced. She paused, glancing behind her, heart kicking up. It was Hannah. Should she go back to find her? It was every man for himself, but Red didn't like it. Go. Vic's amplified yell echoed above the din from a megaphone. Oh, shit, yeah. Here is your megaphone back, Lee. What? Turn it off? Huffing a weak chuckle, she shook her head and jogged down the corridor. The hallway opened into a long stone chamber. Thick fog split the room in the middle. Obscured, a staggering, shadowy figure lurched behind it. A pair of blue flame pillars burned, radiating heat on opposing walls. Surging, the fire pillars drew closed like stage curtains. The light flickered over a mystic jumble of items on two battered wooden tables. A raven's feather floated above each table. Red approached the alchemist laboratory set up slowly. The challenge was definitely to get past the fire, but how? She had feathers, tiny brown caraway seeds, white selenite, and charred bird bones. The assemblage blazed with energy in her spirit vision. She went to the closest table. A thick card with loopy handwriting rested next to a burnt beak. It read, you'll need to hold it up now. The spell ingredients shuffled themselves as the raven feather fluttered to the tabletop. Red grimaced. This was great. She had to float something. The last time she had done that half right was sending a stake against a baby vampire on her first night in L.A. It had nearly been her last in the city when she missed. Hannah staggered into the room, missing a knee pad, half a pant leg ripped away. Deep, angry scratches scored her skin. Red shot an encouraging smile at her. You okay? I'm fine, the teen said, breathing heavily through her nose in pain. She pointedly ignored her opponent to read the card and move crystals around on the table. All right, then. Red tried to rearrange the spell ingredients as she remembered them. Was it two circles inside an octagon or a square? The smooth caraway seeds bounced away from her fingers. She began to sweat, trying to recall magical correspondences. What the hell did caraway seeds do? Her magic kept slipping out of her grip. The hum of the crowd pulsed like cicadas. She tried to center herself to float the feather, but all she could hear were the spectators. And she thought the lectury was bad. The blue flame curtain budged an inch as Hannah lifted her feather. Red refocused, trying to remember all the breathing techniques Trudy had taught her with names she couldn't pronounce right. She slowly found her center, but she couldn't shake the anxiety as her feather lay there. The urge to shock it with her magic tempted her even though she knew it was stupid. This was a magic exam, and there were two more tests after this. She couldn't blow her entire energy load here. Hannah floated the feather above herself, her gaze fixed on it and backed up toward the opening fire. She slipped through a foot-wide gap. No one had said Red couldn't improvise. She ran to Hannah's abandoned table and grabbed more selenite. They were powerful amplifiers for magic. She arranged them in a triangle inside the circle. Breathing deep, she tried to rely on the crystals to anchor her to the ritual and boost her intention instead of throwing everything into it. She imagined her power moment and felt the magic ignite. Floating the feather above her head, she guided it to the blue flames. It was the magical equivalent of balancing an egg on a spoon. The fire curtain opened to billowing fog. Red ran through the miasma, sinking ankle deep in unseen swampy water. It was a cold shock to her system and goosebumps popped out on her arms. Rain pelted her as the fog thinned. A fence lined the perimeter but it was the only sign of the outside world. The dimensions of the place didn't make sense. 
It was like the alchemists had grown an expansive graveyard complete with a pond for the ranking. Rot perfumed the air. Two tombstones squatted on a low hill in the corner. Distant spooky iron gates lurked on the opposite side. Clouds and ravens drifted overhead in a simulated night sky. She tramped out of the bog, summoned by a piercing shriek as the haze cleared. Judging by the smell, she should have guessed what she'd find. Hannah screamed again. Two ghouls lurched toward the brunette teen in the distance, stretching their slimy arms out to snatch her. They had gray skin like the underside of a mushroom. Decay softened their figures, creating odd contours under their long, tattered tunics. Ghouls. Red friggin' hated ghouls. When normal humans thought about zombies, what they imagined were more like ghouls. Ravenous, mindless, undead creatures who infested cemeteries and had a bite that could rot a mortal from the inside out. She yearned for her big hunter's kit. It might have had an old packet of dried ghost flowers in it left over from a job in the south. Better yet, an axe to chop their heads off. That simple solution must not have been magical enough for the academy. Hannah raised her hand. Sparks rocketed from her palm like fireworks. They landed with a fizzle on the ghoul's moist, dead flesh. Just like werewolves, ghouls had a hide too thick for most magic to penetrate. No way! Red pushed through a cluster of reeds growing between slippery rocks. The razor edges nipped her denim jacket as she passed. I'm coming. The ghouls turned, putrefied maws opening in a silent hiss. Long, ever-growing hair, lanky and wet, drooped over their bloated faces as if they had been pulled from the bog. Startling, milky-white eyes protruded from darkened sockets. They were nearly indistinguishable except for a scrap of jawbone showing through one's cheek. Slow, mean, and stupid, they weren't the poster boys for object permanence and staggered toward Red, seemingly forgetting their other victim. Hard to kill, but easy to keep down. You just had to avoid their poisonous jaws, keep them at arm's length. Red tried to yell that advice, but the teen already did the exact opposite. Hannah hopped on a ghoul's back to stop its advance. The second lunged for her, mouth widening, distended jaws cracking. Red ran to the girl and barreled her shoulder into the attacking ghoul. A worm wiggled out of the hole in its cheek as if waving at her. She winced on impact. Her denim jacket squished against the lumpy, moist flesh, knocking the creature down. She rolled away into a somersault. Stumbling to her feet, she held her hands out for balance, scanning the boggy graveyard. What the hell could she use against these things? The ghoul lumbered after her. Don't get close to their mouths, she called over her shoulder to Hannah. The girl backed away from the ghoul. I can do this on my own. Red reminded herself that they weren't getting points on teamwork and ran past a dead tree, dried branches creaking under the weight of the assembled ravens. The beady black eyes watched her as intently as the alchemist's spectators had. The rain cleared. She zagged around a rabbit hole in the grass, smiling to hear the quiet oof of a tripping ghoul. The attention to detail. She had to give the alchemist their due on designing the field. She pivoted to the dead tree. Taking a running jump, she grabbed a branch, bark cutting into her palm. The ravens blasted out of the tree. She let herself drop. The branch bent, splintering as body weight and gravity snapped it. Grunting, she landed on her knees. She leapt up and brandished the branch like a spear, impaling the tottering ghoul at a run. She twisted her face away at the last second. The ghoul popped like a boil. Foul air and cold ooze splattered on her jacket. Nasty! Red pushed it away, shaking herself like a wet dog to get the funky gunk off her. A cheer echoed through the graveyard from an invisible crowd. That answered the question of if they could still see the challengers. Running to the cemetery gates, she stumbled at the screen behind her and screwed her eyes up to the simulated heavens. She could win this. Red looked back instead. At the edge of the bog, the last ghoul staggered toward the teen. Its shoulders were still slumped at a lopsided angle where she had hopped on him. Hannah kept stepping back deeper into the water. Red yelled, they can swim! Ghouls couldn't just swim, they were faster underwater than on land. 
It's why they loved lakes, ponds, and bayous. Louisiana might as well have been ghoul country. Running by the prone demon, she yanked the branch out of its chest to charge at the one still walking. It lurched to the side. Whatever was left of its rotting synapses seemed to remember how she had taken out its buddy. Puss yellow spittle dribbled from its silently howling mouth. Its lungs had long since dissolved into goop. Black pointed teeth jutted out of its rotted gums. She slammed the branch upside the ghoul's head, sending it flailing back into the sharp reeds. The ghoul flopped like a turtle on its back, arms catching on plants and palms as it slipped over the rocks. Hannah splashed out of the water, clinging to Red as they drew back toward the gate. Hey, you were brave out there, Red said. She held the trembling girl up, trying to sound mentorly, even as she checked over her shoulder on the ghoul, failing to pull itself out of the reeds. You had some good instincts. I had the wrong instincts. Hannah blushed, drawing back to trudge on her own weight through the ragged grasses. Yeah, next time do the opposite of everything you did. Red cringed, not knowing why she lied, except to comfort the kid after nearly being ghoul chow. It was a white lie that could get Hannah killed out of ignorance later. Okay, when you got nothing on you decapitate them with, the best thing to do with ghouls is pin them down and... Proving her point, a ghoul blocked their passage, weeping wound staining the center of his ragged tunic where the branch once impaled it, bulbous white peepers fixed on them. And make sure you keep them pinned. Red cursed, hurrying them back to the tombstones for cover. You got here first. Did you find any weapons? Hannah shook her head. So much for having all we needed. Red studied the graveyard. Perinel had promised. That meant something. She crushed a flower under her shoe as she crouched in the shadows. A delicate scent hovered above the putrid rot, ghost flowers. The whitish-blue flowers were in a cluster behind them. Red gathered a few blooms. We have exactly what we need. Shove this at them, right in the kisser. They can't stand the stuff. If we can make a... Grinning, she crushed the ghost flowers in her hands. The oily petals broke apart easily. She added a fistful of grave dirt to the mix. A ghoul hex. Vic taught me this in Louisiana. Hannah nodded, mimicking the action, tongue sticking out of her mouth in concentration. Red stood and rushed to the ghoul, hoping she was close enough. She ducked under its arms. The ghoul spun, wobbling as it went for her. She visualized the crystal grid on the work tables. The graveyard and the laboratory looked different, but it was still the same space even separated by a dramatic curtain. Imagining her power moment, she wound her magic out and whirled it over her head like a lasso. It shot through the mist over the bog into the gloom. She felt it latch against the ritual setup, ready for levitation, her intention pushed into the crystals. Red pitched the ghost flower hex at the ghoul, bespelling it to zoom the rest of the way into its gaping mouth. The crumbly dirt clump looped in the air, her aim would have been good enough to get her on the Academy softball team if they had one. It flew right into her ghoul's cake hole. Gagging, it dropped to the ground, its body sagging under the tunic as the flesh split. A sputter like a flopping accordion warbled into the night, stirring the ravens in the tree. The ghoul didn't get up. Lifting her eyebrows, Red looked back to tell Hannah that Perinel must have planted super-duper GMO ghost flowers. Her words died on her lips. Raven squawked a belated alarm. The second ghoul dropped on Hannah, escaped from the bog. Broken reeds stuck to its torn tunic. Mud speckled the rotting limbs. Spotted dead fingers dug into the teen's calf. She tripped on her injured leg, falling into the dirt and dry grass. Turning over, muddy hex ball oozing between her knuckles, she rolled away. Red grabbed the beast by its long hair. Strand stretching, it fought. She kicked its side. It was like kicking a balloon full of pudding. Hannah reared up, clutching her last knee pad with the ghost flower hex stuck to it. She slapped it over the ghoul's mouth, keeping her fingers shielded by the heavy plastic, forcing it to eat the hex ball. The ghoul convulsed and slumped, hanging by its hair. Panting, the witches stared at each other. 
The moment dragged on as the ravens chattered like the distant crowd, reminding them of the competition. Red dropped the ghoul to the side. Her last courtesy to her competitor was not dropping the ghoul on the teen. She bolted for the gate as it swung open. The unseen alchemists shrieked as one. It was her warning to duck. Red crouched, gawking. She didn't believe what came out of the gate even after a thick, malignant darkness swam over her head. The presence felt too big, like a giant trawled up from the depths and plopped into a goldfish tank. This wasn't a ghost. She could tell it had never been human. It merged with the impenetrable tenebrosity hiding the ceiling and the ranking court spectators. Trailing tentacles bobbled in the penumbra. A cunning round eye, bigger than a trash can, inspected her. Shades obscured the leviathan once more. Red shivered in her wet denim, suddenly chilled to her soul. A silent tweed-clad sentinel stood in the center of the newly revealed room. Trudy waited behind a podium encircled by bones. Her cerulean aura had darkened to navy. An open grimoire shimmered like murky light filtered through strange waters. Spectacles couldn't hide her fully black eyeballs. Dark veins emerged over her temples and the apples of her angular cheeks as if magic pulsed under the skin. Her raised fingers cast shadow claws on an open arched passage away behind her. The last door is unlocked if you can pass. The swirling tentacles whipped down. Red dived out of the way, skidding on her side, sliding easily on the stone floor from the ghoul goo and swamp muck. Racing into the room, Hannah paled, frozen, as the presence turned. The gloom churned, like an aquatic terror, disturbing the sediment. An outline of a broad-pointed fin jetted toward her. Red pushed the girl out of the way. She cringed as vaporous presence hit her instead, burning on impact. Round suckers drew her up toward a shadowy beak. Red flung herself away. Hobbling to her feet, she touched her arm and winced as the scorched denim jacket rubbed on her circular burns. Damn, Trudy. I heard you were good, but I didn't know you were Lovecrafty and horror good. And if this was a real battle, you would have shown your hand just then. Quell your emotions, Trudy said, an unearthly glare on her wide lens. Quips are for the desperate. Rub it in, then. Red said sardonically. A phantom appendage swung down as a reply. Red fell back against a black iron candelabra. The candles fell, their flaming wicks extinguished in the wax. Instinct took over. She swung the candlestick at it. The tentacle shied away. Red grinned manically at the candle holder, inspecting the metal. It was cold iron which, unlike regular iron, neutralized witchcraft. She propped herself up on the candelabra, feeling each bump and bruise as she stood up, silently cursing Hannah's youth. The kid probably bounced back like a beach ball. Hannah held her hands high. Energy, pearly white and swirling like the inside of a rose, flowed from her fingers. The shadows retreated as she walked with staggering steps around the grim circle to the archway. Red frowned, catching her breath. That was one way to do the thing. It still left their main problem as she saw it. She knew what she'd do in the field. It wouldn't win her any brownie points with her magic teacher, but Vic would love it. Hannah hissed as a shadow double slapped her wounded leg and exposed knee. She sagged to the floor. Fuck. Red sighed. Waving the candelabra over her head like a tennis racket, she rushed to the young witch. Over here! Drawing the shadow beast away, she zagged away from a tentacle to rush for the circle of bones. She couldn't just break the circle without releasing the leviathan. She needed to diffuse it with cold iron. The beast flailed above, curling and snapping. A feeler caught her on the ankle, searing the thin skin over the bone. Pain shot through her leg. It wanted to distract her. It knew she was close to winning. Red dove forward and slid on her chest candlestick out, greased on a trail of swamp and ghoul muck. Cracking the arranged bones like a bowling ball, she felt the cold iron neutralize it. The phantom creature vanished. Trudy's glasses slid down her nose, revealing determined black eyes. The grimoire flared like a comet shooting around a distant star. A dark orb grew above it. They locked eyes. Red bolted up and elbowed the bard into the podium. The grimoire toppled and closed with a snap. 
Sprinting for the archway, her feet didn't seem to touch the ground. She broke the threshold. The bright light of the auditorium blinded her after the darkness. The applause deafened. Red had won. She was the first witch. She hunched over, hands on her knees, panting like a smoker after a marathon. Straightening, she heaved out a wavering breath. Triumph faded as she smelled herself. Ghoul grime crusted the front of her old shirt. She tried to shake it off along with the swamp muck, then peeled off her beyond disgusting jacket and tossed it into a trash bin. She needed a bath in antibacterial gel. If she didn't have to live at this academy for a while, she would have been tempted to have ripped off the rest of her clothes too. It was Vegas after all. Vic jogged over to her. Booyah, that's my intern. Hannah staggered out, the blood on her injured leg brighter in the electric lights. Burnt holes spotted the arms of her turtleneck shirt. Ezra and Dr. Finch led her to a chair. Trudy strode out of the archway behind her charge. A sickly green mushroom cloud surged up behind her. The gray fencing fell in on itself and the swamp swirled like a released drain. Loud sucking battled with the cheers of the crowd. The cemetery ranking field disappeared, leaving a wood floor smoother and shinier than a basket court. Trudy's serious gaze met everyone's and no one's at the same time. Her eyeballs lightened from black to hazel, and the magic-juiced veins faded. She pivoted on her heels like a soldier, arms behind her back, and faced the far judges on the high seats. On the opposite end of the auditorium, the synod bent their heads together. Distance obscured their features more than their cloaks. Diego Blanco didn't pull down his hood and wink this time. Alchemists stirred in the bleachers, debates breaking out in the rows. Binoculars changed hands. A little man stood on a middle bench, only a head over his seated neighbor, waving a book. It's not over, sport fans. Red murmured to Vic, I don't get it. His voice came out low and quick like the flick of a switchblade. You won this. Everyone saw. Time passed slower in the spotlight. Her heartbeat in her ears drowned out the speculating crowd. She shivered, telling herself it was the wet, chafing denim that made her want to run. At last, Darius Jefferson, first alchemist of Las Vegas, rose to his feet and lowered his hood over his gray dreadlocks. He raised outspread fingers for silence, then bowed to the competitors across the ranking court. The rank of first witch goes to Hannah Proctor, nine is here nine, and in February 9th afternoon. The Alchemy Academy, ranking court. The first alchemist said it clearly. He said it firmly. He said it with a wizard's gravitas, projecting the words over the ranking court. He didn't need to paraphrase himself. Red got it the first time. She lost. The announcement rang out again for those in the cheap seats. Hannah Proctor has earned the rank of first witch. Vic stomped forward, pushing his trucker hat back so far it fell off his head. His fists swung at his side like waiting wrecking balls. The fuck she has! Come on, Vic, Red snapped, wanting to crawl away and hide. Her arm and ankle throbbed from her burns. She still had ghoul gunk on her shirt. The rest of her was soaked from the rainy swamp and now everyone was watching her mentor lose his shit like an angry parent, yelling at the ref at a little league game. The group around the first witch gaped at them. Hannah put her face in her hands. Ezra wrapped an arm around her, glaring at Vic. Dr. Finch paused in the act of spraying a green potion on the teen's injured leg, his pity focused on Red. Fighting the flush on her neck, Red looked away from the sympathy. She didn't care about this stupid ranking. It didn't stop the embarrassment when she noticed the small bookie collecting cash from scowling alchemists in the stands. Perinel approached them with a mediator's calm. You have words, Mr. Constantine. Vic bent to grab his hat from the ground, jamming it on his head. He jabbed a finger towards Red. My intern was robbed. Red stepped forward lifting her hand to block his puffed-out chest from getting closer to the alchemist. She flashed him a warning look. I think what my bard is trying to say. What did I do wrong? I got through the door first, Perinel said diplomatically. 
The Synod was grading you on your spell work as well as time. While I advocated for your innovation, Hannah's use of a shadow repellent was deemed more impressive and awarded more technical points. It's their rubric. He shook his head. It would have gotten her killed in the field. And what's more, you know it. Always go for the mage first. You've been around, lady. Couldn't you have advocated a little harder? You're the boss. Perinella's expression grew frosty. I am not a dictator. I allow the alchemical synods academic freedom on their campuses. I get it, Red said, even if it stung to lose points on a test. She tossed Vic a C, I'm fine look. It was a cool spell, wish I knew it. Perinel smiled and there was no pity in it, only respect. You were clever with your strengths, compensated for your weaknesses, and you showed compassion to a rival. Those were noted. Be proud of your performance. Vic looked ready to spit once the alchemist turned to walk back to the synod. We need to be good sports, Red pointed at him, raising two fingers to her eyes to show that she would be watching him. She shook her head, walking away. He was acting like he had lost. She was the damp, achy failure. Frowning, she wiped her hands absently on the cleanest patch of her jeans as she realized where his attitude was coming from. In his mind, he had lost to Trudy Fox. He had never been assigned a hero, deemed a wild card early on by the Brotherhood, even though he would have been great at it, in her opinion. This was a battle of the bards more than anything else. Red went over to Hannah and her bard to make peace. The girl had done some impressive magic and been brave in the graveyard, even if she had no idea what to do. Sure, she screamed a lot, but grown men pissed themselves at the sight of a ghoul. Not hop on them even with a leg clawed like Satan's cat had used it for a scratching post. Red said, Congratulations, I really mean it. That was some good spell work. She acknowledged Trudy, nodding. Both of you? Sheepishly, Hannah shook her hand. I guess. Thanks. Is Vic really mad? He'll get over it. Red reassured the girl, patting her shoulder. Hannah turned her gloomy, dirty face to him. Sure. The doctor spared Red from having to figure out if she should console the teen over a very unrequited crush. He handed over the medicinal spray bottle labeled with instructions, then led an arguing Hannah away. No first witch, you need to rest, not play with your phone. Once alone, Trudy pulled her glasses off. She tapped the oversized frames against her chest. A new consideration had settled in her deep-set gaze, as if she were looking at a peer, then a student. You did very well. Vic took Red's arm, teeth bared at the other bard. We have better places to be. Red smiled an apology for him. I need to get the ghoul bits off of me. Bye, Trudy. In silence, the two walked out of the ranking court and into the concourse with the departing crowd to Pyramid Hall. Alchemists in clusters and pairs debated the match like movie patrons streaming out to the parking lot. Snippets of conversation echoed on the marble. Did you see that conjuring? Now that Bard is really the first witch. The speculations and summaries swirled around Red. If her fingers weren't disgusting, she would have plugged her ears. She felt like a swamp creature in her soaked clothes, but kept her mud-flecked chin up. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be hungry after seeing those ghouls, but I'm so craving Vietnamese now, said a nearby black woman crowned by a colorful hair wrap as she checked her phone. Her friend squeaked, noticing Red, and pulled her away. That witch is looking at us. Do you think she heard me say... The voices lowered to whispers as the adepts fled with a giggle. Red picked up her pace. She didn't need to spend her 15 minutes of fame in the academy like this. How long do you think I'll get gawked at? Vic assured her. Less than a week. There are more rankings. A robed man groaned as he walked by. I can't believe how much I lost on that weakling. Did you see that levitation? His companion sighed. Yeah, me too. She blew it. What a poor excuse for a... Vic called out to them. Hey, I got a magic trick for you. The two men turned, sharing a nervous look. We don't need trouble, Red murmured to Vic. She wasn't interested in giving the rumor mill anything more to grind. 
Oh no, this will be fun. They'll love it. Vic nodded at the alchemist's gaze sharpening. You'll love it. Okay, the confused men said. Vic took off his hat and put his hand in it. Smiling wildly, he pulled his fist out like a magician with rabbit. He intoned the magic word. Abracadabra. His middle finger flipped up. Rolling their eyes, the two robed alchemists stalked off with irritated mutters. Red dipped her head to hide her grin. It was juvenile, but that was a benefit to having a best friend. They could be petty when you couldn't be. Vic slapped his hat back on. Shooting a tense smile at her, he lifted his hand as if he were going to punch her shoulder playfully as he usually did when he doled out an atta girl. His cringing eyes on her grody clothes, he redirected to a thumbs up. I know. I'm gross right now. I definitely have a bog smell. He sighed, walking into Pyramid Hall. You did good, Red. I don't want them to take that away from you. You should have been first witch. The ranking doesn't matter, she said, more concerned for him. I mean, it's a smack to the ego to get beat by an 18-year-old. I'm only human, I'll admit that. But she's been studying this stuff since she was a kid. It's not exactly a surprise that she can do some fancy magic. Fancy can get you killed, Vic said, pausing to glare up at the giant banyan tree. Ravens regarded him from the drooping branches. Even just the tactics in that last fight. She went for the distraction. You went straight for the problem. Red crossed her arms, soaked shirt clinging to her. Freezing in the air conditioning, she shivered. She told herself it was that and not the memory of that shadow presence, alien and sentient, above the circle of bones. Damn, Trudy is packing heat. I saw her witch fight when she saved that girl, but that was next level conjuring in there. Yeah, what the hell was that? You don't know, I thought she was in textbooks at the Bard University. I must have skipped that class. She was doing down and dirty shadow shit. What other tricks are up her sleeve? Red wanted to rub away the brewing headache in her temple, but she needed to bleach her hands first. They didn't need to rehash his suspicions. Trudy had gotten permission from the academy to do the spell, not dropped it in for kicks. She spun the conversation away. Are we still getting that victory dinner with Lashon? It's just a regular dinner now, but still. Do you even still want to? You know I need to eat after all that, Red reminded. He had seen her gnawing granola bars in the van, then passing out after using even a bit of magic. Tonight, she had outdone herself even if she lost. Plus, I love seeing Lash on. I just have to spray this medicine on me, pop an Advil, and shower. Actually, reverse the order. Meet you in the lobby after you change. Vic spun away to march to the portal platform. Red went up to her dorm suite, ignoring the stairs except to thank the one adept who turned the spiral dorm stairs into an escalator for her. She sighed in relief to see that Hannah hadn't returned yet. She had no hard feelings for the girl, but she wasn't up for conversation until she took care of herself. Her stiff upper lip was softening. Gingerly peeling off her clothes, she examined the burns on her arm and legs. They were shaped like a giant octopus's sucker. What hell dimension did Trudy conjure that thing from? She cranked down the shower's heat for the sake of her burns as she lathered, rinsed, and repeated to get the cold rain and ghoul grime off her. Maybe it was the fact that she had wrestled in the mud, but she couldn't just wear her usual black shirt and jeans. She had to look put together. The school seemed to be watching. She tossed on a cute top after she had sprayed on the rest of Dr. Finch's green potion. The medicine soothed the burns instantly. She dried her hair and dabbed on more makeup than she had worn in a week. Unable to wait until dinner, she nibbled on a handful of crackers in the sweets kitchenette. If she didn't, she'd feel unbalanced and twitchy while they waited for food. The magic lessons must have sunk in because she had regulated her energy well during her trials. She didn't have that usual flu feeling like when she had done magic in the past. She was just hungry, super hungry. Magic use could leave a witch unsettled until she balanced herself between the mystical and the mundane. She might not have gotten top marks for her magic, but she had used a lot tonight. Food, exercise, a long sleep, or sex— 
Things like that centered the energies of her physical body. A stake would do the trick, and if not, there was a dance floor in the Nostradamus. She didn't have a good option for the last sexy cure, so she didn't think about it. After tossing a stake and a small cylinder of wear mace in her black purse, she trotted out of the suite and down to the lobby of the Circe Casino. Vic pushed off from a pillar, not far from where they had seen Ezra in his one and only performance. Were we supposed to dress up? I felt the need to be groomed, she said primly, sweeping her hair over her shoulder. Red, a voice called behind her. LaShawn. She spun around and rushed up to the waving man in the sweater vest and thick black-framed glasses, giving him a hug. Vic had been taken in by LaShawn's father, Henry Constantine, when the boys were young. They had both been trained as hunters by their barred father, but LaShawn had forged his own path. She hadn't seen him since a hunt over a year ago in Utah. When some meth-dealing vampires put her in the hospital, he hadn't left her side. I need to breathe, he said, chuckling in her tight grip. Sure, sure. She pulled away to check him out. He looked so much like the few pictures she had seen of his black mother, but he had the late Henry Constantine's blue-gray eyes. His khakis and white-collared shirt looked crisp against his dark skin, but his face had a fatigued cast. She said, You look so business casual. That's the accountant's uniform. Lashon chuckled, an arm over her shoulder as he glanced around. Where is he? Vic stepped forward, smile almost shy. It's a Saturday. You could be casual casual, bro. I didn't even think. I was still looking for a wheel. LaShawn put a knuckle to his lips before he could finish the word. Happy tears shone in his eyes. He stared at Vic's legs before pulling him into a bear hug. Taller, he smushed his brother's face and mullet against his chest. Vic pushed away, wiping at his eyes roughly. He straightened his denim jacket. You can tell I got a new haircut then. LaShawn laughed. Tell me all about it over dinner. The last conference session went into overtime. I haven't had more than a banana since lunch. Vic leaned over and read the lanyard around the other man's neck. LaShawn Higgins? Using your mom's name? Professionally, yes. If you met the ghouls in my HR department, you'd want to keep the famed Constantine name out of it. He said it lightly, like a man stepping over a landmine. She tossed the segue like a lifeline to LaShawn. Speaking of ghouls, I fought some today. The accountant grinned, relief relaxing his posture. Regale me with the tail, at length. Their trio passed by the casino floor in the Nostradamus lounge on their way to the steak restaurant. They paused as a guard turned belligerent tourists away from a roped-off hallway. The annoyed leader of the booze crews knocked over a sign listing the new amenities under construction. Red tapped her foot impatiently. We don't need to watch them get 86 Vic. I'm starving. LaShawn, wiser than his brother in the face of a hangry woman, quickly had them seated at a booth in the dimly lit steakhouse. Soft jazz played over the soft conversations of the other well-dressed guests. She perched on the booth's edge, blurting out her order. Yes, rare is fine. Whatever gets it out quicker after Vic uncharacteristically took forever to figure out his order beside her. Bless him, LaShawn made his decision like a man who had already looked up the menu beforehand. The conversation turned to his work after the waitress left. He used a lot of terms she didn't understand with metaphors she didn't quite get about investments and spreadsheets. Something about deductions and subsidiaries. Nerdy, yet considerate. He was jazzed about his job, but also knew that few could withstand more than 15 minutes of it. He folded his hands on the table, smiling at Vic across the table. I know you don't want to hear about my conference, because even in a magical casino, it's still accounting. Tell me about your new case. How do you know there's a new case? Vic buttered up a piece of table bread in the time it took Red to inhale, too. There is always a new case. LaShawn said, smile slightly forced. What does the Brotherhood have you doing this time? Vic froze beside her on the booth bench. LaShawn poked at his mashed potatoes. Hopefully they're giving you health care now, considering everything that you've done for them. Red stuffed more bread into her mouth, 
because Vic had told her to zip her lips about his sacking. She tried to summon the waitress with her mind. It wasn't a spell, but their food arrived a minute later. Hunched over her steak, she chewed as Vic sweated over his answer. It's not the bards this time, even though there is one that I'd like to... Vic stabbed at his steak before he continued telling the story about Hannah and the Lopes gang. Well, you can't set out Wolfbane hidden in cans of dog food like you did when we were kids, Lashon said when his brother finished. Red enjoyed her meal and wine as she mostly listened to the banter, only adding the sporadic comment. Full and sleepy, she could almost ignore the returning ache to her burns. This easy conversation had been hard won. She remembered the brother's last fight in the hospital parking lot in Utah. She had been dipping in and out of a painkiller haze, but it had looked ugly from the front seat of the Millennium Falcon. The brothers worked like a well-oiled unit in a fight, yet something about that hunt had been too much for LaShawn, already half out of the life at that point. He had grabbed his go-bag, yelled something about Vic hunting instead of visiting the hospital, and left in a taxi. Then, radio silence. They'd only reconnected last month in Arizona. It made her heart feel fuller to see the two men getting along so well now. The men nearly arm-wrestled for the bill. I'm the big brother here! LaShawn dropped the cash directly into the waitress's hand with a word of thanks. He smiled. My firm pays better than the Brotherhood. Red elbowed Vic. She had a feeling about why it was so important for LaShawn to show he was doing all right out there. Brotherhood kids generally followed in their parents' footsteps. Let the big spender impress us. Vic hung his head over his beer glass. <laughs> I'm just a kept hunter here. <laughs> you told me your conspiracy theory about Red getting cheated out of glory, Lashawn commented between sips of espresso. My sympathies again. Red patted her stomach. The flan made up for it. Thank you. LaShawn propped his elbow on the table, shrugging. But I still don't get something. Why do you really hate this Trudy Fox, Vic? She got me fired from the Brotherhood. One too many complaints about being an asshole interfering with another bard's territory, I guess. That's great. I mean, it's awful, but now you're free. You did your tour of duty, and now you're out. Time for a normal life. Not the freak show that Dad set us up for. This is my normal life, Vic said, voice pitched dangerously low. Red felt the vibes curdle as the brothers squinted at each other from across the table. Vic had a very uncomplicated relationship with his adopted father. He idolized him. LaShawn had a far different view of their childhoods. Raised to fight demons, they had spent more time on the road than in school after LaShawn's mom died. She'd heard all about it in Utah. Vic jabbed his finger on the table. It was your normal life until you ran away. LaShawn shook his head, pushing his black glasses farther up his nose. I got away with all my limbs functioning. You almost didn't. Now's your chance. Vic cleared his throat. Red, I think me and my little brother need... Already gone. She got up and left with another muttered thank you. Fingers crossing, she hoped their fragile peace hadn't shattered. In the meantime, she needed to drop by the doctor before bed. Each step rubbed her clothes against the burns on her ankle and arms as she left the steak restaurant. It switched her focus from Vic's lousy day to her own. She needed to do something fun soon. Walking by a mural of the moon phases to a hidden door to the academy, she double-checked her mental calendar. It was a full moon tonight. Many werewolves could shift at any time, but they were strongest in the nights around the full moon. She didn't think the Lopes pack would be around for long, but she didn't want to worry about it. Merging into a crowd of people streaming out of the nearby casino theater, she noted the showtimes. There was enough in the Circe Casino and its secret academy to occupy her. If infection didn't carry her off first, she thought grimly, and trekked to Pyramid Hall and down a corridor toward the medical office. She didn't like thinking about the bacteria she rolled in during the ranking. The instructions for the medical spray recommended not bandaging the wounds, but she wasn't sure. She had run out of it anyway. The lights weren't on in either the medical office or the attached apothecary, but the door was unlocked. She poked her head in seed. It was dark except for a light shining from a cracked open door. 
at the end of a hall near the front desk of the lobby. A low voice echoed off the shiny floors. It was Dr. Finch. Red stalked toward the light, quiet so she didn't interrupt what she assumed was a phone call, while the man finished last-minute tasks. He had seemed sympathetic in the ranking court. She figured he wouldn't mind loading her up with more burn supplies. The doctor rattled off a list of potion ingredients as she crept to the ajar office door. That elixir will fortify you, but Ms. Fox, Dr. Finch said, his voice gentle even in reproach. You're a learned witch. You know what effect such powerful magic use has on your condition. Red pressed against the wall at the name, hiding out of sight in the hall. Did she just learn that Trudy was pregnant? How old was the bard? It's terminal cancer, doctor. The direction is the same, Trudy said, tone brisk as she dropped the mind-blowing statement. Ezra snapped, Well, the speed isn't, Mom! Red covered her gasp, her feet planted to the ground. Oh, shit. He was there, too? This was a family medical meeting. Hannah hadn't mentioned anything like this. Ezra said, I've gotten used to having you around, Mom. I'm ready to take care of you. You can take it easy now. I am not an invalid. I don't need a nurse, Trudy said coolly. Dr. Finch began, but rest is a senti. No! Ezra pitched his voice calm like a peacemaker, but a thread of fear masquerading as frustration wove through his words. Mom, I'm not dragging you to a hospice. I just don't want you to drain yourself summoning shadow creatures. I've saved up enough money. You can actually enjoy yourself for as long as you... He paused, audibly swallowing his sorrow to continue in a firmer voice. You don't need to work, is what I'm saying. Work? I have been called to my last service to the Brotherhood. It's an honor to answer that summons. You want to fight? Why not fight for your life? Ezra pleaded, tugging at Red's heart. I already fought for it. Then the cancer came back, and not even magic can stop it. Another round of chemo would sap my strength, and then what use would I be? Trudy said, cold logic chilling her blunt words. I'm here to train Hannah Proctor in whatever my order asks of me. You're thinking of my life. I'm thinking about my legacy. I'm thinking of my mother. Dr. Finch coughed, the sound desperate as if more for attention than any ailment. You are both right. The medicinal and the mystical have limitations that no reasonable person would pass. This is a time to make yourself comfortable, Ms. Fox. Comfort is secondary to the duty from my brotherhood. Hannah must not know. Mom! The sound of a shifting chair drifted through the cracked open door. Red seized up. They would find her eavesdropping once they opened the door. She could explain how she got there, but not why she stayed, except for morbid interest and horrified sympathy. Somehow she doubted that would go over well. She tiptoed back out of the medical office swiftly and closed the door quietly behind her to retreat to the pyramid. The sight of the banyan and the nesting swans didn't soothe her as usual, not after what she had heard. Forcing herself to slow down, Red tried not to look like she had just broken into the campus health center and violated doctor-patient confidentially. Nothing to see here, folks, just a witch on a walk. She tried to be discreet, but it was hard when conversations about her followed. Sadness hung over her, too thick for self-consciousness to penetrate. Ian saluted her, standing next to a female gendarme agent collecting silver poker chips from people disappearing through an archway. Red nodded, giving a little wave as she moved on. The night felt like too much suddenly. It wasn't the burns, it was everything else. She didn't look up until she had pushed open the door of her dorm suite, Hannah sat on the couch, brown hair pulled into a messy braid. Burn spray and a skincare collection lay on the small coffee table in front of her. She smiled tentatively. Raising a pack of makeup remover wipes, she pulled one out. We haven't had a chance to do my face cream blessing. Want to watch a movie with me and try one? That's the best thing I've heard today, Red said. She closed the door on all of tomorrow's worries. Ten. February 10th, morning, the Alchemy Academy, Attic Dormitory. 
The next day, Red woke to an excited voice message. It was Hannah. They had the day off and she was at the pool. It's so nice out. Grumbling, Red pressed her face to the pillow and texted back Blindley. She had been right. The teen had bounced back quickly from the ranking exam. She passed back out after that thought and didn't wake up until noon. After rummaging around the dorm suite kitchenette for food, Red decided she would see a movie, maybe even go wild and see two. Still grossed out by her encounter with the ghouls, she scrubbed hard again in the shower, avoiding the already scabbed over burns. She used more of Hannah's spray on them when she got out the shower. The afternoon came and went as she puttered around watching TV, checking her emails, and loafing on the couch. She enjoyed having nothing to do and nowhere to go. Eventually, movie time drew closer. She glammed up more than usual. It was like a date, but with herself. Smiling ruefully, she knew it was silly. Still, it was a treat-yourself day. She had gone shopping earlier in the week and splurged on a midnight blue skater-style dress. The saleswoman assured her that it was one of those classic pieces that could be dressed up or down. Hopefully it lasted at least a few months with Red's crazy life. She pulled it on and smoothed the A-line skirt flaring above her knee. The square neckline begged for a necklace. She lingered over the mysterious silver one from her inheritance in the jewelry box on her dresser. After the failed attempt at scrying, she had it scanned for magic. Nothing came up beyond that it had once been blessed. She set the necklace aside, not needing a reminder of how little progress she had made on identifying her family. Today was supposed to be fun. Red put on a cardigan instead and whisked out of the dorms to catch the latest mindless Hollywood action flick. A double feature and a lot of popcorn later, she walked out of the theater. She reached into her purse, idly wondering what Basil was up to. He was always good for happy hour. She didn't find her phone between the wooden stake and the wear-mace canister in her bag. Had she left it in the dorm or the theater bathroom? No, it was charging by the tea kettle. A shiver went up her spine, breaking her from her banal cascade of thoughts. Her witchy senses told her to beware. She scanned the tourists meandering around the casino for a threat until she found a familiar devil. It was impossible to mistake Kristoff Novak for anyone else, even in profile. Six foot four, dark blonde, and tieless in a gray suit that looked tailored by an artisan in Milan, he would stand out in any crowd. Her pulse jumped below his claim mark on her neck. She reminded herself that he was a murderer. On the phone, he didn't notice her. Tell Diego I can't wait for our meeting anymore. She should have walked away, but like always, curiosity made her stay. He had a knack for appearing when the trouble started. Kristoff hung up his phone when he spotted her. A soft smile of surprise spread across his face, deepening the cleft of his strong chin. His blue eyes twinkled. Filtering through the milling casino goers, she moved to him without thinking about it. What are you doing here, Mr. Novak? A bemused expression on his face, Kristoff pointed at a nearby sign by a roped-off corridor. It listed the upcoming opening of a new Club Voltava location, along with other attractions. She crossed her arms. You seem to open clubs where I live. This is a deal. A decade in the making. You're the one moving to be nearer to my clubs, obviously. I'm not moving here exactly, Red looked away, wishing she hadn't pulled her hair up into such a high ponytail. She usually saw him when she had a hunter's kit and some badass boots on not dolled up like on a date in a tight black cardigan. She had set up boundaries of professionalism between them. Each meeting wore that down. Let me guess, you're on another one of your famous jobs. I should thank whatever beast you must be tracking. You are infinitely more interesting than a meeting with an alchemist. She leapt onto talking about work. It was the safest topic with him. I'm not officially on a job, but if I was... I would be after a werewolf named Frank Lopes, assassin. He has a hit on the last Proctor witch. Know anything about him? Can't recall either name. Really? I thought you knew everyone. You haven't been to some underworld pit and overheard something about the whispering werewolf? Underworld pits? Where do you think I hang out? 
Christoph's amused tone and chill it as he brushed a lock of hair back off her shoulder. His touch was surprisingly warm. Did the wolf cause your burns? No. She tensed at a vision of Christoph's blood-flecked face rose in her mind. The montage shifted in that terrible, vertigo-inducing way it had in her potion trance days before. Crossbow firing, a rough hand taking hers, a rainy rooftop kiss that never happened. It spun together until it congealed to the scene of Christoph biting her in his L.A. office. She jerked herself out of the enthymema flashback. His gaze grew concerned. In case you're wondering, I don't need an assassin, especially not a werewolf. Red stepped back. He made it so easy to forget what he was, an unsold vampire. Even his touch confirmed that he had fed recently. Was it on a willing bleeder or an unsuspecting victim? With him, she couldn't be sure. No, you can do that yourself. Goodbye, Mr. Novak. You're still mad at me, or is it something else? She had trusted him with everything she had when she asked him to save Vic. All while Trey sat beaten and captive under the Club Voltava building in Los Angeles. He hadn't killed Trey, but he had stopped Red from saving him. The human had betrayed both hunters and vampires. He wouldn't have lasted long on the street. Still, she had wanted to give him a chance like they had sold Sal. Can you blame me after what I saw Donald do? That was on the orders of Cora Moon, the lovely dovey social justice vampire. We were extracting world-saving information, remember? It was personal to your friend, a lover's quarrel. Red sighed, shifting on her feet in the air-conditioned chill and wishing she had worn pants. I don't want to fight whether it's vampires, werewolves, or ghouls. I've had enough of that lately. If there is a ghoul hunt, the local supreme should know. It's the only things that the alchemists let the vampires do around here. Kristoff smirked. Even that I hear they supervise. They let you open a nightclub. How did Kristoff manage to maneuver so smoothly across supernatural lines? A diplomat for the supreme master vampire of Portland? She had seen his power flexes and behind-the-scenes schemes before. She thought it was only with other vampires. I'm a businessman. The alchemists appreciate the extra gold and my employees' well-trained silence. I'm not planning on moving here. I'm still not convinced you aren't. Knee-jerk defiance stoked. She lifted her chin to meet his eyes. I came to study. Good. You're ready for it. She tried not to smile, but her lips twitched up. Thanks. His jovial expression faded into annoyance. My sire is trying to hide behind a roulette wheel. She glanced over to find Lucas lurking like a weirdo. Great. Christoph scrutinized her, slow delight spreading over his face. He loved any chance to piss off his sire. Do you want me to get rid of him? You're both insufferable after the last couple of days I've had. Red didn't need to be pulled into their drama tonight, as the two scored points against each other in their eternal feud. She wasn't the first girl that they had fought over, or probably the last. She stomped away, lost in thought, until she realized she was turned around in the casino. She had meant to go to the donut shop, then find the secret door to the dorms. Pulling down her hair, she fluffed it up to cover her neck. She didn't need more dead guys drooling over her. A familiar young woman in a red hooded jacket dodged through the throng ahead. Red sighed when she saw the bulging bag on the teen's shoulder. She walked over to Hannah. What's the deal with the backpack? I'm not running, Hannah said, panicked eyes darting around as if for an exit. The thought had crossed my mind since you have a lot of supplies for just hanging out in the Circe. It's not what you think. You can come with me. The last time I followed you somewhere, I ended up tripping head over feet on a potion even Timothy Leary wouldn't take. I'm still getting flashbacks. I'm sorry about that, Hannah said, smiling awkwardly with a sheepish wrinkle of her nose. Did any memories pop up? No, just like an art film montage, courtesy of my subconscious. More random than anything else. Red said, listing off a few of the weirder ones like the slow-mo rabbits. There might have been something real among the surreal, but she still hadn't figured it out. 
A few of the visions, like kissing Kristoff, made her doubt the whole thing. That would never happen. Refocusing a laser stare, she wasn't letting the girl off the hook. We aren't talking about me. We're talking about what you're doing. Can I at least ask why you are dressed up? I spent how much of my life covered in demon goo? Today was supposed to be a treat yourself day. Of course, then I have to see... Red started to say, ready to unload about the stupidity of men and vampires. Then Hannah pulled her back behind the sign by an under-construction corridor. Vic and Lashon walked by heads bowed in conversation. <laughs> Hannah whispered, oh God, don't let him see me. He was so pissed. Just at life, not you, Red said. She let the blushing girl drag her around the ropes and into the hallway. They were between the theater and the stikusi. It was so easy to go in circles in the Circe. Still, Vic thinks I suck, that I'm some legacy witch riding on my name. He really doesn't think of you that much. Noticing the sad look on Hannah's face, she realized that wasn't the right thing to say. Did you take us here on purpose? They were in the underground passage to the under-construction hotel tower. Ceiling speakers pumped out the same soundtrack as the area behind them. Fresh paint scented the long hallway. None of the usual vibrant mystical artwork or knickknacks that defined the eclectic Circe Casino decor had been set up. It was like a face primed with foundation awaiting mascara and blush. Hannah said, We both know I wouldn't have gotten through the ghouls without you. That's why I have all this stuff with me. I need to practice. The library is full and so are the labs because of all the adepts studying for their rankings. You can't just do magic in a casino. We can in this one. Besides, this hallway's closed off and all the workmen are gone. Hannah patted her bag, grinning. I have chocolate too. Fine, let's start moving before a guard sees us, Red said. Or Lucas and Kristoff. She kept that last part to herself. That story could take a while, and she still held out hope to finish her treat day on a high note. Hannah took the lead, a victorious bounce in her step. You're being really cool about Trudy and the ranking. I came here to know more about myself, to learn. I know we're supposed to be rivals, but I'm not here for that. Let the alchemists be petty. They barely talk to us anyway. I'm fine with being second witch, Red said. It was the truth. After all the struggles in her life, she had learned not to sweat over things like this. She'd rather have a friend than a rival. Hannah looked down, chewing on her lip. I think everyone agreed with Vic. You're an 18-year-old without any field training who managed to hold off a ghoul and that crazy shadow spell Trudy threw at us. You're being hard on yourself. I'm supposed to be a hero. No, you're supposed to be dead a rough voice called out from the end of the hallway. Lanky, bearded, and a werewolf. It was one of the Lopes pack. He laughed at his own wit, slapping the knee of his black tracksuit. Scabs covered the side of his face where Red had sprayed him with wermace. Nuno or Paul, she didn't know. She only knew that her treat day was officially over. A cackling giggle replied from behind them. Gloria Lopez waved and blocked the way back to the distant casino gaming floor. Her tawny aura pulsed with the power of the full moon. In a black windbreaker and yoga pants, the fluorescent lights made her bleached hair seem white except for her dark roots. Scars rippled on her tan cheek. She had healed better than her brother. Help, Hannah yelled. We're in trouble. Gloria snarked. They can't hear you over the music in the casino, dumbass. The bearded wolf chortled. You've left the nest, baby bird. Red grabbed the other witch as the two werewolves jogged closer. A sickly feeling dropped into her gut when her spirit gaze beheld the walls, bare of sigils beyond one against fire. The corridor wasn't just missing artwork. The usual protection wards were absent. Bolting down the hall, she ran through a set of swinging double doors into a big chamber. She found a broom and shoved it through the looped door handles after she got the younger girl inside. Fuck. She had felt so safe with the alchemist that she had fallen out of the habit of wearing her belted hunter's kit. 
All she had was a steak and were mace in her purse, along with the wrappers from smuggled theater snacks. She hadn't brought the big can of were mace with its fire extinguisher spray either. This was the lady's purse version. The guy at the occult shop had thrown it in and failed to convince her to let him paint it pink. It would sting these wolves, but they had to be desperate to venture this far into the alchemist's den. Hannah dug into her backpack, more sensibly supplied. What do we do? This door won't hold long. They're hopped up on the full moon. We need to hold out until backup comes. I don't have my phone. Red rued her forgetfulness as she inspected their surroundings. An unfinished nightclub. A far section of lights behind the empty circular bar were left on like the last workman had forgotten on his way out. The illumination diffused over the expansive dance floor and stage. Everything was finished in the chamber, from the platformed glass DJ booth to a wall-spanning peacock mural. But there weren't even chairs or curtains, certainly not a phone. Sigils against theft and fire shone in the ether on the ceiling, reminding Red of their biggest problem. She whispered, the alchemists haven't installed the full security system yet. E shit. No sanctuary spell? Hannah groaned before catching herself. She steeled her round-cheeked face. Send Trudy a text, Red said. A muffled argument floated from the hallway. They sound like they're supposed to be waiting for someone. I doubt we'll like who it is. Hannah pawed through the small pocket of her backpack, pulling out her phone. She swiped her thumb on it to summon help. The screen died after flashing an ominous low battery symbol. Fuck. You didn't charge that thing? What kind of teenager are you? Get off your phone, get on your phone. Adults need to make up their mind. The doors rattled as the werewolves rapped on it. A snide masculine voice barked out a laugh. We don't have to huff and puff to blow this house down. Red put an arm around the teen to hustle her across the bar dance floor. We need to build a protection circle, and you're the better witch. They can't hear us, but the Gendarmi might notice some magic. Hannah nodded and climbed onto the stage. They raced to arrange the smoky quartz and onyx into a wide circle. Red set the last crystal in place as Hannah pulled a silver atami from her backpack. She guided the silver blade over the circle to seal the intention. Tell me you have some wolfsbane with you, Red said, rummaging through the backpack and coming up empty. Just her luck. Protection spells should be tailored to specific dark beings, or even a powerful mage could drain herself, maintaining it against attacks. This circle will be hard to keep up without it. I've done protection circles before. Hannah crossed her legs, sinking to the ground. She rolled her shoulders and tossed her brown braid back. The spectral traces of the protection spell rose from the circle in a wild hedge. Translucent, the mystical barrier had a faint pearly sheen. I can focus on blocking them without wolvesbane. You better because I can't. The swinging doors burst open and the werewolf siblings rushed in. I told you we needed to get a little closer, he said to his sister, rubbing his hands. Scabs pocked his cheek and forehead. You explain it to Dad just like that then. Gloria Lopes said sing-song, as if saying I told you so was one of her favorite hobbies. She unzipped her tracksuit and slithered out of the jacket and pants. Nude, her eyes bulged for a moment as she hunched over. Her brother ripped off his tracksuit jacket and let loose a low growl. The low pieces dropped to all fours. In the movies, werewolves just convulsed and grew fur. The strongest alphas might be able to shift parts of themselves seamlessly, but the full transformation for most wolves wasn't anything the movies had gotten right. Sweaty human flesh shone wetly in the light. It bubbled up like a pot was boiling inside. Wild rippled energy shone over them like dappled light in a forest. Twin grimaces crossed the siblings' faces. Their skin split along the spine, falling open like a pulled invisible zipper. It peeled back over muscles dark like aged sausage. Limbs shortening, fingers curling, and faces stretching out to snouts. The horrifying metamorphosis had its own terrible soundtrack of creaks and snaps. The power of the moon sped them through the agony. 
Red looked away. She had nearly pouqueted the first time she saw a werewolf shift. The poor Colorado Omega had taken 15 painful minutes. Wolf Wisdom held that the way back was always quicker, and the second shift of the night more so. It still looked like a bitch to go through. The last part was what turned her stomach. Vic described the motion as a reversible jacket designed in hell. She gagged, hearing the skin flip to shaggy fur with a disgusting splitch. Hannah gasped. The mystical barrier fell, energy slamming down to the crystals. Keep it up. Red gulped. The teen had to. The were-mace in her purse wouldn't hold the wolves for long. Judging by how quickly they could shift, they weren't weaklings. They would fight through it for victory or face their father after a retreat. She knew for a fact that she was less scary than Frank Lopes. The hedge-like protection barrier grew again, thickening with broad, jagged leaves and thorns. Larger than normal wolves in their animal form, the siblings darted forward on four legs. Red had a second to decide how to use the wear mace. Close your eyes, Hannah. Spraying the wear mace over the crystals, she hoped there was enough wolf's bane in the formula to work. Bits of silver dust and plant particles glittered on the wet, smoky quartz. She touched Hannah's shoulder, thinking of her power moment. If she could put Maxwell Baldacci in hell, where he belonged, she could send these mutts to the doghouse. On the transparent hedges protecting the two witches, glowing bunches of tiny white flowers bloomed. The crystal circle drew power from the wolf spain. Silver and other ingredients in the wear mace packed their own punch. This might just hold them. The wolves drew up on their hindquarters as they approached the barrier. They could sense the wolfsbane. Their darting eyes flashed silver as they shied away. Wheezing through their noses like they were trying to expel the scent, they circled the nightclub. Red wished she knew a spell she could cast simultaneously, but all her attention was going toward the barrier. It gnawed at her to stay still. She could hold her own against two wolves with the silver athame long enough to get to the casino, but she couldn't do it while protecting Hannah. The smaller wolf disappeared, and a nude woman popped up in its place. Gloria sauntered around the edge of the stage, running her fingers along it. Bleached hair ran over her breasts like an 80s Lady Godiva. She averted her gaze, her eyes watering from the fumes from the wear mace. A sharp grin curved through her cheek scars. You have to know that this is the end of the line. Hollered for help, made some flashy magic, and still no gendarme. This trick lasts as long as you do. And you two aren't looking so hot. Okay, Scarface, Hannah huffed. The hedges shrank, and the large male wolf prowled closer to the foot of the stage steps. See? Look at that. Tsk. Tsk, Gloria said, curiously still not looking at them head on. Ignore the villain banter, Red said, gripping Hannah's shoulder, inching more magic into the protection circle. She kept a firm hold of her energy as if she was feeding rope into a straining pulley. You're already slipping. It's a full moon. You do the math, Gloria reasoned, voice syrupy like they were all just a couple of girlfriends at brunch. Her wolf brother stalked in the background. We can make it quick for you and let your pal go back to her bard. Hannah paled, looking at Red. She mouthed the words, I could save you. Red shook her head. She had been forced by a psychopath to make the same decision between herself and a friend before. It wasn't right, and it wasn't fair. It was a deal where the house always won. She wasn't going to let Hannah make her mistakes. Flipping the wolf off, she channeled her best Vic Constantine. She's young, but neither of us were born yesterday, sister, Gloria growled. Slow death is fine with me. Our daddy is on the way with Paul, and you'll wish it was just us again. Red propped her hand on her hip. So the bearded son was Nuno, and the bald one was Paul. Stalling, she put half a mind to the conversation and kept her magic spooling into the protection circle with the other half. Frank Lopes is a psycho, but he'll know how stupid your plan is. He's not coming. You're going to face a world of scary weird when the gendarme come rushing in. They don't really have this place locked down as much as they think, Gloria cackled, the self-satisfied hag. We can stay here longer than you can, Gloria. 
My daddy's not scared. He's been at this game a long time, taken down better mages. He has his own good luck charm, too. He stole it from the oldest wolf mage any pack has ever seen. Well, he was until daddy killed Archibald Fowler himself. The she-wolf said the name like they should one, care, two, be impressed, and three, start pleading for mercy now. Red had never heard of him. Vic was the one with the werewolf obsession. OMG, no one cares about your dad. Hannah snarked with all the cutting apathy of a teenager. Tough little Proctor, you should care about my daddy, girl. Gloria bobbed her head, teeth bared. Her eyes flashed silver. He killed yours. Silence dropped on the cavernous nightclub before the low howl of the male wolf echoed on the walls. Razor leaves and thistles jutted from the mystical translucent energy surrounding their sacred circle. A jolt of emotion made it shudder. Hannah stuttered. You're lying. Red touched the teen's shoulder, not sure how to say that the hurtful thing sounded like the truth even on a liar's tongue. She summoned up more of her energy in reserve, hoping to all the gods that Hannah kept up her end of the protection spell. It's some straight-up realness. Gloria laughed like a hyena. She propped her chin on her knuckles, leaning on the stage edge. But when she looked at Hannah, the protection circle spurred her to look away quickly. Still, she looked entirely too smug, even in profile. Your daddy was the first to die in that nasty feud, right? Don't let her distract you, Red said, knowing it was futile. Few could hold it together after a truth bomb like that. She had researched the fall of the Proctors. Joseph Proctor had died weeks before the others. Gloria rubbed her hands, relishing dishing out the gossip. Well, the pedo alpha hadn't wanted to dirty his hands that early, so he called us into Oklahoma. Thought a fresh body would make your coven give up your brother's wolf girlfriend. I guess Hector had a use for Brianna even after she grew up. You're lying! Hannah's yell came out like a sob. You bitch! They found him slumped over in his car with his brains all over his yellow sweater, right? The wolf grinned, showing her canines. I remember because I thought it was hideous with that puff paint on it. World's best, Dad. Did you decorate it? Hannah lunged forward from her sitting position. It was for Father's Day. Red pulled her back. Be cool. Don't... A forgotten silver athame levitated from the stage floor to rocket at the werewolves. The protection spell faded in its wake. Gloria grabbed the blade in midair. Sizzling in her palm, she threw it, shattering the glass wall of the raised DJ booth. She swung her leg up over the stage. Red sprayed the female wolf in the face with the last of the weremace. She should have preserved it, but she was pissed on Hannah's behalf. Gloria fell back on the ground, crying out. She hobbled over to the bar, leaping over to the sink. Her brother loped on all fours up the stage stairs towards the witches. Red tossed the can, pinging it off the wolf's head, and dropped back into the circle. She tried to raise the barrier by herself, heart thumping from the effort. It was too weak without Hannah. They had Gloria on the ropes, more concerned with splashing water on her face, but they still had Nuno, and whoever else in the family was dumb enough to show up next. The wolf ran forward, whimpering when he hit the half barrier. Red shook the teen out of her frozen pose. Help me! They killed my dad! Hannah gritted out. Sparks shot from her fingers. They bounced uselessly off Nuno's thick wolf skin. The girl was too strung out on grief and anger to conjure anything powerful enough to penetrate a supernatural hide. Then use it to fuel the protection circle. Red sweated winding her energy to power the ward. Without help, the hedge looked patchy and withered. Be smart, Hannah pointed, lips trembling. Nuno had shifted back into a human. Suddenly, on the edge of the crystals, he grabbed Red by the neck through a hole in the barrier and squeezed. Boo! Red gagged. Primal panic flooded her system as her airway snapped shut. Her feet lifted off the ground, throat holding the full weight of her body. He pulled her out of the circle. His skin bubbled up as it brushed the top of the barrier. He held her aloft like a duck hunter examining his catch. Light-headed and feet dangling, Red tugged at his steely fingers. 
She choked, extremities growing chill from lack of oxygen. Dull blotches marred her vision. She slammed her fist against his unyielding thick wrist. Calling out to his sister, he wrinkled his nose. I expected her to look tougher. Kind of innocent looking up close. Like that one chick in that show. You know the one? Just kill her, Gloria yelled from the sink. Her eyes turned silver. She convulsed, back arching before she dropped to the ground, preparing to shift. He shrugged and his grip turned deadly. I'll remember it later. Red kicked him hard in the nuts. In fashionable flats, instead of her usual boots, the pointed toes still dug deep into his tender and very exposed flesh. Eyes bulging, Nuno cupped his testicles. His mouth opened into a pained, silent O. Shield yourself, Red croaked to Hannah, jerking away, leaving her cardigan behind in the wolf's grip. The werewolf paled under his beard and back away from Red. She's a bleeder, claimed. Look at her neck. Did you know, sis? Yeah, I have a big vampire boyfriend who's going to kick your ass. Red lied as loudly as she could through traumatized vocal cords. She leapt back into the sanctuary of the sacred circle. Dropping to her knees to take Hannah's hand, she rested her forehead on the girl's shoulder, catching her breath. A canine yelp echoed in the nightclub. Fur flying, Gloria slammed against the wall, dropping into a heap. Her ears flopped at an awkward angle. She staggered to her feet. Nuno backed away toward his sister. Kristoff smirked at Red, adjusting his suit jacket. A silver-plated baseball bat rested on his shoulder. He swung and hit a charging werewolf upside the head. I'm your boyfriend now, Red. Moving a bit fast, are we? Don't start. She put her hand to her pounding chest. They were saved. Her relieved smile felt goofy, but she couldn't stop. Backup was a soulless monster in a great suit, but it was here. Blue eyes turning amber, Kristoff pointed his baseball bat at the wolves. He snapped his fangs out to reveal his real weapon. Who the fuck is challenging my claim? Nuno bolted for the door. Intercepting the wolf in a blurred sprint, Kristoff swung his arms like a heavy hitter ready for the pitch. The bat whipped toward Nuno, cracking the air. A flash blinded her spirit gaze. Red squinted against the mystical explosion. Kristoff rocketed backward, cracking the peacock mural on impact. Red rushed to him. Nuno transformed, skin squelching as he hobbled on all fours in mid-shift out the door. Gloria disappeared down the hall in front of him. Hannah called from the circle. The alchemists put an anti-violence ward up. They must be coming. Dusting himself off, Kristoff met Red in the center of the dance floor. He cupped her cheek, swiftly cataloging her injuries. She knew she should pull away, but his touch relaxed the defensive edge to her frame. The adrenaline and fear still made her pulse jump. She had done so much magic tonight. It had taken all her skill and nearly all her energy, and it had almost not been enough. Kristoff growled under his breath and sped after the wolves. Eyes drooping half-closed, red sighed. She turned back to the other witch and picked up her purse, looping it over her shoulder. Let's get back to the academy. He's mad enough to take them out himself. Hannah nodded and hopped from the stage with her backpack. Oh, my eighth Amy. You can get it later, along with the rest of this stuff. Red put an arm around her, fleeing down the hall. You did good. Ian Kelly trooped at the head of a group of gendarmes in black bowler hats. His trench coat barely covered the pouches and vials on a utility belt studded with onyx that glittered to her third eye. Where are the intruders? They went down the hall in wolf form, Red said, slowing to a walk as the gendarme passed her. Hannah sniffed and wiped her eyes. Her face grew serious, mouth puckering as if she struggled to give voice to her thoughts. What is it? You can tell me, Red asked, gently. She'd been there for the big reveal about Hannah's father, but she wanted to let the other witch express herself in her own words. Gloria Lopez had lobbed that truth grenade, hoping for an explosion. She had gotten an ah me instead. Hannah looked away. How did you know to use that spray? I freestyled. Red shrugged, suspecting the kid had just blurted out something random to keep from fessing up her feelings. 
I gave the protection spell a kick with the silver dust and cold iron in it. It's a home brew I bought in some shady gun shop, so who knows what was in it. Christoph walked up behind them, annoyance etched into the hard line of his jaw. The protection ward works in the parking lot, too. They slipped out of my grip and nearly caused a car accident on the strip. Red smiled. Thanks for trying. Was... Are you really her boyfriend? Hannah interrupted, checking him out. Like, I'm cool with it, but I don't get how the invitation thing works when you have a doormate. Can you come into my room without invitation, or is that a separate domain? We aren't dating at all, past or present, Red said tightly as they walked toward the casino floor. The sounds of jackpots already echoed in the hallway. Hey, go ahead and charge your phone to tell Trudy. Hannah shot a curious glance at him, then ran ahead. He smirked. You neglected to mention the future in that statement. Ask a seer about that, Red said. The future confused her at the best of times. This was a night she couldn't have predicted. Normally, this is where I'd say thank you for the assist. Instead, I ask, how did you find us? I heard glass breaking from the club office, called the gendarme, then checked out the nightclub security feed. It was quite the floor show. I'm not sure how my opening day headliner can compete. I'm grateful you're a workaholic working through your lunch break then. Speaking of lunch, Kristoff bit his mischievous bottom lip. I didn't have one. You'll find it somewhere else then. She crossed her arms to muffle her heartbeat. She'd had almost a few days without thinking about the last time he had fed off her. His dark gift was healing, but the more insidious one was his bite. Most vampires could put their victims in a thrall due to their transformed fangs, which shot out paralyzing venom. Kristoff made you want to stay in the thrall. I wouldn't want to tick off a witch. He leaned in closer, arms behind his back, a corner of his mouth curling up. The silver in his purple aura brightened in her spirit gaze. A strange lightheadedness fell over Red. The floor tilted as she slumped. The heat of a soft morning sunbeam radiated on her face as the din of the casino disappeared at the sound of a door snapping shut, as if right next to her ear. The background blurred as she felt herself drawn against Kristoff. In her mind's eye, he wore a different suit. His face was softer, as if the emotional shields had finally fallen. He pulled her closer and kissed her deep enough to steal her breath with the force of his yearning. She gasped as the vision retreated. The real Kristoff wrapped one arm around her as he tipped her chin up. This is the second time that I've seen you turn faint tonight. Why? She couldn't look away from his lips. Was that vision something the enthymema potion had unlocked from her past life as Juniper? It's either the magic drain or a peyote flashback. Long story. Hannah called out, waving from the end of the hallway. She cupped a hand to her mouth, stage whispering. Trudy is here with security. There's another vampire here. Lucas stepped into view, heart sinking. Red detached herself from Kristoff. Eleven. February 10th evening, the Las Vegas Strip, Circe Casino. Red couldn't look away from Lucas as she walked out of the corridor with Kristoff. His soulful gaze, gray like a distant storm, had indecipherable depths. She didn't know what he felt, but she knew what he saw, her, in a short dress, clinging to his progeny. Even if he had dumped her, the sight would sting. The night had stung her ego, too. After telling him to buzz off and that she was a strong, independent female, werewolves attacked. The last chokehold on her neck still made her words come out raspy. The mental defense didn't make her feel any less uncomfortable. Hannah chattered, phone charging at her feet. The gendarmes are clearing people out of this corner of the casino for the investigation, Kristoff said dryly. They should move quick before the next movie ends. Red barely heard them, so fixed on Lucas that she didn't see Trudy coming until the bard hugged her. When I heard werewolves were in the building, I thought Hannah. Red patted Trudy on the back, looking around in confusion. She hadn't heard this much emotion in the bard's voice even when she had talked about having cancer. Trudy pulled away, placing her chained glasses back on her nose and composed her usual stern demeanor. 
Hannah says you saved the day. I just brought Wolfsbane. I would have brought more if I had known about that missing ward. What was missing? Trudy pivoted to glare at the female gendarme who had started taking a statement from Kristoff. She marched over with a barrage of questions. Who is supervising the wards? Has the Synod sent out trackers? Why haven't my charge and I been escorted back to the academy? Now thank you. The gendarme held up a finger and leaned toward Christophe, murmuring no doubt the usual about being in touch before stepping away. She beckoned the teen and the bard to follow her. All I wanted to do was study, Hannah said, grabbing her phone. Trudy guarded their flank with the intensity of a mother dragon. Lucas asked, Red, do you need to sit down? Red snapped off her witchy sight, realizing she had left it on and had zoned out on the strange energies coming out of the corridor behind them. The academy police weren't just dusting for prints in the nightclub. She shook her head. Just still pumped from the action. Speaking of, was it a bald bloke who attacked you? I chased one through the parking lot until he shifted. Found the security in a fuss when I came to report it in. No, it was a bearded dude who was entirely too comfortable being naked with his equally as creepy sister. She tried to convince Hannah to sacrifice herself to save me. Ian strode out of the hallway, black bowler pulled low over his brow. Red, I need to take your account. Sure. Hand on the utility belt under his trench coat, Ian eyeballed the vampires. Stay close, you two. Kristoff exchanged a glance with Lucas as Ian led her away. Be good, Red said to them. What happened tonight? Ian asked her, pulling a notepad from his pocket. She summarized how their study session ended up a werewolf attack courtesy of Nuno and Gloria Lopez. The cameras would have caught the action so she didn't pump the tale with details. She kept an eye on the vampires. Vic walked up to Lucas with Ezra in tow. What did I miss? You could have texted me before. I was just at the bar. His eyes widened on Kristoff when he noticed the vampire and he nodded grimly. Novak. Kristoff smiled, entirely too chipper. You missed a wolf hunt, Lucas commented wryly. I bet you're disappointed, Constantine. Only if you didn't get the pelt. I'm going to assume my intern saved the hero again. Hey, she's just a kid, Ezra chided. Ian prompted her attention back to him and pointed his pen at her friends. What is the deal with them? Neither of those vampires are locals. You already know Vic's deal. I worked with the vamps in L.A. It's complicated. I'm ready to bet on it. Ian squinted at her neck. I see the mark. I assume it belongs to one of them. Is this a part of the investigation? Red kept her voice calm but fought the urge to get sassy. She figured sassiness went as far with magical cops as it did with normal ones. I'm ready to bet on the fact that you know exactly who they are. Your people probably document any supernatural that floats into town. Shrugging modestly, Ian closed his notepad and tucked it inside his breast pocket. I'm curious. It's not on the record. A good alchemist does his research on new elements to his environment. This case is hot. There are more players on the field than you know. Keep your friends out of it. Why can't you find these wolves? Couldn't you just use a locator spell? Not at liberty to say, he said, voice pitched to a gruff finality. Gloria Lopez said something about her dad having a good luck charm, picked it up from some wolf mage named Archibald Fowler. Red tossed out the information like a bribe to the academy cop, hoping for some quid pro quo. Look, I'm being fully transparent here. His brow furrowed. He didn't have his notepad out, but she could tell he itched to take notes. You can join your friends now. Red filed his deflection away as she walked back to her friends. Ian completely faded from her mind when she heard Lucas say her name. She stopped behind him. Thereafter, Red, I know it. Back to her, Lucas rocked on his heels, hands in his pockets. A deadly restraint stiffened his arms as if he were primed for a fight. Celine saw her brawling in a cemetery in the rain. She said Red looked dead in the vision. Bullocks to that. We can't let it happen. Vic asked, What's the game plan then? 
We keep the princess in the tower and night up to fight some wolves. Red gritted her teeth. Was she some damsel in distress to be saved now? Vic used to have her play bait on hunts. Her so-called knights weren't even plotting to save the right woman. Crossing her arms, she glared at Vic and Lucas. How long would it take them to include her? She thought she hated them going behind her back, but she hated being talked about as if she weren't there even more. We'll take them all out. Lucas laid out the plan, counting the beats with his fingers. They'll be armed when they aren't furry. So first off, we gather up some hunters. Second, we smoke them out with a lure. Third, there's a problem with your plan, Kristoff said, glancing at her. Ezra crossed his arms. She can hear you, fellas. She can, and she's not impressed, Red said, stepping up to the men. First off, I've already fought in a cemetery in the rain. That was one of the trials in my ranking exam. I brought down a ghoul, just like in the vision. Prophecy fulfilled. Lucas interjected, but Frank wasn't there. He was the first time I faced his pack. Time doesn't mean the same thing to your sire that it does for us. It's all wibbly-wobbly in her head. Hannah is the one in trouble. For once, it's not me. You're on their radar, Lucas insisted. You can't stay in this city. Call this holiday off. You're not my master, she snarled, then pinched the bridge of her nose, trying to repress the dawning headache. Bowing her head, she missed Lucas's expression as he jerked away from her. Her unruly subconscious seemed ready to uncover another useless drive-by image. She fought to bury it. That sweaty pre-flashback feeling nagged her. She calmed herself before trying to reason with him again. I'm here to discover my magical birthright. I'm not hanging out by the pool. Vic said, at least don't walk there alone. Fine. Safety in numbers. Turning on her heel, she didn't even acknowledge Kristoff's smirk as she regarded her choices for an escort. She stopped at the bartender. Have a moment to play chaperone. Ezra nodded, cool as a scotch on the rocks under the vampire's intense stares. Red stalked away without looking back, not trusting herself to speak to him without ranting until they reached the pyramid. She tried to explain herself without sounding like a crazy person. I'm not one of those chicks who can't stand a man helping her. We all work together in L.A., but they have been aggravating lately by not telling me things. Seeing them planning stupidity on my behalf without even consulting me. It was either I walk away or put a hex on them. Something with boils. Classic move, Ezra said, deadpan. You don't often see a vampire with boils. They don't really turn the ugly ones, I've noticed. There's probably a brotherhood study on that. You're pretty calm in the face of the brooding undead for a guy who says he's too sensitive to be a hunter. I'm not scared of the monsters. I just can't shake off the sight of what they leave behind. I'm glad there are people like you who can. Her face warmed at the compliment. Thanks. Nervousness flickered across his smile as he handed her a phone number scribbled on a napkin. I've been meaning to give you this. You can take it from here to your room, but in case you want company later. Let's say tomorrow. Possibly at a pinball museum around seven. You can call me. I like pinball. She smiled at him, deciding in a snap. Her treat day had been interrupted. She enjoyed his easygoing company, and he was certainly easy on the eyes, too. I promise I won't try to save you once. The most unsolicited chivalry you'll get is if I manage to win you a toy from my tickets. I'll hold you to that promise. Meet you out front at seven tomorrow. Red tapped his number against her palm, then walked away. A date. She had encountered alchemists, vampires, and werewolves tonight, but that surprised her the most. Clad in a marigold, turtleneck, and worry, Basil appeared at her elbow. Under the weather since his guest lecture debut. He'd missed her ranking yesterday. A sickly sheen clung to his thin features. Red, you've been summoned by the Alchemical Synod. We all have. She sighed. So much for ending the night on a high note with a date invitation. This day kept rolling out the stress. It was doubtful the Synod had summoned them for tea. She wasn't going to be able to write in her journal anytime soon, and she had more and more she needed to get off her chest. 
Tense and lost in thought, he directed them to a marble corridor, then through a hidden passageway under a tapestry. Diego is missing. Really missing. Are we sure he was at my ranking? Not that it helped me. No, he wasn't. I read it off another synod member. They just stuffed a clerk into his robes to make it look like there were twenty. Basil quieted as they approached a doorway guarded by gendarmes in bowler hats who opened the door for them. Red took a deep breath as she entered the room. Nineteen alchemists on two rows of high-raised benches loomed in a semicircle around cleared space in the center. Nervous adepts shooed out of the room by gendarme blocked her vision for a moment, but she could have sworn this was the same room she had met the synod in before. Ushered to wait by the wall, she crossed her arms beside Basil. She lifted her eyebrows when she saw who else had been summoned. Perinelle held her hand to a glass sphere on the podium. It was the one that had drawn the sight of the werewolves out of red on her first morning in the academy. An illusion flashed above the glass ball of the immortal alchemist, passing Diego in a hallway. She inclined her head as the synod accepted her testimony. The first alchemist addressed the newcomers. Step forward, Basil, and show us when you last saw Diego Blanco. Understand that this device can pierce through your perceptions for the truth. Stiff-backed, he trod to the podium and set his hand on the swirling glass sphere. Translucent figures rose above him like a mystical hologram before taking the shape of two men sitting at a table, Basil's teal shaman tunic top and Diego's golden suit, marked it as after the guest lecture two days ago. Diego clinked their beer mugs together in the illusion. You son of bitch, I keep saying it, but you did it. I put you up to that guest lecture because I thought you'd run. I thought you were the same guy who left, just with a different name. The hologram version of Basil grinned, teeth nearly transparent. Technically, I am. No, you're not. The Soulmancer finally had some soul growth. I'll drink to that, my friend, and I insist that you drink to my upcoming ranking. I nearly got you kicked off the Synod the last time. Now, I'm a good luck charm. We won't go that far. You just won't be the reason I might lose, Diego said. He gulped his beer and set the mug down. Now, back to the laboratory so I don't fail come the big day. Yes, yes, more mad wizardry to impress your friends and defeat your enemies. This drink is on me for sticking around. Diego tossed a handful of bills onto the table. Be a champ and make it sound like we were carousing all night. I still like Im to think all I do is sing. The floating illusion of the Soulmancer said goodbye, but Diego had already disappeared and the rest of the image faded. Stirring in their seats, the Synod murmured, hooded heads together as they deliberated over what this testimony could mean. The first alchemist stood to dismiss Basil and call Red forward. She put her hand on the smooth glass orb and thought of Diego. The last she could remember was seeing him on stage for the Soulmancer's guest lecture. Memory became a projection on the ceiling before dimming. The first alchemist nodded his satisfaction, then fell into a hushed discussion with his synod. Red backed away to find Basil by the wall. She had only begun to try to comfort the Soulmancer when a gendarme pulled him aside, leaving her awkwardly loitering out of hearing range. Waiting by the door, Perinel beckoned her and leaned to whisper, Don't be alarmed. They're just acting so strident publicly because I am here to observe. You're not in trouble. Not with them. I might have pissed off some werewolves tonight, though, Red said, quickly summarizing what had happened, leaving out the personal stuff. The immortal alchemist didn't need to know how confusing it felt to have both Lucas and Kristoff in Las Vegas. And you just connected your magic to Hannah's? What was in that were mace, as you call it, to create such a chemical reaction? Perinel murmured the questions to herself as if not expecting an answer. The wolf couldn't even look upon the barrier to speak to you? Red shrugged, deciding to take a stab at the first question because she didn't have answers for the other two. It seemed like the thing to do at the time. That is the beauty of an untrained witch. No one ever told you what you couldn't do, 
so you do what you want. Perinelle studied her with simmering curiosity, then stated in a firm, matter-of-fact tone, I think if the Synod had seen your battle against the wolves, your rank would be different. The comment lingered with Red long after the immortal alchemist had left. After gathering Basil away from the gaze of the Synod, she got him settled in his quarters in the dormitory tower with a cup of tea. They huddled at his small kitchenette table. A hint of gin flavored the chamomile steam. He held his mug in both hands and told her how he had come to the academy the first time. With only a backpack, he'd arrived at the strip under the name Philip after a run-in with a vampire in Miami. It was just a new alias after countless others. I rode them hard back then. Diego discovered him performing a fake seance for the tourists. They had become friends after that. He suggested that I should pretend to be a shaman. It was a tale filled with chuckles about casino shenanigans and sighs of regret over how he left. I fled because I was scared of the vampires on Fremont Street, but now I see a part of me was more afraid of the roots that I had set down in the academy. I had been running for so long that I couldn't stay still, even with a good thing. I think Diego understands. They reckon he bolted to be alone with some experiment. Stress over ranking. Basil harumphed his disagreement. He missed a show at the Nostradamus. He might bugger off from the rest of it, but not that. I know a gendarme. We can pester him about it tomorrow. Red pushed some canned soup on him because he still looked sick, then sent him off to bed. She trotted up the wide brass spiral staircase to her dorm at the top of the tower. A ripped strap on her dress had been holding on by a scrap since Nuno the werewolf had roughed her up. She yearned for pajamas and cozy socks. Pushing open her front door, she idly wondered how long the rest of her new cute clothes would last. This was why she usually stuck to a uniform of black shirts and jeans. A rustle coming from her room stilled her internal dialogue. Hannah snapped her head up, kneeling beside the large hunter's kit at the foot of the bed. She held a can of worm mace in one hand and a silver dagger in the other. She sputtered, I can explain. Red closed the door and crossed the distance from the sitting room to the open double doors of her bedroom. The clues were everywhere. She didn't need an explanation. You have my printouts of Frank Lopes on the kitchen table. There's a packed bag on the couch next to a note, and you're holding a werewolf hunter starter kit. Can you blame me? That fucker and his twisted kids killed my dad. She crouched by the girl. And they want to kill you. Don't make it easier for them. Hannah tightened her grip on the dagger handle. Everyone wants to keep me inside, safe in my tower. Any of you ever think that maybe I could take them out? Let's talk without knives. Hannah frowned, setting the blade down. I plan to return it anyway. Red sighed, settling down and crossing her legs, more to stall than for comfort. The girl deserved an answer that wasn't a pat on the head. She felt a little hypocritical since she'd recently staged her own revolt against being treated like a damsel. The difference was that she knew exactly what lurked outside the tower and how to fight it. The younger witch could cast a mean spell with the right tools, but the wolves knew how to mess with her concentration. They had almost succeeded tonight. Frank Lopes is old for an assassin, and that means he's clever. He won't lumber at you head-on like the ghouls in our ranking challenge. Then you gotta account for the three young wolves, their family, so they won't turn on each other or run when the fighting gets tough like random mercs might. It's not a fight I want. That's not an answer. Backed against a wall, you could pull it off. That's a big if, though, Red said, peeling the truth off like a band-aid. If she couldn't find the right words, she'd say the truth. Do you have the power? Yes. But the experience to keep your head in a fight? Not yet. It takes seconds for a werewolf to rip a throat out. I'm a hero that no one believes in, Hannah said bitterly. You're the hero that we want to see reach drinking age. Red shifted to rest against the end of the bed. Her heart went out to the kid because she knew where this road led. Hannah had some closure when she had thought that the soups who had killed her family were all dead. Gloria Lopez ripped it from her. I know, I know. You want vengeance. 
I've seen the look in more hunters' eyes than I can tell you. It'll fuel you, keep you up when the world smacks you down, but it hollows you out. Vengeance won't fill the hole they made when they killed your father. It'll only make it deeper. I'm not going to tell you that your dad wouldn't want this because I didn't know the guy. Maybe he would dig it. At the end of the day, you can choose your vendetta over whatever, I think. But we both know you can come up with a better idea, Hannah. You haven't even heard my plan. She pulled her knees up to her chest. Not that I'm telling you, because I can do it myself. You don't need to tell me anything, Red said delicately. Just think about it. You've had how long between Trudy dropping you off and me coming back? Is there any part of your plan that seems a little iffy or that you might want more time to prepare for? Hannah looked away. Maybe. There's more than one way to skin a werewolf, kid. Some won't even get you killed. Promise me you won't try to run after them tonight. Give it a week. Play Nancy Drew here at the Academy. Annoy Ian with questions, plot some schemes. Whatever. Just give it a week. Hannah held her gaze for a long moment, then nodded. A week. Don't tell Trudy about this. Promise. Red held out her hand for a shake. Hannah shook on it. <laughs> Red might not have completely convinced the girl to stay put for the whole time, but she thought she could sleep tonight without worrying about finding the place empty in the morning. She stood, smoothing down her blue skirt. The floor is hard. Let's move this to the couch and maybe pop something into the microwave. I'm starving. Yeah, that protection spell gave me the munchies, too. There are leftovers. Red tried to bring down Hannah's defensive guard as they talked quietly over pad thai. Finally, the tears started to fall down Hannah's round cheeks as she spoke of her family. The two witches ended up staying on the couch after their plates had been emptied, talking for hours. The teen eventually fell asleep in her seat. Eyelids drooping, Red covered the girl with a blanket, then switched off the sweet light after checking her charging phone to send a sarcastic meme to Vic's apology text. She accidentally knocked over the contents of her purse on the coffee table, but too tired to listen to her inner neat freak, she waved an irritated hand at the mess and classified it as something for tomorrow. She was asleep when she snuggled under her sheets. Cow. She cracked open her eyes, wondering if a raven had flown into the apartment. The sound rang out again. Her finely awake ears heard it for what it was, an excited teenage girl. She sat bolt upright, rubbing her face, and called out to the living room. What's the matter? Hannah bounced into the open bedroom, waving a scrap of paper with Ezra's phone number on it. It must have fallen out onto the coffee table last night. I know this number! Red flopped back into her pillows, satisfied that no one was dying. It's nothing. This isn't like exchanging Instagram profiles. This has to be a date. Covering a squirrely smile, Red rolled over and pulled the blankets over her head. Go away. Hannah squealed again. It's a date. Doce. February 11th, evening. Las Vegas, Nevada. Green Valley Arcade. Red didn't know where to look first. The gloriously strange arcade was half sideshow museum, half game hall. Tiny LEDs flashed from every direction. The air crackled with buzzers and dings, whirls and thuds, bells and whistles. Rows of games wound up and down the length of the large space, from the latest racing simulator to antique pinball. The little curio shelves propped up here and there were haphazardly filled with strange mid-century memorabilia. Vintage carnival posters hung next to retro 80s toy merchandise on the walls. Dangling from the ceiling, a stuffed astronaut suit pointed to the wall of prizes. Mm. Ezra gave her the tour like he worked there instead of the Circe Casino. A delighted smile stretched across his angular features as he pointed out specific games like old friends. He tucked his longish brown hair behind his ear, faltering briefly. This isn't too nerdy for you? No, it's totally weird. I love it. She pointed to a Fiji mermaid glowering on a hook in a gap between games. Is that what I think it is? Petunia isn't even the best. He waved her over to the novelties dotting the display end caps. Creepy American Gothic style paintings hung next to cardboard cutouts of celebrities and pinups. There were peep show boxes for a dime, 
penny engravers, a 70s love tester, and a puppet fortune teller in her glass case. A funhouse mirror contorted her jean-clad legs and boat knit top. The arcade wasn't just a cool date idea. It was also a neutral supernatural sanctuary. Most cities had at least one where underworld types could mingle. This was by far the most fun one that she had visited. Energy signatures of an anti-violence spell proved the seriousness of the security. That wasn't what convinced her of the place's safety. It was the kids with their families. Roving flocks of fox-eared kids bounced from game to game with friends. This wasn't the usual sanctuary dive where she smuggled in a weapon. She would have had to surrender most of what was in her hunter's kit, so she'd left the whole thing in Ezra's car, except for an unlabeled canister of wear-mace rattling around in her purse. Sigils on the walls were a sign that the management had hired a mage in the past, but the crowd was a mix. Two alchemists she remembered from the library chatted next to the drink counter. A kitsune in a Captain America dress played skee-ball with a shy-looking young man with budding horns like a spring deer. Mostly, everyone looked human, even though some radiated power like the unusually tall woman with brilliantly white hair who played whack-a-mole. Red and Ezra moved from game to game, sharing smiles and some flirty banter, before coming to his true love. She took a break for a snack to watch the pinball wizard. Tossing the last popcorn in her mouth, she hovered over the side of the vintage machine, following the green flipper as it tapped the silver ball. You got it! You got it! Ezra tapped the side buttons. The ball zigged and ricocheted past the flipper, ending the victory streak. He shrugged and smiled, shaking the empty cup. You know what they say about winning some. Fess up! You have a pinball habit. You are not a casual. You found me out. They strolled through the maze of games in a roundabout way to the coin machine by the far-off drink counter. Something scaly in a parka tossed a toy basketball into a pop-a-shot hoop ahead of them. It was a side of the supernatural that she hadn't seen before, demons having good old-fashioned family-friendly fun. Red hadn't felt this relaxed in a while, and after the last few days she appreciated the break. He said sardonically, this is why I stay in Vegas. It isn't the bartending job in a place where I could tell people the truth about having a bard for a mom. It's the pinball scene. You worked that machine like a lover. It's not a monogamous thing. I've played every machine, but it's the old ones that have soul. Don't try telling Hannah that. She doesn't get it. You've really leapt into being like a big brother to her. Genuine brother bear vibes warmed his expression. She needs one. I used to resent my mom's champions. I was the ordinary one in the house with kids my age chosen by whatever powers that be. Now, I just feel sorry for them. I'm not in the life, but I get enough of what she's dealing with to be there for her. I think it's super sweet. I bet your mom appreciates it. Uh, it's been a long road to get here, but it's working out. He raised his eyebrow at her. You've been pretty diplomatic about the Vic Gate situation. Sighing, she tossed away the popcorn bag in a trash bin, decorated with counterfeit Pokemon cards. I don't need to draw a line in the sand. I've met Trudy. Even if every paranoid conspiracy theory that Vic could dream up was right, I doubt you could stop her when she got her mind set on something. She's a bulldozer, not a ballerina. Ezra put an arm around her. You're pretty remarkable, too. You managed to get the bartender to talk about himself all night. Grinning, Red leaned into his side, touching his chest. He certainly kept himself in shape. I figured you could use a turn. What about you? All I really know about you is that you breezed in from L.A., can handle a lot more psychedelics than I could, and you fight werewolves. And you know, badass witch... His eyes shyly met hers as they approached an old-fashioned fortune-teller machine. I don't even know what kind of movies you like, so I can take a stab at inviting you to see one. Ah, we're having second date thoughts, then. Good. I lean toward the light and breezy. I get enough horror at work. The puppet fortune-teller creaked to animatronic life, jerking its wooden fingers to the crystal ball. A light bulb inside the orb flickered. Hurdy-gurdy music twinkled from the machine. He trotted to it. Ooh, this is a defective one. 
It pops out free fortune sometimes. It's yours. Red didn't need a new cryptic prediction. Ezra bent to the fortune tray and retrieved a tiny scroll. He read it aloud. You already know the answer to the questions inside your head. Hmm, not really a fortune per se. More like an affirmation. Oh, there's more on the other side. A new voyage will fill your life with untold memories. Any lucky numbers? Red squinted at the puppet draped in velvet and a black wig. It looked a little like Perinel Flamel. Sweat beaded on her forehead as her stomach cramped suddenly. Her vision blurred, arcade fading to red diner booths. The image held for only a second, but she absorbed it all, from the wide windows overlooking trees and a gravel parking lot, to the James Dean and Marilyn Monroe pictures on the bathroom doors and the boombox on the bar counter covered in stickers. The bell over the entrance rang. A younger version of herself walked inside, crossing her arms over the faded shirt whose text was nearly invisible but for the word charm. She called over her shoulder, Mom! Red stiffened, her heart dropping as the vision faded. It felt real. The diner interior was the same as the one she had visited in the dreamland and her mom was there. Are you all right? Startled, she'd almost forgotten about Ezra. The flash and whirl of the arcade felt too loud, too cramped. Lightheaded, she rubbed her temple. Acid flashback? I think I need some air before we load up on more quarters. They walked out of the Green Valley Arcade and into the dry Nevada night, away from the front entrance. Carnival bright inside, the outside looked like every other warehouse in the dingy complex. She huffed when she saw the Millennium Falcon. What now? The sight of the black van usually cheered her up, not when it was unexpectedly at her date night. Parked on the other side of the lot, the front doors opened. Vic climbed out of the driver's side. Lashon left the passenger side, reading his phone without looking up. I've already curated a list of the most unique machines in their collection that we have to check out. Ezra glanced at her, then her friends in the parking lot. I think I might have accidentally caused this. I did talk this place up this morning. It's a supernatural sanctuary with pinball. Definitely worth a visit. Maybe I should have made it clearer that it was a date. No, it's not your fault, she said. Vic is just that oblivious. He has uncanny timing for interrupting my love life. The side door opened to the van and Hannah popped out, wearing a red wig. He didn't, Ezra said, disbelief shading his whisper. He strode toward the group and pointed to Hannah. Get back in that van before someone sees you. Vic whistled for attention. Whoa, Hoss! Red scanned the parking lot, jogging over, wishing she hadn't left her hunting kit in the car. She stopped by the van's back doors. Ezra's right. What are you thinking? You know what's after her. LaShawn gaped at Hannah. This is the girl? I thought your name was Ellie? Sometimes it is. Hannah shrugged. The picture of jaded teenage cool. Vic held up his hands like he was trying to reason with a group of raptors. She hitched a ride in the van, and I didn't notice until I was out of the garage. LaShawn screwed up his face like he needed an antacid. You picked me up like two minutes after that, Vic said. She quickly made a very persuasive case on why she should come along. It starts with being an orphan, new in town, and gets worse. She first asked if I could take her to kill the wolves. I thought an arcade would be more age-appropriate. Hannah, you promised, Red snapped. Last night, she thought they'd really connected, that she had gotten through to the girl about her revenge trip fantasies. I had a better idea, Hannah mumbled, chin tucked to her chest. This was to get intel. Ezra said, I'm taking you home now. We can't risk being this exposed after yesterday. The pack could have followed you. Yes, go, Red said reining in her disappointment as she handed Ezra the wear mace from her purse. I'll get a ride with Vic after sorting things out here. Ezra frowned. We might need your hunter's kit in case there's trouble on the road. Take it, she said. It was a good first date. Text you tomorrow. 
Hannah said. It was a date then. I'm so sorry. Was it going well? Ezra glared at the teen and marched them to his car. Vic cringed at Red as she gave him the stink eye. He was good in a fight, but he was the worst wingman. Typical, Vic. Just typical. LaShawn jabbed his glasses back up the bridge of his nose, arms rigid. We can never just go play some pinball. I should have known. Hey, hey, Vic started. LaShawn talked over him, stabbing a finger at his brother. After seeing you in Arizona, I thought months in a wheelchair had knocked some sense in you. Made you grow up. I'm the big brother here. We're 11 months apart, LaShawn crowed. Damn it, Vic. I know what this was. A hunt disguised as family fun. Red stay silent, uncomfortable. She felt defensive over Vic, even when she was annoyed with him. The stupid lug had his heart in the right place, even if his head was mixed up. Vic laid out his case. She was going to hang out at a sanctuary with two hunters and the best bartender in town, safe and sound. I didn't know we were date crashing. I better not be the hunter included in that number, as I didn't consent to danger. Nor did she. LaShawn gestured to Red like a lawyer presenting evidence. This is Utah all over again. You were using that girl to get a new trace on those wolves. Fresh bait. No, Vic argued. I was going to teach her something. This sanctuary is the perfect place to learn how to detect demonic types in a crowd. The dogs are finding every hole in the alchemist's defenses. She can't hide forever in a casino. That's common sense. Car headlamps illuminated them in the paved lane between the parking spaces. Red waved awkwardly at Ezra behind the wheel. What potion made someone melt into the ground and disappear? Because she wanted to take it right then. She couldn't imagine he'd want to go to the movies now. She asked, can we move out of the way? LaShawn ignored her to address Vic. That's not reason. It's a rationalization. You're not a bard anymore, let alone Hannah's. These are killer wolves. You know what they can do. Whatever you can do to get the monsters, LaShawn said, voice dropping to a whisper. Just like Dad, this insanity is why I left. I didn't, Vic sputtered. LaShawn walked over to the idling car, leaning into the window. Um, I'm sorry to ask, but are you going back to the Circe? Could I come? At Ezra's quick, no worries, he got into the back seat. The car took off as soon as the door closed. Vic watched them depart with a hound dog's drooping frown. This was supposed to be a teachable moment in the field. I believe you, Red said delicately, ushering him into the van. She believed him, but there was something to what LaShawn had said. I think we've caused enough of a scene here. Once in the driver's seat, Vic leaned his head against the headrest and closed his eyes for a moment. He's not going to talk to me for another year, maybe two. She tried not to lie to him, so she stayed silent. Millennium Falcon rumbling to life, the radio filled the car. An overripe moon followed as they cruised down dark, wide boulevards. The spotlight of the Luxor Casino pierced the clear sky like a guiding beacon. Trekking through the neon canyon of the Vegas Strip, their van passed limos, taxis, and billboard trucks advertising escorts. The police were out in force, on foot and on bikes among the faceless horde of revelers. A fight between two young men broke out at a giant crosswalk at their next red light stop. The full moon was two days ago, but people were still acting loony. Speaking of which, Red couldn't stay silent anymore. You gonna say something about all of this? You know Trudy will be on my ass once I walk into the academy. At least tell me what to say to her. I was doing her job. Hannah can't tell a werewolf from a kitsune. Vic blew a raspberry, turning past the palms. Tell her that. Further questions can be addressed literally to my ass. You can say that last part yourself. She looked down at her buzzing phone in her purse. Surprised, it was a text message from Lucas. Vic told me to come to some arcade to meet the crew and no one is here. He isn't picking up. Red felt stupidly disappointed at the message. She had hoped... She roped off that line of thinking. 
Instead, she shot off a quick reply to Lucas to explain, then stilled her thumbs from writing more. Instinct drew her to him, but her head overruled her heart. How many times was she going to put herself out there with him? Maybe it would have been different if he had come to Vegas without pretenses, even if he had followed up, I missed you, with something more. She'd had a taste of what dating a normal guy was like again. Normal was relative in her world, of course. Ezra was a bard's son and worked in a magical casino. Was she ready to fess her life story and sign a rental lease with him? No, but she liked flirting over pinball with the dude. Lucas says hello, she grumbled. It would have been mortifying if he had showed up with the rest. I told him your plan to crash my date was canceled. I warned you I was bringing backup, Vic said dryly, zooming through a left turn toward the street behind the Circe Casino. He sighed, noticing her sour glance. Sorry, Red. You just said you were busy. I didn't even think about it when I was picking places to go with Lashon before he flew out on a red-eye flight tonight. I was serious about how last minute it was to let Hannah come along. You didn't tell me for a reason, I think. Red fortified herself with a calming breath. She let some things stay unsaid for too long. He'd told her to trust his process. Now his process had imploded on the rest of them. You've been weirder than usual since we left L.A. Normally I wouldn't care. I'd chalk it up to working through your demons and just be there for you, but you're messing with, um... I get it, your personal life. He grumbled. I ruined your date. Red covered her face to hide her rolling eyes. She wasn't so boy crazy that she'd hold her lack of a goodnight kiss against him. It's not just that. I believe you about the date crashing, but you straight up didn't tell me that Lucas was in town. Even if he weren't my ex-whatever, it would have been nice to know days earlier that Selene had a scary vision about me so I could be on guard too. This is a situation where I either have to tell you or you're going to be pissed at me for a while. You're in for it, mister. At least let me talk about it over drinks, Vic said, slowing to drive through the unusually dark street leading to the far back parking lot of the Circe Casino. The van jerked as the back wheel popped. Red hissed, hitting her elbow on the dash. She rubbed it, cursing. Look, he whispered, pointing over the steering wheel. The silver eyes of a predator reflected in the edges of the headlamps. Thirteen. February 11th evening, the Las Vegas Strip. A large werewolf sped into the darkened street behind the glittering Circe Casino, shaggy fur rippling over bulky muscles. Vic hunched over the wheel to mow the beast down. He drove the Millennium Falcon, lopsided with the popped back tire. A bullet whipped through the open passenger door window. It cracked the air over Red's head like a Navy jet plane. The windshield cracked, sending rough granules falling on the dash and outward onto the hood. She covered her face. Startled fear gagged her. Fucking hell, he yelled, Van jerking under his hands. Ducking, she reached for a bottle of wolfsbane-infused oil in the hunter's kit between their seats. Claws dug into her. Pain erupted from her neck down to her shoulder. She fought the sharp grip and flicked the top off the vial. The sluggish wolfsbane oil emptied with a splash on a silver dagger instead. Her flailing fingers grip at a white cristal. She slammed it against the bearded intruder hanging onto the side of the van. Even as she beat at the werewolf, she opened her magic and amplified it with the cristal. She channeled a gust towards him. Beard flapping in the new breeze, Nuno spun back. His claws fell from her neck to grip the open window frame. Vic swerved to sideswipe a tree, knocking the lanky werewolf off the van. That was Nuno, she said not recognizing the shifted wolf who had disappeared from the street. Where's the rest? The driver's door peeled away like the lid of a dog food tin in a metallic squeal and rolled on the pavement. The bald lopes brother braced himself in the empty hole. He snarled. A white scar split his patchy mustache. Very human-shaped and very naked, his eyes rolled like a berserker. Red dove for the silver dagger in the hunter's kit. That's Paul! Vic punched the werewolf in the face. Hi, Paul. The Millennium Falcon veered sharply to the right. Red dropped the dagger in his lap to grab the steering wheel, struggling to correct the wavering van with one hand. 
Paul seized Vic by the mullet, face elongating into a snout of jagged teeth. He didn't spout fur, making the sight even more unsettling. She nearly dropped the steering wheel. He could do a smooth, partial shift, like an alpha. She zagged the van to shake him off. Vic grasped the silver dagger and drove it toward the werewolf's shoulder. Hanging on by one hand, foam on his Anubis grin, Paul grabbed the hunter's wrist. Vic dropped the dagger into his waiting left hand. He knifed the wolf in the kidneys. The pained howl shook the van's back windows. Stabbing Paul again, he kicked him out and the werewolf fell underneath the tires. The van lurched over the hump. Retaking control of the steering wheel, Vic sped over the curb and sidewalk into the parking lot of the Circe Casino. He raced over the empty spaces on protesting wheel rims, zooming around parked cars and looping around to the front. The Millennium Falcon wheezed. Engine were raspy, as if it were catching its breath as much as its passengers. The energy of the wards draped over red like a warm blanket. Pain drenched her neck and shoulder as much as blood. She dressed her bleeding cuts quickly with a bandage anointed with antibiotic found in the hunter's kit. It was messy, but would hold for now. But the pain didn't cloud her from one important observation. The cuts winding down her neck to her shoulder weren't caused by human nails. He parked the van at valet parking and handed over the keys out the missing door. Try not to get a scratch on her. The valet stuttered, gawping at the damaged van. A wave of bowler hats bobbed past them. Vic, Ian said as he hopped into a waiting golf cart before it rocketed off. I'll be looking for you. Vic snarked to the sky as he walked into the dazzling din of the Circe Casino. Throw in a colonoscopy and tax audit to make it my best day ever, God. Red strode in the most direct and reliable route to the Academy Medical Center, wincing from the pain shooting from her shoulder. She bypassed a door to the Pyramid Hall, hidden in a gift shop dressing room. It popped her out by the faculty staff room half the time to go toward the Nostradamus Lounge. She said, I'm not going to tell you to drop your books, but you're not going to like what I have to say. He wrinkled his nose like he wanted to argue. Red applied more pressure to her bandage. Ungird your loins. It's not about Hannah. Paul wasn't the only one to do a partial shift. Nuno had too, judging by the claws. Vic cursed. What the hell has Frank been feeding his kids? Two potential alphas in the same litter. He has to be a heavy hitter to keep them boys in line. Another heavy hitter waited for them by the disguised double doors leading to the pyramid. Trudy glowered, death ray vision locked on Vic. Fists clenched at her sides, her curly ponytail bristled like an angry cat. Her lip curled in disgust when she saw Red's neck. If I was going to get you fired, it would be over this stunt with Hannah. It's not enough to risk my charge. I left a wolf bleeding out on the sidewalk. You have one less to worry about, he said brusquely as he marched them past Trudy. I'm getting her to a medic. It's not that bad, Red tried to be reassuring, smoothing the square neck of her blue top over scratches that the bandage couldn't cover. She winced, brushing a cut. The wolf barely got his claws into me. Trudy stomped after them. Was he an alpha? Had he shifted his hands? Supernatural creatures can have a unique effect on witches compared to regular humans. Add in the complication that you might not even have gone through your bloom. Depending on the moon phase, it's either be born a wolf or be bitten. Vic snorted. Everything else is theory. That wolf would need to chomp on her for a while to turn her even if she did have the wolf gene. At worst, she'll get an infection because he had some Cheeto dust under his nails. Red opened the double doors marked Employees Only to enter the bustling pyramid. And on that nasty note, I need to see Dr. Finch. Alchemists commuted out of the platform archways to filter in all directions through the kiosks, cafe tables, and draping aerial roots of the giant magical tree. The bazaar merchants called out their last specials of the day, People lounged under the banyan, chilling after a long day in the laboratory. Red power walked toward the swan pond, the tension in her shoulders slipping a notch at the sight of the expansive sunrise clouds over the green canopy. The tension beetled back up when she looked back. Trudy blocked Vic from following. One day you'll make a mistake you can't laugh off. 
He sidestepped her. I'd love to stay and be nagged, but my intern is bleeding over there. Stay away from Hannah from now on, Trudy said. Disgust twisted her mouth. She's an impressionable girl. Your devil-may-care style only seems romantic until the corpses fall. I won't have her learn the truth the hard way. She turned on her heel. Vic made a face. Red withheld her comments, hot-footing it to the medical office before someone else like Ian could pop up. She followed her nose down the concourse to a door carved with a portrait of the god Asclepius holding a snake-entwined staff. A white-coated mage came out, releasing a complex, astringent smell. When she had accidentally eavesdropped on Dr. Finch's after-hours consult with Trudy, the place had been full of lumpy shadows. Now she saw the curved front desk and rows of chairs. An attached apothecary could be seen through a window the people within playing the same function as fish in a tank for bored eyes in the waiting room. They weren't the only ones in line for the doctor. An old man sat next to a propped-up landscape painting on a bench. A small figure shook a fist and paced on the painted hill. Nearby, a teenager younger than Hannah studied her reflection and the enormous whiskers protruding from her cheeks in a compact mirror. Manic hiccups escaped a man in a turban by the window. Red and Vic approached the bored woman doing patient registration. Hey, hi, I'm enrolled under the name Red. Just Red. What's the wait to see Dr. Finch to get a proper bandage on this? She pointed to her neck. Tapping his fingers on the desk, Vic added, Werewolf clawed her. The clerk twirled nervously in her chair. Um, I need a supervisor. Dr. Finch is like ranked 21st, so he'll know what to do. You can wait over there. Her wide eyes darted to Red's neck. Away from the others. It's not contagious, Vic muttered, and drew away from the swinging doors by the desk. He stared at the window to the attached apothecary where patrons, including Perinel, shopped. There was a hint of turmoil behind his blank look. He might have escaped Trudy, but he wasn't escaping Red. She said, I think I'm missing the bigger picture. You always told me hunters need to think ahead, be logical in the face of chaos, and not let feelings get in the way. Where's your head at? Tonight? His sigh bellowed out like a steam engine. Was a cluster fuck. I'll give you that. I don't know. It felt like old times for a bit with LaShawn, and I thought I could... Remind him what he was missing? She guessed, leaning on the wall. At a wide-eyed innocent, a tame supernatural sanctuary, and his big brother for some nostalgia? I wanted old times. To feel like myself instead of a useless guy moping in a chair for months. And before you smother me with self-esteem, I know I wasn't useless. You should understand. You want to be your past self again. I am myself. That's not why I want to know who I was. It's not like I could be that again. I don't even think I'd want to now. That's because you could have sucked. We don't know. I've been a certified badass for years. Red snorted, then tilted her head at him, brow puckering. Is this because of the brotherhood? Be honest. I won't judge you for it. It's their loss. Vic made a rude gesture, complete with a sound effect, loud enough to draw the attention of the others in the waiting room. They can't fire me from the mission. I'll do what it takes to be a shield to humanity. That's who I am. Still, I'm just getting my groove back. Dr. Finch walked up to them. He checked his clipboard again, pressing his lips in distaste. Red, we need to take you back, alone, to see if you need to be in isolation. It's a scratch, she said. Isolation is a bit much. Vic rolled his eyes. Is this everyone's first day at magic school? It's weeks until the next full moon. Coolly professional, Finch stared down his nose. We're taking every precaution. Witches can have unusual reactions to supernatural contamination. You should be happy. You're off the hook on telling me your feelings. For now, Red said dryly to Vic, figuring that the doctor was trying to be as thorough as the synod had due to the immortal alchemist presence. She pushed away from the wall to follow Dr. Finch. He led her through the swinging doors and past the exam rooms. At the end of the taupe medical hallway, he wrapped sigils etched into the threshold of a stone archway, flamboyantly anachronistic. 
They stepped through into an unfinished room with a musky smell and missing ceiling tiles. A large cage lurked in the corner, red backed up. I'd like a different exam room. This one has a dungeon feel. We're just being cautious. I'm going to have to leave you here to make a quick call. Finch turned toward the door, then jumped back. Madam. With a whisper of satin, Perinelle leaned her head into the room. The portal cut off view of her torso, leaving her looking unsettlingly like a mounted hunting prize. Oh no, this will not do, Dr. Finch, he bristled. I have nearly reached the synod in my rank. I am qualified to treat such an ailment. Perinelle beckoned Red forward with two fingers. If we have werewolf contamination, this is pertinent to my research. I will tend to her. Red hustled away from the doctor. I'm going with the immortal on this. Perinelli, her long purple bell sleeves swinging like elegant eggplants, took them back to her elegant quarters after hot wiring a portal door. She placed a striped cotton shopping bag filled with leafy herbs on the parlor table, gesturing for Red to rest on one of the overstuffed lavender-colored chairs, then bustled about to open her bottomless trunk and pull out a first aid kit. Red sat at the tea table in the cheerful white sitting room. The bespelled window revealed a sunny morning day in Prague, not nighttime Las Vegas. It's not much of a wound. I was just hoping to get some silver ointment. I didn't think I was going to end up with a cage. Yes, the good doctor overreacted. Werewolf attacks, missing alchemists, exploding laboratories. The synod is not pleased. Usually my school tours aren't as interesting. Perinel plucked a bristled dark hair off Red's shoulder and put it in a small glass bottle. That could be useful. Red peeled off the old bandage, rolling it up and stuffing it into a side pocket on her purse to burn later. It was an old habit Vic had instilled in her to ensure that nothing, magical or demonic, could track her. The foreign hair that Perinel collected could be used in an infinite number of spells. Have they gotten any leads on Diego? That is what the first alchemist assures me. Perinel retrieved a silver tin from the first aid kit and opened it to reveal a moist clump of pulverized herbs. She said, clean your wound with that. It works better than silver ointment. My own recipe, it will hurt. Red dabbed the acidic feeling herbs on the four scratches running from neck to shoulder to meet the deep thumb scratch. The herby wad erased the blood from her skin. It looked like magic, but felt like medicine. She winced as she scrubbed over the shoulder cuts, lifting her ruined neckline to get to them. After Red hiked her shirt up, Perinel sprayed a green mist over the wounds that dried clear and shiny like a liquid bandage. Returning the first aid kit to its place, she pulled a lilac silk kimono top out of her trunk. You can have that. Your blouse is ruined. That's been a theme with my wardrobe lately. Perinel turned away as the witch changed tops. Red tied the wrapped shirt closed with the silk belt. I saw you in the apothecary. You do your own shopping? I figured you'd have an apprentice for that. I know how I want the ingredients. This particular potion is very finicky. The last batch of enthymema draft mysteriously disappeared. It is a neurotropic, but you wouldn't know about that. Perinel raised an eyebrow. Guilty as implied. I thought it would help me remember. Red tensed, realizing that her honesty affected someone else. Her teenage accomplice was already in enough trouble. I did it alone. Perinel nodded, amused by the lie. Did your unguided trance illuminate anything? Before I get into that, put barfing and weird hallucinations on the list of side effects. Red couldn't remember more than impressions of her trance, but it felt like her brain was leaving her a breadcrumb trail in a dark forest. It was supposed to unlock my unconscious. It just stirred up random bits. Some of it was just dream nonsense. The other stuff like my mother's face. I think that was just wishful thinking. Her lips expelled the harsh confession before she could stop herself. I'm never going to find her. I don't know why I bother. I won't claim to understand the inner workings of your mind, but there is value in even our illusions. 
Those subconscious desires drive our conscious actions. Red sighed. That made some of her visions more concerning. The only thing that keeps coming up is this diner. I astral projected there in the dreamland once, I'm sure. I don't know what the connection is, but it's real. Doesn't help me much. Not with what I really want. There are other ways to find what you seek. Perinelle guided her into another attached room, a laboratory. Walled in stone for a classic alchemist look, modernity snuck in like the laptop computer in the corner. Fluorescent lights buzzed overhead. Heavy armoires and counters were crammed with vial sets, scrolls, a golden microscope, and models of the planets. She put the bottle on a work table and pulled out a beaker from a fridge under a counter. Much like I will be able to scry for the werewolf using that hair, I can use yours to find your mother. It's a matter of splitting hairs, the DNA in the strands, that is. Alchemy is the bridge between science and magic. Vic had drilled the importance of not leaving a trace for a spell into red for nearly two years. It took fighting against that conditioning to break off a strand and hand it over. The immortal alchemist dropped the hair into the beaker, green potion turning black on impact, then poured it over a globe on the counter behind her. She waved a hand over the globe, tracing quick sigils into the air. I need to make a few modifications. Some of this is based on guesswork, I must warn. The liquid oozed over the surface before it was sucked into the globe, leaving only a splotch that spiraled on the Pacific Northwest coast between Oregon and Washington State. Perinelle poked at the globe. Only a moment. It will pinpoint the exact location. Red waited, leaning in. The splotch disappeared. She released a breath she didn't know that she was holding. As impressed as I can be with myself, I'm not utterly surprised. Your mother must be a powerful witch. She could obscure herself if she desired it. Then why can't she find me? Why do I have to look for her? Red asked. It was a question that gnawed at her in the middle of the night. She blushed when she realized she'd said it out loud. Sorry, I should be thanking you for using what looked like a complicated potion on me. That probably had to be brewed on a solstice by a Tibetan nun. Full moon by a pregnant woman inducted into the rites of Hecate, but we have one on staff. Perinelle smiled and flipped open a book, then sprinkled a green power on the blank page, revealing text. I could also try... You made the text visible. I received a blank journal. I had it scanned for magic, but nothing came up. If the writing were disguised like this, would it come up in a scan? Perinelle nodded, intrigue curving her mouth. It would be slight. The average mage wouldn't be able to feel the energy, but the scanners would. Back to the drawing board, then. Red shook her head, swallowing back her disappointment. If my mom is so powerful, why aren't I? I study beside Hannah, and I can't do what she does. I couldn't even scry for myself, let alone my mom. I can't say for certain yet about your mother, but I know why you can't scry for yourself. Perinelle tapped her own shoulder, bell sleeve falling down to reveal the swirling network of tattoos on her forearm. That fascinating ink of yours conceals your location from divination. Red tried to look over her back to her own lyre-shaped tattoo. That fact resolved a few mysteries from past hunts against magic users who couldn't get a bead on her. It also answered why Celine's vision sounded secondhand, as if accidentally spotting red in a vision through another's eyes. A thought bloomed in her mind like fervent hope. Maybe my mom has one like this, too. The immortal stilled to somber contemplation. I can't provide answers, but I can tell you what I sense. I need more information about your energy. She held out her hand. Red rested her palm on Perinelle's. Something about the elastic texture felt off, as if the skin had been constructed of something like her own, but smoother. She had been too nervous to notice the first time they met. Perinelle clasped their hands. Sweat popped from her flawless skin. Her mouth twisted into grimace. She stepped back, clutching her chest. Rapid French poured out of her mouth. Perinelle? Madam? Pardon, I briefly forgot English. That was your energy. What is it? 
Yes, your family line has to be strong. You have the capacity for great magic. It has confounded me since I met you. I could sense this lack. Then the results when I scanned your aura. I consider myself a serious observer of the mystical. I do not tolerate hyperbole or exaggeration in my experiment notes. Red spurred the alchemist on. What is it? I can only describe it as an abomination. 14. February 11th evening, the Alchemy Academy, Perinelle's quarters. Red hadn't known what to expect when she let Perinelle take her hand and read her magic, but it wasn't to be called an abomination. She pointed at herself. Me? No. What was done to you? The horrified shock on the immortal's face faded to curiosity. Posture perfect in her purple gown, she stroked her chin in thought. Imagine a mage's energy source like a garden with perennial blooms that come back every spring. The magic regrows after being harvested for spells like taking cuttings from a plant. You are different. Is this like a witch bloom thing? No. Despite the garden metaphor, it has nothing to do with your magic's maturity. Patches of your magic have been pulled out, roots and all. I have seen only seen this once before, but I cannot say if the afflicted ever regained their powers. Red braced her palm on the work table and hung her head. The immortal alchemist's diagnosis was similar to another famous spellcaster, the Bell Witch. Kate Batts had been kinder than the legends claimed. She said something curious at the time of their last meeting, but it seemed ominous now. You have this well of magic within, the deepest well that I have seen in a witch of your age. The capacity is there, but the magic is gone. Perinelle continued, you have but a fraction left, and what is there feels bent and stunted. It may be why your witch bloom was paused or delayed. Still lost in memories, Red echoed the bell witch's old question. Where did it go? A worthy question but the more disturbing one is, what could take it? I have heard of such forbidden rituals, but those are not studied in my halls. Only a very skilled practitioner of the arcane, demon, or mortal could have done such a thing and kept you alive so long. This isn't a mere hex siphoning your magic. Pieces of your very connection to the universe were removed like transplanted seedlings. That would require an intricate configuration of spells and rituals at each stage of the energy transference. No one incantation can do this. Red touched her belly, third eye staring at the humble glow behind her solar plexus. It was her magic. Someone had violated it. Could something like this have taken my memories? Perinelle brought them from the gloom of the laboratory into the sunny sitting room, perhaps hoping that a cozy environment would soften her words. Not on its own, but I imagine it would be expedient for the perpetrator to shield themselves from detection. Not only from you, but from any coven. This act would be considered a crime most foul in my academies. Whoever did it had left me for dead from a vamp bite. My first memory is waking up by Coyote Creek. Red stared hard in the distance, bile burning the back of her throat. Maybe it was better that way. The Bell Witch had told her that the memory block was a kindness. Basil seemed to agree. She already figured horrible things had happened in the dead zone in her memories. It was written on her body. Offing the king of the prairie dead had paid for laser scar removal. It had taken most of her cut of the bounty to erase the old bullet scar on her torso, the lacy web of marks on her wrists, and the constellation of fang bites on her skin. Her mind had sealed up more than her mother's face. I cannot say yet what kind of mage did this. I can run tests on you, but those details are beyond my equipment. Yet. Perinel narrowed her eyes. A magic user of this strength and dark means will have attracted some notice. I am showing my age because I can only think of fiends of yore, long since vanquished. Your brotherhood may have more information than I can provide. The front door glowed, and an urgent chime rang through the room. Apologies, Perinelle said as she put up her hand. She called to the door. Enter, friend. A robed man entered and pushed back his hood to reveal himself as the first alchemist. Madam, I must ask a word. 
Red grabbed her purse. Heavy emotion weighted her like a carpet of snow. She nodded her goodbyes as she left through the sitting room. The door deposited her in a marble corridor off Pyramid Hall. She barely noticed as she walked through the throng of alchemists. Her fellow students were still as much of a mystery as her past. The quest for her origins felt like a cruel joke. The firmest clues were a blank book, a silver chain necklace, a mysterious witch mother with an equally mysterious pedigree, a tattoo that protected her from divination spells, and her own ransacked magic. Her tattered visions from peyote clouded the path more than they illuminated it. She once thought it pointed north to Oregon, but the compass arrow now seemed to swivel toward hell. She needed real answers. Searching for her phone in her purse, she nearly tossed the contents to the ground in frustration before she found it. She swiped to Fat Crispin in her phone contacts, sick of emailing him about reinstating Vic to no reply. He hated calls, but she had discovered something huge about her magic. The clues kept pointing to the Northwest. How many mages on the West Coast could commit a crime like magic theft and order around vampire henchmen? A few with one or the other trait came to mind, but not anyone who could do both. She didn't have access to Bardnet through Vic anymore. Fat Crispin would have to pony up something. He owed her. The phone rang for what felt like ages as she walked without direction through the academy. She trotted by the fresh flooring over the crater that Hannah had made weeks ago. The line clicked to life. A weary and unfamiliar English voice answered, Oh, bother, er, hello? Hi, I'm a hunter and I need to talk to Jacob Crispin, she said, remembering his real first name at the last moment instead of the nickname for the elder bard. Dad's in the hospital. If it's urgent, find another bard. He won't be back at work for weeks. The line died. Red stopped in the middle of the hallway, staring at the phone screen. That didn't sound good. Fat Crispin was a rail-thin, pale, older man, contrary to the school day's nickname that had lasted into his adulthood. She texted a quick message to Vic to let him know. That cut off one source of information about this mysterious mage who stole her magic. What if this had been a rival of her mother's? There had to be a connection. Why here, anyway? Behind her, an annoyed adept asked, Are you going into the library or what? Red nodded, blinking at the roses carved into the grand entrance and headed inside. Her aimless feet had picked the right direction. The library wasn't an elder bard that she could interrogate, but there had to be something here. She wanted to get closure on who she had been to move, but it wouldn't as simple as finding home. Maybe it was naive all along to have thought so. She could float a feather on a good day. When she came home, there could be a reckoning when she finally met whoever or whatever held her stolen magic. She wasn't ready. Lee stocked books at the end cap of a shelf. She rushed to the librarian in a bow tie. I need help, and I can't answer any clarifying questions. Don't even have the name for what I want. You and every other patron. Lee pushed up their glasses, smiling at the challenge. Later, Red walked out of the library with a stack of tomes like the children's book When Wendy's Witch Bloom Came Early, A How-To Guide to Paper Magic, and an Encyclopedia of Strange Legends in Oregon. She strode into Pyramid Hall, eager to find a quiet spot to start reading. Ezra called to her from the empty swan pond as he walked over. Hey! She waved and waited for him by a potted palm that grew glowing purple coconuts. Did your mom tell you what happened? He studied the werewolf mark on her neck. That looks nasty. Are you okay? It's got a magic band-aid on it. I'm going home anyway before they change their minds about putting me in a cage. It casts my little room into new perspective. Let me take those, he offered, motioning at the books. That dorm staircase might as well be Mount Everest. Thanks. They walked through the pyramid. The quiet grew between them before she spotted a peacock perched on a table, picking at a forgotten plate of French fries. The sight kick-started their conversation before the topic drifted from alchemists being strange bird people to which of the old paintings creeped them out the most. They reached the dorm and climbed the stairs. 
Their conversation held the easy, desperate breeze of two people trying their best to enjoy each other, despite the spectacle swirling around them. Ezra shot her a crooked smile. I know it's kind of weird to say that I had a good time with you tonight after everything that happened, but I did. Me too. Red grinned as they reached the landing for the 10th floor and made it to her front door. I still stand firm that skee-ball is better than pinball. It's not a deal breaker. He adjusted the books under his arm and leaned past her to turn the knob. The door swung open. Red idled at the door sill, realizing how close together they were. He kissed her softly, a hand cupping her cheek. Eyes slipping closed, she kissed him back. His aura felt like a calming Nevada sunrise, like she was safe, but a breathless excitement heated her cheeks. A crash exploded from the dorm suite. Pouting, she broke away from him to lean back, looking inside the living room. Hannah crouched by the couch with the standing lamp in her arms. Sorry, I tried to be quiet since you guys were sucking face. Good job, Red said dryly. Hi, Hannah, Ezra said. He smiled at the older witch and handed over the books. I'll see you later, Red. Bye. After checking out his very nice backside as he walked to the brass staircase, Red closed the dorm suite door. She walked to her room, ignoring Hannah's stare, and put the library books down on her bed. Did you guys just restart your date after we got back? Hannah asked, then gasped and pointed. Your neck! Make me some tea and I'll tell you about it, Red said then ducked into her room to change into pajamas. The girl asked her questions through the door. After explaining her death ride back to the academy and refusing to give any details on her date with Ezra, she left Hannah to brush her teeth and then retreated back into her room. She'd had a date with Ezra, and now she had a date with her hunter's journal. Opening the first blank page, she jotted down the fresh memories of her encounter with Perinelle before writing out her first question. What happened to my magic? She flipped open the children's book first, hoping that poor Wendy's story might get her up to speed on how normal witches developed. Her notes from the colorful pages were as serious as the ones made from the introductory magic textbook she cross-referenced. The journaling turned into personal observations before research dissolved into releasing her pent-up emotions. Red remembered checking her phone at 3 a.m., but otherwise the night was a blur of paper cuts and hand cramps. She woke with her face pressed against a leather journal. The questions that had tormented her in the night poked her awake and into the shower to mull over any possible answers. Then she was distracted by an intriguing text message from Christoph. The rumor from the underworld pits is that Sancha Constanza put the hit out on the Proctor Witch. Consider this a peace offering, Red replied after deliberating too long over whether to include an emoji. Accepted. Feeling a little flushed and stupid, she regretted adding a belated smiley face in another message. She mulled over the gift instead of the giver. The vampire queen Sancha had hired Red and Vic to kill the last of the Oklahoma City pack, so it made sense that she would hire out for the murder of the last proctor. Since dying the final death last month, the vampiress was out of reach of justice. The situation was unusual, to say the least. Most jobs ended if the client died, but Sancha was a stone-cold schemer. She conceivably had the forethought and reach to set up a contingency trust for her final assassination order. Red passed the undead gossip on to Vic in a call, then tackled another mystery. Dressing simply in jeans and a long-sleeved black shirt, she brushed her teeth, then texted her favorite soulmancer and left her phone to recharge. She smiled ruefully as she imagined what Hannah would have to say about running around with a dead battery. Like all millennials, she felt a bit naked without a phone, but it would only be a quick errand. She debated putting her journal in her purse, but she didn't want to get lost in organizing the nest of books she had fallen asleep in. She raced down the stairs, dodging alchemists as she went. Accidentally elbowing one, she apologized, only belatedly realizing it was Dr. Finch as she dashed by. His eyes widened nervously at her, as if expecting her to sprout fur and fangs. Hopefully, news of her wolf wrestling hadn't spread. That's all she needed for her reputation. She tried not to dwell on it as she found Basil outside the laboratory in one of the less grand corridors off the pyramid. This one was brick instead of marble. 
You're lucky I was already up and preparing early for my next lecture. I don't take morning appointments, he said grandly standing up to reveal his chartreuse linen suit had been tailored with shorts for bottoms. Red led him away from the crowded hallway to a more isolated row of laboratories in the mismatched maze that was the academy. This is important. I know you just do souls, but Perinelle told me something weird about my magic. She recounted the tale. I don't know if the Enthymema draft worked as intended, but it did something. I just need to check and see what there is to see. I did this a few days ago. Basil sighed. Closing his eyes, he lifted his hands. He frowned after a long minute. That's new. There is more dimension. I can read new imprints on your soul, but they feel like fragments. Are you talking about those ridges that you went on about during your last lecture? He swirled his palm over her forehead, his lips puckered in confusion. Some are more jagged than others. I can't sense anything about your magic that has changed. When we did that first ceremony to recover your memories, I connected with your magic, and then when we were together on the Genesis machine, it always felt like a cup in a gallon jug. An adept stuck their head out of a laboratory. He yelled, Will you two find somewhere else to talk? Some of us are getting ranked tomorrow. Basil huffed, turned on his heel, and led Red into a doorway at the end of the hall. This is only for staff and esteemed visiting scholars like me. I've stumbled into the teacher's lounge before. She walked into a wood-paneled chamber with a ceiling rounded like a wine barrel. Milling teachers and alchemists sat at couches and tables, grading scrolls and eating microwaved meals. More like the teacher's wing, he said, moving toward the back of the room. I can read one thing loud and clear in your soul, that diner in Oregon. Every weird dream I've had lately includes it. I think that's what you sensed when you scanned me. It's a real memory. Are we sure? Really sure? Not just hopeful? It's a concretish lead. Red cringed as she looked around, not meaning to raise her voice. A few professor types looked at her, including the doctor who whispered to another alchemist at the coffee pot. She pulled Basil into a winding side hallway of apartments for the staff. It's solid, and so is this dark mage who took my magic. He smoothed his hair, shifting from her awkwardly. That's a thread you shouldn't pull yet. You're safer doing an Oregon diner tour and binging on waffles. I'm safer being here, she droned as her restless feet moved down the hall, passing welcome mats and doorways marked with sigils. Basil barked out a dry laugh. Say it again with more enthusiasm. I can't. She tried to piece together how to explain the growing call drawing her north to Oregon as they turned a corner to another line of private suites. A distant thump made her pause. She listened for the source and scanned the new hallway. Another thump sounded from an ajar door across the hall. It seemed left open by mistake. Inside the apartment, Trudy paced in her living room. Her curly ponytail bounced in agitation behind her as she spoke to an unseen guest. You went on a date with her? Is that really news to drop a book over? Ezra asked, his head popping into view of the eavesdroppers as he picked up the book to set it on an out-of-sight surface. Red turned to leave, feeling awkward, but Basil put his finger to his lips and pressed himself against the wall. His aura flared white with his soulmancy magic. They eavesdropped together. Trudy demanded answers from her son. Are you sleeping with her? We're close now, Mom, but I still don't want to talk about my sex life. But no, she hasn't sullied my virtue. What is she to you, a girlfriend? What's up with you? Ezra asked. You've been weird since I came over. First it started with breakfast at the buffet, when I haven't seen you eat a carb in years, and then you drop all those bombshells. Now you want to start in on Red and Vic? I'm merely stressed. I received a call from the Brotherhood, Trudy confessed, settling heavily on the couch. She covered her face as she pulled down her chained glasses. They've added to my orders. Two weeks back in the fold, and they're already jerking you around. Is it the Brotherhood or Mr. Gabriel? Don't make that face. They were going to assign Hannah to another bard, even after I found her and brought her to safety. He's the one who got me reinstated. 
Trudy wagged a warning finger. You think the head bard did that? She was the one who led the witch hunt with Felix Williams. Red shared a quick look with Basil. She thought Trudy had retired, not that she was driven out. What else didn't they know? Ezra's tone came out firm and insistent. Melissa was not your fault. Trudy shook off the attempt at comfort with acidic derision. I failed by every definition of the word. She was a responsibility given to me by the Brotherhood. I was always a better warrior than a bard. Let me guess. Management agrees, so they're sending you after those werewolves. Trudy sighed. Mr. Gabriel wants me to take out the threat. The order was for Hannah, but she isn't ready for all that is demanded of a hero. She won't see this side of duty while I'm around. What about Red? Ezra suggested desperately. This isn't the fight that I want for her either, I assure you. He switched tacks and pleaded, I don't want you to Lone Ranger this one. I have resources. A step creaked closer to the door as Ezra asked, Is someone... Red and Basil crept backwards. He hustled her into a portal archway before anyone could see the accidental spies. They popped into a stone chamber. It would have looked like a standard lab except for the two peacocks, laying on a patch of grass in the center. The archway they had entered through disappeared in a ripple that smoothed into a bare wall. Basil muttered as he wandered ahead. Now, I could have sworn that door went somewhere else. He stepped on a sigil, just as she spotted the hex. Red knocked him aside to the ground. An arrow soared over them, shot from the wall like it had been placed in a forbidden temple for tomb raiders. She helped Basil to his feet, looking for more arrows. Smoke billowed over the grass. The peacocks took flight to land on the ledge of a pillar. She started running before she discovered what had spooked the birds. Damn alchemists and their freaking booby traps. She opened another door and ran into an unfamiliar hallway. The stone hall spun like roulette wheel, and she found herself running on the ceiling. She couldn't read the floor sigil that she had accidentally activated, but it was powerful enough to skew her perception. This was vertigo on crack. Her friend bolted in the other direction, still somehow on the ground. Basil! She tried to run over to him, but, defying all physical logic, each step took her farther away from him. Why couldn't he hear her? Where was he going? The room spun again, and she found herself on the ground. She staggered. Leaning against the wall, she fought through the nausea. Basil was gone when she recovered. She tried to find him in the maze of laboratory doors, feeling like she was in one of those old low-budget cartoons where they just recycled the same background image over and over. Dr. Finch stood at the end of the hall in a white coat. She ran up to him. Finally, someone who could direct her out of this loop. Red asked, Hey, can you help me find my way back to the pyramid? The doctor's reply was a sweaty grimace. He lifted his palm, blowing gray powder at her face. The harsh particles rocketed into her eyes and mouth. She choked as the powder coated her throat. Lightheaded, she dropped to the ground, her legs giving into gravity. She barely heard his sad apology as the sedative dragged her into oblivion. February 12th, afternoon. Las Vegas, Nevada. Red rolled on scratchy soft fabric before stopping against a warm form. The wind flapped too loudly for her to stay asleep. A deep feeling of wrongness hit her before true wakefulness did. She was on the move. Cracking an eye open, she winced at what vehicle she was in. This was the werewolf's ride. Diego Blanco lay beside her. Bound at the wrists and ankles, he hadn't been able to pull off a Houdini and escape. A sodden bandana gagged him. His gold suit was wrinkled, like he'd been in it for days. He had been packed like an old duffel bag in the rear of a soft-top jeep. His wide brown eyes willed her not to make a sound. The rippling plastic jeep windows showed white and beige houses in a tidy southwestern neighborhood. Good, it looked like they were still in Vegas. <laughs> How did she get out without alerting the wolves in the front seats? She couldn't leave Diego, and certainly she'd do better with Synod Alchemist on her side. 
His cuffs looked like a special alloy of cold iron etched with unfamiliar symbols. After using a set on Nevaeh Morgan, Red knew their power. The cuffs restrained his magic as much as his movements. Old blood stains on the upholstery stretched between them like grim foreshadowing. Unbound, she stayed still as she tried to peer at the werewolf in the driver's seat without moving her head. Gloria. The passenger seat seemed occupied but was outside her vision. It took a moment for her ears to decipher the conversation with the wind escaping through gaps between the fasteners on the old jeep's soft top. Are different now that Paul is... Gloria's feminine voice drifted from the front. At her brother's name, she whimpered quietly, more like a beast than a woman. Red scanned the back of the jeep to see if they had brought her purse along. Were Mace in such a tight space with billowing wind would hurt her too, but she was willing to take the risk. Unfortunately, she didn't see her purse anywhere. There was only a twisted-up blanket on the floor near where the rear seats had been folded back. The front passenger didn't say anything to Gloria's mumbled words. Masculine hands came into view, lifting Red's wallet to pull out the cash. He tossed the wallet against the back door to bounce and land at Diego's feet. Red frowned. Her purse was in the front seat then. Thank God she hadn't brought her journal. Gloria fiddled with the radio dials and then tapped her fingers on the gear shift. Her wandering fingers, full of the restless energy before a kill, moved to a golden poker chip on the cluttered dashboard. I'm glad we're not waiting for Nuno. I love my brother, but you know him. Chilled, Red fought the ragged gasp bubbling up in her lungs. She knew who was in the front seat now. Dear old Daddy Lopes. Yeah, poor Nuno, Gloria said. That doctor is probably just bitching at him about having a trace on his own key when we split up. Frank Lopes grunted an affirmative. Gloria performed a stuttering impression of the doctor. But the deal was for the other key. Everything tumbled into place for Red with terrible clarity. She knew why they took her and the alchemist. Diego had an untracked key as a synod member. The wolves got a clean way into the academy to get Hannah and Dr. Finch was down a rival. Ranking season could make alchemists competitive. She hadn't realized how deep it could go. Or was it more personal than academic? Diego had effortless charm, natural talent, and a whirlwind lifestyle as a headlining singer. This was before you counted his accomplishments in the laboratory that earned him a place on the 20-member synod. Did it burn Dr. Finch to see the playboy alchemist rise in the ranks without seeming to try? It must have scorched him enough to bring in assassins to ensure he would reach the top. The doctor was smart. He wouldn't want the werewolves use his poker chip key, tracked as a regular adept. Yet obviously, Braun had beaten brains among the conspirators when the opportunity arose to nab Red. A mistake that the gendarme would make him regret his schemes. She could only hope that Ian Keeley had noticed a strange ping on the chip. But why did they grab her? Did they realize they couldn't kill Hannah and escape even with the key and needed more bait to lure the teen out? Judging by the cage in the creepy exam room, Perinelle might have accidentally saved Red from being snatched earlier. Gloria chattered on. Them both dead and buried, then we'll be out of this town by sunset. When the job is over, can we stop at Donkey's, maybe, you think? Diego stiffened. Red bit her lip to repress the gasp. It was impossible. They weren't after Hannah at all. They were after Red. Why else would the job be over once she was dead? The witch summoned her magic without any ingredients. She only had the elements to rely on. She beckoned to the air, igniting her power to ready it to her will, even before she knew what to do with it. Gloria started to whine. I can't wait to get the hell out of that squatter's den. I don't care if it's warded from alchemists. I don't like being in debt to a... Quiet. The hoarse whisper filled the jeep, cutting through the white noise of the wind. Hard fingers yanked Red up by the hair. She didn't struggle against the grip, locked in frozen terror. Frank Lopes's flat stare was utterly dispassionate under his thick eyebrows. Up close, an old scar puckered the skin of his neck. It trailed off into the patchwork of lumpy scars on his hairy chest, revealed by his half-zipped windbreaker. Nostrils flaring, he whispered, 
I smell magic. Red shrieked and lifted her hand out, propelling a gust of air that sent Frank back in his seat. She resisted panicking and throwing all her magic at him. With two wolves, it could be a long fight. Gloria swerved the jeep as she glanced backwards. She was supposed to be knocked out for hours. The iron cuffs repelled Red when she took Diego's hand to combine their magics, so she fell back and tried to find something else to defend them with. Her fingers brushed against her wallet. She tucked it into her waistband, but that wasn't going to help her now. Something long and metallic pinched at her under the floor blanket. She groped for it. It was a tire iron. Now, that was something she could use. The tight fit of the jeep's back area and its folded seats made it awkward to grab from under herself. Gloria called over her shoulder. Daddy's going to get you, bitch. We're going to carve you up for your shitty little friend to find. Then we're going to get him for Paul. Knife in hand, Frank climbed into the back, shimmying over the flattened seats like a marine in a foxhole. Red kicked his head with the flat of her foot. Frank growled, balancing on his knees next to Diego. The jeep bounced over a speed bump. He lurched. Gloria yelled, Sorry! Red threw the blanket over Frank to blind him. Diego rolled in his way to knock the wolf off balance. Red levitated the tire iron up. She didn't have the clearance to physically swing it hard enough to hurt a werewolf. The tire iron bashed against Frank's head and then his ribs. Gloria slowed the jeep. Daddy! Red slipped her fingers under the edge of the soft top over the back door. Channeling energy away from the tire iron, she willed the air to slam the back window open. The plastic flew up over the spare tire to flap against the roof. Wind blowing her hair back, she reached for Diego. She hoped there was enough slack in his chain and grabbed him by the armpits, launching them out of the car. With only a second to spare, she channeled the air, thickening it into a cushion for her and Diego. They glided an inch above the pavement for a few yards. After spinning in a tumble of legs, they skidded to a stop. Red heaved herself to her feet in the center of the residential street. It had that eerie calm of the middle of the day when everyone was at work. Diego hyperventilated behind his gag. Back protesting, she hoisted him to his knees. Come on, we gotta run. The jeep spun into a tire-squealing U-turn. She kept a tight leash on the air energy around her, readying it for defense. Diego's ankle cuffs kept him from moving faster than a shuffle. She ungagged him after they fled onto the sidewalk and crossed a rock lawn. He drew a harsh breath into his liberated lips. Red, you absolute angel. You haven't met an angel yet. Get me out of these cuffs and I'll be an avenging one, starting with Finch for selling us both out. Let's just run, Red said as her hands grew clammy. A familiar feverish feeling from heated her cheeks. Overusing magic had a consequence. She muscled through it as they retreated around a street corner. A sparse group at a bus stop across the empty intersection stared at the mages, pointing and muttering to themselves. She quickened her jaywalking, relieved for presence of witnesses, as Diego shuffled beside her. It was broad daylight. There was a group of bystanders. The werewolves couldn't do anything or risk the secrecy of the Dark Veil. It was the first rule of supernatural law. The bus rolled up to the stop right on time. Red smiled, grateful for the transit pass in her wallet. Frank Lopes had lost. A tire screech warned her too late. The jeep slammed into Diego at her side, metal bested flesh in combat. Red rocketed forward before the car fully hit her. Instinctive magic flung her into a thicket of rosemary by the bus stop. Scratchy twigs cut her face as she landed on the oversized bush. Shock locked her limbs. Her arms trembled, refusing to lift her. She rolled over, buffered by the sweet-smelling rosemary. Diego! He stirred in the middle of the street. Frank jumped out of his jeep, clutching a tire iron, and marched to the prone man. Red struck her hand out, trying to channel the air around the tire iron to wrench it away. The metal bar jerked up from the assassin's hand. A silent snarl on his face, Frank grabbed the tire iron in midair and jerked it down. Werewolf strength didn't need a wind-up. The metal cracked through Diego's temple like a ceramic teapot. It wasn't oolong tea that came out. Without magic and their laboratories, alchemists were just humans. 
fragile. Red gagged as she rose on quaking knees. Oh, goddess, fuck, Diego. Screams erupted from the bus stop. Somebody get his license plate. He just fucking killed that guy. Another bus rider winched their phone up. I got a picture of it. Dad, come on, Gloria yelled from the driver's seat, covering her face. Frank aimed the dripping tire iron at Red like a promise. He jumped into the back of the Jeep. It zoomed through a stoplight. Shaking, Red stumbled to the bus stop. Were you kidnapped? Who killed that guy? What happened? I woke up in that Jeep, she muttered, her voice distorted to her ears. I don't know. I don't know. Someone pushed a water bottle into her hands. Another person asked her name. She could barely breathe from the hovering, but she couldn't move, except for her shocked trembles. The flash of police car lights woke her from her stupor. Cops roamed in packs as much as wolves did. Five cars and the CSI came moments after the first response from the Las Vegas Police Department had pulled up. Ex-military by the looks of his regulation crew cut, the lead detective barked orders to the assembled beat cops and crime scene techs. He loped to the bus stop bench. Red craned her sore neck up to meet his sharp gaze. Before he could speak, she said, I should probably start with the fact that I am living at the Circe Casino. You'll want to warn one of the guys in bowler hats about this. The detective audibly gulped before he whispered into his handheld radio, This is a code, Circe. That was the last, he said, until he dropped her off on the strip. Red was fine with the silence. She was still processing her last car ride. From Finch's betrayal to Diego's key, this was a tangled tapestry. Each thread led to more ghosts. If Diego had survived, what he had learned as a hostage could have been enough to give the gendarme to sniff out every member of the conspiracy. Was the rumor about Sancha Constanza fake? Because the wolves hinted that they had another ally with wards to hide the pack behind. Frank's good luck charm must only protect himself from the Academy's locator spells, and that psychopath was still loose in Vegas. She felt like she had put together a jigsaw puzzle wrong. The pieces fit, but it looked nothing like the box. Ian Kelly I met her at the casino's side entrance. The LVPD detective drove off as soon as she was free of his car. She zipped past the gendarme officer into the casino. They killed Diego. I know. I'm sorry, but keep your voice down. We haven't informed his family yet, and I'd rather they not learn this in a rumor, Ian murmured. He directed her into a coat room off the side of front lobby. Instead of coats, the Grand Banyan swept into view. It's going to be difficult, but I need to ask you some questions. She faced him in the shade of the great tree. We don't have time. The Lopez pack captured Diego to get his key, and they had inside help. Perinelli strode up to them from a nearby archway. I heard there was a disturbance. Now, judging by your faces, I know there was one. Red wavered on her feet, fighting the flashback of Diego's grisly death. They weren't after Hannah anymore. They're after me. Ian steadied her shoulders. Tell me about it while we get you to the doctor. The doctor was working with them. Finch, the one I saw yesterday. Madam, you saw him. He blew some powder in my face, and I woke up in the back of a jeep with Diego. Perinel stepped to a portal arch, tapping sigils on the side. The energy turned from green to purple. She said, let's make haste. Red rushed in with Ian trailing behind her. They spilled out into the fragrant apothecary. She said, I don't know what Elsa the doctor is doing for them, but they are shielded in their den by more than Frank's good luck charm. I think they have a powerful new friend. It's why we haven't been able to scry their location. Perinel raced through the apothecary and into the waiting room of the adjoining medical office. Where is Dr. Finch? The front desk clerk stuttered, staring at the immortal alchemist and the gendarme. He just left, went to his car. Show us. Ian hurried the clerk along as they ran through the swinging doors to the exam rooms and out a back door to the parking lot. The clerk pointed to a sign above an empty spot labeled, Reserved for Doctor. I don't know where he went. Red ran towards the exit of the parking lot where a half-toppled palm tree drew her eye. 
That curbside palm had been straight yesterday. A crashed gray sedan idled on the tilted palm tree like it was trying to climb it. The engine was still on, humming as if confused while the tree strained to stay upright under its weight. Bullet holes marred the back window, cracks forming a pattern like a spider web. Finch had almost gotten away. Or the shooter had just given him a head start. The Lopes pack liked to play with their prey. Red had seen a crime photo of Joseph Proctor. It was the same sniper M.O. She sprinted to the car. Blood splattered the front windshield and the driver's white coat. She opened the door, leaning over the corpse to shift the car into park and kill the engine. I found the doctor. Sixteen. February 12th afternoon, the Las Vegas Strip, Circe Casino, a dozen black golf carts surrounded Red and the crashed sedan. Alchemists in black robes canvassed the murder like crime scene technicians and roped off the scene with a braided chain of vines. A bleary, mystical barrier rose, obscuring that section of the parking lot. Ian directed his deputies in bowler hats and trench coats. Red pointed to the magical curtain. Neat trick. Is that just for the normies or the soups too? Perinelle stalked up to them with a dark anger in her face. Her purple irises shifted completely black. She yanked open the back door of the car and liberated a framed painting from inside. Red studied the painting over the immortal shoulder. It was a serene hilly landscape dotted with green trees around a winding creek crafted from thick brush strokes. She asked, is this the time to appreciate art? I believe your soul mancer is waving at me. Perinel pointed to painted Basil in his chartreuse suit, waved his arms. The picture moved like an impressionist was animating it in real time. Red peered closer, mystified by his predicament. Basil, how do you get into these messes? He stomped over the highest rolling pastoral painted hill, animated in quick strokes. His minuscule middle finger flipped up. Red knew better than to laugh at the tiny, angry man. I'll accept that. How do we get him out of there? Perinel said this was confiscated after the late doctor released the last occupant yesterday. He should have notes. Let's hope we can decipher them swiftly. The landscape seems to have a stream and some orchards, so he has food and water. We shouldn't test his foraging skills. Ian came up to Perinel, hat in hand. His face always had a slight grumpy cast to it with his twice broken nose, but today he looked like a boxer at a grudge match. Madam, we'll have the scene cleared up, but we need to get this evidence to a lab quickly. It's protocol to get the first alchemist's written permission to use a portal disc. Because of the rarity, yes, sensible protocol. Tell him I forced you to disobey, Perinel said with a conspirator's cool. Ian pulled out a metallic disc engraved with tiny spirals of arcane symbols, a grimly satisfied smile flickering on his face. He crouched to toss the portable portal under the bed of the car. Do as I do, Red, Perinel leaned against the metal, arm wrapped over the hood. Her students mimicked the pose, barely processing the strange string of syllables that the immortal uttered. The car disappeared in a blaze of light to reappear in the storage room where she had first arrived at the school. Two white-robed mages pushed a stretcher toward the car. Red looked from their efforts to stare at a shelf of magical curios without seeing the objects. Dr. Finch's body was gone, but she couldn't forget it. The academy wasn't the sanctuary she thought it was. She wiped her cheek, accidentally smearing blood from a cut on her face. How was she going to tell Basil about his friend? But no matter how clumsily she said it, it was going to be better than him overhearing it as he hung over a mantle. Basil, I have something terrible to tell you. The painted man sat down, cross-legged on the fake grass. Red took the painting. Perinel rested a light hand on her arm. The witch confessed the tragic end of the Circe Casino's most spellbinding singer. Basil covered his face, the poetic brushstroke shifted as his shoulders shook. Red teared up at his distress. The soulmancer had only just proved himself and reconnected with his old friend. Frank Lopes had smashed every hope for their reunion. Red said, 
Paranel, the wolves are after me. I'm not Hannah. I don't need to wait on the sidelines, doing my homework in the library. I'm better out there. Ask the Synod to put me in this. I already recommended it. Now I will order them too. The Lopes gang have tricks, but no one has been able to make a hex stick on them. No one's seen them. That takes a major player to cover up a pack. They have another ally in the city. Perinella narrowed her eyes. Somehow, I doubt this ally cares as much about your downfall as ours. It's ranking season all around, Red said. Las Vegas, with its endless supply of tourist gold, was a sweet prize for any faction. The alchemists had tossed their weight around long enough to make enemies. It wasn't the first time that she had been caught up in supernatural politics. Let's make a deal. Full transparency from our end, even if you tell us squat. The gendarme goes after who's hiding the wolves, and I lure the pack out of town. I'll order it done. Perinel took a small vial out of her sleeve and swapped it for the painting. Drink that to fortify yourself. Adrenaline receding. Red already saw spots in her vision. She couldn't argue. Now when she said she felt like she'd been hit by a car, she'd know what she was talking about. She tipped the potion down the hatch. It tasted how mothballs smelled, but a sudden soothing warmth spread through her body. The throbbing in her aching body eased to a dull pang. It didn't solve the drain on her magic, but it was a start. Perinel shooed her off. I will take care of our dear soul, Mancer. Once you have decided your course, find me in my quarters. Red left and walked through a pyramid hall, ignoring the stairs on her way to her dorm. She found her phone, still charging where she'd left it this morning, and texted Vic to assemble the Avengers. Tired and achy, she showered off the blood and rosemary-scented fear sweat. Her tears swirled down the drain, too. Memories of Diego's brutal end stabbed her. She pulled herself together by the time she was thoroughly wrinkled and then turned off the shower. Avoiding her reflected gaze in the mirror, she toweled off her hair and tied it up. She examined the reopened werewolf claw scratches on her shoulder and bandaged them robotically. Grief solidified into a numb determination. She was done with playing defense. Red brought her hunter's kit to the Nostradamus lounge. Otherwise, she was outfitted for comfort in thick leggings and a green hoodie. Her friends had taken over a secluded corner booth. It wouldn't be a party night. Ezra hovered nearby, keeping other patrons away from the table. Vic sipped a beer. Grief haunted his eyes, but anger wasn't far behind. She had seen him lose friends before. The murderers never survived to take another life. He glowered at Trudy, who ignored him. Hannah poked her straw at a pink Shirley temple, sitting between the two bards. Red was surprised to see Lucas leaning against the booth table, and not because sunset was two hours away. Despite the fluorescence, the casino might have been a cave due to its lack of natural light. It was early for a vampire who liked to sleep in. The sight of him dialed down her anxiety. She might not know where she stood with him, but she knew he had her back. Lucas spotted her first gaze sweeping over her with concern. Kitten, look at you. I'm fine, not like Diego. Basil isn't doing great, even if it looks like he's in a Bob Ross painting. Ezra pulled out a chair for her. You should sit. Do you need something? She tried to smile at him, but the heaviness of the day made it impossible. Shaking her head, she launched into a jumbled retelling of the day's misery. Vic cursed. I'll fucking take their pelts for this. Finish what my dad started. While Hannah cried, Trudy asked the sporadic question, Can the Soulmancer communicate from the painting? Lucas stayed weirdly quiet, leather-clad arms wrapped around himself as he glowered. Red finally accepted water from Ezra after she sketched out the mystery of the doctor's death and the painting that trapped Basil. Why you? Lucas asked finally breaking his silence. I thought they were after the kid. Hannah nodded vigorously. I got attacked by a raksha in Wichita and a troll in Taos. What was that then? There was a bounty on you, 
Red explained. It was set up by Sancha Constanza. Besides the Lapices, you haven't had another assassin come for you since she died last month. But why attack me at the truck stop unless... Hannah started to say before she slapped her forehead. It's the main highway between L.A. and Vegas, nothing much in between. They picked the wrong witch. I was in that red wig. Vic said it wouldn't be the first time that a merc was sent in blind with just a rough description and direction. Red added, It's not like I put selfies on the internet. They must have looked up who they attacked later. Maybe demanded clarification from their client. Then in the nightclub, that skank werewolf couldn't look at us because of the protection spell. Red finished Hannah's line of thought. We just thought she was talking to you. Vic slumped back in his chair. I thought we killed all your enemies before we left L.A. Who wants to off you now? Didn't get a chance to ask Frank about his client when I was nearly dying or running away, but they could have, have tracked us from California. Maybe from the apartment, even. I've taken out enough bad guys by now. It could be someone's cousin getting revenge, for all I know. Vic glared at Trudy as the other bard took notes in her journal. I told you we couldn't wait for the wolves to figure out how to blow our house down. That was before Lopes ganked my friend. Those bastards killed my dad, Hannah snarled, slapping the table. We need to go after them. Lucas jerked his thumb to the teen. We're taking the kid. I'm not a kid. I'm 18. I'm over a hundred, Lucas snarked, leaning against the booth. Hey, Red said, you're both too old for sniping at each other. We need... Hannah yelled over her. I'm sick of being a good girl hiding in the tower. Ezra whistled for attention. He gave a calm suggestion to Hannah as he passed by in his work apron. You want to be seen as an adult here. Red smiled her thanks to the bartender, then turned back to her motley crew. They're shielded. We can't find the wolves unless they leave their den. Hannah waved her hand, dismissing the idea. They can't possibly stay here after pissing off the alchemist this much. Vic killed their beta, right? Paul Lopes. It's not about the money now, Vic commented grimly. It's personal. Frank is gunning for me. He still wants that bounty, Red said. She hadn't shut her eyes when Frank killed a man, and she couldn't unsee it now. It hadn't been a crime of passion. There was a brutal efficiency. Just like when he ripped the money from her wallet and tossed it over his shoulder. Lucas suggested urgently, Come back to L.A. Let the alchemists zap them. The wolves will just follow me there, and you know what happens if I break the dark veil in a vampire town. Red couldn't believe she had to remind him of all people, about the judgment from the Blood Alliance's tribunal. She added, I just got out of Cora Moon's debt. Vic squinted over his beer glass. Shifters are impervious to a lot of spells, but there's more than one way to skin a wolf. The alchemists would take them out if they could. They might have wards on the move, too. The daughter mentioned Frank had a good luck charm that he got off an old wolf mage he killed. Red couldn't remember the name off the top of her head, but she had written it down. Hannah groaned. So, they're protected from spells. Red said, Daddy dearest cut her off, but I could have sworn Gloria was about to mention who has been sheltering them. She almost said it, but I started revving up my magic and he sensed it. Trudy tapped her pen against her journal, taking a break from her frantic note-taking. The Synod can make the local Alpha give up any of rogues who are working with Frank. The Pack may resent the Alchemists, but the Lapices are breaking the Dark Veil. That endangers us all. Frank obviously doesn't care about that big code of secrecy, Red said. We need to get them away from a city full of innocent bystanders and away from whoever is helping them. Finally, choose our battlefield. Excited, Hannah suggested. I can be a decoy. They went after me once. Absolutely not, Trudy scolded. Vic wagged his finger. There's an idea here. Someone needs to wear the wig, and I'm not sure how I'll look as a redhead. Hannah is not to be involved, Trudy said. Her chin jutted out at a determined angle at the teen's breathless disagreement. I can take her place in a fight. Ezra rushed to the table. Fear tightened his features like he already saw a ghost. Mom, no. Stay. You're tough, but you completed your destiny. 
You nearly didn't come home how many times when I was a kid? Hand the baton over in this death relay. Red bowed her head, paranoid that her face would reveal that she understood the source of his desperation. Everyone else saw a battle-hardened veteran in Trudy. Only Ezra and Red saw the cancer diagnosis. Trudy stood, crossing her arms. If my brotherhood calls me, I answer. I am needed. Ezra argued, You're needed with Hannah. They have three hunters, including a vampire. I can go with them instead. But you, Trudy sputtered, seemingly flabbergasted as her glasses slipped down her nose. You trained me to be more than a bartender. Let me do it. I can't fight like them, but I can be the wheelman, water boy, whatever. Trudy rubbed the worry trench deepening between her eyes. No, I won't allow it. I'll definitely go if you do. Red coughed for attention, noticing a gendarme in a black bowler hat amid the light weeknight crowd of the Nostradamus lounge. She didn't know how she felt about taking Ezra on a hunt, but she'd feel worse if Trudy got injured. The line of thought disappeared when she noticed Vic's brother. What was he doing back after that last blow-up? A dark-clad gendarme came up to them with LaShawn. He said, Howdy, folks. I found one of your party, and I need to take Ms. Fox to find Madame Flamel. Something about a painting. Ezra grinned at his mother. See, they need you here. Please, Red said to Trudy. Get Basil out. He might have soul read the doctor and learned something. Trudy nodded. Disquiet lurked in the depths of her hazel eyes. She looked to Ezra. Then we both stay out of harm's way. Hannah as well. Hannah grumbled but left at Trudy's curt order, trailing behind her in the gendarme. Vic stewed, relief slumping his shoulders. Lash on, you came back. The prodigal brother cleaned his glasses on his shirt as his worried gaze fixed on Vic. I couldn't go, not after what I heard. Those werewolves are after you now, Victor. I already had a hunter call me about a bearded one sniffing around because you killed his beta. Vic drew Lashown in for a hug. Good to have another fighter. We're planning the ambush now. <laughs> I'm going to need some Chardonnay for this, please, Lashawn said to Ezra. Vic bounced back into the booth with a sly, diabolical smile. I got some ideas for the bastards. Sit, little bro. You've taken out a wolf or two in your day. Red jotted down their brainstorming in her journal as beer bottles and cocktail glasses multiplied on the table. After laying out the facts and taking ideas, the disagreements started to pile up. The problem intensified with questions around the Lopez Pack's mysterious protector. She said, As far as we know, any faction in town could be Frank's ally. It'll be tough to isolate the Lopes unless we make it a road trip. No matter who backs them, we have to get all three in quick succession. Vic cut her off. I can do it, she sighed. Werewolves can rip your throat before you could aim a gun. Frank had been a sniper in the military. He could outshoot us. Maybe you, Vic said, his nose in the air. LaShawn said, she's right. No doubt he taught his kids how to shoot. We're dealing with a dynasty of assassins. The sole vampire at the table pushed his empty beer pint away. His surly expression wasn't reflected on the shiny glass. We don't need all this rotten magic. Just lemme at them. I can rip through a werewolf with blessed silver chains on. That rotten magic can do the job for us, Red snapped. They were going in circles by this point. We can weaken them with wolfbane, take them out with crossbows and guns before we even get to a hand-to-hand -hand fight. It's easier for Frank to shoot us if we run at him. We can win, but we'll lose someone if it comes to an open fight. That's what I'm trying to avoid. I'm with her. LaShawn raised his hand. My vote is for booby traps. I like the idea of an ambush where I don't have to go charging into a supernatural skirmish. Lucas shook his head. We don't even have a location yet. Vic joked. I still like my idea of going to the bunny ranch. No brothels, the other Constantine said firmly. She got up from the table, still stinging from Lucas's wisecrack about magic. I'll find us a location. Perinel should have an idea. Lucas stood to touch her arm. What I said. It's the job, not me storming off in a huff. 
I'll be back, Red said, trying to lower her hackles. She managed to cool her temper before she reached Perinelle's quarters in the academy. The alchemist sat hunched at her laboratory work table, chin propped up on her knuckles. Beakers bubbled on the counters behind her. It smelled like sulfur and failure. She stared flatly at the impressionist prison on an easel. I fear morale is low. Red guessed the answer to her question before she asked it. He's still in the painting, huh? Despite my and Trudy's efforts, he does remain in his beautiful prison. I dismissed the bard for now so I could better ponder the problem. I believe I am close. I just need to figure out where I went wrong. If only I could hear him. Perinelle straightened, arms crossing over her embroidered bodice. Enough about me. You look flush with news. The plan is to draw the wolves into an ambush away from their unknown benefactor's resources, Red said, leaving out the bickering. They'll kill innocents and break the dark veil to get this job done so we can't do it anywhere with bystanders. We've narrowed down some locations, but I was wondering if you had an idea. I thought about the portal we came to the Academy in. It could make for a quick getaway if we need it. The highway to Los Angeles and the southern half of this state has too many demon clans and vampire nests that may aid your enemy to spite my academy. In any case, the pack knows of that portal. However, there is one known to few even in these halls. It has yet to be traveled. Perinelle rummaged through an old battered cabinet. She pulled out an earthen jug. This portal of which I speak is but a transplant seedling. Of what? A proud smile spread across the immortal alchemist's face, erasing her earlier gloom. Of the Grand Banyan. Her roots go deep as her canopy collects the excess magical residue in the academy, much like her mundane brethren do oxygen. She shares the power with her children. The recycled magic fuels many of our spells. Red blinked in amazement at the self-sustaining portal system. Any space used for magic too long absorbed the energy, which created wacky side effects. The banyan was like a natural generator and acted like a bonus air filter. That explains why there aren't any weird spirits hanging around here. Perinelle nodded, opening the jug to release a heavy, moist, green scent. You could do this academy another service. The portal seedling is almost ready for its maiden voyage. We were going to send an adept to water it in a ritual, but perhaps you would like to do the honors. It will take any key holder back to the academy. Now that's an exit strategy. We can call the gendarme in if it gets woolly. Where is it? Battleforge, Nevada, an abandoned mining town in the north. No faction claims that patch of wilderness. There will be little risk of breaking the dark veil. Red looked up Battleforge on her phone. There were closer places to ambush the pack, yet the mining town was right on the border with Oregon. It felt like another nudge from the universe to go north. It looks kind of far. We have our ways to make your journey quicker. Perinelle's smile turned wicked. You should be able to devise all manner of clever bedevilment for the wolves. The boys will love it. Red thanked Perinelle and headed back to the Nostradamus lounge in the casino. When she arrived, Vic was losing an arm wrestling match to LaShawn. She said, I got a location. It's a bit of a drive, but the way back will be a blink. Tensions relaxed once they had Battleforge to strategize around. She was determined they would all come out of this intact, even if the guys wanted to play cowboy. LaShawn had her back at least. Ezra supplied them with a few more drinks to help flesh out some details for the plan, with plenty of contingencies. Guarded by Lucas, Red would be the center of the first assault, silently levitating blades slathered with wolfsbane to weaken and slow the wolves so they couldn't dodge arrows or bullets. Then the others would fire from hidden perches to vanquish all three as quick as possible. It felt fitting to use Frank's tricks against him. The hours stretched into early evening as they deliberated. Red grew more tired. Perinella's elixir had been like a painkiller, easing the body-length ache of being hit by the jeep, but the effects were fading. A headache started behind her ear and spread. She said, I think we got this. Let's sleep on it. Vic nodded. You look like crap from everything that you've been, though. Hit the hay, intern. 
Lucas glared as if he were still her boyfriend. She looks fine, Constantine. She sighed. I don't need you to defend me. Ever the diplomat, Lashawn interrupted. Hey, we're brain fried. Everyone has each other's number, so text if you have a brilliant idea. Sure, she said, rubbing her aching neck as the group filtered out of the table booth. Vic walked beside her. Remember, you're the linchpin, Red. We need that magic ready. Rest up. Eat your Wheaties. You too, Vic, Lashawn said, dragging his brother away with a wave to her. They wandered away to find Ian Keeley and get the gendarme up to speed on the deal with Perinelle. When the humans left, she was alone with the vampire who had broken her heart. Could he help save her life tomorrow? Lucas escorted her silently from the lounge. His black hair flopped into his gray eyes. An impish grin tugged at his lips. He had mastered the sold vampire brood, but the playful smile chased the clouds from his handsome face. He said, you're a marvel, you know. Pleased by the compliment despite herself, Red tucked a stray lock of hair behind her ear. Where is that coming from? He shrugged. I like watching you whip us lads into shape. Eventually I'll have you all trained, she quipped, rubbing her hands manically. Her smile flickered. She didn't know if she was disturbing the fragile peace, but she couldn't leave it unsaid. I know it's been weird between us, but I'm glad to have you here for this. I'm sorry for being thick-headed. I thought I was making it easier by keeping out of sight, but for who? Not my best move. She nudged his shoulder with her own. As a trust builder? No. I promise you can trust me to drive the decoy car. I'll only kill the buggers if they attack me first, Lucas said. He raised his palm in an oath. Scout's honor. Amused, she poked his chest. You were never a Boy Scout. Never did like camping. He flashed her a boyish smile, leaning forward to kiss her on the cheek. She blushed as the kiss radiated over her skin. He winked. I'll see you tomorrow. Get your sleep. You've a rabbit to pull out of your hat. Red blinked, and he was gone in that trademark vampire disappearing act. The goofy smile melted off her face as his words sunk in. Their plan required her to set off booby traps with her magic. She'd used brute magic force when levitating the tire iron today, without any supplies for support. The spell hangover felt like a head cold. Then add that she had literally been hit by a jeep. She'd only walked away because Diego blunted the impact, and instinctive magic flung her away. Battle plans were made confidently in the group, but now alone, the uncertainty crowded in. How could she recharge her strength and time for the big showdown? The crowd parted on the gaming floor. Intuition made her look up. Kristoff stood at the end of a slot machine aisle, waiting with his hands behind his back. He was the answer to a question she didn't dare ask aloud. 17. February 12th evening, the Las Vegas Strip, Circe Casino. Red stopped in front of the unsold vampire in the designer suit. How'd you find me? I could smell your blood. Kristoff Novak brushed a lock of hair off her shoulder, his blue eyes fixed on the bandage peeking from under her sweater neckline. An icy precision entered his voice as if he were holding himself back from anger. I felt my sire go into a thunderous rage earlier. I've been too busy with the nightclub preparations to piss him off, so I assumed something happened to you. Then he texted me in no uncertain terms to not come to the mystery club meeting. She planted her palm on her hip. The angle was too sassy for her thrashed body, so she gingerly straightened. The werewolves had nearly run her over. Her magic had used the car's momentum to blast her away from the wheels, but it wasn't a soft landing in the rosemary bush and reopened the claw wounds. The rest of her wasn't any better. Red lifted her chin, ignoring the crick in her neck. And yet, here you are. He didn't say anything about after the meeting. If you came to see how I was, you can see I'm fine. The lie felt weird in her mouth, like a new word. For an unsold vampire and a hunter, they were unusually honest with each other. She avoided his eyes, drawn to his neck over his black collar. His blood was a dark gift that was beyond the power of the medical alchemists. 
She tried to not think about everything else he could do for her. You have road rash and claw marks on you. Your definition of fine is not like mine, Kristoff said dryly as concern lingered in his gaze. You clean up well for a woman about to drop from exhaustion. I'll give you that. She couldn't met his eyes. He was the secret to getting back into fighting shape. Yet the last time she had trusted him, pride had kept the question penned in her throat before. But now the dam broke. Maybe you... You don't... He said at the same time, then quirked an eyebrow at her. I think I understand. You want a taste. Her face heated as she said, Not when you say it like that. Mm -hmm. He directed her out of the gaming floor toward the theater. We'll want privacy. I wouldn't ask if it wasn't for a good reason. I can say that I put a potion on my wounds, if anyone asks. We're going after the wolves tomorrow, and I must do all this magic. We need to strike, and I'm not ready. She rambled the confession, hiding her face from him. You don't have to explain anything, he said with a silky reassurance. He flashed a pass from his pocket at the gendarme guarding the still-roped-off corridor to Club Voltava. Silence weaved around them before they reached the swinging doors of the club. As they entered, he said, Lucky for you, and not me, the shipment of glasses arrived. You won't have to lick my, uh, what did you call it once? My manly chest tonight. Red snorted at the wry smile on Kristoff's face, following him to the gap in the counter bar. Thanks for helping me, considering everything. I am suppose I am one of those philanthropist CEOs, he said. After riffling through a shelf for a shot glass, he sliced his wrist with his thumbnail and directed the flow like a bartender with a cocktail shaker. He grinned and set the shot glass in front of her. I can put salt around the rim. Wrinkling her nose at the thought, Red didn't reply. She shot the blood straight, swallowing before it could settle on her tongue. Her mouth still tasted metallic anyway. She didn't gag. It wasn't the first time she'd had his undiluted blood. Like a matering wino, she could finally taste something over the initial taste. She studied the stained glass as the H is seeped out of her bones, easing the pain in her neck. Tastes like a cold ocean. Not actually, but the notes, I mean. Never mind, she said immediately embarrassed at saying her weird musing aloud. He smiled softly as he took the glass and rinsed it in the sink. Juniper told me that once. My father had an estate on the Swedish coast. I was born there in the middle of a storm, my mother said. An estate? You made it sound like you were raised on the streets of Prague, Mr. Self-Made Man. Red leaned forward, resting her elbows on the counter. She knew the overview of his life as a vampire, but his human life was still largely a mystery. All she'd known was that his mother had died when he was young man, leaving him to care for his little brother Arno. This detail thickened the plot. Kristoff wiped the glass dry, turning to put it away. A cool reserve rose over his chiseled features. My father had an estate. That and his name went to his legitimate heir when I was a boy. We're not here to reminisce. Red held back a frown at the rebuff. She hadn't expected to be shut down. He had the persistence of a salesman when it came to deepening their shaky, whatever-it-was relationship. She wanted to call it a professional alliance. Even as she thought it, she knew the phrase was a mismatch. She kept the disquiet to herself. Sure. You drank enough to heal some, but I want you clear-headed. I came to see you for another reason. I have a meeting tonight with the Supreme Master Vampire of Las Vegas, about you. She quirked her head at him, trying to find the logic. The last thing that she wanted was to be noticed by another Supreme the Synod have already informed the other supernaturals about the wolves. Even Lucas already tried asking around the local vampires, too. He got the brush off. My sire is a sold buzzkill who hunts our kind. Kristoff huffed a laugh, coming out from behind the bar to lean next to her. He said, I'm lodging a formal complaint about an attack on my claimed human and calling for official action against them. The Supreme can't ignore me like Lucas or pawn me off on a representative like he did with your school. He should see the wisdom in offering the alchemists a wolf pelt as tribute. Come, you might notice something I don't. 
I'm not in the mood to dress up like sexy goth to go to some vampire club. If I have to wear a corset, I'm out. I'll compromise on a wig. He grinned and pulled a small gray vial out of his pocket. Eternal optimist, I picked up a potion from the Academy Bazaar. It will dye your hair temporarily. I asked for pink. Fine with me, but I dressed more for comfort. Does this sweater say bleeder or off-duty bookkeeper? Red asked, plucking at her plain green hoodie. The half-assed blow-dry had only semi-dried her tresses. She was acutely aware of the wild locks falling from the pencil she had stuck into her ponytail to twist it up to a bun. You're perfect, he said, whipping out a pair of black-framed glasses from his pocket like a magician pulling an endless scarf from his sleeve. Put these on. You can be my accountant. We'll save the role of my mistress for another night. She chuckled, putting on the non-prescription frames. You'll need to find someone else to audition for that. Just business as usual, then. Are you going to tell me what the gang was planning? Red gave him the rough strokes of the plan as they walked out back into the main casino and through the parking garage to find his car. After a portal ride to Reno and a road trip to Battle Forge, they'd set up the ambush before Lucas and Lashon lured the wolves and the repaired Millennium Falcon. She demurred from her instinct in asking for more of Kristoff's help. Through the chatter, she kept her eyes on the shadows of the garage. He seemed to be equally alert beside her. It was obvious the Lamborghini was his even before he clicked the headlamps to life. Vic would have cried to see the metal beauty. She slipped into the front seat, and silence reigned as the engine purred in the Nevada night. Kristoff drove out of the garage onto the noise and neon dazzle of the strip. Tourists took pictures of the luxury vehicle at a red light. Remembering the potion, she drank it quickly, then gagged at the moldy coffee taste. It was quicker, but she preferred the salon. Her scalp tingled, and the sensation wiggled down her body. She pushed up her sleeves, boggling at her darkening arm hair. He looked over at her. His smile died on his lips as a deep sadness filled his eyes. I didn't know it would be black. It's fine. Does it look okay? Red asked, growing alarmed at his reaction. She opened the mirror on the sun visor, fearing the worst, but she liked the color. It brought out her green eyes and pale skin. She lifted an eyebrow at him, joking to lighten his sudden melancholy. There's a loophole in professional boundaries when I'm fishing for a compliment. Kristoff cleared his throat, averting his eyes towards the traffic. You look beautiful. Unexpectedly so. I thought I had bought pink. I had a pink wig once. It was perfect for undercover at colleges, she said. She fiddled with the seat belt in her lap and let a few stoplights pass before speaking again. You know, you haven't sold me completely. He turned the car at a sign pointing to Fremont Street. Was there a Segway way that I missed? We've been in the same city for a week, and you haven't stu- She stopped herself because what she was going to say would sound crazy. You were going to remark that I haven't stalked you, weren't you? He asked, guessing correctly, then snickered. I'd be suspicious, too. Local vampire minds his own business. It's a mystery deserving of Sherlock Holmes or Columbo. I didn't mean it exactly like that, but yeah. She tried to laugh off the embarrassment. I co-run a real estate empire, and I'm an ambassador for the second largest vampire city in the West, he said. Posture loose, eyes sharp on the road, he rested one hand on the steering wheel with the easy confidence of a man who owned the world. Amusement curled in his voice. You're fascinating, but I have other interests too, she huffed, crossing her arms over the seat belt. I'm not saying I expected you to be outside my place with your camera, lying in wait in the bushes for an upskirt shot. When I take your picture, you'll want me to, Kristoff said, and grinned at the guarantee. He shot her a sly look out of the corner of his eye like he had read her mind. I know I am a fiend, but I am not going to beat up that bartender. She twisted in the car seat to face him, propping her elbow on the center console. It's a legit thing to be concerned about. 
I don't need to puff up my chest, flash some fang, and make the boy wet himself. I think it's healthy to have a rebound after a stressful breakup. That's what bartenders are for. However, I don't have a voice in who you date, he said before smirking at her surprise. I'm sorry I'm not playing to your evil vampire stereotypes. Should I have clubbed you over the head and dragged you to my lair at the first sign of another male? It was one date, she insisted, fidgeting in her seat. And no, I wasn't thinking that. Not really. I just... After everything in L.A., we never talked. I don't know where your head is at. I feel the same about you as I ever have, he said. His tone was both matter-of-fact and sad. The approaching casino saved her from finding a real reply or understanding the pang in her chest at his words. We're almost there. How do I get my hunter's kid inside? He said firmly. You don't. What? I'm not rolling in there as your helpless arm candy. Your role is as my accountant. Should we have run lines? I need a steak at least. Raising his eyebrow, he asked. You've met a Supreme before. It's like meeting the president. You'll get a pat down. If I die, it's your fault. He looked oddly stricken at the statement. That was a bad joke, she said, shoving her kit into the dash compartment. It was thoughtless to say, and she'd spend the night wishing she hadn't. He had already lost another woman who looked like her and blamed himself. Sorry. It's nothing, he said, smiling as if to reassure her. He turned the car up to a valet parking booth in front of a glittering casino door. An array of light bulbs over the threshold spelled out, The Turquoise Mine, in curling script. She left the Lamborghini and joined Kristoff on the curb. They entered the Turquoise Mine at a side entrance in its hotel tower. Security cameras caught their every step to the lobby, shaded in every variety of blue from periwinkle to midnight. The busy lobby spilled out into the smoky gaming floor. They passed a display case of a giant turquoise nugget in the middle of a sea of slot machines. Red asked, Does every supernatural faction have a casino lair in this town? The smart ones do. I believe O'Sullivan is just a silent partner in this casino's operations. This isn't his only lair. He doesn't trust an outsider like me or anyone else to know his personal residence. Rumor has it the first alchemist managed to hex him once. Never been the same. Christoph led them into a small Hawaiian-themed food court. He strode through a swinging door to a fast food kitchen with the authority of a district manager. Stay silent. I can already imagine your off-color commentary. A quick-moving fry cook flashed his fangs and a crooked smile at him. Spam sizzled as they passed. She leaned closer to her vampire, wishing she were armed with more than him. Kristoff put his hand on the curve of her spine, his thumb moving in a calming circle. He opened a freezer door. Sweeping dramatic violin music soared out. They walked into an elegant speakeasy. A doorman patted them down just as predicted, Kristoff whispered to him. The doorman nodded, gesturing to an open wood-paneled chamber. Inside, darkly dressed vampires lounged with wine glasses like classic villains in repose. Red turned on her third eye as she followed her vampire into the monster mash. Sigils unseen to mundane eyes decorated the walls between paintings of demons in twisted renditions of the old Dutch masters. A magic dampening spell hung over the room, palpable as Florida humidity. Kristoff put his hand on her shoulder, stalking through the crowd with a nod to a bald black vampire in the corner and another pockmarked man at a piano. At the bar, a guard in shaded aviator glasses opened an unmarked door for them. Persistent ticking chimed inside the spacious private office. Mismatched clocks ticked from every surface. The shifting lights of glitter gulch streamed from the windows, reflecting on the shiny timepieces. A boat-sized desk anchored the gloomy room, and its high-backed chair faced away from them as if the ship's captain were contemplating the waves. Kristoff bowed. Supreme. The chair twisted to face them. Red didn't know what to make of her first impression. She had met Supreme vampires before. Killed one, too. 
served others. They were all different, from warm-hearted Cora Moon to ruthless King Kurt and calculatingly pious Hilda Higby. The supreme master vampire of Las Vegas was in his own league. I keep telling you to call me Gary, he said, waggling an amused finger at Kristoff. A dotty grin grew on his plain round face. His ordinary features only highlighted the chaos of his outfit that began normally with a green-brimmed visor over his short brown hair. The weirdness emerged below the neck. His slashed blue doublet looked centuries older than red. The crowning glory of the outfit were neon orange MC Hammer style puffy pants that would have been visible from space. She had seen anachronistic vampires, wardrobes stuck in bygone eras, but Gary O'Sullivan didn't seem to be yearning for a pastime. He just looked confused on which one he was actually in. She met Kristoff's eye, desperately biting back the snark. Her ally shot her a warning look. Don't be a square. Gary said. Christoph replied, never, sir. I'll yeet you right out that door, I will, Gary said, giggling in delight. A cloud of worry shadowed his face. He looked to her. I finally got to use yeet in a sentence, but I fear I didn't use it correctly. Is it still contemporary slang? After 700 years, it feels like I am sprinting to keep up with you clever little monkeys. I think so, sir, Red said. She tried to pretend to be a meek accountant, even as she spied with her witch vision. Painted sigils shimmered on the walls and windows. A complicated sequence wrapped around the room. She could only decipher a few that meant protection against fire, theft, and magic. Though it was invisible to non-mages like Kristoff, she could see the writing on the wall. Literally. A lyre symbol marked the ceiling, bigger than the rest. Was it to block divination like her tattoo? Gary was a supreme surviving in an alchemist town. His office was tricked out for defense and protection. She had never seen a vampire's lair so fortified against the mystical. This kind of protection didn't come cheap, and she wasn't only talking about money. She could almost feel the invisible residue of many dark sacrifices against her aura. Kristoff said, Supreme Gary, I came because because your claimed human was attacked by a werewolf. I got the 411, bro, Gary said, flashing an easy smile. The local curs are on notice, but those milk-livered jive turkeys wouldn't even drag a mouse in the house. It wasn't the calisthenic canines. Kristoff adjusted his jacket cuffs. Some wolf did, though. I brought my bookkeeper from Portland, and I am not losing her in Las Vegas just before tax season. A number cruncher? She looks more like a jazz kitten on a Sunday morning. Gary peered at the shape of her legs in her black leggings and then to her face. He asked, What exactly do you do for him, sweetheart? Red blushed at the insinuation and parroted jargon she remembered from LaShawn at the steakhouse. Ignoring Kristoff's pleased smirk, she spouted off how she saved money for the Novak and Novak Company, with a complicated-sounding list of deductions for business owners. She thought the detail about how some unspecified dealings weren't based in Portland, but in Wyoming through a Shell subsidiary, was a nice touch. Gary held up his hand. I'm convinced. You're an egghead. Thank you, sir. The Supreme settled in his chair hands clasping in his lap. A wily look scuttled across his face. I find myself surprised to see you call upon my help, Kristoff. Sure, I see you on Fremont Street when your prince has words with me, but you prefer the strip, don't you? Kristoff didn't reply for a second as his polite smile grew icy. He didn't miss another beat, rolling out a smooth answer. For a nightclub location, it made business sense. I am opening another this fall in Chelsea, even though I'm more of a Hell's Kitchen man. Gary tapped his temple under his green visor. The famed Novak business sense. They say you always seize the better deal. You certainly left the Alaric order at the right time to nestle into Alzbetitzeren's strapped-down bosom like a second son. Do the alchemists have the better deal now? Kristoff met the challenge in the other vampire's gaze. He coolly said, my loyalties are first to my liege lord, the Prince of Portland, and to you as long as I am a guest in your city. 
Red held her breath as the wall clocks ticked to fill the silence. The more she stared at the odd outfit, the more she wondered if it was a costume. There was nothing addled about the Supreme's shrewd gaze now. Gary relaxed his concrete smile. And guests have rights in Las Vegas. They sure do, buddy. They sure do. Now, you wanted to speak your piece, Novak. I chased the two wolves from my nightclub, but lost the trail. They shifted and ran across the strip without a single care about the dark veil. Which we don't tolerate in fabulous Las Vegas. I don't make mongrels and their families comfortable here. These two wolves are probably beating off somewhere, fleeing the state. She filed away his word choice. Not the hilariously incorrect use of the phrase beating off, but the part about the mongrels. She stopped herself from glancing at Kristoff to see if he noticed the telling phrase too. Kristoff said, You have vassals scattered throughout southern Nevada and up to Reno. One might see a group moving through their territory. I would appreciate it if you made it known that I will pay for solid intel. Gary twisted his chair to face glowing Fremont Street and the sleazy kingdom under his fortified perch. I'll send it through the grapevine. Sayonara, if that's all you have to say. Kristoff inclined his head to the Supreme before he rested a light hand on her shoulder. They retreated out of the private office and into the elegant lounge. He murmured into her ear, Stay behind me. Sure, Red said. He went to the piano man and leaned in for a quiet chat. She tried to eavesdrop, but vampires were expert whisperers. Kristoff offered a charming grin to the pianist, and then even more charming cash, discreetly dropping it into the tip jar. With red as his shadow, he bribed a bald vampire whose fangs looked nearly blue-white against his ebony skin. She wanted to ask so many questions, but she played the good human until Kristoff ushered them out of the lounge and through an empty fast-food kitchen. Who were... Shush. Red picked up her pace to match his longer legs as they walked out of the turquoise mine. The fresh air cleared the old casino smell from her nose. She whispered, Did you hear what I heard back there? He glanced around, leading her to the valet podium. Let's get into the car to debrief. Actually, scratch that. Do you have any tricks to detect bugs? Because I'm betting Gary had one planted in the car. I haven't gotten to that class yet. She grumbled, then zipped her lips as the valet came back with the Lamborghini. The ride back to the strip was quiet to bore any listeners. She had a feeling that even without the threat of a listening device in the car, they both would have been lost in their thoughts. The night had illuminated more than either of them had expected. She let down her dyed hair from the bun and stretched her neck. Her train of thought turned from the walking anachronism on Fremont Street to the complicated vampire beside her. Shifting in her seat, she forced herself not to look at him. They made a decent recon team, but it was hard to be objective about him when he wrapped up in that suit and this car. I can hear you thinking, Kristoff said, pulling into his reserved spot in the covered parking garage of the Circe Casino, about a lot of things. Things that I did right or the ones that I did wrong? Not really. It feels like the whole world is keeping something from me sometimes. You didn't leave me in the dark, though, she said, stepping out of the car and walking with him into a side entrance. Honesty is our policy. I've been busy, but that wasn't why I didn't reach out. I needed space. He sighed, smoothing his hair back nervously. She didn't know how to compute the statement. You did? I shared my deepest secret with you last month. How did that work out? Unsold monster, remember? You don't have feelings. Red paraphrased his old words to him before snickering. He had to be joking. She wanted to shove her words back into her mouth when his expression fell. Thanks for the reminder, he said dully. She winced. Their last real conversation in Los Angeles was an argument before their raid on the burrows. She had called him a monster, but she wasn't joking then. I just hurt you with that, huh? Why are you surprised? Your job is hurting monsters. Kristoff disappeared into a crowd emerging from the casino movie theater. Stunned, she blinked at his retreating back. What was that? They always gave each other shit. He mocked Tauchi Feely Sulid vamps like his Siri.
Maybe his friend Netta had been right about their relationship. Red didn't know her own impact on him. Dodging through the throng, she trotted to catch up with him as he strode into the under-construction passage to his nightclub. Christoph? He stopped and rubbed his jaw, a tight, rueful smile on his lips. I'm turning into my sire. I just stormed off in a tantrum. Your words, not mine, she said lightly. He shrugged, matching her pace. I know why you were mad at me. You have that pesky human morality. It was the timing of it all. I'd only just confessed the secret that could damn me and everything I built. I don't exactly put it on my business card. Your gift is safe with me. Revealing it for leverage doesn't feel right, even in a mental scenario. If you want, those alchemists will have me hooked up to tubes and ready to siphon. You have the power between us, even if my claim is on your neck. You always have. I promised Netta I would be gentle with you. I meant that. It's no fun if it doesn't hurt, he said, bringing her knuckles to his lips for an old-fashioned kiss. Sometimes he could go from looking like a corporate fuckboy to Mr. Darcy. It gave her whiplash. He released her hand, clasping his own behind his back as they walked down the empty corridor. I delayed our debrief. We can start with Gary's genie pants or the fact that he was hiding something. She pushed open the swinging doors to the silent nightclub. You know, the clothes were strange, but I'm more confused about all the clocks. We'll put a pin on that topic, though. He mentioned the mongrels and their families. Few wolf mercs bring their kids to a kill, and there are no signs that threat is local. We knew that before we knew of the Lopes Pack. The Synod only released the photos, not the family connections or the names. And try getting anything out of the gendarme, I dare you. Kristoff sat next to her at the bar. It hasn't hit the grapevine. I've had my own minions listening in the right underworld pits. I saw shielding sigils and felt magic dampeners in his lair. Dark stuff. He's used to fighting mages. I bet that all his places are like that. Are you sure about the shielding? She patted her left shoulder. One looked just like my ink. It's a symbol to block divination, seers, location spells, whatever. So that's what it is? I've always wondered. He brushed his hand over her tattoo like he could feel it through her hoodie. Red shivered and wet her lips, trying to sound neutral. The immortal alchemist checked it out, said it was magic. I never noticed. I forget it's there most of the time. She tried to help me find my mother, too. It's not her fault that she failed. Everyone does. She did answer something, though. The signs point northwest, but it's still a question mark. I haven't told anyone but Vic. Tell me what the immortal told you, he said. Sounding almost desperate, he tipped her face up. His thumb rubbed her chin, leaving tingles behind. He pulled away, shyly like he thought he misstepped. She's a legend where I'm from. It must have been important. I always wondered why I was different from the other witches. My magic, some of it was taken, ripped out from the root. Oh. Red caught the startled understanding in his eyes. At least she didn't have to mangle Perinel's garden metaphor to explain it. Discovering her origins was like fighting a hydra. More uncertainty popped up with every answer. Now I know it was a magic user of some kind, maybe a minor demon. I hated vampires for so long because I thought they had done this to me. It was just a set of hired fangs, a red herring. You might still have plenty to hate certain vampires for, Kristoff said quietly, as if to himself. A slight shiver ran over his broad shoulders, as if an old, dark memory bubbled up. Probably. Wistful hope softened his chiseled features. He offered, You know Oregon is my home territory if you need anything. In the meantime, I can make you a drink, a real one. You can have the very first before the grand opening. There was something tempting about the idea of having a drink with him. They had a whole conversation's worth on the topic of Gary's clothes alone. She liked talking to him more than she should. The need for sleep cut her conflict. She didn't have the mental energy to think about what it meant that she wanted to stay. I need to let the gendarme know what we learned before I hit the sack. It's part of my deal with the alchemists. 
you get the wolves and they get to discipline the locals. Understood, but I paid good money to ensure every vamp in Nevada knows I want intel on the low pieces. I'll pass on what I learn. Vic started a rumor through the hunters that we're going to an old Constantine hideout. He made it sound like there will be alchemists waiting at every gas stop until we get there. He wagged his eyebrows, diabolical glee crinkling his eyes. I can give the rumor wings. I'll say my men will take over the guard, pretending you're going to Oregon. Then they'll really want to stop you in Battleforge. The boyish charm didn't distract her as her thoughts jumped to exactly what kind of battle they were forging. Tomorrow was the big showdown. It would have been intimidating even if she hadn't gotten her ass handed to her by Frank this morning. The thought made her cringe, she said. Even taking a shortcut, it's a long drive, and I still feel that spell I hit Frank with, and the jeep he hit me with, too. Vic keeps saying I am the linchpin. The devil came out in Kristoff's grin. I can fix both your problems. I can't drink from you now. Her breath caught in her throat, voice sounding unusually husky. She tried to cover for herself, explaining primly. That would keep me awake, like an espresso. I know you like to do things the hard way, but I can make this easy. He smirked, standing to reach over the bar for an empty squat blue jar. Wide-mouthed, it looked like it belonged to an antique cosmetic set. He bit his wrist and let the blood drain into the jar, then handed it to her. That's a gift, not a favor. Red took the gift, but ran from the temptation. Eighteen. February 13th morning, Nevada, the middle of nowhere. Red nestled on a Winnebago sofa as the vehicle rolled on an unpaved dirt road and finished a movie on Ezra's tablet. She'd found it on the table with a note from him. In a totally sweet and unexpected move, he downloaded Point Break for her and said she could return the device when she came back. Keanu Reeves in a surfer heist movie was her definition of brain candy. It had livened up the ride from the Reno portal. The camper was luxurious compared to the Millennium Falcon. Spacious enough for a smaller model, the loft bed over the driver's seat created space for a tiny galley kitchen on one wall and a booth table detached from the sofa on the other. Daggers clanged together in a box on the table. They'd loaded the booth seats with supplies. The ingredients for each sneaky snare had been separated by individual spell in different containers, ready to be deployed. Tucked into a nest of blankets, the earthen jar with the portal water was in the cramped bathroom. She had smuggled something else on the beginning of their journey, too, Kristoff's gift. When she had transferred the blue jar from an insulated lunch bag into the mini fridge, Vic gave her a dark, knowing look. Red lifted her chin in a silent challenge as he settled into the driver's seat. He had trained her to do what it took on a job, use everything she had because the bad guys wouldn't hold back. Are we having a staring contest? He barked out a gruff warning. I know what that is, and I don't want to know how you got it. It was the last time Kristoff's blood was mentioned. Vic drove the motorhome through an academy portal to a barn outside Reno. They had decided to bypass the southern half of the state to avoid Gary O'Sullivan's influence, even if the gendarme were going to distract the Supreme. She was grateful that their plan already included taking the wolves north, thanks to Perinel's foresight. They had more than one job in Battleforge. Red did last-minute cramming on the ritual to awaken the portal seedling as the vehicle ate up the highway. Finally, the rocking motion of the sofa lulled her into pulling out the tablet. It had been a cute gesture from Ezra, but it couldn't fully distract her from the face-off ahead. Now the movie was over, and the real show had begun. Vic relentlessly fiddled with the static on the radio. His left knee jangled, and his hand fluttered to tap on the steering wheel. He tipped his hat up to squint at the sunny horizon. As always, he blew past the speed limit. He asked, Did you get anything from Lucas? She joined him in the front passenger seat and unplugged her charging phone. The last status update said he was still hiding underneath a weighted blanket while LaShawn listened to a podcast, still at least five hours out. Any attacks? 
I still don't know if I did right by coming with you instead of Lucas. LaShawn is tough for a guy in a sweater vest, but if they attack early, he's under an illusion to look like me. Their beef with you is business, but they hate me in a very personal way. Do you think the illusion could have faded by now? They haven't seen the werewolves. Besides, the pack won't attack on the highway. Gloria was spooked by the attention when her dad killed Diego. The gendarme used their influence to triple the speed traps. They'll see a lurking state trooper every time their trigger fingers get itchy. Red repeated the facts like a calming meditation. She didn't mention the uncertainty of the lonely road through the nature preserve to the ghost town. By the time the falcon got there, it would be after sunset, and Lucas could throw down with the wolves if it came to it. She kept her tone neutral like Switzerland when she said, Kristoff texted me that at least one vassal near Death Valley took the reward money for news of the werewolves. They're on the trail, then. He gunned the engine, pushing the motorhome forward through the umber gravel. Flicking to the email from Perinel with instructions for the rituals and the intel on Battleforge itself, she zoomed in on the map to its isolated location in an antelope refuge. Vic pointed ahead with a child's enthusiasm on his face. We're coming up to the ghost town. This is real Wild West shit here. Cowboys and miners and ladies of ill repute. She recited from her phone research, The main exports were silver and local artisans. He blew a raspberry. Vic, not every noteworthy bit of trivia about a place is about their sex workers. He chortled. Most of the time it is. The ghost town jutted up from the desert floor like a gravestone. Low, single-story shells of former saloons and shops wore high, false fronts like masks. Tumbleweeds grew in the spaces between the ruined buildings. Back in its boom days, it had once been big enough to rival Tombstone, Arizona, and Bodie, California. Only nine ruins and a far-off graveyard on a hill remained. She wasn't sure the town would survive their visit. If the first assault failed, their last-ditch plan had the werewolves pinned in the butcher shop, the only building with four intact walls and a floor other than the bordello. Weathered wooden remnants leaned over the dirt main street as if still hung over from the silver rush. The desert winds whistled through the gaps in the grayed wood. It was heaven for a former sniper like Frank. They wanted him feeling nice and cozy as he stumbled into their traps. Enough banter, she said. We need to set up. Vic parked the motorhome by a broken steeple in front of a crumbled church. Someone had spray-painted an anarchy symbol next to the caved-in window. A dumped jumble of old cans and a toilet rested amid the dry scrub brush. He commented brightly, this is charming. I should buy a second home here, Red quipped, scanning the horizon for the telltale dust of a jeep. I was thinking film and music. Standing, he jerked back as if he hit his head on the bed loft. He massaged his brow as he reached up and tugged at something invisible. He grunted as something heavy fell into his arms. What the? Hannah materialized from nothing, her eyes sleepy and darting. She blushed, clutching his shoulders. Hi. He set her down in annoyance. Stowing away again. Red slammed a hand on the front seat. You were under a cloaking spell this whole time? It was a potion, Hannah said, backing away from her. It was supposed to work until someone touched me. Trudy is probably out of her mind with worry right now, Red said, checking her phone. She didn't have anything except the texts from Lucas and Kristoff. Vic flopped down on the camper sofa. Fan-freaking-tastic. Now we have to worry about that harpy, Hannah said. She doesn't know. She told me to study and left to help with Basil or something. Don't tell her before you hear me out. I'm younger than you all, yes. I'm inexperienced, yes. I'm convinced, Red said through clenched teeth. Let's water this portal seedling and push her through first. Hannah stood her ground by the small table. Her expression remained calm, even as her words came out fervent. I'm both those things, but I can help. I need to help. These wolves murdered my father. I could have run out of the casino after them, but I've been trying to prove that I'm not a kid. I won't be a burden. I can help set up. I'll disappear when the fighting starts. Whatever. I just can't stay home. 
let me do my duty, if not as a hero, then as a daughter. Red and Vic looked at each other. Her head knew that this was going to turn out to be a pain in the ass. Her heart was with the teen anyway. Hannah added, the portal seedling takes a while to bloom anyway. Vic said, I told you she was persuasive. Red cursed, then waved the kid along. You want to help? Help us unload the van. I accidentally brought someone else with us, Hannah said. Face screwed up in a sheepish wince. She reached up to the loft bed above the front seats. A sleeping Ezra appeared at the tap of her hand. He found me when he was leaving something in the motorhome. I panicked and used all my sleeping powder on him. Vic poked the other man's shoe. Did you kill him? Hannah pulled a balloon made from a cured animal bladder out of her backpack. No, I'll make him huff this. Well, get him up so we can put him to work, too, Vic said. I don't have time to explain this to you separately. Red scolded the teen. He'd better be okay. After Ezra had been revived with the vapor, the group trooped out of the van. It took a few minutes for the brain fog to clear, but he kept quiet as they explained the plan with its layers of contingencies. Frustration marred his usual blue skies attitude. He said, Damn it, Hannah. I talked my mom out of coming. You know she'll hotwire a portal to get here and chew you out for this. She doesn't need to know until she needs to, Hannah said, her pink mouth set in a firm, snitches get stitches line. She was surprisingly intimidating, more than a mafia don than a teen. I'm going to be on the first portal out of here once we get this all set up. You can march me in. Ezra sighed. Let's get this together quickly. What's first? Vic rubbed his hands happily. The dear deranged man loved a werewolf hunt too much. He said, we're exploring here. The lady's got to find that seedling, and I need to find where I'm going to shoot the whispering werewolf. Cool then, Ezra said nervously. Vic jogged into the nearest sagging ruin, skipping through the empty door sill, where the half-hanging sign advertised a general store. Babysit him, please, Red said to Ezra, as she put on a backpack with the portal water jug. He's exuberant but harmless for now. It's not a big place, but use his map if you need to. We just gotta double check that nothing has changed since the last time the alchemists were here. Hannah and I will put on our witch goggles and scope out the portal seedling. Sure, Ezra said, moseying his cute bud over to Vic. The women searched down the main street. Their shoes churned up dust from the barren earth. Red wasn't sure how the weeds grew, but something about the soil must be great for portals. The map marked a spot for it beyond the half-standing saloon, not to be confused with the completely tumbled-in tavern or boarded-up bordello. For a small town, Battleforge had a lot of options for a good time. She would have enjoyed exploring the place without the threat of werewolves over her head. At least one of them was immune to the fascination of Wild West relics, Angst wafted off the 18-year-old. Red said, For what it's worth, I don't think you're just some kid. I know you're meant to be something special. I need to do something for my dad. You're footloose and destiny-free, but you're acting more like a champion than I am. Everyone thinks I'm a brat. Hannah rubbed her arms, looking away from Red. I had a head start. You'll have your chance. Maybe sooner than you want. Red said, sensing a spirit observer. Do you feel a ghost? Everything about this place is spooky. The decayed structures seemed to watch Red as they passed the butcher shop before the street gave way to desert. Scraps of tar paper flapped on a long crib house opposite them. A tingling chill floated on the wind like a shift in the mystical ether. The email had warned that the bordello had ghostly activity. She wondered if the rest was haunted. That would be something she'd have to remember to warn Lucas. Ghosts and vampires did not mix. Hannah pointed to a dry pond and a crumbled wire mess. It had once been a coop. The faded signs still optimistically advertised duck eggs. A dead tree cast shadows onto a glowing lavender-colored shrub, invisible except to their spirit gaze. Bunched sleeping blooms hung from it. Do you see it? It's so pretty. We found it. 
Red waved over to Vic, who was trekking down from the broken porch of the former butcher shop. She set down her backpack and laid out the earthen jug filled with the potion that would ready the portal seedling to open for its first voyage. A few minutes later, Vic drove up in the motorhome and called out of the window. The alchemists were wrong. The back of the butcher shop has fallen, maybe in a storm. Red hollered back. Check the other saloon and be careful in there. We'll investigate the bordello. Keep an eye out. I'm hoping for sexy ghosts, Vic said. He parked, pointing the vehicle's hood at the portal. Coming over to them, he dropped a large box at Hannah's feet. Time to hold your own, newbie. Red directed the teen to spread salt in a wide circle around the dead tree. She started digging at the base with a shovel. It had to be deep. Perinel had explained the rough sketches of the portal creation process this morning before Red and Vic left. The alchemists had planted standing portals all over the state as their influence had grown. Each one was a testament to the patience of their kind. This seedling had taken twenty years to sprout roots and over a hundred to grow to the size of a small shrub. No one who had planted it, besides the immortal, was still alive. Red read off the instructions from her phone, grateful she had saved it offline. The data signal crapped out this far out in the boonies. Take the metal thing and set it with the symbol for Hecate pointing north, then place the rock symbolizing the different elements into the hole. They're labeled with runes. Hannah laid down a copper disc etched with small round grooves. She dropped a different color crystal in each one. Are you supposed to bury it? Red reread the directions. Perinel wrote the email with little anecdotes. The first portable portal was invented by a Genovese alchemist who used it to escape the vampire Alaric. And trivia. In most alchemical texts, the final portion of a ritual would be labeled the Phoenix Stage that were interesting but distracting. It was like trying to read a recipe, but the food blogger wouldn't just get to the ingredients already. They buried the disc and poured the potion over the ground before setting up the precisely measured crystal grid. The sun beamed harshly as they labored in the dust. Finally, the last ingredient, a lumpy bone powder, was laid down. Red took the other witch's hand and started chanting. Teasing out a thread of her magic, she tossed it to the seedling. She made sure to regulate her energy careful. We don't need to send too much into it. It will grow faster, Hannah said. She pushed more of her energy into their connection to pass into the seedling. It was like she turned on a fire engine hose compared to Red's gentle watering can. The drooping blooms opened and the trunk of the spectral bush shuddered and grew. Sweating, she panted, leaning forward as she put her hands on her hips. Okay, one witchy bit down. More to go. Pace yourself. I've learned this lesson the hard way. Sure. You can nap in the Winnebago when you need it, Red said as she repacked her bag. Tossing it over her shoulder to walk across the dirt street, she reread the part in Perinel's email about the bordello on her phone. She bumped into the other woman who abruptly stopped. Hannah stared down the main street. Her brown eyes grew hooded as she squinted for a better look. He has some guns under all that flannel. Who? Vic. Huh, Red said, less impressed by her friend. Vic worked, shirtless in tight wranglers and a backwards hat, in front of the general store. He planted nail-studded boards on the one road leading into town, hoisting the beams around easily. After kicking sand over them, he leaned over to pick up another board from the pile to disguise another row. Hannah leered at him. Red wrinkled her nose. Ugh, I hear you going through puberty from here. I'm perfectly legal here. Channel your weird hormones into witchcraft, please, Red said, nudging the drooling Hannah away. They walked to the bordello where the miners had been tapped for their silver as soon as they dug it from the hills. Hannah bit her knuckle, looking over her shoulder. I know he is like your brother, but damn. Even with the mullet, I would... Gross, I'm ignoring this. Red Mock gagged, putting her phone away in a zipped pocket. What I'm saying is I want to bang your bard. She cracked up at Red's horrified face. Stop, or I will toss you into that portal now, and I don't care where it might take you. Red walked through the empty threshold of the brothel. The spooky sight sobered her amused disgust. 
The front room was empty except for a dusty piano, missing its keys. Tilted on broken floorboards, a quirk of gravity kept the piano from slipping into a hole in the boards. If she fell into it, a pile of dumped scrap car parts, rusted barbed wire, and old tin cans waited for her in the cellar. A sunbeam shone through the empty door sill to the other rooms. Hannah said, I don't like how many exits this house has. I don't like the tetanus potential, Red said. She wouldn't call the place were proof. A long building, it was segmented into three parts, each with its own entrance. She was glad this was their last resort. Hannah gestured into the gloom like a realtor. Let's see the other rooms. Red tapped her foot in front of her and inched around the hole. She walked into the middle section of the crib house. Bigger than the front room, old scuff marks lined the center of the intact floor. It wouldn't have fit more than a few tables of miners and their rented women. The trash dumpers had abandoned an old fridge that blocked an outside door. She marked it off as an exit that didn't need guarding. Hannah rapped on the warped planks boarding up the window of the third room. This room seems a little better. The boards are solid. Until a wolf tries to barrel through them, Red said. She followed the old spur tracks and stepped over the broken remnants of what had once been an inner dividing wall that had long ago fallen to a pile of planks. Whatever had watched her from outside, she felt it more keenly in this area. A rail bed frame rested in the corner of the farthest room. The mattress had long since rotted away. Dusty freckles of paint clung valiantly to the wall above it. Up close, the old mural became clear. Faded pastoral scenes decorated the space where a headboard would be. She touched the twisted truck of a painted desert tree. It was a mistake. Reality faded to a silhouetted room illuminated by midnight candlelight. Phantom piano notes rose from a whisper to a roar. Voluminous skirts glided around tables like fins in dark water. Her chill deepened from a gray rain as the scene changed to a muddy corner of an unkind street, a horse-drawn cart tumbled past, the mares jolted to action by a man with a crop and a dirty top hat. She held out her hand, begging. The cart disappeared with a curse, and the scene changed again. She was in a train car with a young man in a tweed suit. He frowned at her as he said, Cat! A train whistle pierced the air. Red jerked her hand away. Her heart skipped at the transferred scenes from another life. She backed up from the wall, rubbing her goosebumps. Okay, they said this place was haunted, and I believe it. We need to get the S-A-G-E now. Ghosts can spell. They aren't dogs. We can sweeten up whatever is here. Not everything is a fight, Hannah said. She pulled a stick of incense from her purse and sauntered to each cardinal direction. We witches honor the dead. Accept this offering and allow us safe use of your home. The watchful energy dissipated, even if Red felt it like an itch between her shoulder blades. The email said there was another basement entrance. If it's not totally filled with crap, we can set the wolf trap up in it. Hannah found the trap door under the bed. After huffing out apologies to the ghost, they moved it enough to squeeze into the cramped cellar space which ran the length of the crib. Half the space was taken up by trash and rusted distillery equipment, but it was clear under the middle room. Red fought off the fear of spiders and crouched in the low cellar. She assembled the crystal circle anointed with wolf's bane oil. They had brought half of the academy's supply of the stuff. The power would be enough to pass through the wood floor and trap a wolf inside. The last step was setting up selenite crystals to amplify the signal in the corners of the above rooms and obscuring them with trash. She hadn't used much magic yet, but she had never done so many complicated rituals in a row. They hadn't even put up the grids yet to help her levitate daggers poisoned with wolfsbane for the lopes pack. Ideally, the poison would sink deep enough into their bloodstream to dull their supernatural powers. Then Red's part was over. Vic and LaShawn would pick the wolves off with rifles and crossbows from the rooftops. As they finished, Hannah said, We might not even need the circle. Red didn't answer because a part of her hoped they did. It was a cool bit of spell work. 
She reminded herself that destroying the wily pack was the top priority. The wolves were too dangerous to draw out the fight. If they could capture one near death and ask who ordered the hit, it was a bonus. The witches were dirty and thirsty by the time they walked to the motorhome. It was hidden from view of the street behind the false front of a saloon near the portal. The seedling's progress had grown to the size of a short mesquite and was finally looking banyan-like. Inside the Winnebago, a now fully clothed Vic and Ezra dipped silver daggers in wolfsbane oil at the small table. Red leaned against the tiny corner in the galley kitchen and munching a banana to center her energies. You guys are having a great time here in the shade. Vic grinned. It's a witch's world, and us menfolk just live in it. Red asked, Up for the next part? We can do the arrows now. Vic, you can help me, Hannah said, snatching a box off the table and trotting out of the motor coach. He shrugged, putting his hat on as he left. You guys take the old mine office, and we'll take the other saloon. Ezra picked up a box filled with quartz, idling by the door to ask, Did you like the movie? Red smiled as she stepped out first onto the rocky soil. I expected our movie date to actually have you there, but I loved it. It's one of my faves. Sorry as I am that Hannah shanghaied you. It's nice to have you here now. Even with werewolves coming? It's weird, huh? She walked through tall, dry grasses to the abandoned mining office. A low orange sun stretched shadows over the rotting wood planks on the foundations. The brick front still stood, a half-hearted monument to permanence in a forgotten boomtown. She said, I live a life where dating and hunting can bleed into each other. Occupational hazard. This looks like the clearest place. She judged the spot. He had a good eye. She had to be nearby to stay in range of all four of the crystal grids. After they were all done, she'd have to memorize the sight of them before she hid in the butcher shop and waited for the wolves. This is perfect. He helped her arrange the grid like a seasoned apprentice and identified crystals in the box that she couldn't. Bartending school hadn't erased what he had learned from his witch mother. After the grid had been set up, he asked, Do you ever want a more normal life? Like, what kind of normal? The kind that doesn't know anything about the supernatural? Red asked. She had thought about it more than she would admit, especially to Vic, each time she came to the same answer. There's too much out there for me to not want to know. So, not even a little bit? Ezra asked. He wiped his palms on his crouching knees. You seem to have a good balance, she said. She helped him to his feet, holding his hand a little longer than necessary. You know what's up, but you still manage to finish school and stay in one place long enough to use a gym membership. I grew up around this stuff. It's what my childhood centered around. I couldn't forget what was out there if I tried, Ezra said. He squinted brow quirked as if reconsidering. Well, maybe if I had amnesia. No, you'd still remember, she said, idly breaking up dried caraway stalks from a packet and sprinkling the white buds on the grid. Straightening, she realized what she'd said. She might stay over on a first date, but she kept her memory baggage for later. Let's get the other one done. We can hide the daggers later. Dusty and hot, the crew piled into the motorhome for water after the last of the traps had been set. Red took a short cat nap to center her energies. She woke fresher than expected, even with dry mouth from the food dehydrator climate of the loft bed. Sunset brought them a canned chili dinner they ate outside the motorhome, watching the portal seedling grow. It still wasn't ready yet. Double-checking her small hunter's kit, Red belted it to her waist and tightened the stabilizing strap on her thigh. She holstered her snubby revolver, then packed her golden poker chip and a selenite crystal. They were her keys to the academy. After pulling on a jacket, she reached into the zippered pocket. The little blue jar from Kristoff beckoned her with its smooth ridges. She had sneaked it from the fridge after dinner. Vic emerged out of the desert from his quest to find a phone signal. Anticipation gleamed in his eyes. They're here. 19. February 13th evening, Battle Forge, Nevada. Red left Hannah and Ezra in the motor home with a warning, 
mostly to the teenager, to stay inside. The Millennium Falcon swerved a path between the disguised tire-shredding trap. Vic guided the van through, flagging safe passage like a crossing guard. Its unpainted replacement door stuck out like an arm cast against the rest of the black paint job. Headlamps conjured strange shadows in the swirl of dust over the dead village. Lashon pushed up his glasses and waved, wearing a denim jacket identical to his brother's. He killed the engine before he said, It's dropped now, but the illusion worked. Everyone thought I was you. The reaction was unsettling both personally and sociologically. Vic gave him a fist bump through the window. You look good in my style. Lucas jumped out of the van, his leather jacket draped over his lean build. Dark circles ringed the tempest brewing in his gray eyes. He looked like he hadn't slept all day. They're getting impatient, but still staying out of sight. Gotta look at a running wolf once or twice. They'll be coming in faster now without witnesses. Lashon climbed down from the driver's side. I'd say five to ten minutes. The seedling should be ready when the dust settles. Find your places, boys, Red said. She patted the hunter's kit on her waist for emotional support. A numb calm came over her. Ezra had asked her if she wanted a normal life. One of those might kill her. Cognitive behavioral therapy had helped, but she still didn't know what to do with her racing thoughts in the quiet moments without a big bad. The battle loomed, and her mind cleared like the center of a hurricane. Vic asked his brother, Leave the light on and the door open, will ya? We want them to think we're puttering around when they sneak in. Turn the volume up. They might not hear the recording if you keep it at your grandma levels. Lashawn sighed, expelling the weary sound from his entire denim-encased body. He adjusted an ancient-looking boombox, set it on the driver's seat, then scuttled away from the van, a hand pressed to his ear. Stop nagging! The sounds of Vic yelling streamed out of the speakers. Her own voice followed. You're such an asshole, Vic. What were you thinking? Real Vic patted LaShawn on the back and led him to the general store. I got a crossbow for you. I picked this one out myself. I know what you're thinking, but it's not your average bow. Let me run the stats by you. Red said, read him the product page after we get these guys. Lucas gestured for her to follow him. We're over here. She jogged over to the shell of a butcher shop. Earlier, she had cleared out a space to sit in front of a wall crack that peeped to the street. He whispered to her, I hear their engine. All I can hear is me bitching at Vic, she said. Was that how she really sounded? She sat cross-legged and ignored her superficial vanity, trying to separate her mind from the growing dread and anticipation in her body. He leaned over her to rest his hand on the boarded-up window. His usual sandalwood scent had been replaced by some truck stop aftershave. There is a scout over half a mile away on the wrong side of the wind. He's shifting back to rejoin the others. You know, they can probably smell you too. I doused on what Vic calls cologne, something to make myself smell less dead to the hounds. Red forced herself from a line of questioning about supernatural scent to focus. She breathed in deep and connected with the grids, already feeling Hannah's magic. The young witch waited in the motorhome on orders to send energy to the spells until the portal opened. Then she was supposed to haul ass with Ezra to the academy. They calculated that Frank would sneak in like a sniper, relying on his military training, taken in by the possibilities of the town, and fire on the van. Red would launch the poisoned daggers once he revealed his location. She stiffened at the first echoing gun blast readying her magic. The pack was right on time, but they weren't sneaking in. A jeep raced onto the dirt main street. Dust billowed from the back wheels, bleached hair blown back. Gloria drove beside Nuno in the uncovered vehicle. Frank stood in the back, nude except for a raised automatic rifle. He fired on the Millennium Falcon, the rapid pops shattering the back windows. Each one aimed for where Red and Vic's heads would be if they were in there. The recorded argument died in the hail of bullets. Hannah's energy contribution to the spells sputtered out. Red wound out her magic, concentrating hard on her victory over the warlock to ignite her power. 
She ignored the hitch in her lungs at every blast. The charging jeep hit the hidden rows of nail-studded boards. It spun out, slamming the foundations of the post office. Wood crashed under metal as Frank tumbled onto the crunched hood. The rifle slipped from his grip. Lucas darted out of the old butcher shop before Red could stop him. He seemed to teleport to the rifle laying in the dirt. Slamming his foot on the end, he yanked up the handle, bending the metal. She cursed, her magic wobbling as she debated how to trigger the booby traps without hitting the vampire. Hopefully, the hunters didn't reveal themselves too soon and scattered the wolves. Oi, fetch! Lucas called out. Even with his back turned, she could hear his smirk. He slung the destroyed weapon far into the desert. Frank rose without a scrap of naked shame. A red slash like a fresh pacemaker scar stood out on his hairy chest. His hands transformed into clawed paws. Gloria kicked the crinkled driver's door open. Not today, vampire! Nuno crawled out of the twisted jeep. Growling, he turned his head, revealing a horror show. A weeping scab mangled half his face from the patch-covered eye to his now straggled beard. Pus oozed out of his cheek. He still hadn't healed from being sprayed by the weremace, unlike his sister who had doused herself immediately with water each time. Wolfsbane was a wrecking ball on a werewolf system once it was unleashed. Red planned to unleash a lot on them. Frank and Nuno charged for Lucas. The vampire smirked and spread his arms wide like a sacrifice. Red ignited the levitation spell to life. Four silver daggers, anointed with wolfsbane, rocketed toward the pack. She had to aim carefully to avoid Lucas. She wanted to lob the whole lot in a wave too thick for the pack to dodge. Gloria leapt on her father, sending them into the sand before a blade pierced the spot where his heart once had been. Nuno dodged under a dagger before popping up to punch Lucas in the face. He shook his hand and glared as if he'd expected it to do more. Was he too weak to do a partial shift? Red sent another round of blades at the wolves who eluded them to circle around the vampire. Frank caught a silver-tipped arrow, then squinted up at the rooftop where it came from a hidden hunter's crossbow. Had he smelled the other's location? Laughing, Lucas backed up the street toward the trap in the brothel. He wiped at his bleeding nose. My grandmother can hit harder than that, and she's buried in England. Nuno howled and lunged at him, sending them rolling in the dirt. Red tried to aim a blade at him, but she couldn't get a clear shot. Fucking hell. This was exactly why Lucas was supposed to hold back. She was still new at this. On his back, the vampire kicked out to launch the werewolf over his head. You're getting pus on the jacket, mate. It's a distraction, Frank said his gaze sweeping over to her hiding spot. He charged toward the butcher shop with Gloria on his heels. Silver bullets shot out from the roof of the general store, hitting the ground at his swift feet. <laughs> Frank fired a challenging stare back that could make a demon pause. His paws transformed back into hands. The wind caught his gravelly whisper like a ventriloquist's trick. I know who killed your real daddy, Constantine. Red launched more blades, shivering like she'd been doused in ice-cold water. Every word dropping from his lips was a curse, stronger than if he had hexed them. It didn't matter if it was a lie. It would drive Vic crazy anyway. Frank sidestepped her attack. His quiet statement slashed deeper than a knife. Heard about you, Victor Park Constantine. Henry took you in, but you weren't his pup. Vic yelled over the ghost town. What the fuck are you talking about? I met the son of bitch that killed your family, ate him, he said. She bit her tongue to keep from cursing when Vic climbed down from the general store, leaving LaShawn flailing a crossbow like a distressed mime. The wily wolf laid a better baited trap for the hunters than their own. Reconnecting with Hannah's magic, Red summoned two silver daggers. They rose from the quartz in her mind's eye, even if she couldn't physically see them. Her will directed them toward the naked Alpha, sweating, she honed her will to follow his agile movements. Unable to shake off the flying blades, Frank tugged his daughter in front of himself. A silver dagger sliced open her sleeve, nicking the skin. Another hit Gloria in the fat of her calf, embedding down to the handle. He held his screaming child aloft, pivoting to avoid the next blade. Cold-blooded, he was more of a snake than a wolf. He said, It wasn't a lowly feral victor. Give me the witch, and I'll give you a name. 
Vic didn't say anything, but his knuckles whitened on his gun handle. She didn't think he was going to pull the trigger. The few seconds dragged out like years. Bullocks to that, Lucas yelled. He jumped on Frank with Nuno clinging to his leg and tussled with father and son. The daughter clutched her wounded calf near the scuffle, whimpering as she pulled out the blade in her leg. Another arrow pinged out from the general store. Lashawn waved at Red from the rooftop to run. At least he remembered the plan. She twisted open the blue jar and drank it in three desperate gulps. The blood hit her system like a thousand coffees. Her posture straightened and her earache from the gunfire disappeared. The world glimmered brighter to her third eye. Her inner flame of magic flared like gasoline had been thrown on it. A euphoric confidence spread through her body, easing her racing thoughts about Vic. She sped out of the broken hole in the back of the butcher shop. Damn it, LaShawn, shoot! Lucas cried out, voice bouncing off the ruined buildings. Bugger, not me! Red ducked into the bordello and edged around the broken floor of the first section. She ran to the bed frame in the far back. If the job hadn't fully unraveled, the boys were supposed to force the wolves to shelter in the brothel, then take places at either exit outside to prevent escape. Supposed was the operative word. The desert quiet amplified the fighting outside. She had to trust that Vic could fight his feelings and keep his head like a hunter. He'd do what it took. He had taught her that. She cast her magic into the werewolf trap in the basement below. Her energy swirled around the sacred circle, readying the wolfsbane oil-coated crystals. She needed the lopuses inside it before she could trap them. Hannah came through, her magic connecting to the wolf trap right on time. A green feminine silhouette flickered like a skipping hologram over the bed. The spirit energy felt curious, drawn to the magic. That was just her luck. Red beseeched the ghost. Be cool and I will burn whatever incense you want. Lucas sprinted into the crib house, blurring from the speed, to stop at her side. Fangs out and irises blazing demonic yellow, he put himself in front of her and cracked his knuckles. A splash of blood dripped through a bullet hole in his leather-covered back. They're coming. She took a bracing breath and propped her hand on her hunter's kit. Habit moved her to touch her revolver. She grabbed the crystal instead. It connected her to the real weapon under her feet. Tonight, she brought together both sides of herself, hunter and witch. A large gray werewolf loped into the crib house. His missing ear marked him as Frank. The shaggy bulk seemed too large to be allowed, more than double the size of a regular wolf. Nuno burst inside with Gloria over his shoulder, both in human form. His foot nearly slipped into the crater in the front room. He righted himself with a snarl. His arm was slashed deeply by a blade. The skin was painfully inflamed around the wounds as the wolfbane took effect. Stop, Gloria hissed, bravado overriding pain, as she slipped down from her brother to stand on her own feet. Blood gushed from her leg wound. Pain thickened her Boston accent. You're in wicked deep trouble now, witch. Lucas pointed at himself. Do you not see the vampire here? Red stared straight through the woman, her mind's eye full of the uncut crystals glowing with energy in the spider-filled cellar below. The selenite in her hands warmed. She stoked the magic like a blacksmith tending a forge. Hannah's power had weakened, but the embers still joined the war effort. It would be more than enough to fuel the trap. The big wolf stalked slowly on the scuffed trail of forgotten miners. Frank... Lucas beckoned, slapping his thigh like his was calling a dog. The mockery in his voice hardened into a grim resolution. This was always our fight. I got sent a vision. You die. Nuno screamed like a berserker, fingers transforming into sharp paws. He bolted ahead of the wolf. Gloria gritted her teeth, hobbling at a jerky run after her brother. She yelled, wait up! <laughs> Red clenched her fists, gathering her magic, readying the wolf trap to ignite. Fists up, Lucas met Nuno with an uppercut to his wounded cheek. He grunted when Gloria punched his side. You weren't tagged in, love. Frank bounded forward, snorting in canine annoyance. Red raised the wolf trap, 
translucent thorny vines jutted up like shrubbery doused with magical miracle grow. It rose in a circle to enclose the fight. Frank dodged the barrier at the last moment. His flat predator eyes pierced her from the other side of the circle. He didn't look at his convulsing children in the trap. Red dropped the selenite to crash to the floor like her hopes. She hadn't caught them all. Lucas shoved Nuno away to step out of the trap, free to do so as a vampire. He smirked at Frank, hands in his pockets as he strolled forward. I'd barter the lives of your children, but I've seen how much they're worth to you. The wall shook, and an unearthly wail rushed through the room like a burst of wind. Spectral emerald mist glowered over the room. The bed frame jerked forward to railroad into Lucas. The wolf leapt for his throat. A plank wrenched away from a window and hit both males. Red waved her hands, shouting to the ghost, Chill out! A brick struck Lucas in the head. Rusty cans and trash rained down on the supernaturals, spewing out of the hole in the floorboards. Frank slammed against a boarded-up window and burst out into the desert. Lucas flailed his arms against the flying debris. His every step was blocked by the phantom onslaught. Red tried to keep her focus on the trap. Hannah had stopped channeling her magic into it, too. What the hell was the teen doing? Had she left through the portal already? Gloria coughed, rolling over. Blood dribbled from the side of her mouth, coating her teeth. Her red smile stretched wide. Should have caught my daddy, witch. Nuno chortled, a wet, phlegmy sound. He flopped on the floor, spine contorting, back skin peeling apart like a rippling fault line under his windbreaker. The smell of fresh meat hit the dusty air. Even the ghost stilled her attack on Lucas at the god-awful squish of human skin flipping to wolf, thankfully hidden by clothes. Four furry legs kicked out of the loose pants and shirt. Nuno shook his mangy pelt. The old wolfsbane wound marred his snout. He howled to the moon. As she shifted form beside him, Gloria answered the battle cry. They quieted to low growls. Soul-curdling screams ripped through the ghost town. Twenty. February 13th, evening. Battle Forge, Nevada. Outside the old bordello, Vic yelled, Hold on, little bro. Red couldn't see what caused LaShawn's screams, but her mind filled the gap with terrible visuals. She'd seen wolf attacks before. Unbidden tears streaked down her face. This was exactly what she didn't want to happen, but she couldn't move. She powered the spell trap on the lope siblings by herself. Even reaching for her gun might break her fragile concentration. Go, Lucas! Lucas leapt over a fallen fridge and ran to the window where Frank had escaped. He disappeared out the broken window after a nervous glance over his shoulder at her. Was he worried about what he'd find outside or about leaving her by herself? The two wolves circled in their pen, feeling out the edges. Even poisoned, they were still dangerous. If Frank escaped, then they could use his kids for leverage and intel. The siblings waited, teeth bared for the cage to weaken so they could fight for freedom. She shook from the effort of staying at her post. How could she do it alone? Hannah's magic returned suddenly, surging through the wolf trap like a plea to go. Red sprinted out of the brothel, desperate to help Lashown. Her racing feet sprayed rocky soil behind her. The horror show was on Main Street. Still in animal form, Frank dragged Lashon screaming and kicking over dry bushes away from the town. The bulky yet agile wolf shook the grown man around like braided rope. His razor teeth were locked on his victim's right arm like he wanted to bite it off. Lucas launched himself at Frank, landing in the dirt as his quarry zigzagged away. Vic aimed a revolver, trying to get a bead on the wolf. Frank, drop him if you want to see your kids again. LaShawn punched the unrelenting snout. Bite marks on his legs and chest had turned the blue of his denim outfit black. He yelled, Help! Red lifted her palms and channeled her magic through the nearest levitation grid. A wolf pelt protected its owner from direct hexes. She had another idea, visualizing the manipulated air molecules curled around Frank's snout like a hand to yank on his top jaw. Frank lost hold of LaShawn's arm as his head jerked up, and he yelped as he levitated. 
She tried to force him steady so Vic could get a clear shot. Frank broke out of her mystical grip to land into a thicket of tumbleweed. He sped away as Lucas chased him into the gloom of the desert. Vic darted to his brother, falling to his knees. Red stooped to pick up spectacles from the dirt and shove them into her pocket. She ran to the Constantine boys. Heart pounding, she crouched beside them. We need to get him in the RV. Vic grimaced as he pressed a palm to LaShawn's bleeding arm. He pressed the other one to a chest wound. There were too many bites, and he had too few hands. God damn it! Hold on, bro! Listen to me, LaShawn said. This is bad. Vic tried to shush him. LaShawn exhaled harshly through his nose, his gray-blue eyes rolling back as if fading into unconsciousness. A burst of energy jolted through him. He lifted his good arm, bloody fingers pulling his brother closer by the collar. Listen, whatever happens, don't become dad. Vic stuttered. He looked lost like a scared little boy as if reliving another wolf attack. She wanted to hug her friend so badly and lie that everything would be fine. She'd never seen him like this. He hoisted his brother up gently to his feet. You're not going to die. Lashon groaned, clutching his side. That's not what I'm worried about. The brilliant lights of the motorhome swooped over them as it trundled to a stop. Hannah meditated in the passenger seat with selenite in her hand. At the steering wheel, Ezra waved and yelled, The seedling is almost ready. Red and Vic held up Leishon on the way to the camper. Vic half carried his brother up the side steps to rest him on the sofa. She trotted up behind him and locked the door. Vic barked out, Get the first aid kit! Ezra brought the kit from the counter and started tending to Leishon. This is bringing me back to childhood, Hannah confessed from the front seat. The wolves are weakening, but I can't hold the trap much longer, Red. I used too much when I watered the portal. Vic snapped, is it ready? It's big and juiced up, Hannah said. Frazzled, she shrugged. Stable? I don't know. We're going now, right? Ezra asked, spraying a silver potion that made LaShawn hiss in pain when it touched his wounds. Red put her hand on Vic's shoulder. I'll go back to the wolf trap. Go to the academy with them. I'll finish Frank with Lucas. A terrible darkness came over Vic's face. It scared Red more than his earlier panic. He stared down at his brother, his fists clenching, until the knuckles popped. The boy who had lost so much to wolves had grown up into a vengeful man. She knew it, but she'd never seen his naked rage like this. Involuntary instinct made her step back from the man she trusted above all others. I he bolted down the camper stairs without checking if the Alpha was lying in wait. Red cursed, dashing after her friend. She couldn't leave him alone. He always taught her to keep feelings out of a hunt, but right now he was reacting on pure emotion. She whipped her magic out ahead of her to buffer the wolf trap. He scooped up his fallen revolver in the dirt before he sped into the bordello. Red called after him. We can use them. Wait. He didn't. Heart sinking, she knew what he was going to do. Maybe it had to happen eventually, but it didn't need to be him. Not like this. She rushed through the door sill and through the front room. Think. Gun blast shook the wooden crib house. Vic emptied the barrel. It wasn't a hunt, it was an execution. He wiped his mouth with his wrist, then shoved the smoking gun into his belt holster. Mystical vines, glowing to her third eye and sturdy as cage bars, surrounded the werewolves. The larger ones shielded the smaller. Blood streaked their gray fur, their corpses twitched, the legs elongated as the snouts shrunk. Red gagged, turning her head as the werewolves shifted back into humans. They weren't alive. It was merely a step of their supernatural decomposition. She covered her eyes, releasing her hold on the wolf trap. They didn't need it now. The siblings curled around each other as if still protecting each other in death. Once assassins with a foot-long kill count, they looked fragile in their nude stillness. A lone howl echoed from the horizon. Faraway coyotes yipped in sympathy. Red couldn't stand to look at the bodies. This was why she hated werewolf hunts. Nuno and Gloria looked like regular people in death. She said, You did what you needed to do. Now go to your brother. Vic didn't turn to face her. I need to find fucking Frank. She marched up to him. 
You need to be with LaShawn. He glared at her through wet, ferocious eyes. That bastard might have turned my brother into one of them. Killing Frank won't stop that. Taking LaShawn to the immortal alchemist might. He'll never forgive you if you don't go to the hospital with him. You'll never forgive yourself if you don't. And the worst happens. He ground his teeth. Haunted seconds stretched in the silent standoff. A luxury vehicle parked outside the Bordello ruins. Kristoff leisurely called out, Did I miss the wolf hunt? Red, relieved for the unexpected backup, didn't break eye contact with Vic. She tried to sound firm, but it came out a plea. Two vampires and a witch. We'll find him. Vic snorted like a bull and tossed her the keys to the Millennium Falcon. Stomping past, his lips curled over his canines. I'm back once LaShawn is stabilized. It's a two-way portal. Good enough. She forced herself not to look back at the carnage as they left the bordello. Vic rushed ahead of her to the Winnebago. He ripped open the camper door, marching inside. I'm driving! Kristoff leaned by his all-terrain SUV, still shiny as if this were the first time the vehicle had left the highway. His wary gaze studied the brothel. There's more than the newly deceased in there. Another time, Red would have asked how he sensed the ghost, but the minutes were like hours with a killer werewolf on the loose. How did you get here so quickly after sunset? Thought you were busy with your nightclub opening? I'm a workaholic with a private plane, remember? Defending my claimed human is part of the job. So is helping a friend. You're both, he said. His grin faded to a grim line. Where is the last wolf? Escaped. Your sire is chasing him somewhere. It's just going to be us three going after him until Vic comes back. Red shivered, looking to the dark horizon. Her body sagged from grief as much as all the magic use. His blood had given her a boost, but the effects were waning. She needed to clear the field of innocence so she could focus on how to save this shitstorm of a hunt. The creaking motorhome turned around like a lumbering giant towards the portal. Glowing like a galaxy, the ethereal seedling had grown to a mighty banyan, engulfing the dead tree in its translucent starry trunk. Its canopy towered over the decaying buildings. Kristoff tilted his ear toward the main street. Someone is coming. He's here, Red said, pointing to the desert. The loping wolf came in from the west. Lucas chased after him in a flutter of leather. Kristoff slung his suit jacket onto the SUV hood before charging for the wolf. Swift like a pup, Frank darted in the opposite direction to loop around the bordello toward the back of the butcher shop. Go! Red yelled to Vic in the motorhome. He looked frozen behind the wheel like he wanted to run the wolf over. The damn beast would just trick him into crashing. Ezra hung out the side door of the vehicle. It's not ready yet, Red said. Think really hard about the academy then. Hannah has a key. Look out! Red dug her hand into her hunter's kit for where mace, then dropped into a crouch, spraying the stinging liquid behind her. The wolf leaped over her head. His paws were centimeters away from the acid stream. Dust billowed around her. He disappeared into the wilderness. Two dark-clothed blurs chased after him. Lucas lagged after his progeny. Red knew what Frank was doing now. He was trying to wear out the vampires. It was working. Vampires had super strength, speed, and healing fueled by their finite blood supply. They either slowed down or went nuts with hunger when their tanks were emptied. Lucas was burning through his blood power after being wounded and coming off an entire day awake without feeding. The portal created a mighty gust as it opened wider in brilliant concentric circles of blue and purple. Its mysterious wind beat against the ruins, scattering pebbles and dust to reveal the road booby traps on Main Street. The spirit branches of the banyan stretched out beyond the swirling portal like flailing arms. Aerial roots sprouted and slammed into the soil. The motorhome lurched toward the portal. Red relaxed a bit. Frank was on the loose, but at least she didn't need to worry about her friends. Lights flooded behind her from the road, casting her legs into long shadows. She looked back, shielding her eyes. Her night vision was trashed by the high beams. 
Who was that? Her enemies would have shot at her already. A small sedan wove through the tire traps with the precision of a stuntman. Parking in front of the butcher shop, the driver stepped out. Riotous curls flared from a high ponytail, a golden poker chip draped on a chain around her neck. The portal's glare clouded her spectacles. Red opened her mouth to greet Trudy, but her voice was stolen by the blinding sight of the Winnebago disappearing into the portal. A supernova surged up through the spirit banyan before it dissolved into shimmers, leaving the dead tree behind, dormant until the next traveler presented an academy key. She waved to the bard. I'll explain after we get Frank. Trudy stepped away from the car, grimoire floating above her hand. Who's still here? Me and two vampire friends, Red said, coming closer. You met Lucas already. He's somewhere. Murky light streamed out of the grimoire. Crystals and bones shot out of the car like swarming bats to fall in a circle around Trudy. Each landed in a neat thump. Oh, that was cool and convenient. Red would have to ask how she did that trick. Shadows materialized over the other witch, unfurling in a rolling wave. The dark mass shot up to hover over the butcher shop. Its hungry arms spread over the ghost town like a giant squid ready to feed. A jet beak snapped amid the shades. The penumbra misted over the bard like fog. It was the same beast that Red had faced in the ranking court. She felt better having the thing on her side. Trudy, can it tell you if it sees the wolf? A tentacle slapped over her wrist. Red cried out, wordlessly like a confused animal, wrenching away from the pain. She thought this thing was tamed. What the hell are you doing? Without emotion, Trudy replied. My orders. Red sprinted behind the false front of the half-standing saloon, stalling to think of a plan for this David and Goliath battle. There was no doubt who the bard served, or what she was willing to sacrifice. She yelled to Trudy, A brotherhood burn notice. Are you shitting me? You were deemed a threat. A dark feeler groped for Red in her hiding place. She darted from the saloon to the brick wall of the mine office, passing the last dagger laying in the center of a crystal triangle. I haven't done anything. You can't just murder me. I don't relish every duty. Trudy's hard tone brokered no excuse for herself. Red rolled into a somersault away from the shadow's reach. Thunder cracked within it, energetic like a pet finally off its leash. She dashed into the street. You're supposed to be a hero, not a killer. Murder isn't what the Brotherhood does. How do you think you earned those hunter bounties? The question felt like a slap. Red snapped, I'm not a killer. We discussed this. Banter is for the desperate. Sometimes it's just fun, love, Lucas said as he sprinted from the desert with Kristoff beside him. The vapor leviathan swung a colossal flipper, flinging the vampires back to land in the dirt in front of the SUV. Smoky arms crushed the hood as if proving a point. The sudden pressure popped the wheels. Bloody hell! Lucas strained to rise to his knees. Kristoff flashed his fangs at Trudy. He struggled to lift his arms like something held him down. What are you? A devoted hero and bard, Trudy said. Sincerity fortified the steely words. I swore to be a shield in the darkness. The phantasm surged in a cloud of wiggling appendages toward the vampires. Kristoff knocked him and his sire out of the warpath. Red focused on the levitation grids. There was still one more dagger left. She sent it rocketing toward Trudy. A stretched shadow antenna slapped it uselessly to the ground. The wraith jetted toward her. Fuck. She ripped her snubby revolver from her hunter's kit, aiming it at Trudy, not letting herself think. She wouldn't pull the trigger if she did. Solid, masculine bulk toppled into her, knocking the wind and the gun out of her hand. Rolling over, she held her nails ready to gouge eyeballs. No, it can't be you! Ezra straddled her waist, pinning her shoulders. Desperation crinkled the corners of his eyes. Not my mom! Trudy called out, horrified. Ezra! Red slapped him, then shoved him to the side and stumbled to her feet. She channeled the levitation spell and yanked the golden poker chip off Trudy's neck. 
The bard couldn't be allowed to return and lie about whatever happened here. Red caught the chip one-handed and dodged giant tentacle slaps on her way to the Millennium Falcon. The floating monstrosity grew into a thunderhead as a howl broke over the ghost town from the graveyard on the hill. She climbed into the driver's seat and swiped the broken glass aside with her magic before jamming the keys into the ignition. The van flared to life despite the bullet wounds. She swerved around Trudy's bone circle. Without cold iron to neutralize the dark witchcraft, breaking the ritual would unleash the creature. She pressed the button to automatically open the side door and zoom toward the vampires. Get it! Kristoff and Lucas leapt into the back. Red sped out of the main street toward the portal. She held the poker chip in her sweaty palm. To awaken the portal, she tried to visualize the gigantic pyramid hall and the maze of laboratories. It had to be clear. Perinel warned her that this was an unstable portal, and its destination wasn't yet fixed. Red just wanted to be as close to home as she could be. Blue skies over a creek broke through her memories of the Academy in Las Vegas. The Millennium Falcon charged into the growing portal. Light enveloped the van. They shot through violet thunderheads in a treacherous cosmos on a long, strange road. Reality stretched in the pure silence. Letting off the geese, she tightened her hold on the shaking steering wheel. A purple solar flare exploded beyond the cracked windshield. They glided downward through the nebula. The van landed smoothly in a darkened meadow. Snow fringed the grass. The half moon reflected in a bubbling stream. A deer bounded away from their headlamps for the tree line. Red put the engine in park and wiped her sweating face. Kristoff grinned, leaning his elbow on her seat. That was fun. Let's take the Lambo in it next time. Spooked, Lucas asked, Where are we? This isn't Sin City. 21. February 13th, evening, somewhere. The meadow looked serene in the moonlight, even through a bullet-cracked windshield. A stream wound along a dirt road. The air smelled fresh and crisp after a light February snowfall. Far-off headlights of highway traffic diffused on the tree line. Where were they? Red flipped her spirit gaze off, fighting the queasiness of the rough ride. The brilliance of the portal still sparkled in the corners of her eyes. Lucas opened the side door to explore the terrain. I thought that was a one-destination portal, Red. I think I confused it with my intentions. It wasn't exactly ready, and I'm new to the Academy. Where the hell did I take us? She flipped on the radio for a clue, twisting the dial past the static. The final notes of a pop song faded as a DJ started to hype up the airwaves. Your faves from the 90s to today. Right now. 104.6. K. Duke. Eugene. Oregon's place for the hits. That's bloody random, Lucas said. We're not that close to Eugene at all. I know this place. She climbed out of the Millennium Falcon, barely noticing the vampires following her. She darted to the stream and looked up at the stars. Her first memory was an airplane in this exact sky. She still didn't know why she cried from joy to see it. The old memory was as solid as yesterday. She said, Coyote Creek, this is where Vic found me. Why here? Kristoff asked, scrutinizing the meadow. I wanted to be close to home and I thought of my dorm, but the portal must have decided. Red walked from him until she found the spot where she almost bled out in the soil. She crouched, legs trembling, and touched the chilly, wet grass. After a year and some change, the earth had dissolved any trace of her. She had returned many times after she had been found to comb the creek bed for clues. Earned nothing besides mosquito bites. She had promised after the last time that she would be done panning for clues with the desperation of a hungry gold prospector. Now, she was back. Um. What that meant, she didn't have the bandwidth to understand. Suddenly realizing that Lucas was talking to her, she refocused on the present and found her manners. Thanks for texting, Vic. Kristoff said, The local Supreme isn't exactly my biggest fan. We need to drive on. We can be in my territory before sunrise. No, Red said. 
with that windshield. Besides, I'm thrashed from magic. Lucas needs to feed. There's a clean motel nearby. Let's stop and regroup, or at least repair. You call your people. Even if Trudy guessed, the portal went somewhere else. She can't scry for me. Kristoff glanced towards the southeast, as if checking for Trudy's beast on the horizon. That bard has other tricks. I felt her magic paralyzing my limbs. Not with the grip of a necromancer, but strong enough. She practices death magic, for sure. Lucas gestured to Red. She looks ready to drop, mate. That's the big gun in this fight. Not your fancy entourage in Portland. Kristoff clenched his jaw, stalking back to the van, already pulling out his phone. I'll make arrangements on the way. She drove them on the lonely country mile toward a highway. Rabbits sprinted away from the headlamps. The cracked windshield made the ride feel longer as she drove with her head half out of the door window to see. Vic sent a short update that LaShawn was in the Academy's intensive care unit, being put into a supernatural coma to administer emergency treatment to purge the contagion from the werewolf bites. The gendarme had gone into the Battleforge portal and only found the bodies of the Lope's siblings. He sent a longer text about how he was right about Trudy being a backstabber. She let him have the I told you so. The betrayal hurt to think about, so she turned up the radio instead. King. At the motel, Red dug into supplies from the damaged van while Kristoff dealt with the front desk to get a room. She didn't want to speculate about exactly where Lucas went to go feed. On this lonely stretch of a forested highway, there wasn't anything else besides the one-story motel with a Spartan line of doors on either side and the dimly lit two-pump gas station beside it. The windows were broken, but Red locked up the van anyway and hoisted a duffel bag over her shoulder. Kristoff was easy to find at the end of the row of hotel rooms. She could have kissed him when she noticed the small pizza box in his hands. Where did you get that? Gas station? Lucas isn't the only one who needs to feed. He opened the door for her. The room wasn't much beyond a bathroom, and the two beds with hunter green duvets. Faux wood, paneled like a hunting lodge. A detailed map of Oregon was the sole decoration. She shook the last of the grainy glass particles off her bag before she brought it inside and tended to her scrapes and burns in the bathroom. The smell of pepperoni wafted through the open door, distracting her the whole time. Kristoff tested the window locks and assessed the thickness of the curtains, but paused his room review to loiter around her. Dig into that pizza already. I can feel the magic tension from here. Red sat on the bed with the pizza. What you mean? You did a lot of magic tonight. That makes witches twitchy. Considering our time constraints and the situation... I thought food was a good substitute for sex. Not that I wouldn't be a team player if it came to it. Eating is best, Red blushed. Witches had to center their energies after spells to bring them back to Earth. Food, sleep, massage, and well, other things that she didn't need to think about associated with Kristoff. She chewed vigorously, making her way through the little pizza to avoid his gaze. You don't need to feed... I had my fill on the plane before I trekked out to the ghost town. Unless that is a personal offer? Red shook her head, crossing her legs. Her mind provided a very unhelpful flashback to the last time he had bitten her. I caught that uptick in your heartbeat. You caught nothing. Cheeks hot, she put the empty box on the ancient television and scrambled into the bathroom to quickly change into white pajamas. The fatigue of the night settled over her as she brushed her teeth. Stale adrenaline ebbed at the sight of her own reflection in the mirror. She looked pale enough to be dead. The dyed black hair only brought out her pallor. A scared woman stared back at her through the mirror. With a target on her head, she was a witch on the run. In the quiet, the stress of the night overcame her. Was this because she was the reincarnation of Juniper St. James? The Brotherhood had rejected her services for it. Now it seemed like they were escalating their beef to murder. Everything she had thought she knew about her life in Las Vegas had twisted like a roulette whirl. Every kind word from Trudy became suspect in her memories. She had thought of the bard as a friend. 
Was that entire date with Ezra a setup too? Red wanted to punch the mirror. She had really liked him. He had to be a good guy. Or was Vic right? Had Trudy always been out to get them? Were mother and son working against her? She had overheard them before she had fled into Dr. Finch's trap. Ezra said that his mom dropped truth bombs on him that day. Trudy had been given new orders. Red felt stupid to have assumed that it was to fight the wolves. That naivete had nearly gotten her killed tonight. The ambush had been a shitstorm. They had taken out two of the pack, but they hadn't won. Her friends had trooped to her aid, some for their own reasons, but they had come. Even lash on. And he got a werewolf bite for his trouble. They wouldn't know until the next full moon if Frank's corruption had taken hold. She tugged out her phone, dialing Vic quickly, but got his voicemail. Hey, I bet you're with LaShawn right now. I just... I'm going to get Frank. Do what you need to do there. I'll do the same here. I'm sorry, Vic. Red hung up, leaning on the counter, arms shaking as she fought the bitter tears, hot like coffee. Her reflection judged her from the mirror. Had this night destroyed her friend's life? A soft knock on the door broke her from the spell of her reflection. It's open, she said, wiping her mouth absently for any stray toothpaste. The door opened to show an empty room behind her. She turned away from Kristoff's non-reflection to face him. He leaned in the door sill. You look like a woman with a lot on your mind. She lifted herself to sit on the counter. I never expected to come back. The good thing is that no one else will think to look for us here. The portal brought us for a reason. You know you can't learn everything in the academy. I wanted to go home. She rubbed her arms, thinking of the diner from her dreams. The booths were clear in her mind's eye. In the dreamland, she had wished to be safe and landed there. Another sign from her subconscious. I don't think I'm ready. Isn't that weird? I've been searching for so long, but can I handle what I find? He grinned. You could handle hell itself. She put her palm to her forehead, rubbing nervously over her hair. I couldn't last around with a determined duck right now. Trudy isn't going to give up either. She's a woman on a mission. He stepped forward, rolling up his dusty shirt sleeve. A twinkle rose in his eyes. He cupped her cheek. You have a secret weapon in my blood, but no glasses this time. She licked her lips before she could stop herself. His eyebrow quirked in invitation. Is that yes? Red exhaled sharply as she turned away, fleeing his temptation to sit on the farthest bed. She wished the room had chairs, sexually neutral chairs. I need to be clear-headed. Sometimes that stuff makes me feel high. We need a next location after this. Portland, obviously. I have lairs that no one beyond Arno knows about. When they don't find us in Las Vegas, they'll go there. You made it known at Gary's Casino that Portland is where we're going. I need somewhere no one could guess. And where do you suggest? Sighing, she looked down at her hands, scraped up from the long day. It's crazy. I can't do it. I've managed scrying once, but I knew exactly where that place was, down to how the furniture was arranged. You opened a portal tonight. I bet you can find a place on the map. Kristoff snagged the state map framed on the wall and set it on the bed. He put his hand on her shoulder. Try. She pulled some crystals from her bag to arrange them on the map. Using an old necklace as a pendulum, she visualized the diner. She had gotten her ass kicked tonight, but the synod would have applauded her spell work. An unsteady confidence rose in her. She pushed all her focus into finding the diner, summoning it the only way she knew how. I want to be somewhere safe. The pendulum purposefully dipped over a spot on the coast. The town name was in tiny script she could barely read. She touched the words. A wild hope cut through her grief. Charm, we go there. You can't be serious. It's on a dimensional fault line, Kristoff said. A thoughtful smile grew on his face as he reconsidered. The strange is routine there, even if the locals might not admit it. A witch's duel wouldn't be out of place. The mystical energies are so potent there that few would notice your magic there. You know the town? 
I own a house there for business reasons. I always wanted to drive you to the coast. Never thought it would be to charm. Suddenly sleepy, she tidied up the bed, then curled up under the covers. What's it like? It's a little seaside town. Neighbors borrow sugar from each other. White picket fences. Except for the paranormal activity, it might as well be Mayberry. He shrugged as he sat on the other bed. Have you been to this diner? Red asked, fluffing up the flat pillow before she described her vision. I don't know why I went there in the dreamland, but maybe it's in Charm. It's safe. I don't know how I know. I don't remember Charm that way. I mostly remember Alaric's aborted apocalypse ten years ago. I can see you growing up there. He smiled wistfully. Apocalypse Alley. Sounds like my kind of place. She didn't know which blink had done her in, but she woke before sunrise to see the curtains duct taped to the walls to block out any light. The boys had been busy while she had been sleeping. She rolled over. Lucas rested on the other bed, leather-clad arms behind his head. His handsome aristocratic profile was composed in deep thought. A sweet, boyish smile blossomed on his face when he glanced at her. Groggy, she pushed herself upright. Where's Kristoff? He looked to the ceiling, his lips tightening at his progeny's name. He's feeding. Oh God, he isn't killing, right? Red asked, her fear piercing her sleepiness. The bastard is an unrepentant murderer, but he's skimming tonight. I don't give my progeny much credit, but he's smart enough not to kill when he feeds in public, especially now. Worry subsiding, she yawned and nestled back down into her pillow. Isn't that the fun of being an unsold vampire? Not anymore. Two drained bodies a week stick out more than they used to. He told me where you want to go. Are you sure? Honestly, she wasn't. It felt more like a desperate scramble for the top of her bucket list than a strategy. She shrugged, telling a version of the truth. I'm in Oregon. It's as good a place as any. Whatever happens with Trudy, I want to go. It doesn't matter if I'm ready or not. I'll make sure you get there. Even though it takes me away from L.A.? Red fired the question off before she could stop herself. She blamed the days of the pre-dawn and the trauma of the night. Or was it just the part of her that wanted to be open with him? Yes, Lucas said, leaning back on his pillows with his hands in his jean pockets. Celine gave me that vision because you were an innocent to help. Quinn got messages from oracles, seers, all manner of divine intervention or otherwise. Now they're coming to me. I told you I had to grow up. She stretched sleepily under the covers. You have all the potential for it. You're more than you know. That's what Juniper said. It took two lifetimes, but you might see me learn something. Christoph entered the hotel room, curious blue eyes analyzing the scene. It's almost dawn. Red nodded, watching them go into the bathroom and wagged a warning finger. Don't fight in here, boys. Waking up a few hours later, she kicked the vampires out of the bathroom. Red got herself ready with her go bag, then hustled them back in. She put a rolled towel to cover the uneven crack at the bottom of the door. No one needed to explode into dust today because a maid wandered into the room and let the sun shine inside. The late morning was spent going back and forth between the Millennium Falcon and the room. After cleaning it up, she packed her bag and a dry cooler of snacks for herself as the lone food eater. It was ready to go for sunset. She expected to have to deflect questions about the bullet holes when a mechanic came at noon to replace the windshield and perform any other repairs. Christoph's arrangements must have included silence along with an illegally dark tint job. The sun played nice, melting the lace of snow on the grass and kept the clouds at bay until the windows were finished. Kristoff hadn't supplied details, but she assumed a convoy of black SUVs would arrive at dusk to squire them to charm. After zipping her keys in one jacket pocket and phone in the other, she went to get coffee from the front desk. Weak winter sunlight peeked through the hazy sky. Darker clouds waited on the horizon. She walked around the back of the building, seeking a sight more serene than the parking lot, and breathed in the breeze coming off the forest of oaks and sycamores. 
A motel room door opened behind her. She lifted her coffee for another peaceful sip. Someone slapped their palm over her mouth before she could scream. Metal snapped onto her wrist. The coffee fell into a hot puddle at her feet. Her captor wrenched her other arm back and finished restraining her. The final snap of the cuffs vibrated through her body. One second she felt her magic, warm and alive within her, then the next. The cuffs repelled her magic like a plexiglass gate slamming into place. She tried to open her third eye. It might as well have been glued shut. The terrible separation from her magic made her heart race as if her air supply had been cut off. She struggled to get a glimpse of her attacker. You! Frank pushed her into the room, shutting the door with his heel. His hand couldn't completely muffle her curse when she saw who else was in the room. Ezra paced by the bed and his mother. Fear drowned out the question of how he'd found her in favor of how the hell she could fight, bound and magicless against an alpha werewolf and a witch. Red quipped, reaching for a standing lamp. What is this, the Bates Motel? Frank backhanded her before grabbing her neck in a smooth, efficient motion, honed over years of being a psychopath. Muzzle her so I can do this. A clump of shadow materialized inches from Red's face. Flattening like clay, it slapped against her stinging mouth. She opened her lips to scream for Kristoff. Thick vapor gagged her. Frank transformed his other hand, human skin peeling away from the blunt fingers under the palm. The nails turned black and pointed, Vestigial dewclaws grew as fur slid over the hybrid paw. He reared back to strike. Red struggled in his grip, breath catching in her throat. She froze at the knock on the door. Remember, I'll kill him, Frank whispered as he shoved her toward the bard, who wrenched her restrained arms up in a joint-grinding motion. Red shrieked behind the gag, completely muffled. Frank cracked the door open, blocking the view inside. Yeah? Hi, Mr. Patrick. We got your request to the front desk for more towels. An unseen folksy female said, bubbly and quick. Red sagged in Trudy's hold. She already could tell this was just some poor innocent person who couldn't help her. Ezra whispered into his mother's ear, you can't let him do this. Hush, Trudy hissed, time dilated, stretching the anxiety out as the unwitting clerk made small talk. Gosh, it was a nice morning. Smells like rain now. Felt like a slice of summer for a bit there, and it's February back again. She chortled at her own joke. Anywho, we also got a call from the credit card company, the one under your wife's name. I just need to double-check both of your IDs again. Frank leaned his head back, barking. Wife! Trudy warned Ezra to behave with an urgent mom glance. Walking to the door, she pulled a wallet out of her tweed pants. She stepped outside with Frank and closed the door. Ezra whispered, I had no idea about any of this. Red lifted her chained hands to flip him off since she couldn't verbalize the sentiment. If this was some attempt at Stockholm Syndrome, she wasn't falling for it. <laughs> I jumped out of the RV before it hit the portal because I saw her car. I was pissed she had come to stop the wolves. Some last heroism to go to Valhalla, Ezra said. He ruffled his hair. I never... I don't know why the Brotherhood pulled her out of retirement for this shit. This isn't who my mom is. She rolled aching shoulders, trying to urge blood into her increasingly numb hands, unimpressed by the defense. His mother had been a hero, but became something else along the way. It's not who I am. You don't need to believe my words. He pulled her gun from his waistband and put it in her belted hunter's kit, leaving the leather latch undone. Red quirked her eyebrows at him, glancing between him and her kit. She had gone to sleep last night, imaging that everything had been a lie. Had that laid-back guy, who loved pinball and could make a mean gin and tonic even existed? Or was it a cover? A fervent hope tugged her heart. The mystical muzzle grew over her nose. She pulled in a desperate lungful of air as the dark vapor closed over her nostrils. Her thoughts shut off as primal panic peaked. She couldn't breathe. Were they going to smother her to death? Ezra grabbed her shoulders. Red! Trudy strode in first. 
Frank slammed the door behind him. The werewolf pivoted, tossing the towels on the bed. His eyes flashed silver at Trudy. He asked, trying to cut me out? Maybe, Ezra said, lifting his chin up and chest out. Frank stalked to the other man. I've killed better bartenders than you. A shadow orb struck the ground between the men. Trudy stepped forward to her co-assassin. The shadows disappeared from Red's face. She inhaled a grateful gulp of air. The bard said, It appears we have a miscommunication, Mr. Lopes. Ezra, take her into the bathroom. No talking. Vamps could hear, Frank said, his paw lifted in warning. Come on, Ezra muttered, tapping Red's shoulder to guide her into the bathroom. The fan turned on when the light did. He closed the door. Red breathed heavily through her nose, trying to refuel the oxygen in her brain. That was a sick little ploy from Trudy. Ezra put his finger to his mouth for silence. He reached for her pocket and fished out her phone, then swiped the screen, going to the contacts list and tapping Lucas's name. He covered the dial tone coming from the speaker with his thumb as the vampire picked up. The voice was barely audible on the other end. Red love, what? Her heart leapt. Ezra tilted the phone toward the door as the conversation rose in the other room. I saw that trick, Frank said gruffly. You and Mr. Gabriel aren't Welshing on our deal. Trudy replied, Mr. Lopes, you have my condolences for your loss, but keep your senses. I'm not bitching because I'm down some pups. I get paid if I kill her, not if you do. And that goes for your boy. This isn't a time to fight. We are eliminating a threat to the Brotherhood. Frank's gravelly words were cold enough grow icicles. No, I'm earning a lot of cash. Your business is your own. Help me, Red breathed barely a whisper, knowing that Lucas could hear her. She's sweet-talking him, Frank said. Footsteps followed his hoarse complaint. Ezra zipped the phone in her pocket just before the door burst open. The sound of a sudden downpour filled the seconds of silence. Trudy narrowed her eyes at the closeness between them. You need to get away from her. Red pulled out her revolver, hands still chained together, and pointed it at Ezra. She said, give us space. Frank snarled. Let her shoot him. She'll drop it from the recoil. <laughs> Trudy blocked him, fear cracking her composure teeth bared at the wolf. That's my son. The exterior door to the hotel room ripped open to the sound of rain. Soaking wet, Lucas and Kristoff stood in the threshold. The older vampire bolted for Frank, meeting fang and claw in the center of the room. Trudy raised a hand, twirling her fingers as if beckoning something unseen, then yanked it back. Kristoff dropped to the ground, Shadows pulled the gun from Red's chained hands, dropping it to the floor behind her. The bard ordered, Ezra, stand aside. He stepped in front of Red. I can't do that. That's not how you raised me. Book, Trudy said, irises blackening. The grimoire flew into her hands, glimmering as it opened by itself. Crystals and bones flew to arrange around her. The shadow monster materialized above her, cramped in a corner its many arms unfurled, filling the air. Red threw herself into the shower, away from the burning suckers. This is insane, Ezra said, rushing to his mother and knocked the grimoire from her hands. He kicked the bone circle away in his haste to stop her. No! Red and Trudy's warnings bled into each other. Released, the shadow monster streaked forward, gloomy contours enveloping Ezra, Black lightning crackled within hungry clouds, tentacles wrapped tight around its prey. A strange hum of satisfaction echoed on the tile. Red hopped up, swinging the cold iron of her cuffs like she had a club in her hands to dispel the shadows. Heart thumping, she begged the gods that she wasn't too late. It had only been a few seconds for her, but how long was it in the belly of the beast for him? The phantom skittered up onto the ceiling, releasing its victim. Ezra fell to the tiles, his brown hair stuck to his clammy pale face, fear etched deep into his features. Chest horribly still, his closed eyelids were screwed up like he hadn't wanted to look. Red knelt to take his pulse. Nothing. Sob rippling over her shoulders, 
She couldn't say the words. Not to his own mother. Trudy gasped, tears streaming down her cheeks, covering her mouth. Her eyes faded back to Hazel. Oh, goddess, no. The shadow beast dropped curling arms behind the bard. Red leaped up, pushing her out of the way to swipe the chains at the wraith. It retreated. Trudy fell beside Ezra. She smoothed his hair back, then pressed her palms to his chest, attempting CPR with expert precision. The futile efforts grew more desperate. Tears streamed down her cheeks. The grieving mother gathered her son into her lap with shaking hands. Her chained glasses fell to reveal a tortured grimace, mouth open in a wail as silent as a ghoul. The sound trapped in her throat, leaving her haunted eyes to speak for her. Lucas yelled, Red! I'm sorry, so sorry, Red said in genuine sympathy to her attempted assassin. She dashed out of the bathroom to where the two vampires had backed the fully transformed werewolf into a corner by the bed. The shadowy leviathan billowed in like a monsoon, obscuring the space with an impenetrable murk. Strange shapes coiled in the darkness. Anticipation pulsed from the unearthly presence. Shadow tails churned up the pitch black. Lucas cursed. Bugger! Kristoff warned. I still smell you, wolf. Whack. The sound of a large body thumping on the ground followed a surprised canine whimper. Red ran toward the vampires, charging like a gorilla, arms above her head, clearing the space around her chains. Lucas dodged a fin to get to her side. I can hold them off. We can't leave you. I don't care what assigned you that vision, she said, smacking her cuffs at a pulsing shadow. A tentacle slapped her leg. She hissed in pain. You don't have to do this for me. I ran the last time you needed me, Red. But I'm not planning on dying, love. Not that much of a hero yet. I'm just giving you a head start. I told you I would get you where you needed to go. The werewolf charged her, leaping on all fours out of the gloom. She ducked. Lucas tackled him to the ground. Kristoff scooped her into his arms and sprinted out the door. Heavy rain beat down. Shadows poured out of the motel room. Vaporous appendages jetted for them. He rushed her to the Millennium Falcon. She said, the keys are in my left pocket. He unlocked the van, bundling her into the side door. Leaping up into the driver's seat, he switched on the van and flipped it into reverse. The wheels squealed on the way out of the parking lot to the road. Shadows grew behind them. How long can Lucas hold them? Red asked, slipping into the front seat, banging her knee. Her chained arms made her clumsy. Kristoff stomped on the gas until the clouds clear. Twenty-two, um... February 14th, late afternoon. Oregon, Fern Ridge Lake. The Millennium Falcon galloped with Kristoff at the wheel. He eschewed the large interstate going through Eugene to Portland and instead took a smaller territorial route around a lake. Pinkish sweat beaded his forehead. His discomfort was as palpable as the humidity on the newly tinted windshield. It's getting brighter, Red said, lifting the cuffs that bound her magic. And I need to get out of these. There's a jackknife in the hunter's kit. He parked on the muddy shoulder of the forested highway. She held out her cuffs. Now... Vic is better at this, but I can guide you through. Kristoff already had sprung the jackknife and was twisting a pick into the lock. It flopped open. He smirked, undoing the other one. If I had my camera, I would have enjoyed capturing that slack-jawed look at my abilities. It would have been a Valentine's Day gift to me. You're a man of many talents, she said, absently rubbing her wrists. She touched her magic, drawing upon it to remind herself it was there. She had never been in iron cuffs before, even if she had used them on other witches. It felt like she had been hollow, cut down from three dimensions to two. The utter separation from her magic rocked her foundations. She wanted to be magic-free once, not after that. Are you all right? We don't have the time for that answer. Make yourself a nest under the blankets. Kristoff nodded, climbing out of the front seat and shutting the sleep curtains behind him. She got into his place at the wheel and started the van, getting back onto the highway. Usually she hated driving in the rain, but the clearing skies filled her with dread. She did a double take at a hand at her elbow. 
He peeked out from the curtain, holding out an orange camping cup. He must have found it in the cooler she had prepacked. Drink so I can take a nap without worrying. Red took the cup and shot the gulp of blood quickly. Thanks. Now close the curtain and hide before I have a panic attack about seeing you burst into flames. I'm touched. You'll know if something happens to him, right? She asked, vision becoming blurry with tears. There had been too much death today. She bit the inside of her cheek and told herself that Lucas would be fine. His smile faded, a cool reserve dropping over his face as he closed the curtain. Lucas Crawford could spit in the devil's face and still float to the top. He'll live. Red drove in silence, watching the side mirrors for trackers, as the old rural highway wound around rivers and lakes. The sun played coy, peeking in and out of the clouds. Every moment she expected the slash of a shadow tentacle or the dreadful confirmation that Lucas had fallen. She kept telling herself Trudy would have to fight her shadow creature to follow them as much as he would. Her phone buzzed on the dash, flashing Fat Crispin's number. A cold sweat dripped down her back. Was this good news or bad news? She answered, Hello. Red, Jacob Crispin's brisk British accent held the fuzz of fatigue like a man rallying himself to speak. I am ever so glad to hear your voice. Mr. Constantine has left me an alarming message. Many, in fact. About the target on my head, or that his brother was nearly killed by a werewolf? Both. Trudy Fox has gone rogue. There's no official warrant for your execution from the Brotherhood. She isn't working for anyone but you guys. Or at least, that's what she believes, Red said. Had Trudy been tricked? She's dying of cancer. She's thinking of bigger things than an assassination payout. Training Hannah Proctor was supposed to be her last job. Then someone put my murder on her bucket list. Fox was reinstated behind closed doors. I was in hospital when she was assigned to Proctor, Crispin said. Only elder statesmen were at the meeting with the head bard. I would have advocated against it. She was a great bard until she tried to kill me, Red huffed out the sarcasm. Someone hired the Lopes pack and then got her to try and finish the job. Who's Mr. Gabriel? I overheard that he helped her back into the Brotherhood after Melissa. Gabriel is a new name to me, but poor Melissa is not. Yeah, Trudy got her killed or something. Felt so guilty that she retired or was pushed out. I can't keep up with the stories anymore. On the contrary, Melissa fell honorably in battle, fulfilling her destiny as many heroes before her. Every bard assigned to a hero dreads that day. Trudy should have understood. Melissa was her eighth charge. I voted to make sure she was the last. What Trudy Fox did that gray September morn was fueled by grief, yet it was an abomination nevertheless. She tried to resurrect the girl. What? Red asked. Everyone knew that death magic like that would bite a mage in the ass and resulted in a zombie at best. A terrible failure, he added curtly. She has an affinity for spirit magic and necromancy. That explains her shadow creature and her control over the vampires, she said, mulling over the other mage's battle stats. It didn't look great for the underdog. She was the best hero of her age and on track to become head bard herself before Melissa. Whoever recruited her chose their weapon wisely. This has to be about Juniper, Red said. Her past life dogged her as much as werewolves did. At least tell me you can reinstate Vic. I am doing what I can on my end. Dad, whatever are you... His son's exasperated voice appeared in the background of the phone line. No, not business. Have faith in the Brotherhood. Have faith in yourself, Crispin said quickly before hanging up. Red sniffled a little as she drove. The rain covered the sound. His words were a cold comfort. She had lost trust in the Brotherhood and never quite had trust in herself. Hours on the lulling road dulled her fear as she skirted north through Pacific City and Tillamook, passing Cannon Beach. She had done a job with Vic there once. The landmark started to look familiar as she ventured further into a rural patch by the coast, passing through small townships along the thickly forested highway. She didn't know if it was her suppressed memories or that last trip, or maybe just her hopeful imagination. 
We're getting close, Kristoff said, peeking his head out of the back curtain. The fog is coming in. I don't know what I'm doing here, she confessed. Yes, you do. For the first time since you appeared out of thin air, you are finally going where you want to. How long have you wanted to find this place? I'm not talking about charm. Trudy somehow found us before. She is a super witch. I'm not worried about her. You'll win because you need to see where the road takes you next. You didn't come back to leave so soon. I mean, your soul didn't. You sound so sure even after seeing me get my ass kicked all day. I don't have a Hail Mary in the playbook. If she gets her magic in you again, it's just me. And I wouldn't want any other witch by my side. I'll wait patiently for you to save me. Vice versa. Except I wouldn't be all that patient. I know. You take up cutlery in my defense, he said. He pointed to a distant fog-covered exit sign. That's for us. Are you sure? Wrinkling her nose, she sensed a strange vibe in the energetic frequencies. The ether seemed thicker here in her spirit gaze. Sea salt flavored the breeze. Dark oaks lurked in the mist as she turned onto the road, finally close enough to read the sign for charm. I keep the local vampires in line when it comes time for the prince's tithes. The fog is the first thing that welcomes you to this little burg. Red slowed down as the van picked its way through the haze. This is the whole welcome wagon, then. I don't know. I'm not ready for this. Basil told me that tabula rasa was a gift, the chance to start again. With a sly smile on his face, he said, Take a right and go down a mile, then tell me how you feel. She quirked her eyebrow at him, but followed his cryptic directions to a gravel lot. The fog cleared to reveal a diner in a forest clearing at a lonely crossroads. A pelican strutted across the brown shingles on the sagging roof of the long lodge. Wide windows showcased smiling townspeople in the tables and red booths. Every detail inside fit her visions. The sun came out, shining on the entrance. A neon sign curled over the front door, reading, Lily's Diner. Red nearly forgot to put the van in park as she tumbled out. She savored the sight, as if the building would dissolve like another dream. It was real. Something told her once she walked inside, everything would change. Fear slammed into her. This was the place she had been searching for, but was it the right time? Was she ready? What if she was just leading the assassins home? A thread of insecurity wound around her heart. She fled back to the van. Don't you want to go in? Christophe asked from under a blanket. His normally pale skin was pink from a sunburn. I'll just get you to your castle or whatever you have here, Red said. Numb from existential overwhelm, she started the van and left the weirdest clue to her real life behind. They looped around a large cemetery behind Lily's diner. She held her breath, driving past the graves to a long, sycamore-lined driveway of small two-story brick house. Vines threatened to devour the building, blending it into the patch of forest on the outskirts of the boneyard. Bemused, Red quirked her head at the cottage. It was so cozy looking. You get points that it's not a spooky manor, but by the cemetery? Bit of a cliché. That's prime real estate in this town, Kristoff said, while on his phone to manipulate a smart house app. The garage opened for the van to hide inside, then closed, sealing all sunlight out behind them. He was out of the van and unlocking the door to the cottage interior in the same time it took Red to take out the keys and unbelt herself. She climbed down from the driver's seat. You're always on that phone. What else have you done? I already dispatched men to extract Lucas with orders to take out Frank and Trudy. We should lay low for now anyway. I need to feed and rest in darkness after that much day walking. You do look pink red item. She wanted to slather some aloe on him. Intellectually, she knew vampires could handle daytime if not in direct sunlight, but she hadn't enjoyed watching him test the theory. Sadly, it won't turn into a tan. I already ordered a head for bagged blood along with food for you. Kristoff gestured to her to follow him. They moved into the small kitchen. Like the garage, it was uncluttered with only the basic requirements for house maintenance, like it belonged to a furnished short-term rental than a real home. 
The gray marble counters were completely bare except for a microwave. Only the sitting room revealed any personality of the owner. Black and white photography hung on the walls, large prints of people, almost candid in their composition, as if the photographer wanted to capture a moment in time. He said, poke around on the TV, I think I might have every channel, I'll be in the basement. Red took his hand to stop him, feeling suddenly shy as she smiled at him. Thank you, for everything. You helped me find... I know. She wiped her eyes, chuckling at herself. Sorry, I'm getting sappy and you're in pain. You just really came through today. Always. A shy yet pleased smile spreading on his face, Kristoff lifted her knuckles to his lips. He released her hand with a little squeeze as he turned away. Sunset is coming. Keep that in mind if you decide to cross the cemetery to explore that diner. After he left the living room, she checked out the photos, certain that they were his work. She recognized the subject in one, his friend Netta. The vampiress laughed, leaning on a rooftop rail, her short bobbed hair blown back outlined by the city lights. Red didn't think he had a single photo of himself until she finally found him in the smallest and oldest picture. Shaded sepia, he stood with Arno in seersucker spats and fedoras at speakeasy bar counter. Kristoff was taller with lighter hair, but the Novak brothers shared the same high forehead and smile. Pride radiated from their faces, brighter than the light bulb spelling out the Voltava Club in the sign above them. Was that their first nightclub? Red wandered past a leather sectional couch, enclosing the entertainment center to the bookshelf. She touched an aged copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. It looked like it had been reread frequently over the decades. She pulled it out, then found a takeout pack of sushi in the fridge, labeled to have been made an hour before. Chewing slowly in the quiet, her foot tapped and jangled as she tried to start the book. Restless, she couldn't stand the quiet anymore and headed to the van. She added a squirt gun with cold iron water, a selenite crystal, and a switchblade coated with wolfsbane oil to her belted hunter's kit. Should she take the van out? No, it was too identifiable. The far-off lights of the diner coaxed her towards the graves, like a will-o'-the-wisp. The cemetery felt eerier when she thought about Celine's vision, but she already fulfilled that prophecy. While Trudy and Frank were occupied with a shadow beast and probably Christoph's minions or the gendarme by now, Red might as well scope out the lay of the land just in case. Her inner pain over Ezra's death grimly welcomed the next rumble with the two villains. Graves dotted the gently rolling hills to the western horizon. She trekked up a small vista to a mausoleum with a mossy plaque reading McGregor. Expansive, the cemetery contained winding walking paths, aged trees, and even a large pond in the center. Swiftly moving clouds pinked overhead. An old white church overlooked her on a forested ridge to the north. Ethereal energy wafted through the tombstones and mausoleums like fog in her spirit gaze. The diner was straight ahead, half hidden by a line of trees. Ten cascading and conflicting thoughts hit her with every step. Red didn't know what she wanted when she walked into the dream diner. Everyone to say her real name like it was that old show, cheers. She had to tell herself not to hype it up. This could be like the journal and the necklace from her inheritance. Another hurtful dead end. Half a mile from Christoph's cottage, a terrible rotten odor saturated the air. Her stomach dropped as she pinched her nose. Ghouls. She had wolf's bane in her kit, but no ghost flowers. She sprinted back toward the house, passing into the newer section of graves. Two gowls lumbering after her. An hour a peekhead from behind the tome. Faces frozen in silent howls, the ghouls sheet away, racing back to the big pond. What the hell, Red whispered to herself. She pulled out her switchblade. It opened with a firm snap. Her third eye was quicker than her regular ones. She spun, knife out as a wild aura zooming into her vision. The werewolf charged her. His four large paws launched off the ground, a snarling snout aimed for her throat. Bending backward, Red slashed the poisoned blade up, slicing the wolf's chest deeply. Yelping, Frank dodged her and landed in an ungainly flop of fur on a gravestone. He snarled, 
then darted to the pond, sinking into the water to rinse off the burning wolfsbane oil. Stepping out, he shook his shaggy bulk. Something bloody dropped from his slashed chest. His silver eyes rolled with fear. Convulsing, he shifted back to a human man. Red sent a surge of power toward the air, harnessing it to guide her aim as she flung her blade at Frank, who was mid-shift. Half flayed looking, he rolled to the side. He pressed a disc, bloody in the size of a sand dollar, to his chest muscles, and let the human skin roll over it. Cover yourself, Trudy said. She stepped out from behind a mausoleum with a grimoire and a bag she handed to him. Dark circles lay under her haunted, deep-set hazel eyes. Round burn marks covered her hands. Yeah, this is a family show, Red said, propping her hand on her hunter's kit. How'd you find me? Frank pulled a suit jacket out of the bag. It was Kristoff's and left at the ghost town. Perfect for location spells. That'll do it. Red conceded, heart racing as she backed up. Spirit energy surged over the graves to wrap around Trudy. Shadows drifted over her like a cape. Her hazel eyes darkened to black. The grimoire rose, pages flapping as light beamed out. A dark orb fired out of it. Lost your pet? Red asked. She dodged the first smooth sphere, but not the next. Weaker than Trudy's phantom, it didn't burn, but it hit her like a hammer, knocking her back into a gravestone. Hissing at the impact, she hobbled to her feet, gripping the granite for support. I guess you two crazy kids worked out who would kill me then. Trudy didn't take the bait, staying silent. The book pumped orbs like an angry tennis ball machine. Red amplified her magic with the selenite in her hunter's kit to send a gust of wind at them. Shadows blocked the force. Goodbye. Trudy turned a page in her grimoire. The new rounds flying out were different, jagged like a morning star. I sincerely hope your next life is more peaceful. Red sprinted up a grassy knoll, pulling the air around herself for cover. The first orb hit her chest. The shield took the impact but shattered. She staggered, trying to remake the psychic protection. A second orb grazed her shoulder. It stole her warmth like a sinister wind from an arctic cave. Oxygen fled her lungs, breath coming out in icy vapor. She toppled down a hill. Rolling over the wet grass, her limbs slapped against the hard ground. A twig ripped her ponytail down. Her magic curled around her, but she couldn't hold up the energy. Her shoulders and head slammed against a gravestone, knocking into a framed picture and bouquet of dried flowers. The thump knocked her molars together. Pain made her nauseous. Her dyed black hair flopped over her spinning vision, and she curled onto her side. She had the ridiculous thought that the hair color would last longer than she would. A winter's frost spread through her veins. She couldn't catch her breath. Her lungs barely pumped. Her eyelids slipped down. Shock stilled her sprawled limbs. She couldn't get up. The chill reached her skipping heart, stilling it. Trudy crouched beside her, feeling for a wrist pulse. She pulled off her glasses, letting them dangle on their chain, and hung her head. Her irises faded from black to a haunted hazel. She whispered, sorrow coating each word. You fought well and used everything I taught you. Red disguised her chakras as the last gasps of coherent thought surged in her foggy brain. Her vision sparkled as her brain screamed for oxygen. Was it still playing possum when you were nearly dead? Would everything become clear? All she felt was cold. The bard wiped her hands and stood, averting her eyes from her victim. Red concentrated on her power moment, igniting her scattered magic to fight the ice spreading through her system. The giant banyan of the academy appeared in her mind's eye. A phoenix flew into the branches, trailing golden orange and vivid carmine feathers. Her lungs fluttered. The chill left Red's chest. Her heart pumped weakly. She forced herself not to move, watching the assassins through the wild hair spilling over her clammy face. Trudy fished a phone out of her pocket to take a picture. A brisk professionalism evened her shaky tone. Now, Mr. Gabriel knows. Frank turned away. Leave her for the ghouls. Glowering at his back, Trudy pushed her glasses up. She deserves to be buried. Don't get sentimental. The job is done. 
and it's cost us both so much. Trudy rubbed her arms, her hollowed gaze on the fading light at the horizon. He took a buzzing phone from his stolen suit pocket and smiled at the screen, chilling red as much as the spell. Always pays on time, that Mr. Gabriel. The crimson sunset reflected Trudy's glasses. She said, let me see that slash. You might not have gotten all the wolfsbane out. Time is of the essence when the contamination is near your heart. Grumbling, he revealed the ugly slash that looked like a bloody railroad track. A lump rose over his heart. Trudy reached into her satchel and pulled out some gauze and a tube of silver ointment. Hold these. He took them with either hand. She whipped out an old-fashioned silver razor blade. In a metallic flash, she scraped his chest, slicing off the growth. He howled and backhanded her. Trudy planted her feet like a boxer and tossed a bloody handful away to land in front of Red. It was a flattened bone disc. A flap of skin still clung to it. She raised the razor, slashing deep into his throat. Blood spurted over her glasses. You don't need that amulet. Frank pressed his hand to the bleeding wound, trying to swipe at Trudy with his half-transformed paw. Red reached into her hunter's kit to grab a squirt gun, trying not to attract notice by jostling the water. Infused with cold iron flecks, she hid it under the memorial picture frame by her ribs. She needed to neutralize that grimoire. Trudy might have lost her shadow beast, but she had imbued the book with other spells. Frank grabbed at the bard's satchel, tearing it off her shoulder. The grimoire sagged out of the bag and flipped open. A glow poured out. Trudy barreled her shoulder into him like a linebacker, knocking him off balance. She stomped on his neck. The wolfsbane on that razor is reaching your heart right now. Each struggle brings it closer. That burning in your veins is the poison liquefying your cells. Gabriel, the name came out guttural and wet. Deemed you a threat to the Brotherhood now that you fulfilled your purpose. She ground her foot down. A dark orb flew from her grimoire to hit his chest. The whispering werewolf stilled, bleeding out into the grass. I will leave you for the ghouls. Trudy stared at her hands, clenching them into fists. The grimoire floated to her, nudging her elbow like a sympathetic cat. She patted the book absently before flipping to a page. Magical energy slithered from the book. She sighed like it came from the bottom of her soul. Shadow shovels dug in the gap between graves. Two ghouls prowled closer, pond water dripping off their decaying bodies. They would eat the evidence. Red reached under the picture frame for the squirt gun and shot at the grimoire. Trudy gasped, eyes rolling in shock at seeing the supposed dead move. Surprise jerked the book out of her arms. It crashed into a clump of grasses. Dark orbs streaked out of it. Red grabbed Frank's amulet and raised it like a shield, hoping it would protect her like it had the wolf. The magical barrage cracked the disc, but the orbs boomeranged, hitting Trudy in the stomach. The rogue bard collapsed onto her back. An influx of magic overcame Red. Energy jolted through her like an injection of adrenaline to the chest. It was her own, yet it came from the amulet. How? Frank was too dead to tell her. She stood, emptying the squirt gun at the grimoire, fully neutralizing it. Trudy clutched her chest. Blood couldn't hide the tortured grimace on her face. She gasped for breath. Red crouched out of arm's reach. She wiped the grave dirt off her face. You were used, tricked. This wasn't your destiny. No, my destiny was to kill the devourer, Trudy said before she hissed in agony. She coughed. I did that at 22. Everything after that was duty. I never wanted to hurt you. Your assassination was Hannah's assignment, given by Mr. Gabriel after the ranking. I wanted to spare her from it. That hit order didn't come from the Brotherhood. They say you've gone rogue on a bogus burn notice. Tears streamed down Trudy's face. Hannah was supposed to be my redemption. Mr. Gabriel tricked you. Who is he? The bard reached out for her. His name isn't Gabriel. Red squeezed the clammy hand, her urgency forcing the words out like bullets. What is it? Trudy wheezed, shuddering as she died on the grass. 
Red bowed her head. Trudy had taught her more about magic than anyone. After seeing the bard save lives, she knew that the woman had been a hero. Her loyalty had been perverted. It felt like such a waste. The rancid smell of rot made her gag, tearing her from her complicated grief. Ghouls rushed forward like vultures that found their courage now that the hyenas were gone. She scuttled back, stumbling behind a gravestone. The two ghouls grabbed both bodies by the feet and dragged them swiftly away towards the pond. Red huddled on the grave as twilight deepened. Common sense descended over her. She was at the scene of a double homicide. Hunter 101 was not to get caught by the bodies. Ghouls weren't the tidiest eaters, so parts would float to the top. She grabbed Trudy's satchel and shoved the grimoire in there, along with a discarded switchblade. The broken halves of Frank's amulet went in a handkerchief. She knelt to straighten up the grave she had nearly died on. It read, Emma Peters, 8-23-1993, 7-22-2010. She did the sad math quickly, died at nearly 18. So sad. Red muttered a quick apology about the disintegrated bouquet and gingerly set the bent stems on top of the stone. Lifting the picture, she hopped the glass wasn't broken. She flipped it over. Oh, fuck. The picture revealed a red-headed teenager in a Charm High School t-shirt with a crooked smile and green eyes. She sat in a crimson diner booth that Red had only seen in dreams. Permanent marker in the corner scrawl it out. We'll never forget you, M. It was her own face staring out of the frame. Dropping the picture, she slumped back on her heels, heart bouncing against her rib cage. Was she losing it? She blinked, rubbing her eyes. That was really her? There were no magic signatures on it to be an illusion. Usually her thoughts raced. Now only one thundered in her mind. It was her. It couldn't be. She touched the death date engraved on the headstone. It was the same year as the beginning of the deepest dead zone in her memories, where not even historical events or pop culture had penetrated. Vic had asked her once, what were the most recent movies that she remembered to jog her memory? Her movie knowledge stopped that summer. Then it was a tunnel of darkness until Vic found her at Coyote Creek. The dates fell into place. She leaned her head against the tombstone. The magical dye had released its grip. Her tangled hair faded from black to red. She had looked for missing persons before, but never the dead. If it was, she had really survived and no one she'd loved as Emma Peters knew it. The thought made her chest hurt. Trudy had nearly buried her in the right grave. She mourned the part of herself lost at 17. She grieved for Emma Peters, whoever she had been, and hoped she would be proud of who Red had become. Her stomach nodded as a somber lump rose in her throat. She couldn't move even though she knew that she had to. The scent of another storm drifted like a promise over her grave. Kristoff broke out of a sprint. Red, what are you doing? I smelled the blood at sunset. How did you... Hi, she said, trying to not sound both excited and freaked out. He crouched beside her. Wonder suffused his voice. That picture. It's you. Trudy and Frank are dead. I found this. She pressed her palm against the cold stone. Darling, he said, taking her hand. I don't know what you did with the bodies, but there is a dinner rush at Lily's less than a half mile away. We need to leave now before you are seen. Red let him lift her to her feet. She had come to charm to find her home. Instead, she'd found her grave. Twenty-three. By... February 14th evening, Charm, Oregon. The Millennium Falcon looped around the cemetery, leaving Kristoff's cottage behind in the fog. Rain pelted the windshield. Red pressed her face against the window, heart skipping at the sight of Lily's diner, but it disappeared quickly out of view. Drink this, Kristoff said. He spiked a water bottle with his blood, multitasking with supernatural speed, as he drove the van away from Charm. Only the twitch in his cheek betrayed his calm veneer. Sure. She didn't know what to say to him yet. She still didn't know what to think yet about this awful day. He turned onto the highway to Portland and began a dizzying amount of calls, arranging everything from a plane back to Vegas to verifying pickup for Lucas. 
Finally, he ordered the removal of the bodies, or what was left of them, from the pond. She cringed at his brusque tone to his underling on the phone, ordering corpse disposal like he was calling in dry cleaning. The sickly feeling in her gut wasn't because she was shocked at his actions, but because he was doing it for her. Everyone said that he wasn't a guy to give leverage to. They seemed to get in deeper together with every meeting. She said, make sure Trudy is buried, and Ezra, nicely. Christoph nodded, eyebrow rising. A question hovered on his lips. I'm going to lie down. Head aching, she unbelted herself and climbed into the back seat. She changed behind the curtain into clean clothes, then wrapped herself in the weighted blanket. It wasn't the cold making her shake. Trudy, Ezra, Diego, and Dr. Finch had died. She couldn't fully comprehend the complicated web that had led to their downfalls, and she had been there. Ezra and Diego had been innocents in it all. They were easy to lament. Then there was her erstwhile teacher and attempted murderer. Red tightened her grip on the covers as the bard's final moments flashed through her mind. It felt like the most twisted heartbreak of all. Redemption corrupted. She texted Vic that she had survived and told him to keep it to himself until she returned. Eyelashes damp from restrained tears, she sank into a meditation that Trudy had taught her. She didn't emerge from the blanket burrito until they reached a small airport on the outskirts of Portland. Lucas waited for them inside the private plane. Flopping his tousled black hair back, he strode to her and pulled her into his arms. Kitten, I'm sorry. Can you tell me what happened? Red let him guide her to a small sofa. She curled under his arm, breathing in his sandalwood scent as she told the grisly tale over the short flight to Vegas. She didn't know why, but she didn't reveal that the wolf's amulet had given her a power boost. She skipped over it to detail Trudy's final words about the mysterious Mr. Gabriel, then how she'd finally found out her real name. The plane took her body south, but her mind was still in a cemetery to the north. She felt as foggy as the Oregon seaside, but some facts were clear. First, she couldn't return to Charm until she was sure the police hadn't found the bodies. Second, Mr. Gabriel thought she was dead, and she wanted to keep it that way. Third, Trudy's goodbye before nearly murdering her included a mention of a past life. Red hadn't said anything about being reincarnated to anyone at the Circe Casino. She might have found the grave of Emma Peters, but the memory of Juniper St. James refused to let her go. Where did this leave her? The dry night welcomed them to a small airport outside Las Vegas. Red walked down the plane stairs where a minion waited with a shiny black SUV. She had finished the job. The Lopuses were history, but it didn't feel like a victory. It simply felt like an ending. Lost in morose thoughts, the sparkle of the city couldn't distract her on the ride back to the casino. At the front entrance, she hugged both vampires goodbye impulsively. I need to check up on someone. Paranel and Hannah waited for her in the lobby. The LED ceiling cast rainbow lights on their relieved faces. The alchemist addressed her with an appreciative nod. Effervescent in a white linen caftan, Paranel said, Welcome back and congratulations. You fulfilled your end of the bargain better than the gendarme. Gary O'Sullivan is too slippery to pin. Oof! Red huffed out as the teen rushed in for a fierce hug. She returned the rib-crushing embrace. I'm glad to see you too, but I need to breathe. I had no idea. I never would have imagined that Trudy would do that, Hannah said, pulling away. Her plea turned fervent. I hate her for it. Even dead, I do. I feel sorry for her, and I don't blame you for anything. You did good out there, just like a hero. Don't let this tarnish what good we learned from her. She was tricked. We were all tricked. Red squeezed her hand. She didn't know how to explain Trudy's betrayal just then. Even when she found the words, it would still be a pale imitation of the reality. Right now, someone else needed her more. She asked, Where's Vic? He is with his brother in the infirmary. Paranel stepped forward, putting an arm around her. Sympathy lingered in her purple eyes. The immortal alchemist nudged them away from Hannah to ask discreetly, How are you, really? I'm still walking. 
Red lifted her chin, wan smile flickering. All three of you are welcome to stay as Lashon undergoes treatment, Paranel assured her, rubbing her shoulder comfortingly. Even after, if you chose. Thanks. It's kind of you. We'll move on after that, I think. Red had found a fragile piece in the academy, but the road wouldn't stop calling her north, not after what she had learned. You're always welcome. I still maintain that you would make a great alchemist. You have the curiosity. I know what compels you, but as my adept, that drive could be channeled into questions with less painful answers. She shrugged, knowing Paranel was right. Even if I stayed, I'd always wonder. Paranel sighed, a wistful smile on her face. I sensed you still had quite a journey ahead of you. Maybe in your next life, I can convince you to linger in our halls. Maybe. Red nodded and thanked the other woman. Too concerned with Vic to linger, she strode toward a portal door to the academy hidden in the gift shop dressing room. She smiled to see the giant banyan with sunrise clouds draped over its bird-laden branches. It planted seeds of peace within her as she passed the swan pond, crossing the oasis in Pyramid Hall toward the medical center. After getting lost in the winding ways of the infirmary, she found Lashon's private room. He lay with a cannula and glowing IV tubes attaching him to complicated copper-plated equipment. His dark skin was ashen against the white covers. Vic sat a lonely vigil at the bedside. Red hadn't cried on the way back from Charm, but seeing the regret and fear on Vic's face made her tear up. She hauled him into a hug. He patted her back. You got fucking Frank. That's my intern. I wish that it could have happened sooner. She laid her hand on LaShawn's still one. He was such a good guy who had only wanted to save his brother from a wolf's shit list. Last night could have changed his life forever. They'll wake him up in a few days. The treatment is a shock to the system. Vic's voice broke. He has the wolf gene, Red. That doesn't mean he'll turn. Not with this much silver in his veins. He'll be happy to wake up and see you. She hoped she hadn't spouted bullshit. I stayed at the hospital. He'll have to give me that until the full moon comes and he wishes he had caught that plane out of Vegas, Vic said. He rubbed his eyes, slumping into a chair. I think I'm getting that ulcer you warned me about. Basil swept into the room in a fluffy white bathrobe, face sunburnt above the terry cloth. Bandages covered the IV ducts on his wrists. He beckoned her into a hug. Greetings from Impressionism Hell, Red. Art doesn't look like it agreed with you. Dehydration, sunstroke, food poisoning from painted apples. It was like my last cruise, Basil said. Soulmancy magic flared from his aura. Oh, honey, I read the gloom wafting off you. You did all that you could. It wasn't your fault. I sensed Trudy's conflict. I might have reached her, given a chance, but Finch was waiting for me. If that damn picture had let me be heard, I could have saved you so much pain. We all dropped the ball, Vic said, gruffly detouring the pity parade, then turned back to his vigil over LaShawn. Red towed the ground, trying not to soul broadcast her hopes. It's good to see you in three dimensions, Basil. Paranel says we can stay. Are you going to take her up on it, or are you skipping off? Diego would have wanted me to stay, put down roots. Not just because he booked me for guest lectures in advance. The show must go on for Basil Bansko. Maybe the bed rest, too, she suggested gently. Slipping oversized sunglasses out of his pocket and setting them on his nose, Basil hugged her again and whispered in her ear, You're the real first witch. Never forget it. After the soulmancer left, Red pulled up a chair to join Vic by the medical bed. She told him how Frank died, figuring he'd appreciate the blow-by-blow, blow, and skirted over the rest, saving it for another time. After she let him ask questions, she said, Have you heard of a wolf mage named Archibald Fowler? Tried to hunt him down once, but I don't know much about him beyond he was bad news. I got the wrong wolf anyway. His jaw clenched as he looked to LaShawn and fell silent. We can't tell the Brotherhood that I'm alive yet. Trudy got the word out to Mr. Gabriel, and I don't want anyone to contradict her. 
I know. We don't know how deep it goes. This has... A knock on the door interrupted him. Hannah came in with takeout bags hanging on her arm. Shyness tensed her shoulders. I brought your favorites. I can just drop it off. Vic waved her in. It's not like you're going to wake him up. The three didn't talk much as they set up the pop-up dinner on a rolling tray. Then the words came out along with the noodles. Sorrow and fatigue wrapped around red, but with low mane and friends, a sunbeam cracked through the clouds. The next day at sunset, Red meditated under the great tree in Pyramid Hall. A text message from Lucas shattered her zen. Leaving Hannah by the swan pond, she met him outside the casino. He leaned against his bike in a loading zone. The neon Vegas lights reflected off his dark hair and leather jacket. His gray eyes found her like there was no one else in Sin City. The weight of the inevitable pressed on her chest, making her feel breathless. L.A. needs saving? Always does. Got about a day to track down a minotaur with the relic of some evil goddess. Only half listened to Cora nattering on about it. Shrugging, he flashed an impish grin. He stepped to her, hands in his pockets. I know how important it is for you to be here, but you're always welcome at the agency. I reckon when you next waltz through the doors, you'll be a very accomplished witch. Red hugged him. Her fingers clutched his back. She buried her face in his neck, breathing him in. Feeling strong enough to speak, she whispered. I'll be back someday. I just gotta find out some things. I can guess where you'll go next. Lucas tightened his arm around her waist as he stroked her hair. He said, If you need me, I'll come. Sinking into his arms, she wanted him to stay, but he had a city to save. The futile request battered against her lips. Holding him, she didn't want to break the spell of the present with words. Maybe this was just when their story ended. They stayed like that until a security guard ordered the motorcycle to be moved. Lucas zoomed away through the parking lot, leaving Red to watch the bike's headlamp fade long after it was lost in the lights of the strip. I Hannah found her at the curb and turned them toward the Circe Casino. Hey! Let's do a spa night. I'll get the ice cream this time. Red felt the next week progress so slowly as it unfolded, but looking back, it was a blur. The Synod hadn't reassigned a teacher for the witches. Her curriculum was the least of their worries as the long-running Cold War with Gary O'Sullivan heated up. With her days free, Red tried to sleep in, but each down she ended up under the banyan in the pyramid, listening to the birds. It wasn't really meditation since she drank coffee and journal ed, but she snatched serenity where she could. She needed every bit of it at Ezra's memorial service, the stirring theatrical eulogy by an actor friend named Raoul, Tory tears from the Pac Nostradamus lounge. A portrait framed by flowers stood in the place of Ezra's body, buried in some far unknown place beside his mother. She hoped it was a peaceful spot. She held it together for the crying Hannah, mourning the loss of another brother figure. Red felt the sorrow in her throat like she had swallowed an ice cube. Ezra had been a kind man in a hard world. His last act had been trying to save his mother from herself. She hoped the two had reconnected somewhere gentler on sensitive souls. Hannah and Vic were still angry at Trudy's memory, but Red saw it all as a Greek tragedy. She half carried the teen back to their dorm. Days passed under the tranquil banyan canopy in the Academy of Alchemists. Red told herself she was dragging Hannah to the hotel gym, movie nights, and to visit the sleeping Lashon in the infirmary for her own good. They even convinced Vic to do a spa facial with them. It was to keep the girl occupied, give her some stability in the wake of so much chaos. Red knew she was helping herself just as much. It wasn't much, but it felt like healing. Nearly two weeks after returning from Charm, Red reclined alone on the couch in her dorm suite. She finished the last cold bite of pasta in a plastic bowl, remnants of her dinner with Basil, made in the kitchen a day as he regulated her with descriptions of his new apartment. He had left in a flurry of excitement to start settling in, plotting a late run to the mall before it closed. Her big Friday night plan was the last season of Breaking Bad. 
Hannah stormed into the dorm suite with a shopping bag. Why aren't you getting ready? For what? The Club Voltava opening. Hello. With the flair of a showgirl, Hannah retrieved a slinky pink dress out of the bag and held it against her chest. She said, Start glamming up. We're going. I know you have an outfit. Red snorted. I don't need to dress up for Kristoff. Um, modern women here. We're dressing up to take selfies. Now get moving. It's Friday. That calls for Taylor Swift, so shake off those sweatpants already. Hannah tapped her phone to stream a pop song through the speakers. Grumbling, Red shut off the TV and did as commanded. She dabbed on eye makeup, layering more on at the teen's orders until it was sufficiently smoky. Then Hannah fought the frizz in Red's ginger waves with the determination of a lion tamer. Her first two outfit ideas were vetoed. They had a stalemate over a green dress with a halter top neckline that Hannah insisted that she wear. Red broke first just to see a smile. She hadn't seen too many of those from the young witch lately. Red let herself fall into the teeny bopper beat as they got ready and bounced out the door. She hid her giggles as Hannah flirted with a pimply adept to get him to turn the brass staircase in the dorm tower into an escalator. The shortcuts ended after they left the academy and entered the finished new wing of the casino. The line to the Club Voltava opening stretched down the hallway. Pushy and pink, Hannah dragged her to the bouncer. We're not waiting. Tell Kristoff Novak his girlfriend is here. Red rolled her eyes. Thanks, Hannah. The bouncer muttered into his walkie-talkie. Some redhead and her annoying underage friend is here. Is this the one? Yes, that's the one, Kristoff said in the doorway, looking as if he'd stepped out from the pages of GQ. A tailored black blazer and cobalt v-neck shirt brought out the blue in his eyes. Party lights strobed over his dark blonde hair. He beckoned them inside. The club bumped from the loud rhythms as a DJ in the aloft glass booth casted his own spell. Any trace of the fight with the wolves was gone as if nothing had ever happened. Flashing lights pierced the darkness, shifting over the blissed-out revelers. Kristoff said once he could be like a genie. It looked like he had fulfilled the wishes of his investors. This is so cool, Hannah said, squeezing Red's hand and dragging her along to the edge of the packed dance floor. A self-satisfied grin spreading on his face, Kristoff turned around, pulling a VIP pass out of his suit jacket. I assume you want to go backstage before the Mr. Hyde show, too? Hannah boggled at him, pure joy radiating from her doe eyes. Of course we do. I saved him from poltergeists once, so... Red started to say. Hannah bolted forward to snatch the pass out of Kristoff's hand. Amused by the speed of the excited teenager, he pointed to a stern-faced hipster with a clipboard and a septum piercing. Pia will take you to the meet and greet. Do you mind? Hannah asked Red, trotting in place, clutching the backstage pass. I'm good, Red said, laughing at the puppy-like enthusiasm she waved her off. Go, enjoy celebrity spotting. Hannah muffled a shriek and darted away. Tossing her sleek hair back, Red crossed her arms. A teensy smile cracked through her unimpressed facade. That was a Machiavellian maneuver. I see it as a win-win for both parties. Kristoff put his hand on her lower back, his caressing gaze scanning her outfit. That is my favorite color. I'm arrogant enough to think you dressed up for me, but I get the feeling Hannah pushed you into coming. She was rather forceful with the mascara. Red fiddled with the halter dress's collar. His claim mark was exposed on her neck, but she didn't hide it. Her belly tightened a little at the interest lurking behind his effortless cool. I'm grateful for the rough treatment. You look beautiful. I was wondering when I would see you again, he said. His presence parted a path through the dance floor. The dancer subconsciously recognizing the predator in their midst. He walked her to a ray said platform to sit down at a table among the VIP guests. With the best view of the upcoming performance, she fell silent and studied the closed stage curtains. Gloria had taunted them about her daddy's good luck charm there. How did it defend Red against Trudy's last spell and her a boost of power? It wasn't something she had told anyone but Vic and her own journal. Kristoff idly stroked the back of her shoulder, 
regaining her concentration. She rambled some observation about the place looking bigger now with all the people, feeling him return the banter more than hearing it. He leaned in to face her, a thoughtful furrow deepening between his brows. His scent surrounded her, charcoal soap and wintry forests. He rubbed his thumb in circles over her tattoo. I bounced the name of an Emma Peters with your description to Netta for the deviator run. Nothing has come up yet. Charmstown Hall had a mysterious fire around 10 years back, so their records are scarce. I'll have her keep digging. She's busy, but you'll be the first to know what I learn. The openness in his expression made her heart pang. Red had said he didn't have feelings, but she could see the depths in his gaze. I said thank you, but I didn't tell you what it meant when you took me to the diner. You pep talked me into finding charm. You helped me go home. It's all I ever wanted. You would have found it on your own. You're persistent like that. He brushed a stray lock of hair off his mark on her throat. Red bit the inside of her cheek to stop the sigh he provoked. I didn't ask you to come to Battleforge, but I'm still alive because you did. I guess I was worried about owing you again. Somber, he tipped her chin up. You have to know that we're beyond favors now. That's what worries me. I don't know my intentions when it comes to you. She looked down, avoiding everything she saw in his soft expression. Blue eyes twinkling, he ran his fingers down her arm. You don't need to know everything. Jump into the unknown. She shivered as he leaned in, lips hovering over hers. It would have been so easy to let him kiss her. Her mouth already sought his. Corralling all her willpower, she pulled back, hand on his chest, to pause his advance. Her fingers spread over the soft fabric, hiding his firm muscles. I don't know if I can. I just have this feeling that if I do... That you won't get me out of your system. Can you tell me I'm completely wrong? Kristoff traced the curve of her cheek. She couldn't disagree. Not without lying. The racing heart in her chest told the truth anyway. Banging her knee on the table as she stood, she fled the question and the temptation. Disappearing on the dance floor, she hid herself in a nook behind the staircase to the DJ booth. Hand over her heaving chest, she tried to catch her breath. What the hell was she doing? Red felt him before she saw him rounding the corner to her hiding place. Determination graced his grin. Amber glinted in his blue irises. He looked like he relished her conflict, knowing it was tipping in his favor. She knew she should move, but it was like the first time she had seen him. That echo of deja vu enthralled her. Her feet planted to the ground even as she shivered. Kristoff stopped in front of her, hands clasped behind his back. A slight tremor ran through his biceps as if he were fighting himself not to touch her. His gaze devoured her trembling form. You couldn't lie to me. Good. Why does it feel like this between us? Red needed him to be honest. He remembered their last life together. This connection had nearly destroyed them both. Because we were meant to spark even if it burns us. He touched her arm, summoning fire under her skin. His fingers drifted up to caress his mark on her neck. Red lay her hand on his. It was the detonator button. She pulled him closer by his jacket collar and wrapped her arms around his neck. There was one second to think it over. Instead, she flung fuel at the flames and kissed him. He pulled her tighter against him, their bodies pressed together, fitting like puzzle pieces. Every inch of him felt like a recovered memory. She slipped her fingers through his hair. He had always been the one to touch her. She had shied from initiating contact. Now she couldn't get close enough. Her lungs hitched in her chest. Breathless, she didn't want to stop. She kissed him deeper. Red, Hannah called out, muffled and unseen from the dance floor. Reality pierced through her lust. Red panted against his lips, breaking away from him. Her touch lingered on his face as she drew away. Blushing, she flattened the bunched-up skirt on her thigh. She felt his gleaming gaze stroking over her curves as much as his hands. With good sense, finally in the driver's seat of her brain, she backed away. Her body resisted like it was magnetized. She didn't trust herself to look at him. Hannah popped out from around the staircase and grabbed her hand. She bounded through the clubbers, towing her along. Red touched her kiss-bruised lips, glancing over her shoulder. 
Christoph regarded her with the seductive patience of Lucifer, knowing the sinner would be back. What is it? Red asked Hannah. LaShawn woke up. Lost in her thoughts, Red barely heard the girls chatter as they sped to a private room in the academy infirmary. Vic leaned against the door sill, a bittersweet twist to his smile. You're in time. They just put his pants on. Propped on pillows, LaShawn sat upright in regular clothes. A few nurses fluttered around him, taking his blood pressure and whisking away a mirror to hang on the wall. He smiled, putting on his glasses. I've never felt more rested. Is every coma like that? You're positively glowing. Red laughed, hugging him, mindful of the IV ducts still in his arms. Hannah sat on the other side of the bed, kicking her high heels off. Ooh, what was it like? Was it like that one movie? Red floated away from the conversation to lean against the wall next to Vic. She faced him, poking his shoulder. Hey, you're quiet. Vic glanced away to the bed, just thinking of what happens next. Enough of that. You got your brother back in the here and now. Leave the future where it is. Everything's changing. Vic tugged his hat brim up, then crossed his arms. I'm going to have to wait to find out how much. Not like you. You already found what you were looking for in Oregon. Red shrugged. I didn't think it was going to be my grave. Vic sucked at his front teeth, audibly mulling it over. Emma Peters. I don't know. I'm probably just going to keep calling you Red. I'm not her anymore. She lifted her chin, catching her determined reflection in a hanging mirror but I'm going to find out who she was. The Red Witch Chronicles continues in Small Town Witch. About the author. Sammy Valentine is an urban fantasy writer who grew up in the desert and now wanders in search of Wi-Fi and coffee. Formerly a mild-mannered librarian, she had a quarter-life crisis and shook everything up. She started working in an LGBT homeless center, shaved some of her head, and rediscovered some of her old passions. After realizing that her goal in life was to get out of her small town and she had only made it 30 minutes up the highway, she filled a bag and left. That was three years and a dozen countries ago. Find out more at SammyValentine.com. <laughs>